hearing of the Senate Rural Regional Affairs and Transport Legislation Committee. The Senate has referred to the committee the particulars of proposed expenditure for 2016-17 and related documents for the agriculture and water resource portfolio. The committees may also examine the annual reports of the departments and agencies appearing before it. <coughs> the committee has before it a program listing agencies relating to matters for which senators have given notice and the proceedings today will begin with an examination of the Rural Industries Research and Development Corporation, the Cotton Research and Development, Grains Research and Development, Fisheries Research and Development, and the Australian Fisheries Management Authority. The Senate has ordered estimates committees to report to the Senate by Wednesday the 11th of May. So answers to questions on notice will be returned to the committee by 12 noon, Tuesday the 10th of May, best of luck. Um, senators remind that there that any written questions on notice must be provided to the committee before Wednesday the 11th of May as tabling committee reports and reports ends the inquiry. Witnesses should note the answers cannot be received if the Senate has been dissolved for an election. Understanding order 26, the committee must take all evidence in public session. I remind all witnesses that in giving evidence to the committee they are protected by parliamentary privilege. It's unlawful for anyone to threaten or disadvantage a witness on account of evidence given to a committee in such action may be treated by the Senate as contempt. It also may as a contempt to give false or misleading evidence to a committee. <coughs> the Senate by resolution in 1999 endorsed the following test of relevance of questions at estimate hearings. Any questions going to the operations or financial positions of the departments and agencies which are seeking funds in the estimates are relevant questions for the purpose of estimate hearings. I remind officers that the Senate has resolved there are no areas in which connection with the expenditure of public funds where any person has a discretion to withhold details or explanations from the Parliament or its committees unless the Parliament is explicitly provided otherwise. The Senate has resolved that an officer of the Department of the Commonwealth shall not be asked to give opinions on matters of policy, don't take debate, and shall be given reasonable opportunity to refer questions asked of the officer to superior officers or to a minister. This resolution prohibits only questions asking for opinions on matters of policy, does not preclude questions asking for explanations of policies or factual questions about when and how policies were adopted. I particularly draw attention to the, uh, of witnesses to an order of the Senate of the 13th of May 2009, specifying the pro process by which a claim of public immunity should be raised. Witnesses are specifically reminded that a state statement that information or a document is confidential or consists of advice to government is not a statement and meets the requirements of the 2009 order. Instead, witnesses are required to provide some specific indication of the harm to the public interest that could result from the disclosure of the information or the document. An officer called to answer a question for the first time state their, should state their full name and the capacity in which they appear, and witnesses should speak clearly into the microphones to assist hands hard to record proceedings and I could, could I especially remind myself and everybody else to t switch off their mobiles or tender them in audible. And I now welcome, all the way from South Australia, the Honourable Anne Rushton, representing the Minister for Agriculture and Water Resources, Mr Young Darrell Finlevin, Secretary of the Department of Agriculture and Water Resources and his officers of the department. Minister Rushton and Mr Quinlevin, do you want to make an opening statement? Right. No, Chair. Okay. Well, we're into it. Thanks, Doug. Uh, thanks, Chair. Um, <coughs> can I just get some clarity, uh, Chair, uh, in terms, we're going to have RIR, DC, grains and fisheries in this half hour session? Uh, yep. So are they, Best of luck. Yeah, that's what I thought. So we've only got RIR, DC at the table. Can we have the others at the table? We can. Yep. Yeah, thanks. Um, ta. We're going to need a bigger boat. <laughs> Good yeah. So, Mr. Harvey, Professor Stelic, um, what's the current state of play with the relocation? Specifically, have any staff moved? Have any contracts been signed? Um, I can answer that, um, um, Senator. 
Um, before I do it, uh, would, you, would the committee indulge me with a brief statement? Yeah, don't be frightened to speak up. Uh, this is my final appearance before the committee as the chair of the corporation. Um, Congratulations. So it's mine too. <laughs> you're, you're anticipating me, Senator. Um, I've had this privilege since April 2010, and in that time I chaired three boards. And I want to take this public opportunity of thanking them for successfully leading the corporation through a period of turbulence and change. I also want to thank our staff and our stakeholders for the, for the same reason. I'm very confident that the corporation is well placed to meet the opportunities that lie ahead. And the appointment of our new managing director, Mr John Harvey, is symbolic of this new beginning. And I just tell the committee that Mr Harvey's been in the job 48 hours. Beauty. I will get him. Um, I'd also like to take this opportunity to congratulate you, Chair, in your well, eminent retirement. Be careful. And to personally thank you for your advocacy for rural Australia. Thanks. And in particular, your recognition of the often invisible but important contribution of rural women to Australia. Thank yeah, you. Yeah. Hmm. Thank you. So to answer your question, Senator Cameron, um, we have uh, plans in place. Yeah, sure. You know, I'm sure on behalf of the, the, uh, the opposition, we would congratulate you for the work that you've done yeah. and wish you well uh, in the future. I'm sure that goes for everyone here. You speak you. for us. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you both. Um, to, put it, to put your question into context, uh, the board complied with the request from the minister to relocate Rodec outside of Canberra. It did so in its, at its meeting in uh, February of this year. And our plan is to start that process from the 1st of July. So at the moment, to answer your question specifically, uh, we are still located in Canberra. But next week, we have a board meeting in Wagga uh, with our new landlord, the Charles Sturt University, Charles Sturt University. And we will be making plans from next week about the move. And the, so have you signed contracts with Charles Sturt? Um, I'll ask. Uh, not at this point in time. We have a located uh, premise, and we are in negotiations with the university. Uh, so, so there's no contract signed. There's no staff moved. Correct. That, that's Correct. Situation. Um, we're in caretaker. We'll be in caretaker mode next week. What's your plans for consulting with the opposition on this issue? Um, we would be discussing that at the board meeting next week, Senator. Can I just make it clear that um, our contract on the lease premises we hold in Canberra expires at the end of September? Yeah. yeah. What, what's the outstanding cost of that lease? Um, you can take that on notice. Yeah, we can take that on notice, yeah. yeah. Uh, is there, have you negotiated with staff for the, the, the move? We've had extensive discussions with staff. I remind the committee that our first uh, board discussion about this issue was two years ago. Yeah. And I personally have made sure that every after every board meeting we keep the staff informed. Okay. And the staff have had one-on-one -on -one meetings with management throughout yeah. this time. Yep. So nothing's changed at this stage. You're in the process of working through uh, a, a possible move, but you haven't moved yet. Would that be a fair assessment? Well, it is the reality. That's right. Yeah, yeah. Um, who else do we have? Uh, what about uh, Green's research? That end. So, uh, yeah, thanks, Mr. Thomas. I'll just introduce myself. Uh, I'm Steve Thomas. I'm the Acting Managing Director of Grains Research and Development Corporation yeah. until the 4th of July, yeah. which is when Dr. Jeffries will take over officially as the Managing Director. Yeah. Uh, just before I come to you, Mr. Thomas, uh, Ms. Delic, where, where is your planned move, just to refresh everyone's memory? <coughs> where? Yeah. To Wagga Wagga. To Senator. Wagga. Yep. So, so you're off to, to the... Wagga. Yep. Uh, Mr Thomas, what's the situation with you guys? Where are you supposed to be moving to? Uh, we've implemented a hub and spoke model, Senator. Uh, that's been in plan now for some time. We yeah. have a central hub in Canberra, uh, which is looking after our longer term investments uh, and those that are best coordinated nationally. We also have offices that have been opened in Adelaide together with uh, FRDC and Australian Wine. We have another office which was opened recently in Dubbo 
Yep. We will offer, open a further office in Toowoomba, and we've had an office in Perth for some time. Okay, so can you, uh, what's been the cost of this re reallocate, reallocation yes. of resources? So the total cost of offices uh, is a $128,945. dollars 128000 Is there, what about your current leases in Canberra? Our current lease in Canberra is a 10-year lease. It's in the order of $10 million. So you'll have spare office space in Canberra, will you? At the moment, uh, I have a range of contractors in my office uh, that are undertaking a core system replacement. I uh, suspect that when they have left, uh, we will be looking at opportunities to, uh, to partner with like organisations to offer them some space. Now, what I'm asking you, you've got spare office space in Canberra as a result of this decision. Yes or no? I, I have office space in Canberra, but whether it's spare is debatable, Senator. Yeah. Uh, I mean, the more pertinent question is, do you have the capacity to sublet it? I would have the capacity to sublet. Yeah. 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 Having the capacity to sublet is not the same as being able to sublet, are, is it? We are actively looking at opportunities to yeah. sublet. So you've got no, you've got no, you've got no leases. For I have the... no leases at the moment. We have been undertaking okay. negotiations. And if you just ask how many people you've got in that million dollar a year rent, how many people occupy a million dollar rental property? At the moment, within Canberra, I have in the order of 50 staff. 50 staff and, and I have, a million a year. I have a further 10 to 15 contractors at any one time. So 65 staff and a million bucks a year rent. That is what we have can, at the moment. Can you, uh, can you just tell me how much a square metre it is? Well, it's like a good job to me. I'm not your landlord. Sure. Sounds like we're on the job here, though. So, so I missed, missed your chair. Check what did you ask? I missed that. Hey? What did you ask? I asked him how much a square metre. Okay, no. that's an even better question. Uh, I might actually refer to my head of corporate services. Is that if that's okay, Senator? All right. I mean, you can waffle around, but that's yeah, that's fine. That's the right. spear in the heart. <coughs> Bear in mind, it costs twenty-five thousand dollars a square metre to refurbish yep. the government offices in Sydney a couple of years ago. Twenty-five thousand dollars a square metre to refurbish them was bloody bullshit. So while we're waiting for that, that, that sure. response, so you've signed contracts for lease space in these other spoke, if you, the spoke areas, yes, have you? Yes, we have. Okay, you've signed those contracts. Have staff moved? Yes, they have, sir. Okay, so you're down the track a bit. Can I, and while we're waiting for the, <coughs> sure. do we have that figure or not? Senator, Tanya Howard, Executive Manager, Corporate Services. So the cost per square metre of our current building is $475 per square metre. Okay. Per month? No, per annum. Per, per annum. annum. Okay. Um, mm. Fisheries? Who, who, who owns the building? Uh, ISPT. Who? ISPT. Who the bloody hell are they? Uh, they're super a superannuation enough. fund, I believe. Manage oh, a lot of they? superannuation Who's funds. Who's super? Industry. It's the independent. Uh, yeah, independent. Okay. Um, Four seventy-three. Okay, fisheries Four research 75. and development. Uh, Dr. Hone, uh, have you uh, moved? Have you signed any contracts? So, Senator Cameron, uh, the situation is the same as the last Senate. So, we have established the Adelaide office. We have appointed the six people in Adelaide. Um, we've inducted the six people in Adelaide, and in Canberra, we continue to have an office in Canberra. Okay. So, have you contract signed? The contract is signed with the lease in Adelaide. Yes, yeah. and the launch of the Adelaide office has occurred. Yes. Okay. So that's that's all underway. Um, now. Can I just go back a minute, sure. Doug? So the person that owns the building, is that a independent or a industry super fund? Uh, I'm not sure of the Can details. you find that out? Sure. It's a, it's a property trust that super funds invest in. All the super funds put it in the industry. Industry super fund? Yeah, all of It's all a property trust that markets to all super yeah, funds. Yeah. Mm. They're cute, some of these things. Okay, um, greens. Um, can I? 
You uh, used Alan Jones uh, apparently to raise awareness of the value of the grain sector. Is that correct? That's correct, sir. Um, so how much did you pay Alan Jones to do this? I might call my executive manager of communications, Senator. Executive Manager of Communications. That's good. That's good. Is that fine? That's good. Yeah. Um, so, with regards to the costs, specifically for the events, the costs were around $70,000. Uh, there was a slight reduction uh, from the quan that we submitted in the last estimates from 80 to 70. We made some cost efficiencies there. Uh, the entire piece of work, though, so the 950 uh, radio slots, the four events, the four podcasts, the video, um, and access to the 9.9 .9 million listeners comes in at $178,846. Okay. Um, now, was Alan Jones paid $60,000 for three events? So the $60,000 that went to uh, Fairfax Regional Radio, that money covered travel costs, accommodation, food and beverage costs, um, obviously, when uh, Alan was doing the events, he set up a regional radio station, so we also paid Very cosy with Mr. Mr. Jones, aren't you know, Alan? Mm -hmm. Well, we did a significant amount of research to find out who would be the best person to speak to our audience. And Mr. Mr. Jones's research, uh, Mr. Jones's team has told me that over the period we used him, the seven weeks, he was able to reach 9.9 .9 million Australians. So okay, we felt that someone with that sort of reach would be an appropriate person uh, to speak the message of Australian grains. Okay. Now you also used a Western Australian radio presenter, Mr. Bartlett, was it? Correct, uh, Liam Bartlett. He is a, yeah. a, a television uh, host for Channel 9 News and also a radio uh, presenter. And he was paid $20,000 for one event? Uh, so again, the costs <coughs> were for travel, for accommodation, food and beverage, uh, incidental costs. I have a breakdown um, of those costs, which I've been oh, able well, to you can, provide. Yeah, so can you provide the breakdown of costs for uh, Mr. Jones? So and the sorry, breakdown of costs for Mr. Bartlett? A point of clarification. You, you keep framing it as Mr. Jones and Mr. Bartlett or whatever. Did you pay this to these people personally or, or did you pay it to their employers as, uh, prop, as appropriate media outlets like Fairfax Rural Media or can you just give me some understanding because it's being framed in a way in which, you know, it sounds like there's all these greedy yeah. media people out there getting all this money from the government. I never say greedy, but they're well paid by the looks of it. Well, well <laughs> you, can, you have the same opportunity in this great country of ours to achieve the same level of income if you choose to go down that path. Well, I think with the Rush Rick, one of all you shared, that's what Senator Cameron was leading so, down so that so path and the information was so forthcoming. Thank you very much. Just right. to go to carry out the crap. So was the, was the check paid to the corporate entity or to the person? Uh, to, to Fairfax Regional. Right. Yeah. Oh, okay. No, no, but excuse me, hang on, Chair. Senator Cameron was asking, That's and right. the official is doing the right That's thing, right. and the official, I'm sorry, I can't see your name, I've got my glasses on. Uh, Ms. Ms. Lord. Ms. Lord. Lord, thank you. And Ms. Lord was just going to break it all down for the committee. Yeah. So right. we don't need to run up uh, obstructions. No, 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 but I mean, the cheque is not made out to a person, it's made out yeah, to the court. No, no, but, but Senator Cameron is asking the questions. We'll you find out exactly. Ask Fairfax, what they No, no, we, well, no we're, we're going to well, find the, out. The, the reality is, Miss Lord, isn't it, that the, the payment was for the services uh, of, Ms. a part of the payment, at least, was for the services of Mr. Bartlett and Mr. Jones. That's correct, isn't it? So the way that we structured this particular approach was to have research done first to inform us as to who would be the best person to facilitate these events um, and the names that were put forward to us by Fairfax were uh, Mr how much Jones did, How Mr. much did you pay for the research? You would have. Uh, the, the audience research was completed by a separate company 
the research that we've done on audience segmentation, so that research took probably three or four months to complete. That's, uh, I think, the cost of coming just under $100,000, but that was not just specific to this particular program. So That's you spent $100,000 to tell you that Alan, that Alan Jones and Mr. Bartlett would be the best people to do this job, is that correct? No, that's not correct, Senator. Well, what, what, did, what, what was I, the 100000 for? Sorry, Senator. What I have done is undertaken audience research. So actually, for me as a communications professional, when putting together my plans for the year, I can understand where my stakeholders are engaging with media. So what we found when looking at uh, grower stakeholders in particular, they're huge consumers of radio, which makes uh, sense. On the bloody tractor, there's nothing else to do. Quite <coughs> and, uh, very high consumers of talkback radio, obviously. Um, and that would, would be evidenced by the 9.9 .9 million uh, stakeholders that potentially Alan Jones could reach in a seven week period. I'm sure a lot of those 9.9 .9 million would have absolutely no concern about your organisation at all, wouldn't it? Well, wouldn't care. I couldn't, I, I possibly couldn't speculate, but, but if they haven't heard our message, I'm not sure how yeah. else they would learn to care about the grain. So industry. if they heard your message, what, what does that mean for, for agricultural production and research? So I'll give you, give you a very clear example. So of that audience, we've seen that 5,100 of our case studies, so our extension case studies, the most popular of which was called uh, No-Till Pays Bills. So it's a very specific uh, agricultural reference. 5,100 people have read our case studies about yeah. how to improve productivity on farm. Doug, do you know what No-Till Pays Bills mean? I do. Chair. With the greatest respect, we don't have much time. So can we at least behave in uh, no, no, five that hours is that we have? To understand can what you no give Senator Cameron zero the tilling the question. The message to farmers and the out there, if you want to keep the price of wheat down, you've got to keep your cost down. Zero tillage. I mean, once upon a time you fallowed the paddock in the spring and you sprayed it's it for bloody yeah. It's all very it's important. Years ago. And it's now very important. it's zero tillage. And it's a great way to keep your costs chair, down because the this bloody is very wheat market's important, up to chair, shit. But we have limited time, yeah, yeah, well, and you'll get another letter if you're not if careful. You in fact, I encourage you to write another letter. Who from? Oh, whoever it was that wrote it before. But can oh, no, we no, at least no. can we oh, at least no, have the opportunity yeah, to let Senator right. Cameron follow the line of questioning in right. the limited right. time that we have? Yeah, but I think I think that is to graphic zero tillage is a good message. So when is it all finished? I can. Yeah, right. Okay, yeah, thanks. Um, so, um, who decided that Mr. Jones and Mr. Bartlett were of equal value? In what regards? In terms of Mr. Jones gets paid uh, for three events, 60,000, Mr. Bartlett received 20. I'd have for to one say, event. What's yeah, I'd have to take it on notice and actually give you a breakdown of all the costs. But I, mean, I thought you had that, Miss Lord. You were I'm, going to give us a breakdown. I've actually just done for one event. We're actually still in the middle of um, of this piece of work, so it's um, I, obviously I, the events. Have sorry, Miss Lord, I can't believe that someone here hasn't got the figures, knowing darn well that it's Senate estimates. I cannot believe you don't have the figures. You were about to give us a breakdown. You said now, said one event. I've just done. You would this. have you would have the costings there. The first events, but actually we made some savings in the first uh, event. So Same thing, Green. I Doug, I won't take any more of your time, mate, but I'm getting frustrated. Mm. So I'd be happy to take it on notice and provide no, it. No, no, you'd have it here. But you, you, are, the, you are the, I think you, you, you called yourself a communications professional. You're the like one, so. you, you're the person that uh, negotiated all this, aren't you? I did, yes, yeah, and so, I managed so you can't to save the organisation in order of $92,000 through my negotiations on this particular package. So when I was looking no, no, at just, the market... No, no, just stop talking for a minute. Um, I'm asking, asking a question. A question. Right. Uh, so you're, you're the professional, you negotiated the package, but you can't tell us uh, why the Alan Jones was valued the same as Mr Bat. <coughs> You can't, you can't tell me that now? We're getting to the big uh, issues. Senator, I, I think we'd already established that the payment was made to Fairfax Media. That's not um, what you said I in your questions on I, notice. I don't know that we would actually presume to understand how Fairfax might construct its account. Um, if you would like us to take that on notice, we're more than happy to do so. Um, free beer. There was a, a talent fee. Was that, who was the talent fee paid to? 
Correct. So that's what Fairfax calls um, the, just the way that it actually uh, bills us. It's called a talent fee, and that covers travel costs, accommodation, food and beverage, the ISDN line for the show, and yeah. incidental costs. All right. So we provide a breakdown on. Do you have the breakdown on that with you? I have the one event. I have the breakdown. Okay. On. Can you provide that? Can you table that now? Yes, I can. Okay. That's good. If you can table that, that would be good. Um, we might have to come back to that uh, while it's being. Uh, found. Um, now, how many people attended the events? Uh, so we had in the order of 262 stakeholders, not including staff um, and support uh, people. Consequently, yeah. we also produced four podcasts from the event, and those have been downloaded and listened to 1,300 times so far. So approximately 1,500 people at this point. But as I said, we're only at the very that, early but stages. But downloading isn't what I've asked you. I've asked how many people attended the events. That's 262. 262. OK. How many of them were actually growers? So 262 is the number, which is not staff and support. But how many were growers? Um, I would have to take that on notice and get a breakdown. So I've actually got a list of the 262, yeah. but some of them wear dual hats. Obviously, some of them are growers, some of them are researchers, some are industry, some are representatives. So there is a quite a mix. So do you have that with you? I don't know. I'd have to take. Has someone else got it? Someone else behind you? I can't believe this. You come and send this, but you can't even provide basic information such as this. Well, the names of 262. We don't want the names. Send the camera to ask for the names. You surely can't have us believe that you couldn't tell us how many were growers. Well, when they attended the events, we asked them to register their details if they wanted to. They were free in public events, so I could speculate or give you an estimate. This is levy payers' money, Miss Lord. I would have thought the GRDC would know exactly who the audience is. This is levy payers' money. It Sorry, is. Senator Cameron. Okay, um, so. I think that there's been some discussions about the consistency of this expenditure with the Act. Have you uh, had any legal advice on this, Mr Thomas? Uh, Senator, we didn't seek legal advice on this. Uh, when we looked at, at this, quite clearly it fits within uh, sections 11E and 11A of the Perth Section Act. 11E and 11A. So what's 11E? Just tell me what 11E says. Uh, 11E is the dissemination of results what and communication of research and development. What does it say? Do you have the act there? Uh, I do have. I do have. Well, just read 11E to me, will you? 11E states to disseminate, commercialise, and facilitate the dissemination, adoption, and commercialisation of the results of research and development in relation to the primary industry or class of primary industries in respect of which the corporation was established. Okay, so disseminating that to um, a pensioner. In grey stains. How does that meet this? Uh... I would refer you also to <laughs> the functions of. Uh... No, I'm asking. Does that does, does that fit with 11E? Uh, the audience, uh, Senator, was very very broad. But I'm asking you. So... You're spending money to to, get to to reach a pensioner in grey stains in the western suburbs of Sydney, who has probably never been on a farm. Uh, how does that? promote your organisation? Senator, we spent money to promote the grains industry across a very wide audience. So, so are you saying you get value from that pensioner in Grace Danes, uh, who's listening to Alan Jones, <coughs> that you, what's the value you get from I, her? What I'm saying, Senator, is the, the investment was made to increase the awareness of the grains industry across a very wide audience. Uh, so, so, so you, you're happy that you're spending money to tell a pensioner in, in Grey Stains in Western Sydney about your research? Our, re our research and the target of, those, uh, of this actual campaign was to go across a very, very wide audience. Now, including that pensioners been, in Grey Stains? It is, it is whether we were looking uh, for our interaction across the grains industry and those that are interested in the grains industry. Right. Well, it just sounds a bit dumb to me. 11A, read 11A, will you? 11A refers to the investigate and evaluate the requirements of research and development in relation to a primary industry or a class of primary industries in respect of which it was established and on the basis of such investigations and evaluation to prepare an R&D plan and to review and revise that plan. So, 
this doesn't do anything about dissemination, adoption, and commercialization, does it? Uh, I mean, that, that, if you're going to disseminate ad and, and get more adoption and commercialization of your research and development, telling the pensioner in grey stains doesn't do anything, does it? Are we referring to Part A or Part E? No, I'm just it? asking you in general terms. May I answer that question, <coughs> Senator? Um, I just alluded before to the case studies that we put together on key research outcomes. I think the fact that 5,100 people over a seven week period have already engaged with the, the top two, in fact, the first one was the no till pays bills and the second one was focused on the grains industry sustainability. And both of these case studies are trying to give growers insights and raise awareness of things that they can do to increase their mm. profitability and that's core to GRDC's business. Now we're, we're always looking for innovative and different ways to get our message across and we really felt someone it's who innovative. had a reach at this level with this, this type of um, uh, interest in the agriculture sector would be a good way to do that. I think if it would be too early to give you final results, uh, we're still in the process of doing this. We, we are promoting this through our online channels, through Facebook, for our own accounts. So it would be too early to um, give you a full uh, evaluation. But the early signs tell us 5,100 people viewing a case study is a very significant number in our, in our industry. So you've got, you've got abs so can you provide then the, all of your uh, internal uh, documentation in relation to the development of this this uh, program. I'd be happy to. All memos, uh, all file notes uh, in relation to it. Yep, absolutely. Um, the radio ads. Are you claiming they are consistent with the act? So the radio, the radio spots that you are talking about through <coughs> Alan's network, the 950 slots of which I will note that we were able to negotiate 674 of those for free. Um, those slots were actually to raise no, money. I'm only interested, I'm not interested in what you get for free, I'm interested in what you paid for. Mm -hmm. That's what this is about. So how much did you pay for the ads? The entire total of the package is 178,846, right. the first figure I gave. Okay, so, uh, so these were marketing, this was a marketing program, wasn't it? I think when you're, it, Mm -hmm. Marketing is an interesting term in the agriculture space and I am aware of the difference between marketing in a communications context and marketing and developing market access. This particular program was about raising awareness. Um, the particular slots were actually indicating to people in the general public that they could attend the events, that they could come free of charge. So the Greystains granny can come along? Absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. The other thing is too, I mean obviously we, we point them towards our website. We are trying to increase our web traffic which is, uh, and research has told us, that is still quite low but websites are the most important uh, place for information were for the, grain growers. Were the, were the radio ads running in, in Canberra? Uh, they were running across 56 regional hubs. I'll have to check if they were running in Canberra. I'll take so it you don't know notice. whether they were running in the, the nation's capital? They were syndicated, so we had a lot of free and extra slots appointed to us. All of the ones we paid for were across the Did you target Canberra? Stations. Did you ask specifically for Canberra to be included? Uh, we wouldn't consider Canberra to necessarily be a key grain growing region. Uh, we, well, but, but grey stains is not a grey grain growing region either, is it? So grey stains in the western suburbs of Sydney is not a grain growing area? No, but there potentially are young people who sit in those particular electorates whose parents may listen to this and say to them, you know what you should think about? A career in grains. And that is one of the other objectives we've talked about. I mean, obviously there is the extension component right. of can you provide? Can you then provide the, uh, the actual uh, transcript of the ads that went out? I would be happy to take that on notice. Yep, provide them. And what were they saying? But what, what were they saying in these ads? That you'd come and get a job in the grains industry? Well, we weren't quite that forward, although at some point in the future we may be. Actually, what but we no, you're saying is... You're saying it would entice a young person to work in the grain industry. How do, tell me what the ad said that would do that. Actually, what I said, just point of clarification, is that perhaps uh, one of the listeners, we know what the demographic is of Alan Jones' show, might say to a young person, that actually this is a good career for you and agriculture is a, a valuable career. One of the problems that agriculture has is a lot of people give it a bad reputation. Uh, a lot of the image of agriculture is actually of um, centres around drought, we've got no water, we haven't had, we've got all these problems, you can't make a living. 
And one of the functions of the events was actually to try and elevate the image of agriculture. And you know, I found, I'd give the example of Gundawindi. I had three generations of growers standing there and the oldest grower saying to the youngest grower, well, I didn't know that this was this exciting. Now, I'm not saying that in every case, someone's gonna pick up my work and tell somebody to go, but it is, yeah. it is a possibility and it certainly was one of the objectives. So, okay, so if you could then specifically indicate to, to me by you know, a separate uh, question on notice, how these ads specifically um, and, uh, gave an enticement basically to young people in the western suburbs of Sydney to get a job in the grain industry. Okay, that's what you said they would do. I'd Thank like you, to Senator. know exactly where, where that comes. Uh, um, Senator Cameron, could I um, just seek some <coughs> guidance of what's in the back of your mighty brain in terms of we're still on the first issue, we've got 50 issue, different sections. Um, when do you think you'll be finished here? I'm um, having to spend all day uh, on I've this got if you a want. Few, few more. Well, look, hopefully in the next 10 because minutes. Because you're doing a bit of circle work now. Hmm? You're doing a bit of circle work. Uh, well, but, but the reason okay. it circles is because you don't understand the industry. Well, the with well the you know, respect, yeah. the grocery respect. Yeah. 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 <laughs> maybe you might want to get and get another sandwich. Yeah. We're having a decent conversation here. I'll tell you what I do understand. I do I'm, understand I'm when, when grain growers well. are getting ripped well. off. I do understand that. Oh. I do understand that. They're protesting in so, the streets, um, aren't they? They don't know the facts, Sean. That's the problem. Well, this Where advertisement uh, would presumably then uh, so, be leading them in that direction. So they would be a bit of order. Senator Back, do you want to call? No, no hang on, that's no, 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 With great respect, Senator Cameron had the call. You that's interrupted. Right. I have the capacity you interrupted to call. Him. You inter I have well, the mate, capacity I'm happy to pull a vote on if you want to. Put You're right. That, if you want to put that to the committee while people are out there watching mm. and, and right. absolutely engaging in the uh, questions from Senator Cameron and mm. the answers mm. from the department. You're the one that's yeah, running good. the appearance. Yeah, good, good, good. So how many GRDC board members and staff attended each roadshow? Um, so we had a board director speak on each of the panels. Um, except for the orange panel, which we tied into a board, uh, an actual board meeting, because we were doing a regional board meeting in Dubbo and Orange, so the entire board attended that event. The entire board? How many are on, on the board? Eight board members. <coughs> okay. Uh, how many staff? You didn't tell me how many staff. Uh, myself. Uh, I was at every event. Um, and at two events, I had one other communications person. Okay. So can you provide um, details of the costs uh, for staff and board members to stay at these uh, functions? Can you provide itemised accounts for accommodation, for uh, food uh, and uh, any other costs associated with the board members and the staff members attending uh, these road shows? Um, was all flights and accommodation paid for for the Perth? Uh, seminar? Uh, so the board director who spoke uh, at Geraldton uh, is our West Australian board director, our deputy chair. Okay. But there was still a cost, was there, from Gerald? Uh, yeah, yes, there was a cost. So can you provide, um, you'll provide that in that general. So all the costs to. associated with uh, staff, board and staff members attending. Um, Have you paid, has, have you ever paid any money to the, uh, for a Liberal Party fundraiser? <laughs> in the, in the history, not, not, not talking about the TWU here. <laughs> no. has, has, have, have any of the well, staff, the have, any, yeah, have you or any of the staff ever sure. attended a Liberal well, Party well, fundraiser? I've never attended a Liberal Party fundraiser. Senator. Liberal Party function? No, Senator. Anyone? Oh, come on. I have. Anyone? Yeah, I'll put it on record if I can. I have. I've attended I'd like to put it on record. I'd rather drink battery acid. Well, there you go. <laughs> we can <laughs> fix that not. too. Very good. <coughs> can, I, uh, can I ask a okay, question, just, Mr. Uh, on Thank you. Uh, uh, you're the acting managing director. In terms of your capacity and research, do you have a live option to follow Wedgetail? Pick your pardon? Do you have a live option to follow Wedgetail? 
Uh, I'm not sure what you mean, sir. You know what Wedgetail is? I know Wedgetail, I know the yeah. variety very well. Yeah, and you know it's it's a long season wheat. Are you, yes. you folks, are you promoting the next generation of Wedgetail? So the actual uh, the actual wheat breeding uh, environment in Australia, Senate, as you as you'd be aware, has never asked a commercial. Your question unless you know the answer, by the way. Yep, that, and that's fine. Um, so there are options for long season wheats, and in particular, um, from where you're from, Senator, uh, long season wheats that are suitable for grazing. Mm. So as part of your blurb, do you? Uh, I mean, a, and obviously the new generation of young farmers. And we talked about getting young farmers. You can't get tractor drivers now. A lot of these guys are going to use backpackers, and we'll come to 417s later. But we certainly will. Um, <laughs> a big time. Um, uh, we obviously um, try and encourage stock as dual enterprise instead of a single enterprise risk on a farm. Yep. And you know, I, I can give you one name. The families won't embarrass them. But out of Walgett, which is beautiful black country, and every third or fourth year you'll get a bumbuster of a crop and then you'll miss a couple and et cetera. But the young blokes like to take all the fences out and just have the tractor on auto and up and back, up and back, up and back. But, but a wheat like Wedgetail enables a dual enterprise so you can put your stock on through the winter, take them off as I do at the end of August and still get a crop equivalent as, as if you haven't had the stock on the crop. So is that sort of stuff, do you promote that? Oh, absolutely, Senator. Um, we have, uh, we have a, a number of large programs within the farming systems portfolio which are very much around risk and, and running stock as well as uh, serial uh, enterprises, that, that very much point. about managing risk. Yeah, thanks. Thanks, Doug. Okay, thanks. Um, so, so none of you have attended a Liberal Party fundraiser. Um, who's your chair? Uh, my chair is Richard Clark. Yeah. Um, have you ever paid for his attendance at a Liberal Party fundraiser? I'd have to take that on notice, Senator. So you're not sure? Oh. Uh, not to my knowledge. Are you aware of Mr Clark attending a Liberal Party fundraiser? No, I'm not. And what would it matter a rat's ass if he did? I mean, the guy's from the bush. <laughs> and, um, and so and what? And, uh, have you ever attended a fundraiser? Of course you have. And as a union paid, of course they have. What are you going on about? What's wrong finished? with going to a bloody fundraise, whether it's finished? a communist or a whatever? Well, well, we know what happens to the Liberal Party funds. They end up in brown paper bags. Oh, to get the oh, oh, yeah. What about the big B-doubles of T-doubles? Well, let me just put to you, mate. If you go, if you go to the B-doubles, the carpet man... You want to take ten steps outside and say that, Chris? Why would I want to take ten steps outside? You want to put that outside? I say this to Doug across the chamber all the time, Glenn. You know that. I say that to Doug across this table all the time. Look outside. Mate, here we go. Oh, Into it. Doug Don't and I, right out. That, Doug that's enough. And that's Doug enough. and I have this conversation across the chamber. Don't point at me, Doug. Don't point at me. Take ten steps out Don't point at me. Don't take the bait. Settle. Settle. Now that's just that. That was the, ladies and gentlemen. That was. That that was that. That's the ad break. Now we'll go Great back to the program. The line, no. Bullshit. Just Doug and I have, do we not? No, it doesn't matter. I'm not engaging right. in this, I can tell you that. Absolutely. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> anyway, five minutes, you, Chris. <laughs> well, that's okay. Well, I'm happy to talk about um, this. You, you, you um, <coughs> so you'll... Uh, so... Well, yeah. Mr Clark's not here, is he? No, Mr. Clark's okay. not here. Okay. So you'll t so you'll raise with him, uh, and you'll have a look to see whether you've paid well, any uh, any money for I'll be interested a liberal in the party fundraiser. Framing the question, your organisation has never paid for uh, anybody's attendance at any political party fundraiser. How about that? How about we do that? That's that's fine. I I've met farmers that have Labor voters. There are not many. I mean, I mean, if, if okay. Um, can I just can I just move on? No, um, well, we're wondering. Well, I just Doug, we are on limited time. Mate. Yeah, I'm, I'm trying to get through it. Yeah, but I'm I mean, sitting here patiently. Yeah, well, I, I, well, use I, I I'm going to give you a rest there. now. If, if uh, can I just finish this? Have you got a question? No, I'm missing. I've got, right. I've got, I've got one. Okay, we'd have a rest. Doctor, I had a long rest when you were all arguing. Well, you're pure of the driven snow. We know that. 
an, an issue which is uh, affecting us currently uh, uh, in the seafood, or more particularly the Australian oyster industry at the moment. Uh, can you uh, just give me an update or outline what your involvement is with the oyster industry currently uh, and the reaction to the outbreak of the POMS virus, the Pacific Oyster Mortality Syndrome, uh, and that which has occurred in Tasmania. There's yeah. a big issue for them down there. Yeah, thanks, Senator. Uh, so it, it's not a good story. Um, we've obviously had a large outbreak in Tasmania, uh, affected uh, a significant proportion of the Tasmanian production area, but more importantly also a significant part of the hatchery system. Probably 90% of the Pacific oyster hatchery production has been affected by this. Wow. So as a consequence, it also affects South Australia and New South Wales. Um, and all farmers need seed, and obviously we've now got a big shortage of seed production. Uh, as a result, um, the Fisheries R&D Corporation has put a lot of work into making sure that we've got some emergency research happening, particularly around trying to uh, understand what the nature of happened on farm, so we can actually inform those farmers in infected areas how best to respond. And many of them are actually already doing some really positive things. We're seeing um, quite a change in behaviour of how they're going to farm oysters, what we call window farming, where they can farm between the slot between the virus occurring and not occurring. And so that's happening. Uh, we're seeing uh, quite uh, innovative ways in how people are running biosecurity measures, which uh, to the credit of the industry, the government, the federal government, uh, has meant that we've actually not seen the virus now spread beyond any other areas. And that's particularly important to South Australia. I think um, the governments, the response, the Department of Agricultural Resources, all the work that's been done on the diagnostics has been excellent. Um, uh, they've just undertaken to develop a national response plan, and that's identified some critical areas where we need to focus and particularly around getting selective bred oysters for Pacific oysters. Now we've already got a lot of research and train and part of the work is to actually try and fast track that work. And so that is now also happening as well. And there's quite a lot of work being uh, put into communication strategies. Like a lot of things, there's uh, a lot of experience around the world, both in France, New Zealand, and also in New South Wales, where we've already previously had this virus and getting that information onto farms so that the farmers actually understand how best to farm in the presence. And even those farmers who don't have the virus, making sure that they understand the consequences of how they have to maintain their farms and be better aware about reporting uh, mortality on farm. And we've actually, it's been very pleasing to see how much increase in spike of uh, reporting of incidences is happening, which is always a good thing. So that's raised a lot of awareness. Um, where does this leave us? At the moment, we've got a lot of farmers in Tasmania who, thanks to obviously the Department of Agriculture's investment in biosecurity and the Tasmanian government, um, are now responding. But we've, it's probably going to take us two, three years before we know the full extent. Mm. Oh, well, I wish you luck with that for the sake of those growers and, and uh, containing it and uh, ensuring that it stays where it is and we get rid of it where it is. I th think, Senator, that the importance of um, a strong biosecurity in aquatics is really critical to us. Um, we're seeing um, the discussion you know, about things like the carp virus at the moment and things and exotic pests. The marine environment, the aquatic environment, uh, continues to have uh, incidences of either pest incursions or disease outbreaks and building better systems around biosecurity and, and awareness around farmers is absolutely critical to that. Mm. Okay, so we're on the job. Uh, I think um, Senator Seward so wanted some time too. Not, not in this area. Oh, right. okay, so we, just, oh, just to inform the committee, uh, Doug has got a couple of more questions on research, on the research portfolios, and as I understand it, Senator Cameron, you want to move on from this? Yeah. Sorry? Does yeah. anyone else have questions on the research portfolios? Uh, yeah, yeah. Yeah, Senator Gallagher. No, okay. After you. Okay. Okay. So, w what advice have you had, Mr. Thomas, uh, in relation to the possibility of leasing the vacant uh, office space as a result of this uh, move? Mm. 
Uh, I'll ask my I'll ask my head of uh, corporate services to join me. Uh, my understanding is that we have looked uh, at a sublease arrangement uh, for a, on a number of uh, with a number of parties. Those uh, negotiations have been ongoing, uh, and at, as yet we have uh, not managed to conclude the deal. So when did you start these negotiations? Uh, I might hand to uh, Ms. Howe. Um, we've been in discussions with a few different agencies for probably the last um, about six months. Six months. Yeah. You, you may and have you, to just you... raise your tone a little. Don't have to yell like us, but just a little. Thanks, Ms. Howe. Um, so you've been trying to lease it for six months unsuccessfully. Uh, what, what is the vacancy rate for office accommodation in Canberra? It is extremely high at the moment, um, and we did, uh, we have had meetings with a few different leasing agents just to try and understand yeah. the market. It is um, the vacancy rate is incredibly high. Yeah. Um, the top-rated offices are a little lower than some of the um, older offices, but it is still uh, a significant issue in Canberra. Yeah, so you're, you're competing with a range of other yes. vacant offices. You've been trying to, to get this lease done for six months. Uh, is there any po uh, positive signs that you'll be able to lease this in the near to medium term? Um, we are hopeful. I guess we just don't know. You don't you know. know. We, we don't have a crystal ball. All right. So what is, what is the cost of this vacant space to the uh, to, to your organisation? Uh, at the moment, we don't have a significant amount of open um, vacant space because but of when, our contractors. When when the, when the it comes online. Um, it would probably be about. Uh, around 20% of the cost of the office. Space. So that's about 200,000, is it? If, if it were a whole year vacant, yes. But it's six months vacant already, isn't well, it? Well, no, because we've been using our core system replacement staff have been in, in our that. office and using the space. All right, so they're going to move on, are they? When the project is completed, yes. Yeah, so then, then there's $200,000 per annum, basically. Yes, yes if of, we're unable of unused to space. Sublease with no sign that that is going to be uh, leased? You've got no signs that that can be leased now, have you? At this point, no, but we are optimistic right. that we will be able to sublease over the next well, year Well, but so. that's a hope, isn't it? Yes. You'll be getting to prayer soon. <laughs> Six months is a long time, right? Okay, so th this is a cost, direct cost to the organisation with no si sign that that can be fixed. Was there any discussions with the minister's office about this exact issue prior to the minister directing you that you should uh, take up this hub and spoke approach? Uh, not to my knowledge. Uh, Mr. Thomas? Oh, we'd have to take that on notice, sir. Eh? Surely you would remember if. Uh, or did you raise with the minister? Did no. you raise with the minister the cost of having these, this office space left lying vacant? I wasn't the managing director at the time, Senator. It doesn't matter whether you were. I'm talking about you as an organisation. Have you got any notes, any file notes that you have raised this with the minister? I'd have to take it on notice, Senator. So who's been ha so, Miss Howitt, you've been handling this for how long? Thank you. Um, I've been with the organisation since August 2014. Yeah. So you were, so you've been handling this specific issue. Are you aware? Elements of the issue, as yeah. I said earlier, I'm not right. aware of. Um, discussions with okay, Mr. Strong. Thomas, if you can take on notice whether you actually did, uh, whether your organisation raised the co this issue of uh, vacant uh, office space being a dead weight in terms of a financial cost on the organisation as a result of Senator uh, of uh, Minister Joyce um, uh, making this decision. Uh. Certainly, Senator. We will look into whether those discussions were had. Any file notes between you and the Minister's office on these issues, uh, telephone calls, <laughs> any correspondence uh, on the issue would be welcomed. Um, has there been any, any complaints uh, to the organisation uh, in relation to the roadshows? Uh, 
Senator, I'm, a, I'm aware that there are um, some growers and some members of the public that uh, do not agree with the approach that was taken. Well, I'm sure that granny in grey stains would want to listen to something else other than your research. But anyway, um, she maybe wasn't one of them. Who's complained? Senator, I don't have that with me. I'd have to take it on notice. You, so you can't give me any idea? Some, you said some of the growers. You must know something about it. Uh, Senator, what I said was there was a range of people in the regional areas that could include growers, it could include advisors. Um, has Minister Joyce expressed any concern? Uh, I'm not best placed to answer that. I'll ask uh, my executive manager of communications. So, so if there's a communication with the minister, that goes through your communications person, does it? Senator, it comes down to the fact that I'm an acting managing director at the moment. You're lucky. Uh, Senator Cameron, I'm happy to uh, take that. Any um, approach to anybody who was invited to speak as a guest on the panel was made by Fairfax uh, Radio, so not directly Correct. through us. Um, obviously, I have um, informed the minister's office um, that yeah, we were doing the these events yeah. over the course of conversations. Um, and likewise, had informed the Shadow Minister's office um, as part of the course. Mm. So, you, you spoke, was there a specific fee to Alan Jones? A specific fee to Alan Jones? I will happily take that on notice. I have provided the costings from the first event. Uh, Alan has publicly said that he has done uh, the events uh, and he didn't accept a, a fee, but that's I would have to take that on notice and ask Fairfax for uh, for that. So does this sound, does this sound right to you? Six thousand dollars in travel costs, five thousand dollars in accommodation costs. This is the uh, these are the costs that Fairfax had provided to me, and they were the first, so they were obviously the reduced costs. Yeah. Um, Two thousand so dollars food and beverage costs. Correct. That's for the that's for the whole event, though, not for Mr. Jones. Just to be clear, so the accommodation. I wouldn't costs expect Alan Jones to be well. Two thousand dollars depends what the caviar costs. I'm not sure, but who knows? And what's the one thousand one hundred and sixty-six dollar incidental cost? Uh, I would have to take it on notice. I would assume <coughs> it would cover things like printed materials, uh, projectors. No, I don't want an assumption. So I would take it on notice and provide it to you. Okay. Senator okay. Now, there was some concern that some of the... This is a long two question. Yeah, that, yeah I'm, I'll finish on this. The, the food forum uh, wasn't well attended. Is that that's, correct? That's because I wasn't invited. Uh, that's incorrect, Senator Cameron. I read that opinion piece um, in the Weekly Times, which, uh, which had suggested that. But in fact, um, the last sessions of the day, uh, to my mind, were very well attended. I was actually um, at the event. Um, I understand the opinion piece. Is this the Pratt thing? There. Correct. All right. Minister, does the, uh, does, does the minister support these roadshows and this expenditure of uh, public money? I'd have to take that on notice, Senator discussion with, uh, Senator, uh, with Minister Joyce. So, um, uh, look, uh, before we go any further, I should declare an interest now, because I've been uh, a guest speaker at the mm. Pratt Whatever Food Forum, mm. yeah. and I, I didn't get paid, Doug, and most of them got up and walked out when I started to talk. <laughs> Why am I not surprised? <laughs> yeah. um, so, uh, Senator Cameron, I'd, I'd also um, point out that um, your leader in the Senate spoke at this food forum, um, Senator Wong. Good. Yeah. Hmm. And I'm sure she, like everybody else, so that spoke. There was, was, yeah, probably so. I'm so just pointing out that it was. So uh, what? Mate, should oh. we press on, Doug? Well, so what to the question, no, the Senator Stirl? So, well, yeah, but so I, what I, to I the just, question, like Senator Stirl? How really much more? Just wake up. What a no. fantastic contribution. Uh, excuse me, Chair. Chair, yes. can I point so of order, please? Excuse oh, me. I would draw. Can I, I, would draw. You know, I don't know why you're I so cranky apologize. today, Senator Stewart. Right now, he's withdrawn. Don't take the bait. I'm so sorry. Please forgive Don't me. take the bait, because this is it's developing into the schmozzle that it was always going to be. So, so uh, Miss Lord, you, you I'm are... I'm trying to be respectful <laughs> and shut up, unlike you. <laughs> That's more like it. So, so, so Miss Lord... You, you indicated. Why are you doing this today? 
I, I'm ready when they're finished. I apologise. Well, I tell an Irish joke. Or? So, no, could you provide oh, details of the attendance so at the uh, food forums? Could, for all attendees. Yes, or all attendees. And could you in, indicate, you know, where they came, whether they were growers, uh, you know, what sort of classification of people they were in, in attendance, the numbers, and the cost-benefit analysis that have been done. Has there been any cost-benefit analysis done in relation to this? Uh, so we're in the early stages because the event is obviously one part of that sponsorship, um, and now a lot of the editorial content will come out. Um, from our perspective, in terms of guests who attended, we invited uh, some key grower groups, some industry uh, representative organisations, other uh, research and development corporations. So we had a range of guests there as well. Uh, okay, so could you provide then also that, that detail I'm asking about who attended, what, what, who, who was there? And can you also provide the, uh, all the, all the uh, papers relating to the business case? For the for for this uh, pro this whole program, that's the food forums and the advertising. What what was done to uh, to develop the business case? Uh, should, can you provide the business case that said this Absolutely. is what you should do? Uh, so all correspondence, all file notes in relation to the business case. I Thanks, Chair. You. Thank you. Could I just for the to, for the sake of evenness point out that. Mr. Clark, who was in some way queried today, um, was actually appointed by Joel Fitzgibbon to the job, and so we might include, has he been to any Labor functions, because the Labor Party appointed him to the job. Uh, there you go. By the way, could you also take on notice uh, um, um, any details of costings around a um, recent legal conference in Hobart, which was put on by the Family Court, in which the, uh, and, and the uh, banquet the night before, in which the entertainment put on by the Family Court and the Chief Justice of the Family Court was two professional women dressed in judicial robes who simulated sex. And at that function, the, uh, the Chief Justice of the High Court, the Chief Justice of the Supreme Court, got up and walked out with two other judges. It was a disgrace. You don't have to take that on notice. I'm just letting you know some of the shit that goes on. Oh, the uh, bloody chair, family. Chair, um, disgrace. Um, I'm I'm sure that's for no, I know, but it's <laughs> for out there. Yeah. Um, chair, not that I'm going to respond to that. I wonder why we don't have a judicial commission, for God's sake. Uh, chair, would it um, we seek your indulgence to also put on the record the government's thanks to Professor Stellick for her role? Yeah, yeah, I was going to come to that. OK, well, on behalf of the government, um, I would like it recorded and thank you very much for the role that you've played and the contribution you've made to research and development over the time that you've been chairing. Just so be just before, yes, Professor, before you leave, Senator Gallagher has two questions which I... Well, it's basically to the Grahams. So. Yeah. But look, I, ISBT have got eight properties in Canberra. Which one are you in? Four National Circuit. Four National Circuit. So you have a 2,000 metre lease in Four National Circuit? We have a floor on the uh, eastern town. So you're paying $475 a million a year. It's 2,000 plus metres, 2,027 thereabouts. Uh, the actual, do you want a, a precise answer? Oh, well, it's, it's got to be in that figure, hasn't it? A it floor. has to be in that figure, yes. So you've got 50 permanent staff and you have 15 contractors. So you have 32 square metres per person, which is roughly double the, gen the most generous allowance in the public sector of about 12 to 14 metres per person. So your rent is twice what a normal public service department has. Do you accept that? Uh, Senator, I'd have to take on notice to look at all the figures. Yeah, yeah. And you've told Senator Cameron that you have a 20% redundancy in that floor as we speak. Uh, what we've indicated is that at the end of a current core systems replacement, we will have 20% of the floor that will be available for us to sublease. So for all those levy payers out there doing their work in the field today, the department or the Grains Research Council looks after them, is renting space which is roughly double the most generous allocation in the public service and has a 20% redundancy in the million dollars a year rent that it pays. There you go. Oh, just a follow-up on that. Have any of the other agencies got vacant office accommodation as a result of uh, the Senate, uh, Minister Joyce's relocation? 
Um, on behalf of Rodek, no, Senator. FNC, no. Okay, thanks. I'm finished. All right, so in whitefellow language, that's um, half an acre. Is that all right, Pat? Sorry. I, uh, Pat, I think we'd better get you to say something, seeing how you're fresh to the thing. How, how, what's your uh, perception of this committee and its opening? Uh, <laughs> I, 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 <laughs> <laughs> Say something on the record, Pat. I, I thought Senator Dodson was his usual diplomatic <laughs> self, and uh, I don't think he's going to break that right now. Anyhow, welcome aboard, Pat. Thanks very much, Mr. President. Okay, I think I think we quit while the going's good, eh? Who do we want next? Well, I think that I'm just following the program. <laughs> My God, I've got APMA, APDA. Poor Charlie, our agency's in here. And AFMA. Um, and we'll and kick Lancare. off with who? So do. Swish, swish. So, you, Rachel, you've got I've got questions for you. Will only be on this floor, maybe this top floor. Okay, okay. So, could we, we, right. or could we down in the main sure. committee room? Yeah, I'm not sure. Still, 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 I'm not I can not see it since I looked at Mr. Murray's book. I want to go with you. Yeah, no worries. So here, I think. Okay. Thank you. In continuation, Senator Seward. Thank you. Can I ask the APVMA about the budget measure on that provides 17.1 million over four years to further reform agriculture and vet chemical regulation to improve competitiveness? You know the one I'm talking about. What practical changes does that mean you're going to be making with that, and how's the money going to be used? CEO of the APVMA. <coughs> the um, measure we're talking about is in relation to the agriculture white paper. The total figure that you refer to is for the entire uh, initiative. Uh, the APVMA is responsible for part of that. So our allocation is $7.3 million over four years. What we're going to be using it for is investing in ways to fast track applications and specifically what we're looking at is um, building an online self-registration facility where for some of the applications which are for low regulatory risk products uh, where applicants can do uh, essentially declarations and follow standards or follow guidelines to apply online uh, to get basically to the point of registration and then we just do final checks rather than handle a complete application altogether. So we believe we can cut uh, assessment times or registration times for some categories of applications from about three to four months down to three weeks. So a, lot, a fair bit of this money is going to be spent doing the um, IT build because it's a rather complicated IT build. So the money's for the IT build? Uh, that, for part of it, yes. How the much? other part of it is for, um, this is part of it, uh, our 7.3. The other, we're also spending money on developing standards. So for example, we're getting us, we're developing a standard at the moment for dairy sanitizers, which means for, that for anyone what, for dairy, dairy sanitizers. sanitizers. That's right. So that means that eventually when we've got the standard and we put that online, anyone who is applying for a, a dairy sanitizer will be able to come on and declare whether their application meets these different guidelines and standards uh, and um, then we would be able to fast track registration. Now part of the money is then onto compliance. So preempting one of my questions. That's right. So if we are putting less effort up front we will be putting more effort in the compliance area to make sure that these people who are declaring against standards are actually supplying products that meet those standards. Okay. So, um, so we're, we're looking at, at the moment, the balance between the IT build, developing standards and compliance. Okay, so there's the three components. So That's if you're right. saying you're looking at the balance, does that mean you can't tell me the, the monetary breakup for those three? Not with any level of accuracy right now, okay. um, but certainly in the future we will be able to. Okay, thank yeah. you. In terms of the categories of low of low risk, you said low risk, and then you said categories. So, yeah. what does that? How do they correlate? <laughs> 
Um, in incredibly simple terms, um, we there are some applications that we are able that we consider low risk. So, for example, the first one that we're trialling as a pilot to see if we can get this right is when an applicant wants to repack their own product. So at the moment, um, a company, they have a product already registered. If they want to repack it into a different um, packaging material or perhaps they're a contract manufacturer where they produce the product for a range of people, they have to put an application in and right. we take four okay. months. This time, what we're looking at is if they can do this as part of an online registration, they own all the IP, they own everything. And they've already actually had the chemical... That's right. Yeah, OK. Yeah. Right. So it's things like that. Okay. We're also, and again, against standards, because we believe that things like dairy sanitizers, household insect sprays, swimming pool chemicals, anti-fouling paints, we actually know a lot about these chemicals okay. already, and we can develop guidelines that are very accurate about what should and shouldn't be in these okay. chemicals. Right. It doesn't, won't apply to any of the new chemistry coming in, won't apply to anything that we don't previously have done assessments for. So when I'm talking about categories, it's not just products, it's also type of application. Okay, so can I just be clear? So what you just said, is anything you haven't already done assessment for won't fall into this category? No. Is that correct? That's correct. Okay, thank you. Um, thank you. In terms of consultation, what what consultation obviously with the sector but also with the community will occur on development of the site? Uh, sure. We've, um, we've already done a lot of uh, consultations. We started this work oh, gee, over about two and a half years ago and we have an industry reference group who has been working with us all the way along to work out what's feasible okay. and what's not. And um, now that uh, the announcement has been made in the budget, we will be, and now that we know what our forward work plan is, we will be engaging industry again. Uh, really, this is about how we make our application process more efficient. So that's our focus. Uh, I can't see that we would be doing community consultation. We have on our website um, all the information. We're about to update it in the next week or two with what we're going to be doing now that we've got the budget announcement. Um, but beyond that, I don't anticipate specific community consultation, but definitely industry consultation. Okay. I, I suppose where I'm coming from is there's obviously a number of broader community stakeholders that take a deep interest in what you do. Yeah. And that they're the groups that I'm thinking of in yeah. terms of uh, engaging those those groups. Yeah, um, we we tend to engage with them on an ad hoc basis uh, because it tends to be issue by issue. In terms of uh, of this particular initiative, it really is around the mechanics of how we physically do the applications, rather than uh, necessarily um, changing. Um, our overall risk appetite, if that makes sense. Like yeah, we, yeah, I understand. So yeah. Um, if there are particular issues that the uh, individual associations have, we engage with them on that basis. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Um, Thank you, Chair. Thank you. Uh, do we have any further <coughs> questions of APVMA? Um, do the others. I'll just, uh, uh, yes. Very good. Yes, good questions, yeah. Yes. Senator Cameron. Oh, thanks, Chair. Um, APVM, yeah, thanks. Uh, who's taking the lead on the accommodation issues? Uh, it, at this stage, it's probably more the department, but we can answer specific questions in relation to the APVMA. Yeah, that's, part of this, that's yeah. APVMA. Yeah. Uh, so, um, have you moved as a result of uh, Senator, uh, Minister Joyce's directive? No, no. So you're still in Canberra. That's right. Have any, have any, so where, where were you supposed to be heading off to? Armadale. Okay, have you signed any leases in Armadale? No. Is there still ongoing discussions with the Minister's office about the move? Uh, I'd have to refer that one to the department, because um, the department has the lead in terms of the next stages of this initiative. So, um, so you're an independent organisation, are. aren't you? We are. So but why, it, would the, why would the department be, why would I have to ask the department? The minister has asked the department to undertake an independent cost benefit analysis of the move, the APVMA. Okay. So that's, that's where, the, where it's up to and that's why uh, as, even as an independent authority, uh, we are not, um, we don't, we're not responsible for that 
cost-benefit analysis. That's the questions for the department. Okay. And, uh, did you seek the cost-benefit analysis to be done? I didn't know. No, not you personally. The organ. Uh, that the that has to go to the department. It was a decision of the government. It was a decision of government. It was a decision of government. Ms. Arthur, are you still concerned about the implications of the move for the department, uh, for your, or, your uh, organisation? Uh, Senator, I've had no reason to change the advice that I provided last year, which was based on the information at the time about um, the difficulty in taking the regulatory science component um, in sufficient numbers uh, that I would not be able to fulfil my statutory obligations. I've had no reason to change that view. Uh, so what would be the implications if you couldn't uh, fulfil your statutory obligations? Um, well, it's a, it is a, a lot of um, speculation, but I take my role very seriously in terms of being able to deliver what the government has set me as part of my legislation. So the implications, it, and this is a hypothetical, is that uh, if we were not able to process applications, it could mean that a number of products would not be available. So at the moment, we handle about 5,000 applications a year uh, with a significantly reduced staff and without alternate mechanisms in place to process those, um, we wouldn't be able to get through as many. Have you had any budget cuts? Um, Senator, we are fully cost recovered. Uh, okay. So our budget is very much determined by the levies. Okay. So in terms of this cost benefit analysis, Mr. Quinlan, who's handling it for the department? Uh, well, we can either deal with that under outcome one, which is when the relevant people would be here at the table, or we can bring them up now and have that conversation, whichever you No, no, you well, I'm, I'm happy to do that when they, when they come. Then. Yeah, OK. That's, that's so fine. outcome one. Uh, well, maybe just, uh, you know, in, in the broad term, um, did you provide advice to the minister on this issue? on the removal of APVMA? Uh, well, we've provided quite a bit of advice over time. I, I think it's unlikely we would have provided any additional advice than, than that we talked about last time. Uh, uh, the only uh, uh, development since then has been this, uh, mm. this cost-benefit analysis, which we're in the process of uh, organising at present. Yep. So in terms of the, uh, the authority, uh, Ms Arthi, um, your, your, your analysis is it should continue to operate out of Canberra? Based on the assumptions at the time, yes. And um, I, that's purely because when we did a staff survey, um, the fact that there were uh, regulatory scientists were not willing to move to, at that stage, the choices were Armidale or Toowoomba, uh, based on if they were the assumptions, then it would be difficult for us to sustain operations for a number of years while we rebuild the agency. Uh, so that, um, so in, by default, uh, without alternates in place, it would be very difficult for us to sustain an operation outside of Canberra at this time. So, Ms. Arthur, how long have you been with the agency? Uh, coming up to three and a half years. Three and a half years. So you've basically been here the whole time of the, the right. current government. Uh, were you consulted? Uh, by either the uh, by by the minister in terms of the implications for this move. Ah uh, yes, um, the minister began writing to me. I don't have the exact dates with me, but it's uh, began writing about two years ago, I think it is. And there's been um, various um, uh, correspondence between us, and we have had discussions about implications. And you. The minister is well aware of the problems that the move would cost, would, would create? Well, I have provided my advice to him about the various issues that I see. Tell me what the, uh, I don't want to know what you, you told the minister, but can you tell me what you see the problems? I outlined them before, and it's um, the fact that in previous, I have tabled previously our staff survey, and the fact that at the time we had 85 regulatory scientists, they are highly specialised people that we take between two and five years to train. Uh, out of them, there was only a very small number who were willing to move. And without that critical mass of regulatory scientists and the inability to quickly bring new people on in, a, in an area where there aren't 
regulatory scientists just lying around. Um, that's my main concern in terms of being able to sustain an organisation of, of our nature. Given, given that evidence, I'm struggling to understand what the cost-benefit analysis conducted by the department actually encompasses. Well, we're going to get to that when you come. Um, so, Minister, um, given what you've heard here, why would we even spend any money and any time of the department doing a cost-benefit analysis if the, it's so clear that this is just a dumb move? Well, I mean, obviously, the Minister doesn't yeah. believe it's a dumb move, as you've described it, Senator Cameron. But, um, but he seems to be the only one. Sorry, sir. He seems to be the only one that doesn't think it's a dumb move. Um, well, I think there are other considerations that need to be taken into account, and, and obviously, um, uh, Ms. Adi has put on the, the record um, the concerns of the agency in the short term of a move from where they currently are outside of Canberra. Uh, but there are obviously other factors in the longer term that need to be considered uh, and, and the cost-benefit analysis needs to underpin whether the decision um, about a, an alternative model of a transformation, um, a transitory um, situation where maybe the move occurs over time to allow the agency to be able to, um, to get the new scientists. I mean, you can't just, you can't just look at it as a point in time. Now, I'm saying this because they're my thoughts. I have not had the discussion with the minister, and obviously I will seek um, a direct response for your question from the minister himself. But uh, I think that there is there is a broader, longer-term picture here in terms of whether uh, we are going to seek to have our agencies all centralised in Canberra, or whether we're going to seek to have um, government agencies more broadly um, in uh, in areas other than Canberra. Because obviously you would be well aware, Senator Cameron, that. Um, this government uh, is very supportive of our regional communities and providing um, mm. you know, the assistance to those regional communities that can be provided by um, government agencies. You know, Minister, you know, how would it be supporting regional communities if you end up having the APVMA basically disintegrate? That's got huge implications <laughs> for Indeed. regional Australia. It's got huge implications for uh, you know, for the uh, agricultural sector in this country, why would we pursue this peccadillo of the ministers when you know it's just clearly a nonsense? Okay. Well, I, I don't accept the premise of what you're saying. Um, I certainly accept that there have been some concerns raised in relation to um, these specialist scientists in the short term. But um, as uh, Ms Hardy said, that there, there is a period of time to train them um, and possibly there, is a, there, there may be a cost um, benefit that says that it is a smart thing to do over a period of time as new scientists come on board that possibly um, you know, their, the location of, of their employment be considered. Uh, we don't have that information in front of us well, at the moment, Senator Cameron. Yeah, yeah. Um, Mr. Quinn Levin, you're of, you, you get to your people going to come in. Can you um, can I just uh, indicate that we'd certainly be want to have an idea uh, about the uh, the basis of this cost benefit analysis? What are the underpinning positions that are being adopted to determine the cost and the benefit? Will we, will we be able to get that uh, analysis? Uh, well, we, we've commenced a process at the request of government to to uh, commission a cost-benefit analysis, so we can talk about the process. But we're, uh, we're expecting that the analysis will deal with all of the things you've talked about. We don't have uh, prior positions going in. That'll be the that, that's the purpose of the exercise, really, to to look at those. Uh, costs and benefits in a, in a balanced how, way. Given your job is to, to, is to serve, serve the minister, how can you be independent uh, when the minister has made it so clear uh, what the outcome that he wants? It's not really independent, is it? We're not, we're not doing the cost-benefit analysis. We're, we're commissioning the cost-benefit analysis. So we're the, we're the client, if you like, and our expectation is it'll be done mm. professionally at arm's length from the department. And who, who will determine the terms of reference? 
Uh, look, can we deal with that? No, no, uh, I might, no yeah. th this is, uh, these are issues I, I would, who's handling it for, for you? Uh, the, well, the staff that are coming with Outcome 1, okay. as we mentioned so, earlier. So, so we'll be listening in. Yes, so can, they're listening, can, they'll so, be well So can prepared. they then come armed with the terms of reference uh, that the government or you are going to use in this uh, so-called independent I, I think the terms of reference analysis. have reached the stage where uh, we can say uh, what they are, but I'm just, um, just not sure of exactly the, the stage of that process we've reached yet, but certainly the people who will be here um, uh, under Outcome 1 will be. Okay. Um, have, have you allocated funding for this? We're in the process of doing that, yes. So this is more waste of government money, huh? <laughs> okay, thanks. Uh, Senator Edwards, do you have no, any questions? Good. <coughs> Delegates? Okay. Now we've got uh, a couple of minutes before Smoko, so why don't we uh, break now and then come back at, uh, what time do we put aside to 10? So 10.40. 10 10 so, uh, yeah, no worries. No, we're finished. We're Senator Cameron's, Cameron's finished. Have we got land finished? care here? Yes, yeah, can I, I've got a couple of questions yeah. there. So we've got a couple of minutes, yeah, haven't we? Yeah. Uh, sure okay, have. thanks. Um, so you're getting a boost of $22.6 million in the, the budget? Ms. Um, yes, it? I've read that, but I, at this point I don't understand what that's actually uh, going to contribute to or where it's actually going. With It's part of the National Land Care Programme. But you would okay. expect to hear about that in due course. So... <laughs> That's happy news. Yeah. So, <laughs> yeah. so, so no, no, no one has consulted uh, um, this <laughs> with you in relation to this allocation of funding in the budget. You, as the chief executive, have got no clue what it's about. I probably need to just clarify how Landcare Australia fits within the Landcare movement uh, in a, yeah, in a, in a short benefit. period, yeah. just because it will clarify, hopefully, why we're not... Clear. Um, so Landcare Australia is a not-for-profit organisation that's independent of government. Uh, we've got um, three, more, three or so main functions. One is awareness ra raising and promoting the Landcare movement and encouraging people to participate in Landcare. Um, another is that we provide um, a lot of knowledge sharing services to the Landcare movement. So that includes things like um, Landcare and Focus, which is a publication which goes out in the rural press. And we also support um, the movement by running things such as the award National Landcare Awards and Conference and so forth. So, um, and sorry, yeah, so the, sorry. The, the broader Landcare movement, which consists of about 5,500 Landcare groups around the country, they receive their main funding from government via the uh, 56 NRM organisations and that funding does not go via Landcare Australia. Right. Our funding at the moment mainly comes from the Department of Agriculture, and that funding is to um, provide those knowledge sharing, um, celebratory <coughs> and awareness raising functions. And our funding is about four and a half million over a four year cycle. So the 22 and a half million Nothing is unlikely to come via Landcare Australia. Okay, I, you, I uh, wish it would, but I don't think it will. So has Landcare suffered any budget cuts? Landcare Australia? Yes. Um, well, Landcare Australia's um, current contract with the Department of Agriculture was signed in 20, uh, financial year 2014 and runs till June, June 30, 2017. That budget or that allocation of funding has not changed. Um, where we have um, seen some reduction in budget was an independent um, submission to run the National Land Care Conference in 2016. We received 75,000 from the Department of Agriculture and 75,000 from the Department of Environment, and that was considerably lower than in 2014. I, I th thanks. Okay. Was it Jaskovic? Yakshevich. Yakshevich. <laughs> My accent ain't going to work with that. I'll tell you. <laughs> <laughs> it's a tough one. Um, so, Minister, uh, could, could you explain then, after the, the last two budgets cut half a billion dollars uh, from the programme, uh, so half a billion dollars cut, 22.6 million going in, 
What's, what's happening? What's going on? Can you explain what that's about and what this 22.6 million will do? Uh, hmm? I uh, Senator Cameron, I've just been advised that outcome one is uh, is probably the best area that we discuss the, the broader issues about the allocation of funding across um, all of the, the environmental programs which include land care um, so that we can look at them in a holistic way instead of specifically... Um, okay, so we'll come care. back to this in outcome one. Happy to because obviously there's been movement of funds between various programs. Okay. Well, can I then just... Uh, could I then ask you to maybe have a... <laughs> talk to the Minister's office, because I'll be asking that specific question. Half a billion dollars out, 22 million in. Uh, how is that helping uh, land care in, in Australia? That, if you could maybe get yep, some sure. advice on Happy that. To. Happy to. Yeah. So that's, that's it. Break. Well, thanks, okay. Cameron. So just so we're all clear, uh, we finish, we're finished with that, Matt. Is that correct? No, well, well, we're coming back to the, the funding, the broader land care so funding issues. Around. Okay, but then when we come, but I don't we think come, we need. No, don't need us. I don't think we need the agencies no. actually. Okay. So I think I think Chair, yes, what you're saying is we'll be coming back to corporate matters. Yeah, the, and then that's what I'm and then following the agenda from there on. Absolutely. So we're going to finish now yeah. in this area, and then our next one will be corporate matters. But the agencies still need to hang around for outcome one. Uh, not no, the agencies, because the oh, department will handle right, okay. yeah. right. Senator so Cameron, that was right, wasn't it? You're finished with the agencies, Doug. So, yeah. Well, fisheries, yeah. pesticides, and, and yeah. the PEVMA. APVMA I, well, and AFMA. Yeah, and we're, doing the, we're dealing with the cost-benefit analysis as in, well. For, in outcome one, that the department one, yeah. can do. But yeah. well, you don't need these guys. Okay. No. Don't, Clear I, don't, as I, I don't think we need no. the agencies. Right. They can... Clear as much. Cool. Okay, well, well, let's take a break. Everyone's clear and we'll come back at what time? Can I see that? 10.45, thanks.
Well, good. Thank you. Senator Cameron. Yeah, thanks. Um, Mr. Quinlan, um, with going back briefly to GRDC in terms of the department's involvement, um, and then I want to go to backpackers' issues. So, um, on. We could deal both with both of those and the APVMA issues under outcome one. It's the same people who would help with those questions. Uh, just let me try this. Yeah. Well, I, I would have thought this was a, a corporate matter where your officers spend their time. Uh, well, the, the, this, this session uh, is notionally about the corporate management of the department. Yes. Out, outcome one is where the, the line policy areas who do most ah. of the liaison the, with the agencies. This is about the corporate management of the department. Yeah, not the, not the agencies. Not the agency. Okay. No, no. Sure. Okay, so um, you're aware that some departmental uh, officers attended the GRDC events? I'm not aware of that, no. Is there anyone? Here aware of that? Uh, if there's anybody who uh, who would have been doing that in a professional capacity, it would be the people in outcome one. Okay. Mm. Well, okay. That, so they can answer whether yep. they've been there, right? Uh, are you aware that at the GRDC events there was a debate initiated on foreign investment in coal seam gas? No, I'm not. No one reported that to you from no. the department? Would you be concerned if that was what this was being, uh, what these forums were being used for? It doesn't seem to be consistent with the Act. Uh, well, uh, uh, your question was whether they were raised, and I suspect if you had uh, uh, agriculture uh, events with agricultural stakeholders in certain parts of the country, you'd be surprised if they weren't raised. But this was not an agricultural event as such. It was supposed to be about research and development. Correct. Yeah, no, I'm just, I'm answering your question and saying I wouldn't be surprised in response to your question, in response to your second question, which is whether it's a function of GRDC to be engaging or initiating those, I'd say it's a different I'll question I'll altogether. We will come back to this mm. in some detail, I think, in outcome one. Uh, are you aware that uh, Mr Alan Jones claimed that he had not received any payment for that, but the documents we've had tabled show that he was Paid? Uh, I have no knowledge of that, uh, beyond what um, we've heard this morning. Would that be a concern for you? Uh, I think it's mainly an issue for the GRDC board, Senator. It's for the GRDC board? Yes. Okay. Um, does the department have any oversight of conflict of interest issues with GRDC? Uh, we have... Uh, in line with the conversations about uh, fraud control for agencies within the portfolio, we have a uh, we have an overall uh, responsibility for making sure that appropriate governance mechanisms and arrangements are in place in all portfolio agencies. And uh, I would expect us to have an assurance from the GRDC, as with all portfolio agencies, that they've got. Uh, modern and effective arrangements for handling uh, conflicts of interest within the organisation. Would, would the department be involved if the GRDC forums were providing a platform for a new political party called Country Minded? Uh, would we be... Well, let me put it to you. They were used as a forum, as a platform for a, a, a new political party called Country Minded. Uh, what, how, yeah. does, how is that consistent with the Act? I have no knowledge of that whatsoever. Would you? And, uh, and I'd want to know something more about uh, the facts and evidence before having a view on it. Um, sure. But certainly as a matter of principle, uh, that conceptually that is not a GRDC function. Yeah, uh, and, and inconsistent with the Act conceptually as well. It may well be. I'm not sure of the technical answer to that question, but um, I wouldn't be surprised if it is. I don't think it would be a technical issue. You, well, you, you a can't technical use legal research issue. and development funds uh, to promote a political party, yeah. surely. I, I'm, I'm saying I'm not sure whether technically uh, it, it's, it's, le it's legally, it's a, 
it, it's uh, consistent with the legal functions of the organisation. But I'm saying, irrespective of that, uh, I don't as a, conceptually, I don't think it's an appropriate thing for portfolio agency to be doing. But I'm not necessarily so accepting we might that that's what this happened. A, a bit further with your officers who may have. Been well, I'm there. not sure our officers will have any knowledge of that. They may be in very much the same position well, as myself. But we'll see when they get we'll here. We'll see when we get there. Indeed. If they've attended then I, I, would, I would assume that if political parties were up there, you would have received a file note at least. Well, we'll see. I'm, I'm, you, I'm, don't, you, you, is, can't, you don't remember any file note on no, this no, issue? No, no, and you know, I'm not making assumptions that the, the advice that you have you know, is, yeah. is, is reliable either. Minister, surely it's not appropriate if this is what's been happening for that to happen, is it? Well, on the face of the assumptions that you've put forward, then um, uh, I certainly would be questioning that. Yeah. But um, as the Secretary has pointed out, um, I'm unaware that this actually has occurred, and I'd like to find out exactly what's occurred before I'm I... Sure you, I'm sure you would be unhappy about country minded, mm -hmm. whoever they are, being there running a political mm -hmm. agenda. But anyway, OK, uh, backpackers. Um, the uh, sorry, Senator Backpackers. Uh, again, the relevant people. Uh, okay, that's outcome, that's one. outcome yeah. one. Yeah. Uh, what about then the uh, the budget issues as they pertain yeah. to the? Uh, okay. Um, is there any uh, job cuts arising from the the uh, budget? Uh, any, fi any financial cuts? Uh, we we our our budget for. Uh, uh, for the for the for the uh, uh, next year and the Ford estimates is a judge is adjust will be adjusted slightly by uh, the efficiency dividend, uh, and the numbers uh, are material but manageable and don't affect us in the short term. So uh, we're not uh, we certainly won't be planning on any job cuts in relation to the budget at this stage. Okay, even the efficiency dividend. How you how, what's the efficiency dividend? I might let our Chief Finance Officer take you through that. Emily Thanks, Canning, Canning. Chief Finance Officer. So you're looking for the impact of the efficiency Yeah, dividend? just tell us how much the efficiency dividend is to be applied to the Yeah, department. so it's 1.5% in 1718, 1% in 1819, and 0.5% in 1920. Yeah, and what, what, how, what does that equate to in, in dollar terms? So for the 1718 financial year, it's 5.6 million. And for the 18-19 financial year, it's 9.1 million, and then the 19-20 financial year, it's 9.7. Okay. So, how are you going to absorb these efficiency dividend cuts? Uh, too soon to say, Senator. They're quite some way out, and there are a lot of variables <coughs> that we have to take into account in in setting our budgets and and staffing levels. And so, uh, for the 17-18 year, we'd be We'd be approaching that, those very questions um, uh, sometime before the start of the year. That's a long way off. Can I just ask a question in terms of the efficiency? I mean, I noticed lately that they're shutting, for instance, the bomb sites, Wagga and other places. And, and I presume my question is: is technology obviously? You know, it's a bit like can't sell newspapers now. Everyone's online, etc. In terms of departmental efficiencies. What, is there a sort of a cost analysis on the removal of staff and the increase of um, technology? Uh, we I mean, I can go on here and yeah. see what the weather is in, you know, Carnarvon or something, mm. and, and once upon a time it was a telegram and, a, you know, God knows what. Um, we have a continuing uh, program of capital investment to improve the capability of the organisation, and probably the most obvious uh, evidence of that externally is the service delivery modernisation program which we've been running and, the, and the, the, the problem there is to maintain our ability to uh, efficiently manage uh, an increasing number of tra trade related transactions, important export transactions, uh, with essentially a stable workforce and so we need to continue to improve our capability and the efficiency of our systems. And we do that through you know, cont continuing capital investment program. So our problem is not so much coping with falling staff levels, but uh, coping with an increased transaction load 
and also the transactions are getting more complicated as more trade patterns become more complex. Yeah, that's one's that's quite a different problem. I'll come back yeah, to it. I, Doug, Doug wants to yeah, go to the toilet. Uh, go. Thanks, Chair. I, I've, I've got head off for at least half an hour, I think. Uh, so can I ask one question on, on the, uh, uh, the corporate area? Uh, Department of Agriculture and Water Resources, 2015-16, um, the average staffing level was 4,250. 2016-17, uh, it was 4,000. Uh, it's estimated to be 4,517. That's an increase of 267. What uh, what will these staff be doing? Uh, Senator, I might take that question to Joe Evans, Deputy Secretary. Uh, the difference between those two numbers is a combination of both the fact that the 4,250 average staffing level for the current year is slightly less than where we had anticipated to be. So we had expected to be more up around the 4,330-odd uh, staff, so we've been slightly under our expected staffing level for this year. We expect to catch up uh, on that, so that's for the, the kinds of functions we've already been running. And then in addition, in the coming financial year, we have a, a, a ramping up of the activity under the, Australian, the Agricultural Competitiveness white, white Paper, in particular in the biosecurity area. And so a lot of that staffing increases to support those programs. Mm. So we're uh, sorry, it's not just biosecurity. It was the other programs that were announced under that paper. So it's white paper here uh, in this uh, outcome in one corporate one outcome one. Yeah. Well, okay. And both actually. Um, sorry, it, it spans all the outcomes. Yeah. So what are these particular increases in uh, staffing levels? in relation to the white paper, what are they? I, what I are haven't doing? got those with me, so I'll have to take it on notice. Can we do that in outcome one? Uh, we can see if we can come back with it uh, in time. So then there'll be people listening in. So For, for uh, the individual programs, they should be able to tell you what the staffing levels are, that's right. Yeah, because uh, you're, you are in a, this, this area, water and resources are in a more fortunate position than many other government agencies. You're actually increasing staffing. So I'm particularly in interested to know what that increased staffing level will do. So when we come to outcome one, I'd appreciate people being able to tell me exactly what this is about. Okay. Thanks, Chair. I gotta go. Uh, where are we up to? Did you finish it, though? I'll be back up. Yeah. Because we want to go to backpackers take this in outcome one. Could I just seek some guidance from the Secretary? No, that these, it seems there was, there's some questions on backpack attacks, 417s. Um, the decision making and financial decisions there, are they with Treasury or where do you fit into backpack attacks? Doesn't matter. We well, it's a, the, the, Treasurer, uh, the Treasurer is the responsible minister, and the primary advice to the Treasurer, of course, will come from the Treasury. Um, but to the extent it's, uh, uh, it's a cabinet matter, obviously we'd be advising our minister to participate in that so cabinet can, discussion. Can we ask you meaningful questions on it and get meaningful answers? Uh, well, depends whether your questions are about the, well, the actual process. policy instrument yeah. and the matters that are not resolved. Or um, the outcome. Uh, or some of the underlying issues. But, you know, I think it's principally... It. A, well, have a prin go. Look, to the extent it involves tax issues, it's essentially a Treasury matter and really the questions need to oh, go. It affects there. this portfolio. So yeah, well, anyhow, we, we're going to have a crack at it? Yeah. Righto. No. Outcome one. Okay. Thanks, Emily. Yeah. 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 Get through it at length, I think, when Senator Cameron comes back. No, no, intervene. No, no, no. You start. Yeah, if we're all interested. Okay, if I can. Thank, thanks, Chair. 
Mr. Quinlivan, could you tell us how many how many backpackers that we have working year to year through Australia, roughly, in the agriculture area? Areas. Yeah, Fran. Yes, yeah. Senator. Uh, good morning, Fran Freeman, um, First Assistant Secretary, Agricultural Policy Division. Uh, Roughly, we have uh, in 1415 there was roughly 56,000 backpackers working in agriculture for a few months. For a few months. So, so, it, so yes, it's sort of the majority of them would work probably in the horticultural sector. And how does that average out over, over the last 10, 15, 20 years? Uh, we've seen spikes. The general down? trend has been uh, increasing. Okay. And currently now, what are the tax arrangements for these backpackers in agriculture industries around Australia? So, yes, certainly. Um, so basically, uh, the um, non-residents are required to pay 32.5% uh, of their earnings um, in tax. That's current now? Yep. Yeah, yeah. Is that from $0? There's no tax-free... Tax so it's unless they meet the criteria for residency status, which is as on the ATO's website. So that would be, you know, obviously a matter for individuals to go to the ATO website. So whether they earn 100 or whether they earn 10,000, that's 32 and a half percent tax rate. Uh, well, no, it depends on up to. I can run through the various arrangements, or depending on their how much income they earn, it would vary. Uh, that the marginal rate would be less if they earn. I, th I, I can get you the actual numbers. I think it's eighteen thousand uh, dollars, and then it changes at thirty-seven thousand dollars from memory. Thirty-seven thousand. Yes, 000. I can. I can certainly pr happily provide you with those details. So get uh, Just explain it to me. Once they earn thirty-seven thousand, or thirty-seven percent, the tax goes to. 37,000 and 32.5%. What is the average earnings of the backpackers? Do we know? I'm sure the industry would have some figures. Uh, I don't know. that. I have to take that on notice. So okay. we've got figures here of $14,910.77. You haven't got access to that same brief that I've got? Uh, not on me at the moment, Senator. Where's it from? It's just in my... Uh, this is that 2014-15. Senator uh, Gallagher, I can confirm that they're the figures that have uh, that certainly are widely accepted as as, okay. as bank About fifteen thousand. About fifteen thousand, yes. Okay. Now there's but there's a lot of uncertainty as we know, and this should be an issue that should not split those of us in this parliament who have first and foremost in our minds the betterment of Australia's agricultural industry. Can you tell us where we are up to? in terms of the new back ta backpacker tax arrangements, to the best of your knowledge? I think, Senator, we probably we haven't got anything to add to the public comments that the Treasurer has made over the last 24 hours, which is that uh, the matter is still under consideration and is consulting within the government. So, OK, so what are the new arrangements that have been proposed but there's no change and not implemented yet? Uh, well, what will it mean to the agriculture <laughs> industry? Just to tell us. I mean, well, we we just haven't got. We're not part of that conversation. No, but, okay, it's but between that, ministers and. Okay, let's make it easier. Yeah. What are the proposals in terms of backpacker tax that's been floated by the government to date? Well, I don't think the government has floated any changes. Well, why is everyone up in arms? Some, some, as I understand it. Some propositions have been put Tell by members of those out there. Well, I don't see. have them, and I don't have. Does any, anyone in the agriculture I don't think, area I, know them? I don't know that they've had any public visibility, uh, but but my understanding, and this is fr from the same information sources essentially as yours, uh, some uh, members of parliament have put propositions to the to the treasurer. He said yesterday publicly that uh, they hadn't been accepted, and he was looking at. Uh, some alternatives and consulting with people. So, are we so talking about reducing the tax to these back buyers, backpackers? I, I have, I'm not able to guide you any further on that beyond exactly what the Treasurer said yesterday. But just for my benefit, if the average earnings is fourteen or fifteen thousand dollars for these people, and the scrapping of the tax-free threshold at eighteen thousand for these people means they'll get about thirty percent less income, is that right? So they'll be down to 11,000 for their work, and it'll be less attractive to them. Is that is that the nut of the problem? Uh, well, that, the math sounds roughly correct. So the industry is saying we can get these people to work for 15,000, but if they're going to pay 32.5% tax, we're not sure we can get their commitment to do the fruit picking and the seasonal work for $11,000. 
That's, that's essentially what we're talking about here, isn't it? That's the assertion. It seems pretty logical that if you get a 30% reduction in your earning capacity, the job would become less attractive. Senator Gallagher, it's probably worth noting that um, when this particular measure was first put forward in the budget in 2015, uh, in response to the budget and the indication that the ATO's determination that they believe that these particular visa holders, 417 visas and 462 visa holders, um, did not have eligibility to, kick, to tick the resident box, uh, mm. and so therefore they would come under and classified under the non-resident status, which um, attracts the 32.5%. Yeah. Um, uh, the position of the Labor Party at the time was that they supported uh, the changes to taxation of holders of uh, work and holiday visa holders. So, um, I just put that I, on. I the, accept that, Minister, and probably, yeah, sure. you know, maybe only you and me that have actually picked a few grapes in our working oh, life. We know how sure hard it is, and I'm not sure we go there for 30 per cent less money. No, no indeed, and, uh, and as was indicated by the Treasurer yesterday in his, uh, in his press club response uh, to the budget or follow up on the budget on uh, Tuesday night. Uh, he indicated that um, that there was this was an issue. It was an ongoing issue, and that he was considering it. Um, and so, really, any details past what we've discussed here today um, are most probably best um, targeted to uh, the treasurer's um, estimates, because apart from the information we've provided you, with you here today, I mean, this agency doesn't have any further. What we about here today is the impact. Absolutely, uh, and, and I mean the impact. And the impact is sort of partly our own fault because I, mean, I won't name the towns, but there are yeah, the people on ice or grogs or marijuana who go out to the local abattoir uh, to, as part of their commitment to their $360 money to stay in bed and get up after lunch and get back into the bloody ice. Um, that's the incentive. They might go for one, and I declare an interest because I deal with this <coughs> stuff all the time and sell a lot of sheep, etc. Um, they usually go for one or two days and then it's <coughs> all too much trouble. And they fail the drug test, they fail the grog test, and we do nothing about it. We still pay them money to stay in bed, which, you know, I mean, it's a big decision to drug test someone. If you fail the drug test, you're not getting the dole, but, I mean, it's an us about face sort of an issue, but it's a absolutely critical issue to be able to get the fruit picked, if you want to have cherries when you go to the supermarket, etc. If you want to, have, you know, lamb chops, etc. I mean, at Juni, and I speak from experience. I think we have 40 odd people from, and they are wonderful workers. They no trouble in the town. They're from Korea and other places. Um, and you know, I guess um, in terms of the decision of the government, which occurred, as I understand it, last year under the guidance of Mr. Truss and Mr. Hockey. Uh, with the impact down the trap, we're now at the impact stage. Um, it's a disastrous, bloody outcome. Look, um, Senator, there's no doubt that both the, um, the agricultural sector and the tourism sector have um, expressed um, concern that the impact of the change in, well, the determination of the ATO that, that will change the way um, working holiday and work and holiday visa um, holders are, are going to be treated from taxation arrangements, um, they believe that it will have an impact. They've also, um, as part of that um, consultation and the information that's come forward from the industry, indicated that there are a myriad of things that are impacting on the labour force um, that is available for the agricultural sector and the tourism sector more broadly in Australia. Um, I have to say that the, the small amount of interaction that I've had with those two sectors about this issue and the broader issue of labour force um, um, availability uh, has been extremely productive and I know that both of those industries are working at the moment um, to develop a broad plan about how they're going to deal with the shortage of um, labour into the future. Uh, so, but in terms of the actual specifics of where this particular um, issue is right now, um, obviously, as I said, it, it's best directed to the Treasurer, yep. but we certainly can confirm. The working reality, Minister, is here. Are you aware of the, uh, of the, of the uh, 
shall I say, the journey of a backpacker to the journey abattoirs, how he gets there? <coughs> Senator Heffernan, I'm probably as aware as anybody in this room about the issues of backpackers. Well, how do they get there? <laughs> well, they usually get one of those little wicked vans. No, 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 no. What's the process to get the job? In terms of a four, five, six... Uh, um, a, at the abattoir. You don't know. I'll tell you. There's a lot of labour hire contractors Correct. in the job. Those blokes, some are dead set spivs. They are the ones that have the responsibility mm. for collecting the tax, etc., etc., etc. And I think if we're going to do this, we've got to look at the system of how of employment through. The, we don't know. I mean, the average guy. And I'm talking from real knowledge here. Uh, in, in an abattoir, if he's in the boning room, he might be on $30 an hour. If he's, he's just picking up the guts and chucking him in a bucket, he's probably on $25 an hour. And they'll work an average of 40 hours a week. They'll start at half past seven or si uh, seven o'clock in the morning, finish off at half past two or whatever. Um, but the management of whether that guy gets his, the various bits and pieces to his wage is the contractor. We don't know, and the, and the abattoir doesn't know whether the, the guy that said they are wonderful workers cause no trouble in the town, they are fantastic. Um, we don't know whether they get ripped off by the uh, labour hire contractor, whether he takes a commission or whatever. But all I know, speaking for rural Australia, is we'd be buggered without them. Thanks, Chair. If I can, if I put the question to Mr Quinlan and all the Minister, but clearly, um, I'm just ashamed, Senator, the Dodson's not here, but we'll talk about the Kimberley in Western Australia. And, and uh, it is a well-known uh, fact that if we didn't have backpacker labour in the Kimberley, mm -hmm. the roadhouses would struggle to open, the pubs would struggle to open, the resorts would struggle to operate. Our IGAs in Fitzroy Crossing, Cunanara, Broome and Derby would struggle to, to operate. Uh, in fact, you would kill... This decision would kill tourism, but more important, the agriculture area in Cunanara and Broome and so... Has the government or has the minister done everything he can, in, to your knowledge, to persuade whoever's <laughs> idea this is that this is one of the dumbest, dumbest decisions ever, ever to come forward from a government? Has the minister been out there advocating against this stupid decision? I'm not, I'm not, I can't comment on internal okay. government uh, uh, no, decision making, fine. Senator, but what I can say is that I th the Treasurer, as I understood the Treasurer's comments yesterday, he was saying this isn't just a tax matter. Uh, there's exchange rate issues, there's, there's the, you know, the, the performance of the economies from which uh, we've, we've taken large numbers of backpackers in recent times, and there's equity issues across uh, labour force when you look at uh, treatment. There's the conduct of employers and there's the conduct of the labour hire firms, as Senator Heffernan said. All these things are relevant. And uh, what I heard him say yesterday, he was looking to uh, a solution that dealt with more than just one of those things in making a decision on this. So um, I, I didn't hear him disagreeing uh, uh, with uh, some of the points you're making there, but he's saying, I thought that he was looking to a more sustainable uh, solution here than just uh, tweaking the tax system. I, I just struggle with that, Mr Quinlibben, and thank you for the answer, but uh, in What's terms the of the department... The yeah. Well, yes. Senator, we, no, look, I, I appreciate that. The budget's just been handed down. There's been a scare campaign out there, and Senator Rustin, you know more than... Uh, no less than anyone else has been very, very vocal about the impact that this would have in regional rural Australia. And with your background, I would expect you to lead the charge. But you can't go into caretaker period with a looming election with this uncertainty. And I have no confidence, and please correct me if I'm wrong, we all know this is ridiculous, it's dangerous, and yet it's still hanging out there. How is there certainty within rural and regional communities and industries that rely on backpackers for their very existence? Yeah, look, certainly, um, as I said, the, the Treasurer, the matter is with the Treasurer. Um, I don't think the Treasurer would be... Um, Come tomorrow, we uh, the Treasurer. Yeah. Yeah, I was going to say, unaware um, of the concerns that have been expressed by um, the agricultural sector and the tourism sector, the two sectors that rely most on, um, on this particular type of uh, a labour. And um, I'd be very confident that in any decision that he makes, um, that uh, those factors will be well and truly taken into account. But I still come back. Um, 
I mean, I know it's not my place to be asking you questions, but has the Labor Party's position on this particular taxation arrangement changed? Well, let me tell you, you're not going to ask us questions. No, no, I just uh, put on the record, please, Senator Cameron. Right. So I'm sitting there, sure. and I've got some questions for you. Sure. All right. Take the call. Thanks. Um, can you just outline the process of consultation that took place uh, between the minister and the industry before this decision was made? Um, I'm unaware of the consultation process um, that took place with the minister and industry. Um, Do you know if there was any consultation? I would have to take that on notice and ask the minister. Um, I have only been involved in it since. What the about Mr. Quinlan? Yeah. Uh, well, I'm just let me get there. Um, <coughs> so, Mr. Quinlan, um, has the department done any analysis in terms of the productivity or economic outcomes of this decision? Senator, um, in terms of the consideration of the matters, we've had uh, a number, a department <coughs> official attended an industry roundtable on the 21st of March, and two departmental officials attended an interdepartmental meeting on the 23rd of March, um, as part of uh, consideration by the Minister for Tourism's review into working holiday taxation arrangements. Okay. Um, so, did the department uh, receive any instructions? Uh, from Minister Joyce about what position you should take to those roundtables? Uh, uh, to my knowledge, no. No. So the, so the Minister didn't give you any uh, instructions. Did you provide any advice to the Minister about the implications uh, uh, of this, uh, of this um, uh, backpacker tax? Uh, we've provided a range of facts and figures uh, in relation to our knowledge of uh, uh, numbers of visa holders under different categories, for example. Yeah. So we've been providing uh, information. So when, so when did you prov first provide? And, and I'm not asking you, you know, what advice you provided the minister. But when okay. did you first start providing advice to the minister on this issue? Uh, I would have to take that on notice, Senator. But the comment I would make is, is obviously, um, as uh, Senator still made the comment that uh, employment in the agricultural sector is, a, is an ongoing issue, uh, particularly for the horticulture sector. And we have, uh, uh, we would not infrequently provide statistics and information uh, to ministers' offices uh, in relation to this. Yeah. And oh. so, so, so I'll, I'll, I'm not. Um, the point I'm genuinely trying to make, Senator, is that uh, we would often provide uh, information of this of this nature to to the office. Yeah, sure. Uh, provide, but have you provided? I'm not asking what advice you provided, uh, no, but sure. have you provided? Uh, uh, advice in relation to the implications of increasing tax on backpackers to the productivity uh, and uh, uh, and yeah, the productivity of the industry. Uh, I would have to take that on notice, but my understanding, my suspicion is probably specifically to that question. No. Uh, what about A Bear? Are A Bear here? They're, they're, they're in this, this one, aren't they? Uh, I don't know if uh, we've got the relevant people here. I th look, I think it'd be fair to say, uh, Senator... No, just ask, just before we... Is, is this where A-Bear should, should be? Is this... Um... Yep. Yes? So can we get A-Bear at the table, then? I think it'd be fair to say, Senator, that labour supply difficulties have been an issue for the agriculture sector on a permanent basis, like ever, forever. Um, because of the, the seasonal and relatively low paid character of it, and it's, this is the latest manifestation of it. But uh, as long as yeah, I've but been. This manifestation, you'd have to concede, uh, Secretary, is a manifestation about, about a political decision. So this is a manifestation uh, of causing more problems because a political decision has been made on a taxation issue that's got significant impact on the agricultural sector, hasn't it? Well, that remains to be seen. Uh, no decision. So you, you're saying there's some, that, that it may not have an, uh, be well, an issue? Uh, well, I don't know what the decision's going to be, Senator. That's what no, we've no, been discussing. No, no, the decision here. is at the moment. There's a clear decision in the budget. No, there isn't. There's nothing in the budget. Yeah. Well, what is the decision? The then? existing the, law is going to continue. Yeah, the budget in 2015 highlighted the fact 
that the ATO had made a decision that these two working, these two holiday visa types, 417s and 462s. So they have to pay. Yeah, but the ATO's decision was that, that they had been incorrectly um, ticking the residence box, which allowed them the um, taxation um, arrangements yeah. that related to that, as opposed to they should have correctly been ticking them as, as so non. So is this the individuals that have done this and ticked the incorrect box, or is this, is this a systemic issue in the industry where the employers are advising people to tick that box, do you um, know? I think it was it, because it had been occurring over a period of time when they'd been ticking the, the resident status, it had been continued to be accepted by the ATO that, as acceptable, and it was only when the ATO obviously investigated the matter and made the determination uh, that it became apparent that there had been um, an accepted error. I mean, I don't think anybody was making any accusations that anybody had done anything knowingly incorrectly. It is just something that had happened over time. How could a backpacker not knowingly or unknowingly tick residential? How, how does oh, that... Well, obviously, the advice that was being received either through employers, through um, the employment agencies, was that it was acceptable. And the ATO, for a very long period of time, had been accepting it as such. Okay, and and th this has caused a real problem in terms of the implications it might have in the agricultural industry to get labour, hasn't it? Look, there is certainly a, a widespread concern about the potential implications um, when this comes in, but it was also noted as part of this process that there were a number of other issues that were impacting on our ability to attract this particular labour force, not the least of which was the issue about these dodgy labour hire yeah. um, companies that um, have been, that, that, that Senator... Yeah, Hathaway we are well had. aware of yeah. that. And, yeah. and the, there was a uh, suggestion that the amount of backpackers in Australia had declined because of the, the proposed taxation changes. Um, well before they came into effect. So mm -hmm. there, it became very apparent that it was, there were a number of issues that were impacting on our overseas labour workforce. So given the white paper, uh, why weren't these issues canvassed in the white paper, given that they've got such huge implications? I'm sorry, Senator? The, the agricultural white paper, why, why weren't these type of labour issues dealt with in the white paper? Um, well, I would have to refer that back to the um, to Minister Joyce, who just an oversight, was it? We, we might be able to get Mr. Sure. Morris, who was involved in the white paper development, to comment yeah, on Mr. that. Morris, why wasn't this issue debated and discussed in the white paper? Paul Morris, acting uh, deputy. I can't hear a word you say. I'm sorry. It's, it's sorry, I was just uh, introducing myself uh, for the record. Paul Morris, acting deputy secretary. Um, so um, labour supply issues generally were considered as part of the white paper. There were a number of submissions that were made in relation to uh, labour supply issues um, as, uh, as, part of the, uh, as part of the white paper. As it turns out, um, there weren't any uh, specific measures that were introduced in, in response to those at, at the time. Um, however, of course, um, both the Agricultural White Paper and the Northern Australia White Paper needed um, uh, funding uh, to, um, to to pay for them, and um, part of the uh, source of the fundings was was from this particular measure. So was it? So you say these issues were were raised. Uh, so was the issue of four one sevens and taxation raised? Uh, we had discussions through the course of the uh, White Paper uh, preparation around visa arrangements generally. For example, superannuation arrangements came up as, as another issue, and many of the issues that are being discussed um, in the context of the, uh, the current um, discussion were, were also discussed at the time, but in the end there were, uh, there were no, um, uh, no specific changes in the Ag White Paper. However, there were some uh, changes that were made to um, visa arrangements as part of the Northern Australia White Paper and... Yeah, uh, I'm, aware, I'm aware of that, but I'm yeah. asking you about a different thing. I'm, uh, you've indicated that some of these labour issues were raised in, in the lead-up to the development of the White Paper and they weren't followed through. Was, visa, was, was the visa issue and tax part of that, uh, the issues that were raised with the uh, with you or the department or whoever was organising the white paper with the minister. 
I think I was answering that question, Senator. So what I was saying was it was a part of an overall package of uh, measures. And uh, in the Northern Australia White Paper, there were some specific measures that were uh, provided for um, uh, improved arrangements for visa holders. So for example, uh, under the um, work and holiday- no, I'm not, I, Mr. Morris, I'm not interested in that particular aspect. What I'm interested in is the dilemma that, uh, that seems to be facing the industry now, and that is the increased tax on 417 visa workers. Was that issue raised? Um, well, not specifically, because it was, um, uh, it was a measure that uh, came in as, as part of the, uh, as I said, the costing arrangements for the, uh, for the, for the measure. But in, in, I mean, the reason I was explaining some of the other changes were they actually improve access for visa holders into Australia. Yeah, but I'm, uh, I'm not asking that. I mean, you can, I mean, sometime when we've got more time, maybe we can get that little story. But what I'm interested in is the issue that is the hot political topic, and that is that the industry are claiming that they are facing a real problem uh, because of the increased tax on 417 visas. Mm -hmm. So you're saying that it wasn't considered in the lead up to the, uh, to the development of the white paper, other than in general terms. Is that, is that your evidence? Um, that, that's correct. Um, uh, but of course, as the, um, as the minister just uh, explained, um, uh, it's not actually a change to the measure, it's an enforcement of the existing measure that's in place at the moment. Yeah. Were, you um, aware, were you aware that the, this measure was not being enforced um, were, were, uh, during the, the white paper there, development? There have been a couple of um, AAT cases um, in the recent times which have uh, confirmed the view that we had at the time that uh, it should have been interpreted differently than what it was being interpreted. Okay. And so there wasn't sufficient evidence at the time to, um, to say that outright. But since that time, there have certainly been some additional AAT cases which have confirmed what we believed at the time was a uh, misinterpretation of the existing rules by visa holders. Okay, so when you were developing the white paper, you were aware of this issue. Um, why did it then disappear off the white paper agenda? Because you know people are just saying they can't continue to operate. Surely, the operation of the industry is fundamental. Well, it depends what you mean by which issue. We were um, a decision was made at the time as to what to what to proceed with, which was to uh, ensure that. Um, the law was interpreted as a saying that non-residents uh, or visa holders who were non-residents should be taxed at the non-resident tax so, rate. So this was during the course of the white paper discussions, was it? Uh, well, clearly uh, there was a decision made as part of the, um, not just the ag white paper process, but the Northern Australia white paper no, process. No, I'm asking about the, the, the ag white paper. But it was, it was uh, used for both of those papers, so you can't okay. differentiate. So, so, so right, so this issue's been known for a long time, hasn't it? Um, for a while, yeah. I mean, since uh, since just before the uh, the white papers were finalised. So what date was that? When when was the start? Well, the agriculture white paper was released on the fourth of July last year, and uh, the Northern Australia was um, I don't know the exact date, but sometime in June last year. Yeah, but when did you? But the release date? I think it was. How long did it take to develop the white paper? Well, we started, the agricultural white paper commenced in, uh, and, and the Northern Australia white paper commenced about November 2013. Yeah, because I remember everyone saying, when is this white paper ever going to eventuate, right? Um, so so that, this was an issue that was known. Um, so did you take any steps to uh, d discuss this in the white paper? Did you give any advice? Uh, to, to the minister, and I don't know the specific advice, but was there any advice that this is an issue? The issue was part of the cabinet process, Senator. The issue is part, so, the, so, so you're saying that the cabinet knew about this issue? Well, this is it. We, we're talking about tax policy now, so that's what this is. This no, we're is talk, this I'm, I'm talking about agriculture. Well, production. it's actually a, it's a tax policy issue. Sure. So sure. I think issues about awareness and, yeah. and whatever action was taken and what advice was provided 
would have been happening in the tax policy yeah, I'm not space. asking what yeah. advice. I'm just asking, was this an issue that, was, that, the, that the developers of the white paper and the minister was aware of uh, during the development of the white paper? And I think the answer is yes. Well, I'm, I'm, I'm saying the, the answers to those questions go to what kind of tax policy advice was being provided to no, the government but, but at the also, time. But it also goes to the, to the issue, surely, for the agricultural department and the minister, if taxation decisions are made that have got a fundamental effect on the productivity and output of the industry, that that's an issue that has to be dealt with. And so, what I'm saying is the minister, if he was aware of the issue then, uh, either you should have advised them or he should have been aware of the politics of this and had an input into the Treasury decisions. Well, we may not have had any awareness of the advising process that was going on in the appropriate tax policy context. So the left hand didn't know what the right hand was doing? Uh, well, we, we, would have had, uh, we would have had knowledge at the point it reached a, a decision-making or a whole-of-government process through, uh, through a cabinet process, for instance, but uh, up until that point, uh, it would be a matter for the, for the relevant department and minister. Were you or the previous secretary made aware that this could be a problem in the in for the industry? Well, I certainly can't speak for the previous secretary. Uh, but well, but I'm, you can I'm if you've seen his, his file notes. Um, the the issue has been bubbling. I've been aware of the issue. I think in a in a low key way for for, for some time uh, since the white paper, and in a higher profile way, in, in in the same way all of us have been over the last couple of months. Okay. Um, so. Is Abair here? Uh, well, actually, Abair was under the previous uh, outcome and they've gone, but they're coming back in response to your request. I guess they're not here yet, or they'd be. Well, at the I'm going to be leaving in two minutes. I'll be gone for half an hour, so they don't have to rush. So maybe we can come back to them. Chair, uh, can I have a couple of Thanks. Yeah, well, Senator Gallagher. Well, one Senator clarification on the line of question that Senator yeah, Cameron I, was on. Can I, just, can I just indicate, Chair, that I've I was supposed to be I mean, at 11. That's been postponed to 11.30. I'll go there and I'll be back about 12. But I'll, I'll get some questions. Still questions here, so yeah, no worries. So, so the 417 visa form that's given to um, you know, people to tick a box of resident or non-resident, with a clear in, you know, if they tick residents, no tax, non-resident, 32 and a half. It's who, who provides that form to them? Yeah, look, it's, it's, um, it's slightly more complicated than that, um, Senator, but um, I think the detail of that question should really go to the ATO. Okay. But there, there are a number of elements to. Um, That's fine. So, so I'll go for a job as a backpacker. They give me a form for super and for employment and for taxation purposes, and I tick the beneficial box of no tax, and it's taken since 2013 for the ATO to work that out and apply basically the principle that they are not residents and should have been up for tax since they started. There are a number of criteria under which they can claim residency. And um, they were applying only one element of the residency criteria. And you had rather... nothing to do with designing this form that no one could fill out correctly? No. All right, that's Senator a taxation Gallagher. form. Senator yep. Gallagher, can I just suggest, I mean, whilst happy to answer questions in relation to the implications on the agricultural sector, some of the details, and for instance, about Australian Taxation Office forms would definitely be best directed to the ATO tomorrow. But you obviously had a vested interest in ensuring the backpackers could assist agriculture in Australia, but you had no input into the design of the form which has caused this issue. The form predates, it's nothing to do with the white paper, it predates the, um, the arrangements. This is something that's been a long standing arrangement going back years, and uh, backpackers have been applying the law in a certain way. And the AAT, the Administrative Appeals Tribunal, is saying that the way they have been applying, or many of them have been applying it, has not been correct. Thank you. Um, just a question to anyone, even the Minister. Is it a fact that in the 2015 budget reply by Shadow Treasurer Chris Bowen, that he supported, Labor supported this backpackers tax? That is correct, Senator Cameron. Um, and on the, as the Shadow Treasurer's, sorry, yeah, I'm Senator right. Williams, yeah. sorry. Withdraw <laughs> that insult, please, yeah. Senator okay. Rustin. Okay, <laughs> I'm not sure where that is. Oh, so, yeah, I, I, my sincere apology, Senator way, Williams. <laughs> um, <laughs> <laughs> yes, and on, on Doug, the... did you hear that? No, sorry. I just paid him he a compliment, me I called Senator him Senator Cameron. Cameron. I said, withdraw that insult, please. Oh. 
I thought it was a compliment, <laughs> Senator Cameron. Um, yes, I no. get lots of compliments in this place, so just. No, no. Just <laughs> water off the duck's back. But yes, on the Shadow Treasurer's uh, website, it also says accordingly, Labor will support the passage of the following measures. And first one is the change to taxation of holders of work and holiday visa holders. So Labor support it? Yes. Well, it is a problem because it's still dumb. I don't care who supports it, it's dumb. And the, and the fact is this, <coughs> yeah, no, I don't think we why aren't Australians picking that. the fruit and picking the grapes? That's a question I ask. We've got plenty of unemployed. Well, you're a country senator. Tell us. I've said it many times. I read my maiden speech. Some need a touch on the backside of the cattle prod. I said in my maiden speech. Some are young and healthy and don't want to work. There's a problem. Listen, you're not going to take over for Bill, from Bill Heffernan when he goes. We don't need any more. Senator Cameron, no one could take over from <laughs> Senator Heffernan. You know that. And you're going to try, I think. <laughs> no. Okay. Now, this is going to sound strange coming from me. Bit of order. No, that's what I've got to ask at this stage. Uh, oh, look, like can I go that. back to Senator Cameron, Senator Suit, because he does go to 11.50. Yeah, yeah, we'll right. keep it going, yeah, yeah. but he has to yeah, go yeah. 11.50. Thank Senator you. Senator just, just to indicate, I've now had three changes in times for this meeting, so I've got yeah, to go yeah, at 11.50. Totally, you know right. what it's like. I've only just come back, so... We yeah, thanks. Right. Um, so I, just want to, I just want to continue on this, this tax issue. Um, I won't rush. Labor would have supported this on the basis that due diligence would have been done on the decision. We weren't government at the time, so the decision was made. We would have expected due diligence to be done. Um, so, Senator Rustin, what due diligence did uh, Minister uh, Joyce undertake to ensure that this decision would not disproportionately affect the industry. Mm, I have to take that on notice, Senator Cameron. Okay. Uh, are you aware if there was any due diligence done at all? Senator Cameron, I was not around at the time in my current capacity, so I would not be aware of anything that occurred in that process. Okay. Or, you know, the minister's involvement in that process, yeah. I would have to take that on notice. Yeah. Mr Quinlivan, the department's got an economics division, hasn't it? Uh, you might be referring to ABS. Well, not ABS, but you, yeah. do you, you have your own internal sort of capacity? ABS, ABS so is our internal economic advisory group. Yeah, I've been dying to get ABS here for a long time, so I can't wait till they come. Um, so, uh, so if ABS are here, I do want to pursue some of this with them. Uh, did ABS provide you any advice on any implications for the agricultural economy? Uh, of these, this tax issue? Uh, we, we would, we, we, our advice would be prepared uh, in Ms Freeman's uh, group, which has uh, responsibility for advising uh, uh, on labour supply and related policy issues. Mm. They would take advice from ABEARS in formulating okay. that advice. So then, Ms Freeman, did you have any discussion with ABEARS on the implications for the uh, economic well-being of the industry arising from this tax decision? Uh, I, I have to take it on I think, I think yeah. that's the same so question, question yeah. we answered a little while ago, which yeah. is that we have provided, uh, I think Ms Freeman said, we provided quite a lot of information to, to ministers and to various interdepartmental processes on this over the last Little I'm asking about the. I'm not asking about the minister. I'm asking about how, how yeah. the department yeah. yep. internally dealt with what people are seeing as a huge threat to the industry. And, That's yeah. what I'm trying yeah. to deal with. And, and, and on a, I would have to check on a case by case basis with this engagement with AB is on a regular basis on a range of issues across the d divisions. Um, and on this particular one, I would have to take it on notice, Senator. I'm surprised that you would have to take that on notice. Either you did or you didn't, and I'm sure that if you did, you would surely remember because it's such a big political issue. Um, Senator, as I mentioned before, um, labour supply issues are indeed, an, as Mr Quinlivan has said, has been, have been an ongoing issue for the agriculture sector. So there is a long history of looking at these but issues. But not this issue. This, this has been going since uh, I mean, we knew, the Minister knew about it prior to the, the White Paper. Uh, we've established that. Uh, we've established that the White Paper uh, ignored this issue and didn't deal with it. 
uh, we've established that, uh, that you can't remember whether you've done anything in terms of your uh, engagement with ABR on such an important <coughs> economic so issue. So I'm just wondering, under this minister, what's happening in the department? Why isn't this issue at the forefront of your minds to try and deal with? And why wouldn't this department be providing advice, never mind the minister, why wouldn't the department be providing advice to your um, departmental officers who were engaging with the tax department on the implications? I think I mean, we've, did, we've, did we've, you? We've said that we did just that. That, that was the answer to the question yeah, earlier. But, mm. So, so yeah. you, raised with, you raised with the tax office that this has got huge uh, economic implications for the industry. Is that what you did? Well, it's been raised been read through these various forums that, yeah. that, that have led to some of the advice that has gone to the Treasurer. And yeah. so, as we said earlier, he's looking at that, along with other advice that he's got, including from members of Parliament, and he's, he's considering it at present. So he, was look, he was looking at a GST as well, so I'm not sure you can be confident that he'll deal with this either. You know? so, um, so how many complaints have you had uh, about from the farming community, the agricultural community, about the implications. Who deals with that in the department? Uh, well, uh, I can say that I've had I've met with a number of uh, uh, peak industry bodies over the last couple of months, and they've raised it with me, but not as their highest priority issue. Um, some of them obviously feel stronger than others, uh, but as we've been discussing, their primary uh, their primary target for that kind of, or their primary audience for those concerns has been the Treasurer and, and the Treasury. Well, and what's so the, the, I'm interested in that. What is their higher priority problem than this one, given, is, given that uh, you know, this has been made a big political issue? Well, it depends on the, depends on the particular Just give me a flavour for some of the issues that they're raising with you. Uh, well, in the horticulture sector, um, they're quite concerned uh, about um, the, uh, the R&D arrangements and the long-term sustainability of the peak industry bodies. That's a very large concern. And so a lot of the, a lot of the people that I, I've met with uh, over the last few months where this issue has come up, uh, their principal issue has been about the viability of their own industry bodies and the extent to which uh, uh, government can assist them to uh, uh, to be to survive, that's probably been the main issue actually with really? horticulture bodies. So, the, so an in, in the survival of an industry body is more important than the economic. I'm, I'm not saying that at all. I'm just saying did that you, has yeah, been. Yes, you did. You, you no, said, I didn't. You said I, that they were raising said, issues. I, I, said, I said they were raising issue. it. I'm not you saying it's say more that. important. You asked me what were the issues that they were raising with no, me. No, no, I asked you what issues of more importance, because you said there were, that this was not an oh, issue of importance. Uh, we're getting into yeah. semantics here. No, I, was, I was simply yeah. describing what had been said yeah. to me. OK. And, and what about the agricultural industry in general? So are they, they're more concerned about their peak bodies than the tax issues? Is that, is that true? Uh, I think a number of peak industry bodies throughout the agriculture sector uh, are experiencing financial difficulties. So yes, I would say that is a widespread, uh, that is a widespread concern. Okay. I don't think I'll get any more. Can I just oh, that's just chaotic, I think. If, if I was an agricultural employer and I accepted an incorrectly filled out form from a backpacker, and that meant that they got a 32%, 32.5% benefit of no tax, does the ATO chase the backpacker? Or the employer. I think you should. I think you should well, ask, you're in the industry, ask, and the agricultural industry relies on you tax. having a 417. No, no. You're, you're talking about a, a technical legal transaction with the tax agency. Well, I will tell you the uh, answer. I mean, if I'm the employer and I accept a dodgy tax form, I'm up for it. So, is anybody in the agricultural industry suggesting to your department that you have allowed a system to flourish? which could leave them vulnerable to the taxation department for the collection of 32.5% for every $14,000 they pay to a backpacker. I've not heard that particular concern raised with me. Well, it would appear to be quite obvious that that would be the legal situation. Once again, I think, Senator Gallagher, the legality of a tax arrangement should probably be directed to the tax office. 
I'm going to take the minister to say, hey, what's the implication <laughs> yes, sure. of this for uh, farmers? Mm, I don't think that was the question, Senator. No, but I'm asking, asking. You, don't, I'm asking you, don't you think the minister needs to start understanding uh, what the implications are if these individual farmers uh, face uh, act, both a tax bill and a fine? Mm. Look, I certainly think that the minister um, has taken and is very concerned about this issue, and I think he is obviously having um, input into the treasurer um, in coming up with whatever decision is made in the tax space. So, I mean, I don't think that we can verbal the minister to suggest that he hasn't had any involvement. Um, no, he's just I'm not, not here to answer. That. It. I was asking. You know, wouldn't he be concerned about this? You've just indicated, I think, yes. Well, I think the detail, the details around these changes of arrangements and how the tax office has viewed them regarding the legality interpretation is something that's best asked of the ATO tomorrow, uh, and they may be able to shed some light as to the legality yeah. or their interpretation of legality. Of this. It's not for us to yeah, interpret. You see, if, I want, if you want, want to send me along to the ATO to ask questions, I'm entitled uh, to understand the implications for the industry sure. uh, of this issue. And that's mm. what I'm trying to understand mm. here. Uh, has anyone done any analysis as to the implications of productivity uh, and the viability uh, of, uh, of uh, various organisations in the agricultural industry of this tax change? OK, well, Senator Cameron, I can advise you that in um, discussions with the, both the agricultural and tourism sectors, the one thing that was uh, very clear when we spoke with them um, that they volunteered was that there was a lack of information around this particular issue <coughs> and that both industries have um, agreed that the, as a, the highest of priorities that they needed to get more information and data collection as to the specifics of the details, I issues like we broadly say that, that there is insufficient um, labour in some of these areas, but when we actually drilled down and said to them, OK, well, where, where exactly is the problem? What is the skill area, etc.? They were quite um, forward and, and open in saying that they didn't have that information and that was part of the problem and that they agreed that as a matter of absolute priority, both the agricultural and the tourism sectors are currently, as we speak, trying to uh, are working um, to, to come back with mm. that kind of information so that they can provide a more detailed and relevant mm. um, um, response to what the implications would be. Because at the moment, they were, and they will say this themselves, they were talking very broadly about what the issue was as opposed to being able to get any detail. So la labour market, ma labour market uh, issues are important, aren't they, for the, for the sector? Labour market issues are important for any um, business. Yeah. Um, so, if it's important, it really just was ignored in the white papers. So that's a fundamental flaw in the white paper, isn't it? Well, Senator, uh, as I said, the um, and, and as the agency have said that there were the labour market issues were considered as part of the white paper. Um, however, I'm not going to speak on behalf of the minister for an issue that I wasn't around at the time it was uh, it was discussed. But I think the agency has been reasonably clear that yeah. these issues certainly weren't ignored in the white paper process. Well, you're saying they weren't ignored in the white paper process. Oh just was pointing to the evidence that had been given by the, the agency staff well, to the previous questions. I was not part of it, yeah, so sure, I'm not, can't I'm not give you first-hand information. I'm not saying that for yeah. one minute. Uh, but what I am indicating is that when you read the white paper, these labour market issues are not there. That's the issue. Well, and this is a labour market issue that people are saying has got a fundamental effect on the viability, the productivity, and the profitability of the industry. That's what I'm, I just can't understand why these issues weren't included in the white paper. Okay, Other well, than the white paper was the minister's little uh, plaything. Well, so, um, I don't know that I'd describe the all right, a paper I, I as important go, as that so as a plaything. I'll be back. And can I just indicate I do need a beer? Uh, I should be back. If a beer can be around when I'm back. And uh, I do have a range of questions on uh, output one. Thanks. Uh, Minister, can I just take you to your reported uh, public comments about 
Uh, tourism and hospitality have raised concerns about the level of the tax rate being non-competitive in the international market, uh, detrimental impact on backer, backpackers when they are deciding where they're going to go, highlighting competitors of New Zealand and Canada in lieu of Australia. And then you've, uh, the last comment that we've got here is that there's certainly every chance we'll see some changes, she said. Obviously it's a matter for Cabinet to decide, but there's been some very positive and proactive measures put forward for consideration, and I'm hopeful some of these will be adopted. Can you tell us what those positive and proactive measures that have been put forward were, and which ones have been adopted? Well, obviously, I, I can't tell you what the Treasurer has decided or not decided. Um, I mean, I can um, certainly draw you to your attention comments made by uh, the Treasurer in his response to the, the budget speech yesterday, and, and that's where he said that the proposals that were put forward um, were not proceeding. Um, there were um, a number of um, issues, including you know, changing in the, the quotas of, of visas, etc. But um, the absolute details of that were, were provided to the Treasurer. Um, he has chosen in this instance, as he said here, that, um, that he hasn't accepted um, those changes. And in doing so, he actually has highlighted the fact that he believes that there is a, a, a broader um, and a more complicated set of issues than just this one particular issue that was put forward. Uh, and he says that he's seeking to resolve the bigger issue of all of the issues that impact on labour. Uh, and that was, um, I refer you to his response yesterday, or his, his follow-up okay. um, to the press club yesterday. Um, following the budget on Tuesday night. Um, I am obviously not in a position to make any comment um, about <coughs> what the Treasurer's thinking is. So, What I'm about the positive and proactive measures that were put forward? Mm. I mean, I can understand the Treasurer saying, oh, we've got lots of non-residents who pay 32 and a half cents and we've only got 40,000 backpackers. I can understand that mm. argument. But what were the positive and proactive members, uh, measures that were put forward mm to fix this particular aspect mm. of the yeah. problem. Yeah, yeah certainly. Um, one of, the, one of the, the, probably the most proactive um, uh, measures that was put forward, and I think, you know, obviously, as I said, I'm not going to verbal the Treasurer, I'm not going to suggest I'm making any decisions in, on behalf of the Treasurer, this is entirely his issue. Um, however, um, you know, campaigns to, to make sure that, it, that, that backpackers understand how, um, what a great place Australia is to come to, um, so that it's a great place to come for a holiday, it's a pl great place to come to work, uh, to make sure that we have uh, the number of backpackers um, is not just sustained but is increased. Uh, so there are many of the, uh, the proactive measures. They're not things that the Treasurer needs to have necessarily have anything to do with, and that's one example I can think of off the top of my head, mm -hmm. um, where you know, a, a marketing campaign through social media, which a lot of these backpackers use, um, explaining that, you know, what a great place Australia is, um, you know, is one of the measures that the tourism industry was very keen to put forward to encourage more backpackers to come to Australia. But no one put forward a regulation saying that 417 visas endure the $18,000 tax-free threshold? I'm sorry, I... No one put forward uh, that the tax-free threshold to residents apply to this class of visa? Uh, I... As far as I'm aware, and I wasn't um, at all of the meetings, um, that, that issues in relation to direct taxation weren't something that I was privy to any conversation about. So all of the points about lack of competitiveness internationally and driving uh, uh, backpackers away because they're mm -hmm. now going to get 32.5 per cent of their $14,000 will go in tax are alive and relevant today mm -hmm. and continue into the future. Certainly, Senator Gallagher, um, there was absolutely no doubt that one of the, the fundamental points that was put forward by the agricultural sector and the tourism sector um, was that, uh, that we had to ensure that um, we weren't making ourselves uncompetitive in the international marketplace for backpackers. Um, and it was at that point, I think, that it became evident to both industries, that the industry sectors, that they didn't have the kind of information or sufficiently detailed information to really understand what um, what the Australian marketplace looked like, where the holes were, what was missing, um, and so it was it was evident that more information needed to be gathered, and and they proactively agreed to do that. And we know that on the 15th of March, the Deputy Prime Minister and Minister for Agriculture and Water Resources announced a review into taxation arrangements for working holiday maker visa program recipient. And we basically the answer is that review didn't get up. We're exactly where we were before the review. 
Mm. Okay. Well, as I said, that's uh, it's a matter for the treasurer. I mean, this is a taxation issue, and um, I can't pass any further comment than that. Okay. So, Senator, can you just uh, reprise that last question where I think you said that an announcement had been made that a review would be done? Uh, well, I'm you... just quoting from what appears to be a uh, press release. From the Deputy sorry? Prime Minister and his. The Deputy Prime Minister and the Assistant Agriculture and Water Resources Minister has have announced a review into taxation arrangements for the working holiday visa for the working holiday visa broke. Okay, sorry, I thought you were talking about something subsequent to that. Is there something we should know? That no, 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 no. I was just clarifying what, what, what the question we were answering. Yeah, yeah. Well, all I'm trying to work out is we've discovered we had a problem. We had to form the people either couldn't fill out correctly or. Presumably, that's the most uh, kindest interpretation. But I suppose if you have a form where you ask people to say, do you want to pay tax or not, I think a lot of Australians would probably err on the side of no tax. So we can't really blame the backpackers for filling out a form, which oh, is beneficial uh, to them. That sounds like fraud to me. Yeah. You designed the form, not the backpackers. No, we didn't. <laughs> well, the public service did. Yeah. Once again, yeah. these are matters that really should be directed yes. to the ATO, Senator So Gallagher. in your sector of responsibility, you have a beneficial program for agriculture, and it's unwound and undone because of a public service designed form. Look, I, I, I don't, I don't, I don't think be... that statement is correct in, in, a, in a variety of ways, and as we've been discussing, I, you know, we invite you to go and explore those various issues with the tax office tomorrow, but uh, yeah. I think you're... Does that you're mean? Your attribution of this problem to the difficulty in filling out a form is not right. Okay. So has there been systemic fraud in the 417 visa uh, application where they fill the wrong format? Well, I think it... it, it you mentioned fraud, not me. No, no. Uh, well, from this evidence that we've heard this morning, at the very least, we, 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 I think we've established that the problem's in partly arisen by a judgment by the tribunal, which has resulted in a different interpretation, which is quite a different matter to... Uh, incorrectly filling out a form deliberately or otherwise. So both those issues I think you need to go and talk to the tax office okay. about tomorrow. And, and we know there's no change from the, from the budget, so the problem still exists. We have a less, lessening of international competitiveness and perhaps a lower availability to agriculture of seasonal workers. Would they be factual statements? Uh, I'd say the matter appears on the face of it not to be resolved and the Treasurer is considering it yeah. present. But it would be a matter of fact that well, it we're hasn't happened yet. internationally less competitive because of our tax rate. Do I you think, agree or disagree? I think there would be widespread concern about the competitiveness of some of the users of this source of labour. Yes, that's undoubtedly true. And it, it, we may well face a lessening or a, a lower amount of people coming to assist our seasonal agricultural work? Is Those that, sectors are certainly concerned about that, yes. You're not concerned about it? Oh, I've got every reason to believe they're, they're right. That's, but I, it's one of a number of issues, and that's what Treasurer is considering. Okay. And it would it be uh, wrong to draw the conclusion that the best endeavours of the Deputy Prime Minister in agricultural sector and Minister have been unable to resolve this problem in the benefit of the industry? To date. To date. Is that your understanding, Mr Secretary? Yes, that's precisely what we've been saying. I think we'll go to... Just on the way through, so if I can. So, Mr Quinlivan, your department's engagement between the uh, representative groups in agriculture, horticulture and everything that relies on backpacker labour, and with conversations with the minister and the minister's office and the minister, that's the deputy prime minister, and the minister at the table, could you tell the committee that if this backpacker, backpacker tax was adjusted in the negative to the industry, has the industry at all <coughs> let you know where the heck they're going to get the labour from if it's not backpackers? Have they raised those concerns with you? Uh, well, clearly they're anxious about uh, where they might source that labour um, if, uh, if, if the, the current scenario uh, plays out without a further policy intervention. They're, they're obviously very anxious about that. Mm. Yep, thank you. So, so some comments that were made that um, you made earlier around the feedback from various um, grower and farmer organisations. Did I understand correctly when you said there'd been varying various amount of feedback, uh, various types of feedback? Can you just expand on that a bit? 
more clearly, because certainly the feedback I've had has been basically the same, is that this is going to have a significant impact. So can you just can let me know whether I've misunderstood what you said or whether you have had, in fact, had consistent feedback from, particularly from the organisations, and I'll come to specific farmers in a minute, organisations that, that are mostly use backpackers in their operations. Uh, I might get um, uh, perhaps uh, Mr Morrison, Ms Freeman to expand on this. I was responding to a question about what issues and what priority issues have been raised with me by some of the bodies that um, are concerned about this. And I was just making the point that it was one of a number of issues that had been raised with me and, and probably the most uh, uh, prominent issue that these bodies have been raising with me since my appointment has been difficulties uh, with the ongoing financial viability of peak industry bodies. Not all of them, but uh, quite a large number of them across uh, uh, a wide range of areas in the in the agriculture sector. So I was just answering that as a matter of fact. So on to the substance of your question. Um, I think it's probably safe to say, Senator, you know, there's a competition within Australia for uh, working holiday makers and, and backpackers, you know, included in that. Um, and the competition between the sectors and agriculture and, and uh, tourism and the mining sector uh, in recent years. Um, so there's sort of always been this ongoing uh, concern expressed uh, by industry um, about that issue and, and certainly uh, this department has been very much uh, engaging and continuing to raise uh, the concerns about the sector okay. uh, in, in that fora, but for, for a long time. You know, it's, it's sort of bidding for labour, yeah. if you like, in, a, in, in the market. Ms Freeman, you know, you know where I'm coming... You know, you know that I'm asking specifically about the changes, the tax changes that yep. are being made. Yes. And so that's what I'm particularly interested in. I understand the issue, because yep. I've been yep. lobbied yep. the same. Yep. I don't think we've got much to add to yeah. the last half hour or so's yeah. conversation on this, Senator. Yeah. We, we agree that industry bodies have, have raised these issues with us, as they have with ministers and, and, and the, the Treasurer and the Treasury, and so we agree with all that. So how much, and how much contact have you had from specific, uh, from growers direct, as well as the industry bodies? Um, well, as Mr Quinlivan said, the, sort of the issue is, has raised uh, in, in different engagement with different officials, but I think specifically looking at the working holiday taxation arrangements, um, there has been, uh, you know, there was an industry round table which obviously the department attended, and there's been an interdepartmental uh, committee that was, uh, was held in March, and again, um, the department uh, sent officials in terms of representing the concerns of agricultural sectors to that. Senator, I'll probably uh, just for clarity, I should say, I know you weren't here, but this is the very issue we've been talking about uh, for the last uh, probably three quarters of an hour or so. So mm. well, I'm happy to go over it again, but... No, well, no, no I was trying <laughs> to clarify some of the detail. Uh, yeah, right. yeah, thank you. Um, in terms of the review, is that a thing or not? Is it happening? Uh, well, uh, if you're... The Asking about that, the review that, that Senator Gallagher mentioned yes. earlier, um, my understanding is that uh, Senator Colbeck, or Minister Colbeck, um, led a process and provided a report to the Treasurer. Okay, so that's done. That's that process. It's done and dusted. That's, that's my understanding. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Chair. So just to put it all in some sort of perspective, if you earn 32000 or $30,000 backpack, a backpacker, you'd pay $1,040 tax, whereas uh, pre the application of the uh, non-residency uh, versus residency form, you'd pay $300 tax. Is that about right? No. Did you say 30, well, you, well you, you wouldn't pay any tax on the first 18000 of your 30. This is what's been 10, in place. 000. I think yeah. it's 10000 not 1000 Eighteen thousand was the tax free threshold. No, you said if they earned thirty thousand, they'd pay yeah, a thousand so dollars tax. Yeah, they'd pay ten thousand dollars tax. So again? You said if they earned thirty thousand. Yeah, yeah. Pre the application of pre the, the application. You'd have eighteen thousand tax free. Yes. And you'd pay tax on twelve thousand. Correct. Versus paying tax on thirty thousand at thirty two and a half percent. 
constituents. It's a significant issue in terms of what people actually take home in their pocket. And we've been unable to resolve this. To date. And are we... Well, no, not for the uncertainty out there, Senator And you know, in the industry, there should yes, not I be this uncertainty mm -hmm. hanging Chair, around our regional areas. Chair, I mean... Yes, Senator Lewis. I've, I've got no questions uh, on this, but we, we have... Everybody's had a go, and we're just going back over the same... No, 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 I think Senator, no, Senator Gallagher has raised... Oh, no, no, no I think he's finished, but we've... we've no, finished. no, I think we're raising some very... Right, OK. Some, look, it's a big issue. Senator Gallagher. So... If we're taxing people at the full 32 and a half cents on what they earn versus a situation where they were taxed on, you know, 12,000 of the $13,000, you can't resolve this issue in the affirmative for the industry. This won't, uh, whatever the Agriculture Deputy Prime Minister and yourself, Minister, do, there is no positive outcome for the uh, agricultural sector and the tourism sector in far flung places. So the bananas, the mangoes, the roadhouses will uh, have a diminished supply of labour. Is that the end result of the review? Senator Gallagher, you're making the assumption that the matter is not going to be resolved. Um, all I'm not in a position today is to tell you what the outcome or, or the actions of the, tre uh, the Treasurer are going to be. It is a matter for the Treasurer to decide. We have certainly, from an agricultural sector and from a tourism sector, um, have provided a very, um, very detailed information to the Treasurer and the Treasury about what we believe the implications of this will be on the respective sectors. Um, and I think that we, and it's now with the Treasurer, I don't think we should be assuming the Treasurer is going to do anything one way or the other. It's a matter for him to decide, um, and I'm sure he will um, be making a statement um, at some stage. So I don't think you can assume that nothing is going to happen. Um, I'm just saying that at this stage I'm not privy to whatever decision is going to be made. So just a so is it possible to make a decision if the government's in caretaker mode on this issue? Mm. Look, I'm, I'm not an expert in caretaker provisions um, and I'm, the government's not in caretaker mode as far as I'm aware as we speak. <laughs> we may well be. <laughs> so we, we have a very, I mean, for the industry that may be interested in this, and, and I'm serious, there, there probably is a potential liability, not on the backpacker, but on the employer. So what, And they won't be happy about the fact that the administrative tribunal has decided to interpret tax law differently. The legal implications on an employer who's been a regular and systematic user of backpack labour, who's accepted a form which ticked the wrong box, the legal liability will almost certainly Senator be on that employer. Senator and you're providing no, no certainty for those people between now and Saturday when the Prime Minister may well call an election. Well, I'm not privy to what the Prime Minister's going to do on Saturday or whenever. But all I'm He saying... did say you'd call it this weekend yeah. on TV. Yeah, sure. That could be Sunday, but that, that's semantics. What I am saying to you is the issue that you're raising in relation to issues of legality around the filling out of a form that is the domain of the taxation office should be directed to the tax office. Um, I don't think that there has ever been any suggestion that there has been any legal action or illegal action taken that will result in liability in relation to this. However, that is an issue you really should raise with the ATO or the, tax, the Treasury and tax officials tomorrow. That is not something that I can or any of the agency staff here are in a position to answer. Senator Rustin, you and I have both had dealings with the Taxation Department as running of a business and you know the legal implications as well as I do. So to deflect it to the taxation, it's just common sense. You are the responsible entity for collecting and forwarding the tax to the tax department. And to say that someone incorrectly filled out a form will not get you out of trouble. That's what the every business owner in Australia Senator knows that. Gallagher, Senator Gallagher, can you please just accept the fact that this is an issue for the tax office and it is not something that we can comment on? <laughs> I think it's a matter where the, we igno I acknowledge where the department should be actively pursuing a change in policy to give surety to an industry that needs systematic employment of seasonal workers. I can assure you that the agricultural sector, whether it be um, the industry groups, whether it be individuals, whether it be growers, whether it be the agriculture department um, or the ministers that um, sit within that department, we have all been very active and making sure that all the information that the Treasurer needs to have to make his decision has been provided to him. 
and ultimately you have not succeeded and we may well be in caretaker mode until July the 2nd. To date. I, Senator Gallagher, all I can say is please direct your questions tomorrow to Treasury. Um, we have done, I believe, everything that was appropriate for us to do in this space and it is now resides with the agency that has responsibility for the decision making. Well, thank you, Chair. Thank you, Senator Gallagher. I'll just wrap this up and say let's hope that the Deputy Prime Minister can shake some sense out into the Treasurer's head. Good luck with that within the next 48 hours or whenever the election is called, because at this stage I don't have any faith. But anyway, Senator Williams did tell us to watch this space, Wacker, so you've obviously had a yeah. chat to Banana Bee and hopefully it'll all be fixed by tomorrow. Anyway. Well, I, I don't know that it will all be fixed by tomorrow. It's a complex issue and and uh, responsible government takes these decisions not lightly. All right, well, to all those out there in rural, regional in land. Well, we don't rush into things. I mean, you could talk about cash for clunkers, you can talk about live cattle bands, you can talk about all those things. We don't do things like that. I've got more questions in outcome one. Yes, no, well, let's, let's move on and let's just hope and pray that our agriculture and tourism sector can have a win out of this stupid decision or indecision, so Senator, See what. Thank you. Um, can I ask in question one about the farm co-op and collaboration pilot? Yes. In the um, budget papers, sorry, I've gone to the wrong page. In the budget papers, talks about um, changes from the white paper. Yes, I'm happy to answer that. Can you just certainly, take uh, me through what those changes uh, are? Certainly, uh, Senator. There's, there's um, two changes to be aware of. Uh, one is that there's been, uh, while the funding envelope for the program hasn't changed, that the, we've actually shifted some of the funds from 15-16 to 17-18. So, so, so you're starting so it later? Yeah, effectively, yes. Yeah, okay. So, so we'll, yes. And, and then the other one is the... Uh, uh, Southern Cross University will be delivering the program as opposed to Rudick. They're the only substantive changes to the program. So why was that change made? A uh, decision of government, basically, uh, Senator. I can understand it was a decision of government, yep. but why? Oh, well, I think, I think um, so there was a range of uh, issues that were undertaken as part of uh, as rolling out this measure. Uh, uh, Rudick was uh, given the task of uh, doing extensive industry consultations, which they did, and uh, developing a program framework. Similarly, the minister also asked uh, Kevin Hogan to also go and consult on a range of issues on how it might, uh, the program might be run. I think it's important to note that the intent of the program uh, has been consistent, which is to provide knowledge and materials to farmers who are looking to establish co-ops and collaborative business models. Yep. Um, so there was a sort of a range of exercises that were undertaken. Uh, and uh, the minister decided um, basically with the view of, of wanting to uh, engage particularly off the existing network of regional development authorities and educational ex uh, institutions that basically um, there was uh, opportunity with Southern Cross University and, and their expertise and engagement to basically leave a legacy of, of developing a centre of excellence in collaborative business models that could leverage off the RDAs and educational networks. So did that go out for tender? How was that decision made? Uh, it was uh, consistent with the Commonwealth procurement uh, guidelines. It was a decision of government and it was a non-competitive tender, but it was consi consistent with um, government processes and it went through all relevant government uh, administrative and legislative approval processes. What does that mean? Sorry. It means sorry, that, sorry. that, well, exactly, because this is, is this university the one that's in his electorate? In, sorry. Isn't this the isn't Southern Cross, is that not in the Minister's it's electorate? Loca uh, it's located <coughs> in uh, Lismore, Southern Cross University. Is that in his electorate? No. Not Just in outside his electorate? Not, not in the... Just outside his electorate? Where's Lismore? Ismore's in northern New South Wales. Okay. So, how, when was that decision made? Uh, the decision, I can actually tell you that. Uh, so, sorry. It, it's sorry, not in the minister. No, no, I still don't understand no, no. what, so, what so, that all meant. Okay. Okay, if you can follow that, for yeah. 
to, I'd have to take it on notice, but I think the decision was probably made by the minister in January, from recollection. Okay, and so you it was actually announced by. I, I beg your pardon. It was. I, I'm getting confused. The minister announced um, uh, in April, 14th, that Southern Cross University would be delivering the program. Okay. So, but the decision was made before that. I, that I actually, I, I confess, I'm getting my different measures confused, <laughs> Senator. So, uh, my mistake. Perhaps uh, Ms. Free might just go through uh, the times and the decisions here in a clear, <coughs> clear way, so we've got this straight. Certainly, certainly. So, so basically, um, a process was undertaken by by Rudick, which commenced um, in August last year, noting that the Ag White Paper uh, was announced in July. So Rudick uh, basically was engaged to develop a draft program fr framework in consultation with stakeholders. Uh, and this was done and provided to the department uh, at the end of uh, November. Um, in early October, the minister asked uh, Mr Hogan to develop an options paper on cooperative arrangements in Australia, which was drawing on the draft framework that Rudick had been developed. Mr Hogan reported uh, to advise the minister uh, in December that he'd uh, received feedback that basically identified some uh, shortfalls in the Rudick framework, including a perceived top-down approach and the risk that there wouldn't be a meaningful program legacy. Mm -hmm. And who had provided that, that was through his consultation process? Yes, correct. Okay. And, and you'll notice uh, also in the quans that were tabled from the last estimates, uh, Senator, there's all um, the material that we have from that process, so okay. that's all uh, uh, freely available. Okay, thanks. Yep. I'll go to that. So, okay, so Mr Hogan then recommended to the Minister that there were some shortfalls in the framework? Yes. And then what? So, so then there was sort of ongoing uh, consideration uh, by uh, the minister asking the department, I think it was in, in January, to investigate whether Southern Cross University uh, could potentially uh, deliver the program. So why Southern Cross? So as I said, it was basically building on their, um, particularly their existing network with regional development authorities and uh, the idea of actually being very well familiar in that particular region of Australia with um, a lot of the uh, very successful cooperative arrangements that are in place in that region. So was there not consideration that that region is only one part of Australia? Uh, uh, indeed. Yes, this is a national pilot program, Senator, and the program uh, is will be run that way. So I'm asking because you made a comment that they understand what's happening in that region. Uh, yes, that did. was there consideration. Um, they, they do. Want, so there's several elements, I think, Minister, uh, Senator, to be clear. Um, they certainly are familiar with the, the successful cooperative arrangements in that region. They also are very well linked in from their other uh, networks with the regional develop, uh, development authorities, which go nationwide. And obviously, um, they can leverage off uh, broader education networks as well. Okay. Thank you. Did you look at any other universities? or entities that also did this type of work? Uh, I can't speak for what Mr Hogan uh, did, um, so I, I can't comment on what on what he did, obviously. Um, but Rudick, um, we basically looked at Rudick as one option and then um, Southern Cross University was investigated. But Southern Cross were the only mob that were asked to, and I'm not casting any aspersions, no, so no, I just put no. on the record. Uh, from Southern the department's University, perspective, the Southern answer Cross. would be no. Thank you. And so the shifting of the funding envelope, yes. does that um, mean that basically there's been no progress in actually starting the... Uh, you've started the process, but in yep. terms of what Southern Cross has done, it yep. means that you're moving that into the out years. Uh, so so uh, people, people can basically get in touch uh, now and register their interest, um, any interested parties. So, so I'm happy to provide any of the details for that. We expect um, that it will kick off uh, early in the next financial year, so that farmers will be able to access the pilot early in 16-17. And that's open to any farmers to access the pilot? Um, yeah, so that there's basically three elements uh, to the program. Uh, if I'm happy to run through if you'd like. 
uh, Senator. So one is sort of basically farmer group projects, of which $3.8 million will be made available to farmer groups to submit proposals to get their collaborative pilot project off the ground. Yep. Um, the second element is sort of customised expert support, so that'll be just over $5 million, which will support farmers having access to a panel of independent experts. So that, that will be selected through a competitive tender process uh, to help them decide on the best way to collaborate and capture more value uh, through the supply chain. The sorry, could, sorry, sorry, could I just ask you there? Certainly. What, what do you mean they'll be selected from competitive tender process? So, so I should say at the moment, um, so the, the, there's been a deed of agreement signed between the department and Southern Cross University. We're currently going through establishing uh, the governance arrangements for that, so how that will be done and who's making and the uh, processes in terms of getting industry, setting up an industry Who advisory. will be on the expert? Uh, the department will be playing a role in that, yes. Okay. So, sorry, the competitive tender process is for the expert support? Yes, that correct. Was, okay, yep. sorry. Yep, yep, that's all right. And then the third element is the knowledge exchange, which is $1.9 million to support farmers and farm advisors being provided with relevant information and resources on collaborative and innovative business approaches for farmers. So this is designed to create a legacy, if you like, that will live beyond the pilot. And who's doing that? Uh, that, that will be part of the program. So uh, Southern Cross itself will do that, is yes, that what you're saying? Yes, okay. yes. But I think, I think what I would say is, so the governance arrangements for the project include a joint Southern Cross University and departmental steering group to oversee the project delivery. Okay. Uh, and it will include an industry advisory group, as I said. Okay. Thank you. Thanks, Chair. I don't want to take up too much no, thanks, time. Thanks, Senator. I just want to come back to you, Ms. Freeman. So, how how did it end up at Southern Cross, this pilot program? Uh, so, you, you, so, you mentioned that a lot of so, so, bureaucratic so basically, phrases sort of went over your head. Well, well, I think, uh, Senator, basically, um, when the program was announced, um, Rudick was engaged to do some uh, extensive industry consultation and, and come up with a, a, a program framework. At the same time, well, in October last year, um, the minister asked uh, Minister uh, Mr. Hogan to assist him and provide advice on, on this measure. And Mr. Hogan undertook a, an extensive consultation process of his own. Uh, he had provided uh, his report to the minister just prior to Christmas, again, that was all tabled in, in the Quans on where he thought Southern Cross University uh, uh, was may have merit potentially, and uh, the minister asked us to investigate uh, that. So, okay, so extensive consultation process. So happy to, okay. to provide you with details of consultation that's been undergone, but I think yeah. I should say okay. a lot of that was provided in the Quans from yeah, February yeah, sure. estimates. No, um, I'm just trying to get back to with Senator C. What's yep. questioning where I was having halfway through a chat with, with the secretary, and and, and Senator C. What did ask just to confirm no other universities were approached. Uh, the department didn't consider the department didn't consider any other university. So, I, I can't. Um, okay. I can't comment on what Mr Hogan may or may not. So the department, well, no, I'm just trying to figure out if any other university had the opportunity to put forward a, uh, a claim to accessing this opportunity. Uh, so basically there was a non-competitive grants process was used and approved by the minister. What is a non-competitive grants process? So mean? under the, uh, and I'm not an expert, but under the Commonwealth grant guidelines, there's a range of ways of which um, uh, services can be procured. Um, and I, I could provide you with the relevant. I'm, I'm not sure of the specific sure. details of that, but it, um, basically the process that we used with this was consistent with the Commonwealth grant guidelines. So, so we don't go out there and get three quotes. So uh, it depends. Well, there's a range of procurement options that people can do. Well, well was that? So, so for this, this particular, for this particular, that? for this particular measure, um, uh, we did not. Did any other universities? Um, have a gripe or a win so they didn't get the opportunity, to the best of your knowledge? Uh, to the best of my knowledge, no. To anyone else in the department? Was there any? No, we're not aware of None at all? <laughs> and just to follow up on Senator Seawitt's question, I didn't even know where Lismore was. Apologies to all Lismoreans, okay, but I can tell you where Muck and Boudin is. Um, in what electorate is Lismore, do you know? Uh, Richmond, I think. In Richmond? I think. Is it in Richmond? In Richmond. I'm pretty certain there's more in Richmond. Okay. We thought it was Page. Okay. I'm not. 
Oh, so it could be Paige. On, hang on, it could, it could be in that boundary. Well, just that you did ask the question and, and, and the answer came back it was in Lisbon. I, I thought the indication was it wasn't in Mr Hogan's electorate. But no, I think we were answering the question that it's not in the Minister's electorate. Oh, yeah, yeah. OK. So it is in... OK, so yeah. Lisbon was yeah. in Mr Hogan's electorate. It was in Mr Hogan's So after all that hard work on the competitive... Oh, OK, that's... Uh, now, so just to confirm, oh, it's okay. in the electorate of Page. Oh. So it's in Page, is it? It's Page. OK. Lismore. Very good. Did, is that one of the ones that changed? I think it did. So what we have established that it was in the federal seat of Page, which Mr Hogan is the current member, but through a redistribution it's now fallen into the seat of Richmond. Am I correct? We we'll okay. have to check that. Yeah, yeah. No, it's no big deal. I just wanted to know what the answer was. Senator yeah. Steele, that is correct. Thank you. Thank you, Minister. Okie dokie. I don't have any further questions on that area. Does anyone else? Senator Williams? I bet I you do. don't. I do. No? Still in outcome one. Yeah, still in that. No, there's still more in outcome one. Please fire ahead, okay. Senator Seward. You've got a text message. Lismore's still in page. Lismore's still in page. Yeah. I've got pages. Yeah. yeah. Okay, um, can I go to the Managing Farm Risk Program? Um, in terms of the um, in terms of the changes to the program. Oh, first off, can I ask how many how many farms have been assessed as part of this program? Um, Greg Williamson, First Assistant Secretary, Farm Support Division. Uh, Senator, we've um, received four applications and they're being assessed at this point in time. As of as of five May, to be precise. So as of five May. Um, I understand that. A, oh, how many of these had revenues more than two million? Oh, since there's only four. Uh, I, I can't comment, Senator, in terms of the what what uh, what's been applied for, whether or not the applicants are eligible or not. That's okay. that's currently under assessment. Okay. So my understanding that um, there, that there's going to be a new means test being introduced under the new process. Uh, it, part of the eligibility criteria yeah. is that um, applicants are limited to a turnover of well, it's a it's cash receipts of $2 million. This is, but than, that's just sorry, being less introduced. Than clarification. Less, less, than, less two, than $2 million. $2 million. That's, that's just being introduced, isn't it? Under that, that, was, that was part of the, the guidelines that were approved by the minister. When were they approved? Uh, Senator, that's a good question. Uh, the... Well, the program opened nationally on 29th of March. Um, the, the guidelines would have been active from that point. Sorry? The, the program opened on the 29th, 29th of March. March. The, the guidelines would have been active from that date. OK. And you've had four applications today? That's correct, Senator. OK, thank you. Can I just... All right, so were the guidelines... Sorry, I'm a bit... It may just be the language, and I apologise hmm. if, if this is the case, in the, um, in the budget paper number two, um, where it says there'll be, the government will achieve efficiencies of $9.2 million over four years from this program. A means test will be introduced to limit eligibility. So is the means test always there, was it? That's my understanding, Senator, that the, the, it's part of the eligibility criteria that that, I guess, limit on, on the amount of cash receipts by, by an eligible applicant is there. OK. So the way it reads, its implication is that it's been introduced because of the efficiencies. So you're telling me that's not the case? Well, I think when, when the government looked at what, what was needed for that program, it was decided that the full amount that was originally anticipated wasn't needed, given, uh, given the nature of the program. And, uh, and when we had a look at the sort of demand that might come through uh, for a program like that. So what are the efficiencies 
there's just been less money. It, this this doesn't say there's less money allocated per se because of because no. of of um, what you've just said, the yeah. lack of demand. This is linked to efficiencies. Back. That's what I understood yeah, you. Yeah, no, I, no. Or, what, or no, you didn't need I, as much money. Yeah, I'd like to just clarify that. I, I wasn't implying there was lack of demand. I, mean, I think we, what we did was look at the program and think, well, this is the sort of demand we'd need and therefore match that and marry the, that demand up with the amount of money that we'd need. So when the, when the program was initially announced as part of the white paper, as I understand, I think there was a, it was anticipated we'd need around $29 million roughly over the, over the four years. Um, however, though, when we, when we started to look more closely at the sort of applicants that we get, um, uh, just sort of, four. and we looked more closely at the program design, we uh, considered, or the government considered more, more appropriately, uh, that a, a lesser amount of money was actually needed. And I think okay. that's the efficiency that they're talking about. Okay, seems a bit odd language. And so you, the means test was always applied. I want to be really clear about this because it says will be introduced. Uh, Senator, my understanding is the eligibility criteria were set as part of the guidelines, and those guidelines are active from the 29th of March. And that, and that um, criterion around um, only being eligible for businesses that had less than two million dollars in cash receipts has applied from that time. Thank you. Can we just clarify that just to make sure yep. we're 100% accurate on the record? Um, so when the white paper was announced, it was announced as the program for um, providing uh, assistance to farmers who are taking up risk management um, insurance and so forth. Um, there, there was a period of time during the past few months where the guidelines for the program were developed. And as part of the development of the guidelines, uh, that $2 million cap was introduced at that time. So okay. I think what you were saying was, was it part of the original program, which is, um, yeah. it wasn't in a sense because the guidelines hadn't been fully developed okay. until later on. And then when the guidelines were developed, that was part of the program and demand was assessed at that time. Okay, thank you. So, so the, what I'm trying to find out, is this a budget measure that was introduced? It's not per se a budget measure. It is something that's changed between the white paper when it was first announced and when you do the budget. Is that how I interpret what you Well, just we said? didn't have all the details of how it was going to be rolled okay. out at the time of the white paper. Yep. And as part of the guidelines, that was one <laughs> element of, uh, okay. of the guidelines that were, uh, was announced at the time of the 29th of March when, uh, when the guidelines okay. came out. Thank you. Thank you, Chair. Thanks, Senator. Senator Cameron. Uh, thanks. Um, do we have air beer here yet? We do. Can we get yeah. them to the table, thanks? <coughs> Afternoon, Ms. Schneider, Mr. Goodell. Um, could I just uh, ask whether ABEAR has done any analysis of the uh, productivity effects, the profitability effects, uh, or of, of the uh, tax uh, issue for 417 visa workers? Yeah, no, Senator, we haven't done any work specifically on those issues. Okay. Um, wow. would, I, would I be right to say that the, that the industry is concerned about it because it would reduce the supply of labour if, if the proper tax was paid? That seems to be accurate, yep. Yeah. Um, well, so pe people need to pay the proper tax. Um, so... <coughs> You didn't receive any, any, uh, uh, any um, request from the department to provide advice on this issue? So we haven't done any work specifically on the backpacker tax issue in right. terms of how a changed tax arrangements might affect the supply of labour, if that's what you're asking. So yeah. no, we haven't, we haven't done any work specifically. Would that be an issue that, that you should do some work on, given what people are saying the effect of this could be? So we are undertaking some work on um, labour availability issues in agriculture. So we've got a survey 
in the field at the moment in the vegetable and horticulture industries that that is attempting to get at some of the issues around labour availability, um, where the problems are, what's behind the problems and what employers are seeing as um, what might be some of the issues um, coming up in the future. So that survey's in the field now. We should be finished collecting data in um, towards the end of this month and hopefully producing some results early next financial year. Okay, so you'll have some results. Will that be a, will that be publicly available? It's the intention. Yep. So it's publicly available. Uh, so how many how many uh, agricultural industries are you consulting with on uh, on this? So our um, our vegetable survey, we do face-to-face -face surveys with 300 vegetable growers across the country and we're doing an irrigation survey in the Murray-Darling Basin where we'll be talking to uh, 300 cotton and horticulture uh, growers, so they'll, they'll all be filling out this supplementary survey on okay. labour. Okay. Um, that's good. Um, so can you also... Um, advise me what are the main factors driving the cattle price in the in this country so that might be um, Dr. Penn. Senator Jimmy Pan, Assistant Secretary, ABS. There are a number of uh, factors driving cattle prices uh, currently. Uh, we are having relatively strong international demand for beef exports. Also, uh, some areas are uh, facing uh, uh, adverse seasonal conditions, and that will increase uh, cattle, cattle turnoffs, and that may put the uh, downward pressure on sell yard prices. And if seasonal conditions improve, uh, as uh, uh, currently uh, suggested by Bureau of Meteorology's three months outlook, then restock demand may increase and that may uh, help to support uh, sell yard prices for cattle. So, so in international demand, is there a relativity between uh, you know, the, the implications for each one of those issues on the cattle price? Is one 50% or 20%? Can you do that analysis? Uh, Senator, I, I don't think we can. Uh, come across such a detailed uh, uh, percentage in terms of uh, each market's movement on domestic cattle price movement. Uh, we are exporting uh, beef uh, uh, to a number of markets, including Japan, Korea, the United States, and China. Uh, those are the uh, large export markets. And each market has its own inferences on their beef demand because they have domestic production yeah. and they also import from other sources. So it will be very difficult for us to single out a specific percentage in terms of a domestic uh, cattle price movements yeah. to specific markets. Yeah. Not to mention, we are also facing variable seasonal conditions by region, so it would be uh, difficult to uh, come up with uh, such analysis. Um, well, what's the implications for the strength of the dollar and our export capacity? I mean, that's a, isn't that another area? Of course, that... Uh, if I've high, missed any, I want to know them all, thanks. You know, the, the yes, uh, we have done some uh, analysis that uh, in aggregate, 
a sustained appreciation of Australian dollars against the US dollars for a period of 12 months, we estimate that will have an adverse impact on our agricultural exports by around 350 million, assuming other factors remain unchanged. So $350 million impact? Yes, on okay. export but, value. So that's dollar appreciation? That's right. So it will reduce yeah. our export earnings. And, and where yeah, do you... Well, so I, I, I'm happy for you to have a go, but I'm, I'm trying to follow well, a line of questioning. So, so I'm, just, I'm not trying to be rude or interrupt you, and I just want to know, well, just the did, dollar goes yeah. up two cents, what effects that have on the cattle price of exports? Sorry, I wasn't trying to be rude no, sorry, or anything. Sorry, okay. Okay. Go sorry. ahead. Go on. You, you keep going, Senator Cameron. No, you, you were asking a question about... Yeah. You know, what, if, yes, if, for Senator, example, if the Australian we, we, dollar appreciated five cents against the US dollar from say 73 to 78 cents, what effect would that have on the price of cattle back here in Australia as far as export? Price? Senator, we haven't really done that kind of uh, uh, detailed analysis because there are a number of factors in play. Uh, international demand uh, is one factor, restocker demand domestically uh, is also another factor which uh, mostly subject to seasonal conditions movements. So uh, we haven't really come up with uh, uh, an estimate for appreciation of Australian dollars. What would that do to specific seller price movement? Thanks, Chair. Thanks, Doug. Um, thanks, <coughs> uh, Senator Williams. Um, so really, the strength of the dollar seasonal issues, international demand. Anything else? Those are the uh, uh, most important factors uh, for uh, sell air price movements. Of course, there are other uh, factors which uh, are relating to uh, perhaps uh, uh, a number of uh, uh, wide range issues, taxation, domestic policy, international competition, so uh, there are uh, a large number of factors that can influence uh, so, price movement. So when, when you talk about taxation and domestic policy, uh, I suppose uh, domestic policy, uh, are you talking about domestic policy in Australia or domestic policy in the countries that we export to? I mean, both uh, uh, policy changes can uh, hypothetically uh, influence uh, price movements because uh, it can influence in demand and supply and then influencing the price, but this is purely hypothetical. All right, so what are the key domestic policies that are influencing the price? Uh, we haven't really uh, looked at uh, specific policy uh, issues uh, influence uh, 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 domestic cattle markets currently. Uh, my understanding is that uh, 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 ACCC is uh, looking at uh, uh, sell air price uh, 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 operations and uh, we haven't uh, done significant uh, work to look at specific policy issues for domestic cattle price movement. Okay, so you have been asked by the, uh, the minister to provide, you, provide the minister any advice on domestic policy uh, issues and their implications for uh, uh, the cattle prices? Uh, I'm not aware uh, in my area uh, that we have done uh, such an a, a analysis, uh, but of course I'm, I'm not aware of uh, other parts of the department whether such uh, uh, request has come through. So, so when you say other parts of the department, you're talking about ABER or the department generally? Uh, both, because I'm only uh, uh, looking after agricultural commodity and trade branch. Yeah. So my understanding is relatively limited. Okay. Um, Senator, I think it'd be fair to say that there aren't any uh, policy proposals around at present that might be expected to have a material change, a material impact on the cattle market. Uh, 
it's it's going very well commercially at present, although obviously the seasonal conditions are a, uh, are a challenge. Uh, but I'm not I'm not aware that there are any policy proposals around at present that would warrant that kind of uh, that kind of work. Um, and I think. Yeah. I mean, it's, bas it's basically commercial decisions. Well, it's a com the, the market commercial decisions. market's proceeding well. There are, there are obviously yeah. some grumbles uh, and, and ongoing worries about uh, competitiveness at, in the in the um, uh, in the sale yards and elsewhere in the selling process, and that's part of the rationale for the creation of the agriculture uh, commissioner at the ACCC through the white paper process. And um, uh, already, uh, the commissioner and the ACCC have, have, have uh, commenced an inquiry into. Uh, into uh, the cattle cattle markets, um, but, but that's, that, that, that's is that about distortions in, in the the cattle markets, illegal activity? Uh, well, I'd say potential potentially uh, anti-competitive behaviour. I think that's, anti that's, that's, which is illegal. That's a concern. That's illegal. Well, activity, whether yeah. it's illegal or not is another issue, and of course that's one of the issues that the ACCC be looking at. That's, that's, that's part of the rationale for um, for uh, having this inquiry. So are you engaging with the ACCC on We this? have been, yes, yes. Is, yeah. is ABARES giving any advice on this matter? Um, they, I think the ACCC uh, is calling for submissions shortly and we'll be making, the department uh, will be making, we'll make a submission including material from ABARES. I see, so, so you, you will coordinate. Yeah. A, so ABARES will assist you in putting your submission. That's right. Yeah, right. Um, is there any big issues that you're you're, you think are uh, having an effect on the cattle price at the moment? Uh, well, I've got nothing to add to, to, to the evidence you've heard. If, if there's anti-competitive pressure that, that people are looking at through the ACCC, it usually means that the prices are being artificially inflated for profitability. Or, uh, well, it's or, the other way around, or, I think. Yeah. I'm just going to say, <laughs> or, yeah. or there is, uh, you know, because of, uh, you know, some market power uh, pushing prices down. Delusion. Uh, so what, what 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 area are you looking at? Well, that's the you know I think there have been a number of in parliamentary inquiries on this. Uh, there's all, there's been the issues had a fair bit of public attention. I might get some more in a few moments. Um, uh, and uh, that was part of the rationale for the creation of this new capacity within the ACCC. So I think uh, the government's responded to that, and provided this. Uh, uh, avenue for these issues to be to be looked at. Mm -hmm. um, so, the the international markets, um, they are that that's just a process of world demand, is it? Well, um, they they are uh, issues relating to both demand and supply, yeah. because uh, uh, of course from Australia's perspective. Uh, it's a demand issue, but uh, those export markets also have their own domestic production and they can also import from our competitors. So uh, there are uh, many other factors influence uh, demand for Australian beef exports. Yeah. And there's also factors that, that, that determine the, uh, the, 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 the stock in Australia, isn't it? Uh, there, there has been a decline in cattle stocks mm. uh, numbers in Australia, yes, uh, mainly due to adverse seasonal conditions, of Look, course. To put it in bush language, we're below... You've only mass. just got your we're backside kidding, in the seat. We're killing more than we're breeding. <sighs> and I'm going to give you one more question and then go to Senator Williams. Well, you've only just come in. You don't even I know, know but I'm aware answer. of what's been going. You've been going all the time. Don't give him a go. You don't even know that. I do. I've been no, following you. We just told you. Dobber. You bet you I want to run as well. Come on, Doug. These are not Cameron estimates, they're Senate estimates. If you want to learn Pardon? about cattle, I'll teach you, but not here. What did so you these say? are not Cameron estimates, they're called Senate oh, estimates. Yeah. Yeah. The well, time I, we're all dedicated I, to you. If, if, you don't, if you don't understand the process, this is about the opposition's I'll come back to you, Doug. Okay? You come back to me? Okay. Of course we will. Come back, right? Thanks. Thank you, Senator William. <coughs> Senator, could I just add to Dr. Penny's um, evidence that um, clearly demand and supply is very important in international markets, and the government does have an influence on some of that through uh, FTAs and as you're aware, and a number of the key markets that uh, Dr. Penn mentioned are markets where we now have free trade agreements in them. 
the department has also uh, got a role in this through our overseas councillors and uh, we've recently expanded our overseas network by five councillors and a lot of their work is to ensure that we have the protocols in place to enable trade to happen which is of uh, significant benefit to the cattle industry as well as other agricultural industries as well. So I think it's worth mentioning, if we're going to policy sort of issues, um, then uh, beyond demand and supply in, in the market, it's also how much access we've got into markets, which is critical. Sure. Back to Mr Abez, if I could, please. We're talking about the price of cattle, and you're saying demand and supply, increase in demand from overseas. I want to take to the live exports of cattle. Has there been an increase in live exports? Um, because it was not mentioned, and I believe there's been a huge increase in live exports. Could you confirm that for me, please? Answer to a question about growth in the live uh, live cattle trade, Senator. Uh, we're just checking the latest uh, agricultural commodities so publication. So while we're getting that, are there is the issue of facilitation still an issue in trade with FTAs as opposed to before for the FTAs? In other words, the fishers have got to bribe to get things done. I guess you guys would have come across it. I mean, I deal with it all the time because people own up that they've got to bribe people to get a container off the wharf at wherever. I think the, um, the important point to make is if there's any facilitation known of, then it needs to be reported to appropriate authorities. But having said that, the lower the tariff is, the less incentive there is for uh, you know that sort of behaviour. Because these occur. guys don't want to lose their trade, so they're happy to. Yeah. And if we if we have access into uh, certain countries, so uh, let's say China, uh, then it actually and we have very good access into that market and there's direct trade into that market, again, that reduces the incentive for uh, It's got behavior. better into China. You know, it used to be all the agents in Hong Kong and you had to pay them and they had to pay someone in, yeah. But that, that's got a lot better. <laughs> How are you going there with the... Yes. Uh, Senator, uh, if we look at the uh, financial year, 2014-15 oh, uh, right. yeah. as a whole, oh, yeah. The uh, number of uh, live feeder slaughter cattle exports increased to around uh, 1.3 million hectares. 1.3 million in the year 14-15 financial yes. year. Live now export. we are forecasting that uh, uh, in current financial year, the uh, uh, number of uh, live cattle exports will decline. Uh, to about 1.17 million hectares. 200,000 reduction in this current financial year, your forecast? What is that of, of live? Of live, live export. Could I just ask a question? Go for it. It? So there is just now beginning, and especially with the free trade agreement, the export, <coughs> it's early, of sides of cattle to be broken up up there. Would that be affecting the live export? Are you familiar with the sides that it's only just started exporting, you know, skin them and gut them and send the, the body up there to be broken up? Are you familiar with that? Um, no, Senator. Isn't the economist that make you sick? <laughs> <laughs> That's right, yeah. Yes. As a joke. As a joke. <laughs> Senator, I think, the, I think the, the, that change is mainly driven by our assumptions about improved seasonal conditions and herd rebuilding. I'll have to ring you back. Well, no, the, the point the Chair makes is very valid because I know abattoirs are setting up to have the bodies slaughtered here, the beasts slaughtered here and the bodies broken down, broken up and packed overseas. Mm. Has Abares had any look at that sort of issue that the Chair makes? <clears throat> Senator, from my understanding, that's still at the early stage. We are preparing our uh, June quarter forecast and 
uh, of course, that uh, uh, with given information that we will uh, looking at those issues. But uh, that, uh, in, in, in my understanding, then that if, if it turns into beef, then it will be counted as beef exports and not live exports. Right. So yeah. it's really both yes. beef exports and live cattle exports that we have to look at. Yes, yeah, I'm well aware if they've been broken down or carcass sent over there, they're not still alive. I'm very well aware of that. <laughs> Um, <laughs> looking at these live exports, because I was quite amazed when Senator Cameron asked you the question about what is driving the price. You know, we had the live export ban in a previous government, which had a devastating effect on the price of cattle in Australia. That all be slaughtered here and are transported literally thousands of kilometres to abattoirs. I know from the top of Western Australia to Inverell, where I live, thousands of kilometres. Since then, of course, Indonesia was very uh, disgruntled with our decision, or the government's decision at the time. The live exports have continued to grow into Indonesia, is that correct? Uh, Since the banning, I mean, because... It, of course, yeah, yes. Could, could you tell me how much I've grown over the last three years? Someone behind you is coming to give you some information, I think. Yeah, thank you. Yes, Senator. Uh, live exports... Uh, to Indonesia uh, has been uh, increasing from 2012-13 uh, uh, from uh, 292 to 339 around uh, in 2014-15. What's your forecast for 15-16? Uh, to Indonesia, you're going from 292 and 12-13 to 3.39 in 14.15. What's expe expected for 15.16 and 16.17 in your forecast, please? In our <coughs> forecasting exercise, we uh, don't really break down or we'll publish our uh, live cattle numbers by country. But I do have uh, uh, information here. Give uh, year to day uh, uh, in 2015-16 uh, to around uh, 430,000 uh, head. So year to date, and we've still got basically May and June to go. It's almost doubled since 12:13, which is good news. And obviously, that's back to Senator Cameron's question. That clearly has an upward pressure. Has upward pressure on the price of cattle when we've got increased live exports. Correct? You being the economist. Sorry, I didn't catch the, the last okay. bit. Okay. Senator Cameron asked you about what's driving the price of beef upwards. You said the exchange rate, the overseas demand, etc. But you did not mention live exports. We're seeing an increase in live exports, almost doubling in two years to Indonesia alone. I said, surely that helps drive the price of cattle up at the farm gate as well. That's international demand. In, in, in the sense that uh, live cattle trade is a relatively small uh, component of the whole beef trade. So, of course, it will have a regional impact, especially for those uh, uh, regions concentrating in live cattle exports. But in other regions, perhaps uh, a bigger influence will be from uh, international demand for beef. So, uh, I, I think that the, the, the quest, uh, your question uh, the answer to your question perhaps needs to a little bit uh, uh, qualification. Well, I would have thought 1.3 million a head of cattle a year exported live would be a pretty substantial amount it, of It is for Northern Australia and for the regions yeah. that many uh, uh, engage in live cattle trade, but uh, there are also regions in Southern Australia that uh, live cattle trade may be relatively uh, 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 less important. Of course. Yeah. And AB is forecast for the future of, in summary, for the future of the beef industry and prices. What are you predicting? We are forecasting uh, soya prices uh, uh, will remain relatively strong, but uh, depending on seasonal conditions, mm -hmm. if seasonal conditions uh, improve, then uh, there will be strong restocker demand, then that will provide support to sell our prices. But if uh, seasonal conditions turn out to be less favorable, 
then there could be a, a continued strong turn off, then that can put some uh, downward pressure on soya prices. Yeah. And in summary, because we are sure it's break for lunch soon, been a big increase of live exports to Vietnam, and I think about seven countries in total. Is that correct? And that would also yes. be driving the demand and hopefully holding the price up to where they are. Yes. Because they've been terrible for many, many years and very depressed. And uh, so you're saying the future ex extra exports into um, Vietnam and many other countries, you're confident the market will hold about where it is, fluctuating depending on seasonal conditions. Is that your yeah. summary? Uh, n not uh, precisely. The seasonal conditions will determine on the supply side yes. and the demand from well, Vietnam. Not only that, but even when it does uh, rain, it still takes a long time to breed the herd up. You've got a nine month gestation period for a cow, for yes. another 12 months till they're ready for some slaughter. So you're looking at almost two years. Precisely. Uh, that's the reason why we think in the short term, the cattle herd number may still under pressure yeah. or continue to decline, and it will take a, a few years uh, for cattle numbers uh, yeah, to increase right. if seasonal conditions turn out to be supportive. Yeah. Thanks, Chair. Thank you. We'll knock off and be back at two. Uh, Chair, just before we do that, um, two things. Um, I've got uh, white paper um, FTE numbers, Senator, for uh, all of our various programs, which I can table and provide to you. And then can I check where we are in the program? Because you we probably know better than me, mate. We, we, might, we might have got to the end of outcome one or we might not have, but uh, no, if, if we have, have... No, I think we haven't. Okay. Senator Stella wants to come okay. back. Yeah. Okay. This is a bit uneven, isn't it? This is a bit uneven. One, one versus. All right, thank you very much, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, are we all right up there behind the panel? Did you have a nice lunch? Thank you. Um, and in resumption, Senator Cameron. After EBA. Thank you, Mr. Penn. Um, now, I think we, we left it, we were sort of trying to get an idea on the issues that affected the cattle price. And we went through a lot, and I won't go through them again. But um, you're, you are the major research capacity for the agricultural department, <coughs> aren't you? We are the research bureau of the department. The research bureau. Um, so one of the issues that hasn't been, you've mentioned seasonal issues. Uh, what about climatic issues? We do take account of climatic issues in our um, commodity forecasts, Senator. Okay, well, nobody mentioned that. Can you just... 
Uh, yes, the senator. Um, <coughs> so, is it, is it so? Is it such a small issue you didn't need to mention it? Oh, we do. Uh, in our quarterly forecasting report, uh, we put in boxes uh, talking about uh, the seasonal outlook, and also we produce a quarterly report. Uh, named the Australian Co-op Report, yeah. uh, we have uh, extensive discussion on seasonal conditions, soil moisture profiles, uh, and uh, uh, other seasonal condition issues that uh, will affect uh, crop prospects. Okay, so um, you used to have your own dedicated climate change department, didn't you, within ABARES? We did have a section, uh, or at one time perhaps a branch, that dealt with climate change issues. Okay. Um, how many people were in that branch? I can't tell, can't tell you that off top without, going, without looking for the details. So, so is that branch no longer exists? We don't have a branch that deals with climate change issues, but we do deal with climate change issues in the context of other work. Okay, um, so do you have, so were there specialists in this branch? There were economists in that branch. Um, environmental economists? Not specifically environmental economists. I'm sorry, I'm, I'm speaking about a time when I wasn't there. Uh, so Who I was there? Is there any senior officers there that, that can tell me this? So I'd rather you don't guess. So there were some um, general equilibrium modelling experts? Yeah. Um, that would have been the main economic specialty, and then um, there would have been some um, some scientists in the um, in the branch as well. You don't have many scientists. No, I wouldn't. Okay. I wouldn't have um, So that capacity to provide that information were these people just disseminated through the uh, through a bears, or were they made redundant? So, well, as, as the, a, a lot of the, the previous work program was around um, describing the impact of different um, mitigation policies, global mitigation policies on uh, minerals and energy and agriculture sectors. And as the um, responsibility for undertaking that work shifted from uh, this to, well, went to the Treasury and other departments, uh, those people followed that work. So where do you get your specific expert advice on climate change issues from? From CSIRO and the Bureau of MET. From CSIRO. Okay, do you have a contract with CSIRO to provide that? No, not a specific contract. We look at what they're doing. We have um, you know, contacts within CSIRO, so we're after a particular thing. We know we know who to talk to. Well, who pays for this advice? The CSIRO do it. They just, just because they will provide they like us you with guys. What, if, hmm? if it's available, they'll provide us with what yeah. we're after. But what, what if you want to do some analysis? Some on, um, on, specific on, analysis. Yeah. Well, depending on what it is, we will we will purchase um, data or, or advice. So at the moment we're in the process of, uh, not from CSIRO, but from University of Queensland, purchasing some, some data so that we can do some, some analysis. So right. that's not a, sort of un, that's not unusual. So that analysis, is that on the basis of the carrying capacity of the agricultural industry uh, or the cattle industry? Or what, what is this? What are you asking for? So the, the, the particular data we're after at the moment is to do with um, how... Um, Pasture, it's model data, so how pasture, how pasture growth has changed in different, across the country yeah. um, from 1901 up to the present day. So there's models that allow them to tell us how yeah. things have changed and we're getting access to do that so we can do yeah. some analysis. So that's the history. What are you doing to look forward in terms of climate change issues? Well, looking forward, we'd be relying on, on the work that's published. It'd be fair to say we're going to event-based pasture. We've been through this before from Dwarganock Clover, you know, which was an annual or barley grass or whatever. And the biggest thing now in runoff with better yeah, event-based pastures is, is the fact that you can't right. get the runoff for the ground tanks. Okay, so, um, so I, 
Are you aware that um, the retiring head of the, the Bureau of Meteorology uh, said that Australia faces a perilous water security future? I haven't read that in particular, but okay, I Okay, so Hebert, who in Hebert has dealt with this issue? Here's, here is the former head of the, of the Bureau of Meteorology saying we face perilous water supply issues. So who within ABA has dealt with this? So we, we have an area that's looking at um, climate and water issues at the moment because we think that that's an important thing to be looking at. So we have a program of work there. Um, I um, can't say I've you know, read what Rob Tessie has said, but um, it's no doubt that we think that uh, well, see, I'm, These I'm, issues are worth I'm a bit amazed by that because what he said was that water shortage is a problem. Climate change is going to intensify the drought and flood cycle. Uh, noting that water demand is increasing and Australia faces a really perilous water security challenge in the future. That's fun isn't that fundamental to the agricultural industry and the carrying capacity and the productive capacity of our agricultural industry? Fundamental, surely. Is well, and, and, and what I'm saying is we we have a work program at the moment that's looking at some of those issues. And what, what, okay. Okay. Oh. Sorry, Doug, but we know that. I'm a farmer. The prediction by 2040, to be doing that in 45, is a 15% decline in runoff in the Surrey-Murray-Darling yeah. Basin, 6.2% of Australia's runoff, which will relate to a 35% decline in runoff from 15% decline in rainfall. We're now increasing rainfall in an anticlockwise direction around the north, we know all that stuff. There's no great mystery. We live with it, and that's why we're changing our farming practices. OK, now, uh, well, with that little homily, um, in, terms of, in terms of what you're, you're doing for the future, we've had this warning, uh, as Senator Heffernan says, we know that there are problems. Um, has that been factored in to any of the analysis, analysis, Mr Penn, on the price for agricultural produce within Australia? and as a long-term analysis? Senator, um, we don't really do a very long-term price projections. What the uh, ABIA does uh, for commodity forecasting uh, is that uh, 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 in March issue of our forecasting report, we produce five years uh, projections. And in the rest of the three quarters of the year, we produce forecasts uh, for 12 to uh, 18 months uh, horizons. So uh, climate change That's is, seasonal, isn't it? That's right. That's the reason why- So you don't my, do any climate change analysis? Uh, not in my function. Right. Uh, we are uh, more focused on climate variabilities yeah. and seasonal outlook rely on yeah. information provided by Bureau of Meteorology. Okay, and that, that's the short term, that's the seasonal yes. changes. Yes. So the implications that, that, that Senator Heffer and I are talking about, those longer term implications, uh, no one's doing any work about, the, about what that means for the industry. We are doing longer term work, Senator. We're doing a, um, a, a piece of work on, uh, that looks at the links between farm productivity and climate change. Uh, that will that is looking at longer term. So, what's the? Can you provide details of uh, what what exactly that is doing? When is it going to report? What, do you know when it's reporting? Um, when? Well, it's a, it's a work in progress. How many people are engaged on it? It's probably three people engaged on it. Three people. Um, so, if you can tell me what the terms of reference are for this project. Uh, what you, when the report will be available and um, any progre up progress on where it's up to. Yeah, that should be, be okay. Yep. Thanks, Chair. Um, any further questions on this section? No? So where do we move to next? Uh, so, no, sorry, sorry. sorry, sorry. I'm so sorry. I'm for Abares. You're right. Okay. For Abares, okay. Mr. Gaday, uh, you said you're doing a survey when Senator Cameron was talking oh, yep. about yep. the impacts probably of a backpack attacks. Yeah. How many surveys have gone out, or how many? So the, the many surveys are in the field at the moment. They're face-to-face -face interviews. So we're interviewing 
300 vegetable growers and we're interviewing um, horticulture and cotton growers as well as part of this and there's about 300 of those as well. Can I just put it on the record and declare an interest while I'm doing it that I had a phone call during the lunch break from an abattoir which has contracts into the United States and Singapore and other places who said without a doubt this is the boss man talking to me they will shut if they lose their backpacker workforce. And that is a critical abattoir. So you've got 300 veggie growers and 300 horticulture mm. and cotton, did you say? Yep. yep. And they're face to face. Mm. So yep. how long have you been out in the field, or your office has So been it would have started field? in March and it will finish later this month. March and finish later this month. So mm. out of how many people could be affected? Do you have any figures of how many? Um, Families or companies or individuals that would be affected should this, uh, no, this so tax hit? At, at the moment, we haven't seen any of the data that we saw about 50,000. I, I think are employed, but we don't. Know. We don't yeah, know. No, so I'm just asking you. Sorry, I mean you're, you're interviewing about 600, and I just want to know how many industry, how many businesses or families or individuals could be affected by this this tax. I think it's a lot more than 600. I've worked out, but yeah, I couldn't. I couldn't tell you that at the moment. Okay, and it's been out. You just need to know, and this committee works this way, this is going to bugger the bush. I mean, the workforce, we can't get Darrows off ice in country towns anymore, and we can't get them fit to go to work, and we pay them too much to stay in bed. This is, I get it from all over, and I live it, and I declare an interest. We are going to go topsy-turvy in the bush. And, and, and the government, I don't give a rat's ass how hard we have to be. We've right, got to sort it. Hey? The road is backside. Yeah, 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 right. So at the end of this month, you hope to have all that information collated, is that right? The data collection will finish at the end of this month, and then we'll have to clean the data and analyse it. And, and how long will that take? We would hope to be having some preliminary results in um, July or August, and we were intending to have a, a final report written up towards the end of the year. Towards the end of towards the end of the year, of August. No, the I'm sorry, I can't. October, November. Oh no, not October, November. Yeah. Okie doke. Can you tell us how much it's cost to do this, or how much it will eventually end up costing? Um, well, it's done as a as an adjunct to our standard survey, so um, I haven't got the costings for the for the supplementary survey. So, so some other surveys missed out. No, so it's, it's, done on the, it's done on the back of a much larger survey that I mean, this we run is important, yes. every year. So, you uh, can't tell us how much. It sounds like a small incremental cost, yes. Senator, if you think of it that way. 600 face to face. Yeah. Oh, yeah, okay. Well, we're, we're interviewing them anyway, so. <laughs> it doesn't sound like it's in. Yeah, yeah. You don't have to go around interviewing them. I, yeah. I can tell you, mate, save you going around. It's going to bugger the whole job. I mean, save your money and fix the problem. I mean, just, this, is, yeah. this, is, this is a strategic error by government. I don't care who the government is and who supports it and who doesn't. The impact of this, we can't get people to work on farms, pick prunes, whatever, in the bush. And the people that do it through the 417 thing enjoy doing it, they enjoy the experience, and they're no trouble. And, and, and like, if we can pay, and I can take you to towns where there'd be a hundred people in a reasonably small town who are getting around and getting a disability pension are no more disabled than me. And, you know, except in the head. I'm pretty disabled in the head. So, okay. I'm but it's a serious, serious problem that really doesn't need to be That's academically credentialed. No, no, no. Services or DHS. No, no. I'm, it's an issue for the government, mate. I'm sending a message yeah. to you know who. And this is what well, I just want to wrap up on this. The, the NFF have come out and they've got 31,000 signatures. It's not for me to tell you how to waste or spend parts of your budget, but I just think this is an absolute fair for your survey there, for the greatest respect on this issue. We don't need a survey, anyway. we need to fix it. Okay, um, right, Doug, what do you want now? I'm finished with uh, A beers, but can I just indicate? Um, that if I'm still on this committee after the next parliament, <laughs> um, uh, I would be requiring a bears to attend for every estimates. Um, it's an important area, and I don't think we've gone anywhere near 
uh, dealing with the key issues that A bear should bring to bear to estimates. So just place that on record. Yeah, well, I think it's fair to say though that probably more than the awareness in this building, that, that and I won't name the individuals out there that are doing research like Bernard Hart, etc. cetera, um, but farmers are acutely aware of what's ahead of us mm -hmm. and the changing weather patterns and the fact that we can grow a crop with zero tillage in lower rainfall areas, and I've just had experience myself where we sprayed out some, some, some area, we let stock on other areas, we were able to get the crop up where we sprayed out. We haven't got the crop up where we had the stock. All that's, we're acutely aware of the changing, um, and that's, you know, basically it works from the research up through the farm organisations and LinkedIn and all the rest of it. So, uh, yeah, we're onto it. Well, just before you go, can I also just on, on notice, could you provide uh, details uh, of your expenditure on climate change associated research? Uh, within A bears since uh, 2007 through to now. We'll take that on notice. Then. Yeah, that's what I've asked you. I said put it on notice. Yeah. That's thanks. Where are we going, Doug? Uh, we're going to. I want to go back to um, the. Uh, they go back. Oh, well, no, it's, we. It's departmental. We're in. We're in. Uh, outcome one. Uh, I was told that we had to deal with. Uh, the APVME issues oh, yeah. in outcome one, so that's where I want to go to. Who's? Yep, that's us. Mr. That's Morris, you again. Okay. Now, you know, I was asking questions uh, about APVME. Um, do you know how much the department has expended uh, so far on? Uh, this issue of relocation, what resources you have put to the relocation issues, uh, both in terms of uh, number of personnel, hours involved, and the cost to the department? I would hazard a guess, and Ms Freeman might want to add to this, is it's part of our normal business in, in a lot of ways, and so to actually, it's not a project per se, and to actually disaggregate numbers out of say Ms Freeman's division and say this element was for this purpose and this element was for another purpose would be quite difficult and uh, certainly it's not being run as a project at the moment. So is it just the, difficult or you just don't know? Well, we so don't, there's so a difference, it's isn't difficult it? in the sense that if we were to go back and try and recreate all the you know, effort and, and try and allocate people's times to it, it would be um, extremely difficult and time consuming to try and do that. Um, has there been any individual working on this continuously? Uh, uh, no, it's been a range of individuals, Senator. So a range of individuals, is there a team looking at it uh, at times? Uh, there's a, there's a, a team that has a number of responsibilities, including this. Okay. Does that team report in terms of what it does? And how, you know, do, do they log the issues that they deal with or not? Not, not in a sort of project accounting sense, uh, Senator, but they, they have a range of responsibilities that they spread the time and resources are, are spread across. So what if you wanted to make an analysis of the effectiveness or otherwise of that team, how do you do it? Um, take their word for it? Uh, sorry, I beg You just take their word for it? You've got, no, you've got no management tool that you can go and they spend X amount on this, that or the other? Well, there's a range of responsibilities that they are, um, the division is responsible for, of which uh, this is a matter um, the government is looking at, and we have the team that sits within Agricultural Productivity Di Policy Division uh, is responsible for. So there's resources across the division that do a range of things, and this is yeah. but one of many. Senator. Yeah, but one of many. You, so it's a, is it a small issue for you? Uh, it varies from time to time. OK, so it can be a big issue for you at times. Okay, now this this uh, independent independent analysis that uh, is that, is, that what, is this co is that cost benefit analysis that's being done. Okay. Right, yep. yep. Now it's supposed to be an independent cost benefit analysis. Uh, who has the, who has determined the uh, terms of reference? Ultimately, it's uh, the department and the minister uh, developed the terms of reference for the for the review. Okay, so on the terms of reference, um, it's the minister and the department. Um, 
So, have you provided advice to the Minister on terms of reference? We did. Okay. Um, have those terms of reference changed? Uh, so, if I, if I may, Senator, so uh, terms of reference were um, the scope of the review was uh, uh, undertook a lot of consultation with a range of stakeholders, um, and they included the APVMA, the National Farmers Federation, Crop Life Australia, the New South Wales Farmers Association, Animal Medicines Australia, Accord Australasia, Plastics and Chemicals Industries Association, the Veterinary Manufacturers and Distributors Association the New South Wales Department of Primary Industries and the University of England were New specifically, England. Uh, sorry, New England, I beg your pardon, were specifically commented. Uh, Consulted? Viewed, they, they were, yes. And, and, and was that this unit that did the consultation within the, the department? Uh, yes, the, the relevant area in my division uh, facilitated okay. that consultation and that advice was also provided. So was a consultation them. done like over a set period of time or has it been... Well, how, how long has that, that done? Oh, I, I, would ha I would have to check, um, Senator, but there was a range of, uh, in terms of the scope of the review, uh, uh, from memory, the department sort of, uh, in consultation with the Minister's office, uh, came up with a, with a scope of the review. Those bodies were consulted with. Uh, that feedback was provided uh, to the Minister's office, and then the, the uh, terms of reference for the review so was can settled. You, can you just explain to me how this could be independent, given the Minister has got this obsession about uh, moving these organisations to uh, uh, various areas. Where's APVMA going to again? Armadale. 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 No decisions. Sorry? No decisions. Yes. No so made, the, the two areas was Armadale and Double? Yeah, yeah. No. Uh, was that right? Uh, so some time ago there was uh, Armadale and Toowoomba was mooted in terms of the... I can't hear for all this. Yeah. So, you know you don't. Yeah. So, so Ms. Freeman, so maybe this, can, can you tell me? Uh, yes, at, at one stage it was debated um, Armadale or Toowoomba. Yeah. Uh, for the purposes of this exercise, it's Armadale. Yeah. It's Armadale. Yes. So, given that's the that's in the uh, Deputy Prime Minister's electorate, uh, given it has been the, uh, the 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 key one of the key issues that the, the, the Deputy Prime Minister has promoted. Uh, to get this uh, agency moved to Armadale. Now that he is Deputy Prime Minister and still in charge of this area, and his, he, his office and the, Pri and, the, and the Deputy Prime Minister himself have an input into the terms of reference, can you explain what was done to ensure that this could, in any way possible, be an independent terms of reference and an independent analysis? How was that done? I think is, is what you're saying. So the uh, the condition is that the analysis is done independent of that, and, and that is what is happening. But now. the analysis is done on the terms of reference coming out of the minister out of the minister's office, isn't that right? In consultation with a broad range of stakeholders. No, the minister has got the final call, hasn't he? Of course, Senator, because the yeah, that's um, right. Yeah. Well, the, so the, that, the, that, the study, that's you've answered the question. Yeah, but the study so, is being done within this department. Yeah. Um, of course, but the, the, minister the head has minister got a of this department interest. has the opportunity to determine the terms of reference, and the, the, we've the, now the, provided those terms yeah. of reference to the independent consultant to actually do the research. Was there any advice from the department in relation to conflict of interest to the minister on this issue? I'm not sure what the conflict of interest the would be, the, minister, is. The, the conflict is the minister's pet project. The minister is trying to, to move an agency that doesn't want to move, who thinks it could destroy the agency. The minister wants to move it to his own electorate. Mm. And uh, you're trying to tell me there's no conflict of interest. Uh, well, I, I, the minister uh, obviously has determined the proposition that's in the terms of reference to be examined by the study. That's right. But he won't be uh, determining the nature of the analysis and the assessment of those costs and benefits in the study. And that's what we'll be the crucial thing but for Mr. the Quinlan, final decision. Mr Quinlan, you've been around long enough. You don't become a secretary of a department uh, in the Commonwealth of Australia without understanding conflict of interest issues. And there is clearly a conflict of interest in the minister who, who has this as a pet project, mm. trying to move it into his own electorate for electoral gain, uh, setting the terms of reference for the so-called 
independent study. It just cannot be real. But it's I'm, a I'm, joke, I'm, isn't it? I'm making a distinction between the proposition that's to be assessed and the actual assessment of that yeah. proposition. And I think you're uh, trying to say they're the same thing, and I can't quite see how that well, could be the case unless you don't have well, any... Well, Mr Quinn Levin, with the greatest respect, mm. if you can't see the potential for conflict of interest in this... You need to go back and get some high-level training on conflict of interest issues because this is a big problem. The minister is establishing the terms of reference. The minister stands to gain politically because of this. It's the minister's pet project. He sets the terms of reference. It's almost Bejelke peterson esque you know? Another perspective to this. Um, this is a bit of a trap for coalition governments, and Isn't I'm sorry, sorry to do this, it's bizarre. sorry to do it's this, bizarre. but sorry. in Victoria, and I won't mention the seat, I mean, there was a lot of public servants moved to a regional centre, and the seat became marginal because a lot of the people that got moved belong to the other side of politics. It doesn't necessarily have a, tack, a, a, a political advantage to move a department anywhere. They all, might all hate your guts. Um, I mean, the minister's made his mind up on this. If you go to uh, an article uh, on, the, uh, on the 24th uh, of November, uh, it's on, an online article, uh, the minister says, uh, he says there's a reluctance to leave Canberra. Well, we saw that from the chief executive. They don't want to move. They think it could destroy the organisation. But the minister's saying, said that he, uh, he said, I, I, I can understand that, but we've got to drive through with the program. So I'll continue to fight for its relocation. So this is the guy, this is the minister, this is the deputy prime minister, clearly indicating his bias on the issue, who is determining the terms of reference for the so-called independent inquiry. It just doesn't make any sense, does it, Mr Quinlivan? Are you satisfied that this can be done in, a, in, a, in an unbiased manner when the minister has basically publicly made his mind up? Could I just uh, give some guidance to the, uh, this process? Mr Quinlivan, I wouldn't have to remind you that you do not have to respond with an opinion. But he wanted to. Yeah, well, I wasn't going to offer an opinion. I was just going to offer a statement of fact, which is that the minister won't be involved in the assessment of the costs and benefits. But yeah, Mr. Quinn Levin, again, <laughs> again, I've got to say it to you. Again, I've got to say it to you. I don't want to accuse you of being naive. I wouldn't do that. But certainly, any prime, any deputy prime minister who is setting the terms of reference for a pet project, you know what the outcome is. No, I don't. You know what the outcome no, I don't. is. Yes, you do. No, I don't. And I just think it's an absolute disgrace. An absolute disgrace. So can you table the terms of reference? Yes. I yes. think we can do that, yes. OK. So uh, table those terms of reference. Where, uh, how much is it going to cost for this uh, in the so-called independent analysis? I think we do have a figure or an yep. estimate, yep. at least. Uh, Two hundred seventy-two thousand dollars. Sorry, roughly two hundred seventy-two thousand dollars. Another two hundred, another quarter, over a quarter of a million of public money for for uh, uh, Minister Joyce's pet project, on top of the cost of the part of individual units uh, working on this. This is an absolute disgrace. Now I understand, Mr. Quinn Levin, your reluctance. Uh, to, to actually take this up uh, in a strong way, because we know what happened to the last secretary that stood up to this minister. But I reckon um, this is I, utter, I utterly disgraceful. Utterly disgraceful. Pause you there. Um, I have to say that I, I won't ask you to withdraw, because you won't withdraw, but to cast an aspersion on, on I take it you're referring to Dr Grimes, um, you would need to be aware of how close to the edge of the ice rink you are and the real issues behind that. And if I were you, I wouldn't go there. Well, if I need your, your advice, I'll ask for it. But anyway, um, so we've got the terms of reference. Can we have a look at those terms of reference? Yes, I've just handed them. Just getting them now. Um, so, so 260 odd thousand. 70 odd thousand. 270 odd thousand uh, for this uh, pet project. Um, has the, has the authority 
uh, had discussions with the department about the implications of this move? Yes. 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 So they've raised, I assume they've raised similar issues with the department that they've raised here, that it could end up they have to rebuild the, apart the department. Is that right? Well, we've received the same advice from the authority as the minister has, the yeah. uh, advice that uh, um, Ms. Arthur referred to earlier today. And that was that there's a potential they'd have to rebuild the whole department? That was her advice. Uh, sorry? That was her advice. That's the advice. So if you have to rebuild the whole department because the minister's got a pet project and there's probably a million dollars getting spent on this pet project now, um, what, what does... Uh, have you actually analysed um, internally in the department the implications of this? Why do you need to spend $270,000 to simply come to a common sense decision that this should not happen based on the advice of the chief executive who said that it would destroy the authority? Uh, because the government has asked for the advice, Senator. Just because, because the government has asked for the advice. So, yeah. All right, I don't know if I can ask much more on this uh, crazy proposition. Yeah, just in relation to APVMA, a couple of things. Shifting it to Armadale, do you have to buy or do you rent premises up there for the APVMA? What's the plan? Well, that's really a question for the uh, APVMA. We wouldn't be dictating to them how they uh, manage the property transaction. Right. So I'm just thinking the rents would be surely cheaper in Armadale than Canberra, wouldn't well, they? Well, all of those kind of issues would be taken into account in, in this, <laughs> yeah. this cost-benefit yeah. analysis. Savings in them, yeah. yeah. Um, Cheap rents, but no scientists. What a, what a joke. We didn't waste that money on building education revolution. We could build your new premises for all departments right around the nation, probably. Well, I just want to take you back to this. Back in March, the Shadow Agriculture Minister, Joel Fitzgibbon, was negative about Armadale being the home of the APVMA, Mr Cremant. He claimed there wouldn't be enough professionals in Armadale capable of supporting the operations of the APVMA. He also suggested there might be only one flight a day to Armadale. He's not claiming that. It's the executive. Excuse me, you've had the, the call. It's my executive. call. Chair, can you... Uh, thank you. Thank you. He also suggested there might be only one flight a day to Armadale. A uh, local member, Adam Marshall, fired back about his negativity and invited him to Armadale to, so he could learn the truth. I mean, we have had five flights a day to Armadale. Does the APVMA believe Armadale is the backwater Mr Fitzgibbon is suggesting? Uh, well, Mr. Morris, Mr. question to the APVMA, but those, those issues of fact about the kind of services that would be available to an organisation located there will, will, be, will be looked at in when the study. When do we get the APVMA, Chair? They've been and gone. Been and gone. Sorry, I was tied up this morning. Yeah. That is a pity. What have you got? You penny? Uh, well, just I won't go under the Khaleesi, Khaleesi virus to be released soon because uh, we missed out, but never mind. Yep. Uh, well, can I just, uh, on, on this, still on uh, this issue, um, uh, the tender for the consultant, has that been let? Yeah, yes, it has, sir. Uh, is this an open tender? Uh, no, we went off the uh, panel from the consultancy and uh, business services panel. That was established through an open tender process from the then Australian Customs and Border Protection Service. Second and who uh, uh, has, has the tender been awarded? Yes, it has, Senator. Uh, who has the, who's, who's won the tender? Uh, Ernst & Young, yeah. <coughs> Ernst & Young. Ernst & Young? Yes, sir. OK. Um, OK, well, let's see what Ernst & Young come up with. Great. And I've got to say, um, this will be something we'll be very interested in, $270,000, just to please the minister for his pet project. This should not go ahead, I want to make it clear, from our point of view, this is a nonsense. The chief executive doesn't want it to happen. They say it could destroy the agency. This is a pet project gone wrong. It's bizarre. Thanks, Chair. Chair, okay. Chair just on this then. The cost-benefit risk analysis, when will it be reported from Ernst & Young? Uh, due in uh, early June, Senator. Early June. And now a look at the analysis should consider the cost, benefits and risk of the APVMA moving from Canberra to Armadale compared to the APVMA remaining in Canberra as part of the terms of reference, correct? 
Yep. Yes, correct. So we'll look at those costs and we'll get those answers, no doubt. Thanks, Chair. Right, uh, so Doug, where do you want to go next? Uh, I think uh, next uh, we should, um, let me see, what's the list? Go home or? Uh, not quite yet. Uh, I, I can tell you I'll be gone by five to three, okay? Three um, fifteen. So, okay, if you VM it. Concessional loans, is that here? Yep. Okay, um, uh, Doug, will you send a cheerio to Joel for me? Mm hmm? Sorry? Send a cheerio to Joel. Okay. Joel, are you out there? He's just um, been kicked out of Parliament, so he's probably got plenty of time. Did he get kicked out? Did he? <laughs> ah, playing up like a second hand Victor Lawmar, eh? Right? to tune back in. Are we still in okay. corporate matters time? Well, I don't know, don't know where this lot are, but I'm trying to, yeah. Outcome one. No, outcome one we're in. Yeah, I thought we moved on. Outcome one. Outcome one. So. Can you give me an update on two. any outcomes uh, that the department has undertaken or, or delivered since the ANAO's recommendation about the failures in concessional loans? Um, maybe I'll start off, Senator, and then uh, hand over to Mr Williamson, who will uh, talk about the um, ANAO report which uh, we think uh, overall was um, <coughs> raised a number of issues which we accepted, uh, indicated that we were making good progress in terms of um, the... Um, so, I, so the, Mr Boss, I just cannot hear you. I don't know why, but I just cannot hear you. Do you want me to speak a bit closer to please, the... Please, please. Yeah. Yeah. Sorry. Uh, can, you, can you guys... I can't hear. I really we're just, having a laugh. Yeah. Well, I know you're having a laugh, but I'm trying to get some... Go on, have a know. That's it. I'll... I'll try and enunciate a bit more clearly no, for I, you. I don't think it's, <laughs> now there's quietness, I think it's all OK. <laughs> Thanks, Mr Morris. OK. Uh, I think what I was just saying was that um, uh, the ANAO report did recognise that uh, we'd run a number of programmes and that over the course of those programmes there had been a number of improvements already made. The report itself was uh, published on the 28th of uh, April and uh, there were four recommendations made in it and um, you can read in the ANA report itself that we accepted um, all of those recommendations either in full or, or in part and um, we're uh, in the process of, of uh, implementing the parts of those recommendations that we hadn't already done because we had already made some progress on, on some of those. Would you like us to go into the detail of each of those recommendations or...? Yeah, um, um, well, if you could be as concise as a public servant can be, Mr Morris, uh, in terms of, because I've got limited time, and, and I, I don't say that in a critical way because we need, we need the information. So what was the key uh, recommendation? Go to that one first. So you've, you've accepted three and one you've partially accepted? Correct. So what's the partially accepted one? Just tell me what that was. Um, I'll just see if I can pull that one up. So the one we uh, accepted in part was uh, recommendation number four, uh, three, sorry, which was um, to underpin robust governance arrangements for the concessional loan programs. The ANAO recommends the Department of Agriculture and Water Resources review and validate information reported by jurisdictions to ensure that it is complete and accurate. Um, and so in terms of uh, the response to that, which you can read in um, in the ANA report itself, um, we said that we would continue to review the loan portfolio, uh, financial and key performance indicators and default information provided to it by all the jurisdictions on a monthly basis and as part of the formal six monthly review process. Um, we're also going to continue to work with jurisdictions to confirm that reporting is complete and verified against historical data as required. Um, we have systems in place to receive and verify incoming monthly data against historical data and we're doing a, a lot of checking in terms of making sure uh, if there's any apparent uh, concerns with that data that we go back to the um, providers to make sure that everything's clear. Um, we are developing an automated database for collecting and storing of reporting of the information from jurisdiction to make it easier for us to um, 
uh, analyse and um, report on that information. Um, we've already got capability to audit the functions and roles of, and records and so forth of delivery agents and we're going to use that capability as it's deemed appropriate or necessary in, in the future. So, so what aspect so, of that recommendation are you not going to implement? So we, we're mainly doing most, uh, most of what's there, but I'll, I'll get uh, my colleague just to clarify exactly the element that, uh, uh, that we're not quite doing. Uh, Anna Willock, Assistant Secretary of the Concessional Loans Branch in the Farm Support Division. Senator, the element of the ANAO's Recommendation 3 that uh, we, we won't be fully undertaking is uh, a system of intensive manual review and validation of the state's data. Uh, we think that with the measures that uh, Mr Morris has run through, there are sufficient safeguards in place to ensure that we can uh, have assurance that the information that we're receiving is, is, is verifiable and uh, is accurate. Well, how can you be sure of that when ANO had to point out all of these problems uh, with the, uh, the, the system that you were operating? So how can you be sure well, that uh, everything's OK? Because you must have thought everything was OK when it wasn't. Well, we've taken a number of steps to improve our current processes. Uh, one of the things that we're building at the moment that Mr Morris mentioned is a purpose-built database for the loans. In the development of the new loan scheme, we're also going to seek some additional quality assurance from our delivery agencies. So we have more confidence that they have internal systems in place such that when the data is transmitted to our database, that uh, there are already quality assurance processes that have been gone through. So these so, are electronic quality insurance, is it, issues? Well, it, uh, at the moment, there are separate databases that each of the delivery agencies run. Mm. We're building a new database that's purpose-built to, um, if you like, talk directly to the state's existing database, and that will allow uh, a lot of human error to be removed from the system. Currently, it's quite resource intensive to double check all the information, go back to the states and these sorts of things. So, so have you done any analysis as to uh, whether there has been any cost to the, uh, the public purse as a result of the human error? Well, I, the errors that are picked up uh, on occasion uh, can, be do, can do with uh, double checking with the state uh, on the status of an individual loan. Yeah. Uh, there can be differences in the way states report the industry that um, the farm business, uh, the industry that it comes from. So for example, uh, there are 19 different permutations of how an industry sector is uh, described in the various delivery agencies. So is that because of state legislation? It's in part the way that they describe their own industries and they don't necessarily always keep to the same centralised codes that we are asking for. So Why for wasn't this resolved before the system kicked off. Why, why did it need the ANAO to say, look here, hey, there's problems here? Well, I think the ANAO has pointed to the fact that uh, we need to increase the level of assurance that we otherwise have uh, around the data that we received. I don't think that they have actually found that there are deficiencies in the data and that there is incorrect data that we then rely on in terms of briefings uh, so, to the minister. So you, are you assuring me that there's been no loans issued that, that shouldn't have been issued? Uh, that's a different question, I think, Senator. That is, you're yeah, but, talking but it there arises about... from the, it arises from the check and balance procedure. Well, the, the recommendation three is about our, our ability to look across the loan data and analyse that across the entire portfolio through all the delivery agencies. The question you've just asked is getting to the judgments that a delivery agency makes in assessing a loan application, which I, I, I think is a different, uh, a different question. But the judgments, the the judgments have at. to be based on some criteria, don't they? They are, and in previous estimates we've been through those. So there's the matter of security, there's the matter of ability to repay, there's the matter of the eligibility of the farm business in a drought affected area, okay. financial hardship criteria, etc. They're the things that they base their so judgments on. So when did on. this loan system start? The, the, Loans themselves or the collection of data? No, the system, the, 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 loan, uh, the, the, the loan, the loans themselves. Well, the first loans, uh, which was the farm finance loans, was introduced in um, early 13, 14. Okay. Um, so, th they, they were brought in with the basis of the checks and balances that the ANAO determined 
were not sufficient, is that correct? So would you repeat the question? The ANAO found a number of deficiencies, right? Is that correct? I think they found a number of areas of, of areas for improvement. Uh, I don't think they found that the information on which we were currently relying was fundamentally flawed or inaccurate. They've okay. really made a finding and recommendation about how we could uh, further. So uh, I, mean, I don't want to get accuracy. semantics here, but the ANAO say, say here's areas of improvement. I've said there were some deficiencies. What's the difference? Well, the difference is that one suggests that the information on which we currently rely is inaccurate. Um, I have said to you that we have a number of checks and balances in there already and that we're looking to improve those and one of the improvements will be automation of the way that we collect that data. Okay, thanks. Now, um, the, how, how, do, how will this relate to the $2 billion water concessional loans? Are they going to be in, under this new system? Uh, that'll be um, uh, done in a different area of the department at this stage. So um, you're talking at the moment to the farm support area, which is delivering the drought loans. This will be water. And this will be the water area that you're, you're talking about. What, why, given that you've got this system in place now, which is basically a loan, whether it's a water loan or a farm loan, mm. uh, couldn't this be done under the one mm. efficient, changed, ANAO uh, analysed body? Yeah, look, I, th I think it's a logical question, but certainly there's learnings we've made as a department in terms of how to run loan programs through a series of loan programs, which I think will hold us in very good stead for the department delivering the, uh, the, water, the water loans. So certainly those lessons and learnings will be applied to water, whether they're delivered in this area, which you're unlikely to, or the water area. Okay. Um, so is there a possibility that you could consolidate your loan delivery within the department? I mean, if I was the minister, I'd be saying, why set up another distinct facility when you've got a facility there that's been checked by the ANAO who improved their delivery performance? Why, why start afresh? What's the I think reasoning it, for uh, that, Mr Quinlan? It depends a little bit on uh, uh, what you mean by that question. If you mean uh, the management of a, of a loan portfolio once the loan transactions have been agreed and so on, I think that's an entirely, uh, uh, entirely feasible thing to do. In fact, we probably will do something like, uh, like that in due course. But before you get there, and that's where Mr Morris is really saying, we'll, make, we'll learn the lessons from uh, our existing experience, but in, it's quite a different transaction uh, uh, loaning to a state government onto a project proponent for a, for a uh, an infrastructure project which has a whole range of parties involved, which also need to uh, relate to one another commercially in a in a, in a, in a viable way. It's quite different to a, a concessional loan to an individual uh, farming yeah. business. So, but there is the possibility the Department of Agriculture and Water will deal with the loans at this stage. Oh yes, well we will. Yes. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, I'm just pointing out that they're quite different transactions okay. until the point where you have loan agreement signing, at which point they're quite similar potentially. Do you have a, a, a how much this a figure on how, how much this will cost the government over the forward estimates and over four, 10 years? Uh, well, they're revenue neutral over the over the long term. I'd have to take on notice uh, what the numbers are on the forward estimates, unless our CFO can answer that very quickly. No, I think we'll have to. Yeah. Um, I'm, I'm, I think it's published in the measures statement in the budget papers. Okay, who's eligible to apply? Uh, you Which talking loans about the water are we talking loans? about now? The water loans. Yeah, yeah, the, yeah. The water loan, water infrastructure loan facility. Uh, we'll be we'll be publishing pro project guidelines um, uh, in due course, which will make all that clear. But the loans will be made through the states. The loans will be made through the states. We'll fund them. Yes. We fund the loan, loans are made through the states, but you're not leaving it to the states to determine who accesses it, are you? No, no. Is there checks and balances uh, uh, on the states in terms of their performance? Uh, we'll have very uh, tight arrangements for maintaining an appropriate level of control over what When you what say we will have funds. them, when will you have them? Uh, I'd have to see whether our water people, if they're currently present, could answer this question. This was... Uh, We've now moved on to outcome three. Um, so, so the eligibility of who can apply 
uh, and what projects are eligible. Can anyone give us any advice on that? Well, government hasn't government hasn't agreed guidelines yet, so uh, we're just talking about the broad parameters of the scheme yeah. rather than the precise answers. But to that extent, we say what we can. Okay. What about the interest rate? Are you aware of what sort of interest rate is going to be charged? Defer to my colleagues uh, here. Uh, the interest rates haven't been determined, Senator. Um, so when will they be determined? Uh, as part of the process of settling the final guidelines for the fund. Uh, the fund has only a... just been announced, so the, yeah. the, the, the next step along the ro that road is, to, is for the government to determine the guidelines and operating arrangements for that uh, fund. So we don't know at this stage who's eligible to apply. We don't know what projects are eligible. We don't know what the interest rate's going to be. Uh, do we know what, over what period the, the loans will be? Yes, well, Senator. Senator. Cameron, so, so, we've got one. We've got uh, one. Uh, um, Senator Cameron, just to let you know, qualification, only state and territory governments are eligible to apply. Yeah. So I think Thanks. we've got broad parameters that we are working towards, which answer quite a number of those questions. Um, so, okay, do you know what the Commonwealth's borrowing costs are, are projected to be on this? We we don't have that data, uh, Senator. You can't really tell us much about this, can you? Well, we, we, we can tell you uh, that, uh, as the minister was saying, that states are eligible to apply. Uh, the uh, the interest rate that will apply to these loans is yet to be. So, so how can the states apply if we don't know what projects are eligible and what the interest rate is going to be? And over what period it would be They will it. know that, of course, before they are uh, but it's been expected announced. to apply. It's been the, announced. The, the program has been announced as a program, uh, ah, as, so a the measure, program as a has measure. Been announced, the, 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 no details. The policy has been announced as a measure to implement this loan fund. Mm. The implementation arrangements will be developed uh, by the government uh, uh, as, as in its own time frame. So like th these projects, I don't want to know what advice you've given the the, uh, the the minister, but has there been advice to the minister on this program? Yes. Sir. Um, okay, and that was from you, Mister. From the department. Yeah, yes. From the department. From, from you specifically? Is it you? Well, from 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 the department through my division. Yes. Okay. So have you? Uh, have you come to a conclusion about who should be eligible, what projects are eligible, what the interest will be, and over what period they'll be lent? Have we're you not, dealt with those we're issues? We're not going to discuss for the committee the details of advice we provided the government on this. No, I'm not scheme. asking you what. This is not about advice to go. This is a project that has been announced. Hmm. This is not about some advice to the government. About uh, a pro you know some project that you, they are going to think about. Mm. This is an announced project, Senator. and we don't know who is eligible to apply. We don't know what projects are eligible. We don't know what the interest rate is. We don't know what period it's going to be. Like. Somebody in the department must know these things. Senator Cameron, can I just put a bit of context around this? Um, as you'd be aware, as part of the, um, the white paper, a $500,000 fund was um, established for, um, to provide funding in grant form to states and territories for um, water security projects for... So, no, you're right. So, just saying, as part of the agricultural white paper, $500 million was made available to the states and territories um, with the outcome for achieving greater water security um, for our regional areas and our agricultural industry. The uh, amount of projects that were submitted by the states and territories when the first round of that particular um, project were put out were so far in excess of the funds that were available by that program. Um, so this, this program is in response to that overwhelming demand for water security by many, many of our state and territory understand governments. That. So I'm just putting some context about this. Understand that, it's, not just, it's just not some thought bubble that came out of nowhere. Well, I, I, was, every, I was just thinking thought bubble, thought bubble, thought. Don't say thought bubble, but you've said it. And I've I really just said think, it's not. I think it is, because nobody can tell us how it's going to operate, 
or any of the key parameters. Mm -hmm. So yeah. I have to go. Thank you. Okay, can I just uh, seek uh, some clarification from the committee? Now we are finishing at 3.15 here to go to infrastructure, correct? Very quick question yep. if I can in outcome yeah, two. Yeah, sure. <coughs> but, uh, I know, thanks. <coughs> We're not there yet, are we? So you do want to get infrastructure. It's in biosecurity. <coughs> Thanks, Dan. I, I really would like to get this question answered. If he ain't here at 3.15, mate, I'm killing it. OK? Yeah, because I've got to come back. Well, send him back. Send him back. Send him back. Send him back. Have we swapped? We've gone. It's gone out. Two. Can we do carp? Can we do carp? Not well, I was here. Yeah. No, no. Okay. We're okay. set. OK, thanks, sir. Uh, Chair, thanks, Secretary. Well, Look, I want to ask a question about the fate of okay. what was the Subcommittee on Animal Health Laboratory Standards, SCALS. A decision was taken by our government for it to be discontinued. As we all know, it was not um, a government advisory body. The government didn't own it. It wasn't funded by the Commonwealth. You may or may not know that I represented very strongly to my ministerial colleagues that it was a bad decision to get rid <coughs> of SCALS. Uh, its role was as a standard setting body for veterinary laboratories in Australia. Uh, and of course, as we know, it was the de facto national veterinary laboratory network <coughs> that brought together government, university, CSIRO and the private laboratories. <coughs> I was assured by my ministerial colleagues that it was all in hand and that the department would take responsibility for the role and the outcomes of the SCALS Laboratory Standards Group. Can you just tell me where are we today and are we meeting the objectives and the key performance indicators that was previously SCALS? Chief, uh, Australian Chief Veterinary Officer. So after the uh, dismantling of SCALS, the secretariat uh, function which resided in the department remains, and uh, we are endeavouring to uh, meet, meet the functions of the former uh, subcommittee uh, through uh, provision of services through the uh, secretariat. So without disrespect, when you told, told me that you're endeavouring to, uh, could you give the committee some comfort that in fact those standards are being met? Uh, and that laboratories are continuing to be evaluated, assessed uh, and remain at a high level uh, from an international scrutiny point of view, Dr Shim. Uh, there was an undertaking at the time that decision was made that there would be a review, a review and uh, the outcomes of that review are not yet available. But has the review been uh, has the review been undertaken? It, it's commenced, but not not complete. And who's is that being done internally? Or is In, it being... Internally, yes. Okay. And will it be the subject of uh, will will the, will the review <coughs> report be made public? Um, I, I I'm unsure of that, but uh, I expect it would be yes. Thank you. I... Senator, in, uh, in, in view of your obvious personal interest, um, we'll do what we can to provide you with a briefing uh, when we can. Uh, uh, when this review has reached a point where we can provide that to you? I just hope that I might be around long enough, Mr Quinlivan, to be able to receive the value of it. But, we'll see. Uh, <laughs> um, and and uh, I, would, I would say that, um, as Dr Ship knows him well, my colleague uh, Dr Barry Richards from Western Australia was instrumental in SCALS. Uh, it is he that uh, has shared continually with me the, the, that concern. And e even when the free trade agreements were signed, I remember him coming back to me saying, well, you know, under those free trade agreements and the, the various export and importations, are we still satisfied that the laboratory standards are up there? So I would be most appreciative, Mr Quinlivan. Thank you. Thank you, Chair. We have probably lost the, uh, the, the mob, but uh, can we talk about CARP with you? Yes, yeah, sure. Certainly, Senator. Fantastic. Thank you. Ooh. Now, Ooh. now, Mr Joyce has stated that we're going to have between half a million and two million tonnes of carp. I take it that's what we're going to have to kill each year with this virus, is that right? It's not so each year. Yeah. It, that's the total amount well, of carp it. that we estimate is in the Murray-Darling Basin and its tributaries at the moment. Okay, so we're not targeting how, we're just going to kill them all and over whatever time it takes. Well, we hope to kill about 95% of them. 
um, and to be able to then have ongoing activities that will suppress that other 5%. I mean, it would be wonderful if we killed 100%, but I think that's probably unrealistic. But our understanding from the advice from uh, the CSIRO is that it would be a reasonable expectation to get 95% of them killed in the first go. Great. If we can take out the cane toads at the same time, be even better. Yeah. So, lovely you, talk, you want, mate? It would be great. Now, you, you got a question from a couple of truckies up here. You see, half a million to two million tonnes of carp, that's not a small difference. No. Mm. What is it? Um, my understanding is that um, the, the figure that had been agreed on was about a million tonnes. Um, and, but in the interest of the fact that it's very difficult to, to actually count them, they put a range in there so that when the department scoped out this particular project, that there was a, a reasonable range in it in terms of, as you brightly point out, a massive uh, logistical effort camels. to be able to get rid of them. Sorry? <laughs> Sorry? This is the same mob that counts camels. Yeah, but the camels literally can see them. Camels are a bit easy to see. Yeah. Uh, okay, so <laughs> probably, range, yeah. probably about a million tonne of carp. Do we know how long that would take to kill 95%? Um, my understanding is that within about seven days of the virus being released in a particular area, um, the carp will start showing signs of being affected by the virus and within 24 hours of them actually showing those signs, they'll be dead. Gee. Uh, uh, okay. It's a herpes and line. is there a strategic... Look, do we think there'll be one or two teams running around Australia or will there be a uh, big hit one? Yeah. What are we going to do? Um, Fishing clubs. Of carp killers. Um, obviously... Um, the, process, the, the announcement of the, the $15 million towards this project, the first uh, activity of that is going to be designing the communication strategy, the community engagement strategy and the clean-up strategy because there's no way in the world that this virus can be released until those issues have been dealt with. So as part of that process, the entire logistical arrangements of the, um, the impact of the, the, the carp kill will be... Um, be prepared. So from the announcement the other day of, of this um, um, uh, pot of money to address this, this serious issue, it would have been nice to actually get uh, a balanced and considered response from the Minister and unfortunately I saw the performance he put on. So I'm, it's nice to be able to talk to you, Minister, yeah. to try and get some common sense out of it. Um, Sorry, I wasn't aware of those questions. Oh, it's viral. Do yourself a favour, don't bother oh, watching no. it. It's embarrassing. Okay. Um, it's on YouTube. Um, well, you disagree? Uh, anyway, let's get back to it. So, so what happens? So, so the, the carp float to the surface, obviously. Some then, will float, some will sink. And then what do we do with them? Okay, well, that's part of the process, as I said. The, the reason, even though that we have um, the capacity and all the authorities and all the testing has occurred to, to um, prove out the fact that this particular virus is benign to anything else apart from a carp. So we're not there yet. Oh, no, no, we are. We are, we are in are terms there? of that. So we won't um, kill we birds or anything? Yeah. OK, so, we, I mean, in, in a sense, we could release the virus tomorrow um, because we are absolutely confident that all safety requirements around the virus have been checked and double-checked and rechecked again. But what we do need to do over the next two years and why we've made the announcement that we were released in 2018 is exactly what you're saying. We need to get a communication <coughs> strategy out there so that people understand what's going on. <coughs> we need to get community engagement because obviously the communities along the river, I mean, this is going to be a, a major um, activity when it occurs. Right. And also to deal with like the clean up to, to make question. sure that um, you know we have all of the logistics in place around making sure that that clean up occurs in a way that's not going to have major detrimental impacts on the communities and possibly some, some positive impacts because um, when you're speaking to people about what opportunities there are for the commerciality of the, the, the product, um, whether we turn it into fertiliser or pet food or fish meal or, or what we do with it. So, but we can, we can safely say that we can have a by-product industry from the car. Can yes, we say that? We, we believe that that's the case. Um, we, um, certainly there's been preliminary discussions with people who would be interested in, in some of them, but as you can imagine with a million tonnes of carp, it may be a whole range of different um, commercial opportunities that, may, that, that we need to have a look at. Is the science settled that there'll be no, in the product or the by-product of the releasing the virus, that, that that won't be transmitted down the food chain? Yeah, my understanding is that, that the CSRO uh, have confidently um, tested that you could eat the European carp that has died from the virus. So if they made so probably won't. you don't transfer it to no. someone else? Just, Minister, just adding on from Senator Sterling Gallagher, a million tonnes of carp 
when I was pig farming, fish meal is very high protein. You need it for young pigs to grow them quickly and so on. It's also very expensive. If you could see that perhaps looking at some project to actually process these dead fish, get them out of the river and into, the, into a high protein food supplement for livestock would be a brilliant way to just instead of them you know, rotting on the side of the banks, actually put them into a processing food for, for further benefit. Yeah, we certainly, there's no intention to leave them rotting on the side of the bank. Um, there is, you know, any opportunity to use it, as you rightly point out, as a, as a great source of protein. So you would do export. areas of the river at a time, I and mean, you might go to uh, Mungandai and do a, a kilometre sort of thing. Um, I think is that, that the plan those... To do area? You just can't go and do the whole lot, there'll be dead fish everywhere. Um, yeah, look, I think there's some of those issues that still need to be worked through. One of the things that obviously they have to make sure that there's a contingency in place because if some crazy person decided that they were going to go and transfer water from one section of the river to the next. So all of those things and the logistics and the implications of every eventuality need to be worked through and hence the reason why we've made the announcement it's two years hence. And you'll be involving local fishing clubs to help with the Absolutely. Up the the, um, yeah, the Australian Recreational Fishing Foundation um, and the recreational fishing organisations within each of the states have already pledged their support. Um, they stood by the ministers um, on the weekend when they made the announcement of the, um, of, of the project. Uh, and we're, we're really, they're, they're already very, very engaged and have taken ownership of the project and will be assisting us particularly with the clean up. Do the the first next? Sorry? Have we ever done this anywhere else? We as in... Well, CSRO. Right. Where, where uh, the, the, the virus this, in this particular virus has been used in, in other fish. parts of the world mm -hmm. um, and, and has been proven successful in other yeah. parts of the world. It, um, I believe it's been, it was developed in Israel, although originally it was first identified in Indonesia. Mm. I can't wait till you do Lake Burley Griffin. <laughs> That's going to be hilarious. Anyway, why did I say that? <laughs> you say a lot of things we often question, Senator. You watch, all, you watch all the hate emails that have come from the Canberraites. Um, and I meant no disrespect. Oh. Senator Beck. Unrelated to that topic, again, Mr Quinlivan, if time permits, um, in 2009-10, I think it was, we successfully organised the negotiation of an emergency animal disease response agreement for the horse industry, and it was to be reviewed after a five-year period. I just wonder if you could or one of the officers could tell me where we are with that five-year review. See now, why couldn't part of the do a balance? In response, um, response, early stages yeah. of planning for the review. So it's on our work program at the moment, and uh, we're looking at the, the review of that, um, the levy arrangement, which Time is by statutory review. Time completion, end of this year? Uh, this calendar year, yeah. Calendar year, thank you. Thank you. Thanks, Mr. Secretary. Senator, Thanks, Senator, Senator Williams, do you have any further questions? Or Senator Gallagher? No, because we're keen to get to infrastructure. The agreement was 315, and we have a lot to go through infrastructure. So, can I? It might have afternoon tea now. Yeah, with the indulgence of the committee, can we knock off now for 15 minutes, have a comfort break, then come back with infrastructure to yeah, the officials? You, Thank you very much. Where's the chair? Great, let's put everything on notice, and we'll see you all up there. <laughs> Down the green Thank you. Yeah, Doug and Bill are not here. We can. The cane toad and the European carp, the two biggest pests they brought into this country. Appreciation and best wishes to you, Chair, for the future. Um, it's been an absolute pleasure. We've worked together for many years yeah. through this committee and, yeah. and in this place. And uh, can I say how much we've appreciated both working with you as Chair of this committee, but also uh, when you've sat on, on the committee in other capacities. And uh, it's been an absolute pleasure and privilege. And on behalf of all the staff of the department, can I wish you and your family all the best for the future. And thank you for your work in this place, which I know has made a terrific contribution to the, to the nation. And wish you the best for the future, Senator. Thank you very much, Mr Murdoch. And can I just say to you and your department, um, I'm most um, humbled by those words because really, I, you know, I can be a bit of a bugger at times. And um, I apologise for, for uh, any disruptions I've caused, but this committee is rather unique in that even though at times we appear not to get along, we do actually get along very well, and we do tend to deal with the issues, not play the politics, and just, you know, who's got a cop it, cops it, and who doesn't deserve it, doesn't. So, I mean, it's been a great honour and a privilege to be in Parliament, and uh, I just hope between all of us, um, we can keep the world, Australia the best place in the world to raise a family, breathe fresh air and drink clean water. Well, and we do appreciate that. This is, I think this is a committee that does work very well together and works pretty productively with the agencies and uh, again all the best for the future Senator. Thanks very much. Senator Happy Bell. to go to questions Senator. Thank you Chair. Mr Murdoch um, just briefly 
We had some interesting conversation in the last portfolio about moving on some of Australia's biggest pests, particularly carp, uh, the cane toad, and all of a sudden, Senator Heffernan's leaving us. So. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, <laughs> but, uh, but only in spirit in this building. I've got to so. go home and burn a stubble before the rain at the weekend. So. OK, uh, welcome Mr Murdoch and the, and the uh, officers from the new Department of Infrastructure Regional Development, the DIRD. Is that right? That's OK, correct. DIRD. Uh, now, last round of estimates, Senator Ludwig, it was question 37, asked about uh, public, uh, you know, so what, what publications does your department or agency purchase? And you have come back and answered it. And I note that, amongst other things, one of them is uh, what a waste outsourcing and how it goes wrong. So, how much did the department spend on outsourcing last year? Uh, we, un we engage a range of contractors, Senator. I take that on notice. Are there particular areas? We, we a range of our services functions to the department are all outsourced to contractors, ranging from building management to cleaning and everything else factors. I'm happy to give you a breakdown of those sure. if, uh, if that would assist. Yeah, could you give us a rough idea, Mr Murdoch, uh, within the closest half a billion or something? I don't know. I'll just see if my chief... I don't think we can, Senator. I'd, it'd be across the range of our business activities. And if we limit adjusted services to the department, I can give you an answer fairly quickly on that. OK. Is there a substantial amount of outsourcing? Uh, Carl, the Chief Operating Officer. Senator, the main area of outsourcing is, as uh, uh, you mentioned, is property. And the second one is IT, where some of our services we, are, we outsource and some we deliver internally. They will be the, the, the two that would take up the most uh, expense. OK, sure. No, Sorry, no. the third one will be legal advice. We've got a small le internal legal team, but we access a lot of external legal advice. Yeah. And I understand that you will take it on notice and you will come back with a dollar yes. figure. But do you have a percentage figure? I wouldn't even want to hazard a guess, Senator. Okey dokey. Uh, can you tell us of anything that did go wrong in outsourcing? <laughs> no, you're allowed. Oh. The beauty of living in Australia, it's not a jailable offence if we make a mistake. Don't tell the politicians that because they don't <coughs> believe that it's true. I think we've tried and tested various models of service delivery. I think the current arrangements are all working, to my knowledge, Senator. I'm not familiar with any, <laughs> uh, any breakdowns in the <laughs> service delivery. You did that with a straight face. Sorry. That's right. Sorry, could go. No, that's. I'll take on notice, but I don't believe we have any breakdowns in service delivery at the moment. Okay. All right. So, um, has the Department of Finance's functional efficiency review been completed? Uh, yes, it has, Senator. It was completed in February this year. February. Oh, good. And its task was to determine if the department's current resources and functions align with the government's forward priorities. Is that correct? That's correct, Senator. And that's including according to the terms of reference where certain functions should be provided by alternative approaches, including contestability, and that to recommend, among other things, the, I'm quoting, the proposed transition path to implement preferred alternatives, including how performance could be managed, APS staffing, capability considerations in governments. That's part of terms of reference D? Yes, correct. Okay. How did it find, Mr Murdoch? Um, the report's currently before government. It has recommended uh, a range of measures which uh, would uh, look at a mix of functions ceasing to be performed. Functions uh, ceasing? Functions ceasing. Uh, functions which could be performed by other agencies or uh, areas of government uh, and also areas where efficiencies could be made. Um, it's, it's recommended 18 areas of action for the government to consider. Uh, that, that has currently now before government and, uh, and I expect will be considered in the next term of government. Sure. Are you able to uh, point us in what areas they are at uh, this stage? Uh, they predominantly range around areas of, uh, in terms of the department itself, some specific functions which uh, could be considered for no longer continuing, particularly areas such as the way, some, some examples that, some areas that have been identified, such as the performance of some functions, such as the administration of financial assistance to local government, and other payment processes, which should, could be considered for centralisation in other areas of government, such as the Department of Finance, uh, ceasing areas such as uh, the Department's performance of activities in maritime regulation, and whether that better sits with the Australian Maritime Safety Authority, um, and also in in, indicates areas where government may wish to consider larger structural changes, such as considering the future of Air Services Australia. Wow. How? Sorry? Sir? How? 
uh, whether the government wished to consider future options for different governance and ownership arrangements for some of our statutory bodies, including Air Service Australia. So that could be outsourcing? That could be, or it could be looking at uh, taking it into different ownership structures to what they currently are. And what process, or what could they be, Mr Murdoch? Oh, the reason why I'm talking, because we all know Air Services Australia is, is, is uh, there is no competition. Um, you know, it's quite a bit of a money earner to the government. So how could you shine a light on how that could be done in a different way for us? Well, that would be uh, the efficiency and functional efficiency review did look at international examples of where governments have placed their air traffic control provider, air services provider in different governance structures, particularly uh, the United Kingdom and Canada, where they've been placed in either part or full, uh, part private ownership uh, or a uh, not-for-profit government body. Uh, they, they are models that have been looked at, and the scope and the functional efficiency review recommended that we consider further options for the future of Air Service Australia. So, function ceasing is, is as it suggests, uh, how can we outsource certain parts of, of the department or work that's conducted by the department or agencies around the department? Was there a flip side where there was, there was a study looking at how you could bring stuff back at all? Uh, that wasn't an area that the functional efficiency review settled on as one of their 18 areas of action. No worries. Thanks, Mr Murdoch. And we'll watch that space with some interest. When do we think the government will... Well, I know they're going into caretaker mode in the next couple of days, but is there an indication when they could possibly... or they were looking at responding to that? Um, I think the indications are it will probably be part of the next mid-year financial review or the budget process. OK, yep. Thank you, Ducky. Now, who conducted the um, review? Uh, the review was undertaken by KPMG, sure. uh, and the uh, lead uh, reviewer was Mr Warwick Smith with KPMG. Okay. And it was only KPMG, no one else? That's correct. Okay. Now, is it true that um, KPMG were paid almost $600,000 for this work, Mr Murdoch? Uh, that's correct, Senator. I can get you the final amount, but it's of that order. Yep. Okay. If you could, please, that's fine. Now, does KPMG otherwise provide services to the department? Uh, Other yes, services? It, yes, it does. They, KPMG is on our panel of providers for a range of services, professional services and advice. Could I, could I ask you who they are or what they are? Uh, they would range across the department where we do look for advice, either financial or professional advice in relation to areas such as our infrastructure program or in any one of our line divisions where we're looking for professional advice. KPMG is one of the firms that we have on the various departmental panels. Okay, we well, look, I have a list here in front of me and if I can just tick off that I've got the right information that KPMG has contracts directly with uh, DIRD under the Oz Tender website and it's diesel supply contract, is that correct? Uh, that's correct for our Indian Ocean Territories. And is that at $280,000 a year? Uh, I don't have that in front of me. I reckon I Mr Murphy that. might know that one. Uh, no, in fact, I'm, I'm looking through my list. I've got one for um, Assurance and Compliance Program for 125000 but I'm not finding that one. Has so anyone got the Oz Tender website there? I just want to make sure I've got the right info. I don't doubt that I do, but I'd like to check. In fact, what I've got in front of me is <clears throat> that the um, consultancy that we've entered into from 1 January this year through to 31 March. So if this was prior to that, I yeah, wouldn't have my, it. My information is that for the calendar year of 2015. Okay. Right. Would it be hard to get that up in front of us just to confirm or deny or set me straight? Would that be hard to do? We can ascertain to do, try and that. do that. Now. Okay. Well, look, I'll run through it. So while, while Miss. Potter. Miss Potter. Potter. Potter, sorry. Well, Miss Potter's diligently um, banging away at the computer there. I have in front of me that uh, KPMG have a contract to do with diesel, uh, the diesel supply contract of the department at $280,000. I have uh, in front of me local government territories risk and control mapping contract at $120,000. Assurance and compliance project review one at $415,000. Comprehensive Health Services for Norfolk Island at $183,000. Wider Economic Benefits Project at $275,000. Uh, 
and the development and impl implementation of the Norfolk Island multi-purpose service contract of $600,000. We'll check that, Senator. Okay, and I'll do some quick sums. That's a lot of money. Okay, so we're well, <coughs> we're, we're, we're getting close to about one and a half million dollars, I believe, I think. Anyway, you'll check that <coughs> for me. But I, are we far away from confirming? Yeah, I, I'm having Sorry. trouble ringing it up. Well, I think my information would be pretty spot on. So let's go with this. And Mr Murdoch, I don't, it's not hypothetical. Okay. Uh, so um, would it be fair for me to assume that there's a massive conflict of interest in having an external provider of services to the department review where the department is resourced to deliver government priorities? Um, no, Senator, the, the government established the functional efficiency reviews to be independent reviews. They were certainly did do a very independent analysis of the, of the department and the portfolio. Uh, and uh, I don't believe there's any conflict of interest as the very fact they are a provider of other services. We selected uh, KPMG off the basis of a uh, tender process. Uh, they provided a proposal which was we, we accepted and contracted to undertake the efficiency review. I suppose where I'm coming from, Mr Murdoch, when we you know we talk a lot about this since, <coughs> since Miss Bishop's indiscretions about the pub test. Um, but if we're we, if there is a government department that is uh, engaging KPMG to at the tune of six hundred thousand dollars, now you use the term uh, part of the review was function ceasing. Yeah. So this same mob KPMG, who have got the $600,000 to look where efficiencies could be found in outsourcing, but they're actually a client of yours who is outsourcing certain parts of the department's work to the tune of one and a half million dollars. It's a bit like banning the live cattle export. If we ask all the processes, of course, they're going to want to ban the live cattle export. I find that very conflicting. Maybe Senator Heffern and the yeah, chair I'm might think I'm great. wrong. No. And this is why I ask. Because yeah. well, there's a number of mobs out there that do the work that KPMG could do. And if I was the one issuing the contracts, foremost in my mind would be, this could look a little bit stinky. Well, I can see the, the point you're making, Senator, in the sense that uh, we, we certainly, at the, ultimately, at the end of the day, the department has the opportunity to respond to the, to the report and government will make the final decisions. But I, I do understand the point you're making. But as I said, uh, I think it, it was a thoroughly independent review and no suggestion that they, the review's recommendations are anyway tailored to the future work possibilities for KPMG, in my view. Sure. And it comes back to my early question from Senator Ludwig at the last round of estimates, which you have come back and answered. And, and part of the spend on the... Uh, 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 on pr um, uh, purchase of um, uh, pu publications was what a waste, outsourcing and how it goes wrong. And I just see the suspicion in me says this is a glowing example of how it can go wrong. Now, for the purposes of timing, um, I think I've made my point clear, and that is certainly, to me, <coughs> does not pass the pub test. But, Chair, did you want to interrupt me? No. Are no, you happy? OK, so I can continue. Yes, yeah, Senator Dodson, of course. Just wanted to know how you've mitigated the risk or ensure probity prevails in this situation. We, we had, for the functional efficiency review, we did set up a team within the department to provide information and support to the study team. Uh, that obviously enabled us to ensure that the data provided to the team was, was accurate at all times. Uh, and also, at the end of the day, there were extensive discussions with us in relation to the proposals that the functional efficiency team review was putting forward. Uh, and so we did look very carefully and provide advice to them on where areas that we thought were not uh, going to be workable for outsourcing or for other alternative providers. Uh, and that was reflected in the final report that KPMG did provide. So we, we were very scrupulous in ensuring that we were clear to them of areas that we thought were and weren't able to be able to be performed by other parties or contractors. Thanks very much. Congratulations on your first question, Senator Dodson. <laughs> Under your tutelage, <laughs> yeah. Mr Chair. So my, my sum as quickly as Senator Dodson was asking, it's, it's closer to one and a half million dollars of work that KPMG currently enjoys um, um, from the Department of Infrastructure and Regional Development. May I ask you, Mr Murdoch, are you aware that KPMG is on the lobbyist register? Uh, I'm not, I was not aware that they were on the lobbyist okay. register. You are now. Uh, we, actually, we are, we are aware of that. Um, there was a <clears throat> question on notice um, that Senator Ludwig asked, which 
asked us to um, state which lobbyists we may have engaged in answering that question. We, did, we identified that KPMG are on the lobbyist register. However, um, their lobbyists who have been explicitly listed on that register have not been involved in any of the work that we've done with KPMG. Yeah, I understand it's very hard for me to be comfortable with any form of lobbyist, but you know, anyway, I think I, I have made my point clear and I'd be very interested to um, see what comes for, forecasting it now once the government, whoever they may be, goes through the $600,000 review of KPMG to see what comes as the suggestions from KPMG, because I have no doubt that they probably may be part of the tendering mob for that. Do you, do you go to tender? Uh, from, yes, we do. All that? And is it evenly spread around? Or some companies get more than others? Or uh, Well, we generally look at the capacity of the firms bidding for the work. Um, we, we, don't, we obviously look at ensuring we get a, a good panel, a, a range of firms on the panel that give us expert skills, but we often uh, look at a range of criteria when we award work. Do you have a, do you have a preferred tenderer's list? Is that what you call it? Or do you we, just chuck them all out there and see what comes on each? It varies project. on the contract. We have a what we call a, t a panel for various skills, be they accounting or project advice and the like. Uh, firms have pre-qualified effectively and given a schedule of rates for those panels, which enables us to go quickly to those panels and, uh, and target our tenders to those firms that have already demonstrated their skills in particular areas. Okay, so I'll go to Mr Murphy now. So what other companies do you use to outsource that are also registered as lobbyists? Uh, none. We've only um, had any interaction with one lobbying firm, um, or that was listed on the lobbyist register as lobbying. And so it's only the one. Other services. It's only KPMG. No, no. no sorry. Um, <clears throat> the lobbyist register lists individuals who are identified as lobbyists. So KPMG have indicated a number of people who are lobbyists who are on the lobbying register. We've had nothing to do with them. We've no, but KPMG are on the lobbyist list. Yes. Yes, that's what I've asked. So have, have we? That. Do I? What? So I do, I do not know with with other firms that may do some lobbying and some other, for example, consulting activities. Okay, um, but I'll come back to you. Do you, the department, Mr. Murphy, do you check the lobbyist list before you issue client a, a contracts for outsourcing or? Anyone, or is who's, on, on, anyone who's on the lobbying register has to indicate that they are a lobbyist and we okay. would not consider them for other, other okay. work. Okay, so KPMG is the only outsourcing company? No, no, individuals. on the, So KPMG, if they wanted to use someone, some, one of their people who was on the lobbying register to provide other services, they would have to indicate that they were on the lobbying register. Okay, I understand that, but for work that you, the department, outsource, clearly, and you've led me to believe there are no other companies who you outsource work to who is also on the lobbyist register? No, I'm not saying that. I, wouldn't, I, I do not know. For example, okay. um, the legal firms that we engage to provide legal advice conceivably could have other members of their firms on the lobbying register. I, I do not know that because we do not engage okay. them for lobbying purposes. All right. In terms of KPMG's large chunk of work that they've access on back to you, Mr Murdoch, I think, or Mr Murphy, who have, who have got the big chunk of 600, but then nearly a million and a half of ongoing outsourcing. Are there any other companies who you engage, or you have engaged when you outsource, have worked to the value of KPMG, similar, higher? Uh, there would be a range of firms um, of similar and higher um, um, amounts that we contract through a year, yes, and that we use a range of professional services firms, particularly in our infrastructure advice work. Um, other major firms, professional firms, are, we do engage through the year. Okay. Now, that wouldn't be a secret, that list, would it? No, we'd be happy to give you Maybe a... Maybe if you could uh, that table that for us, or table Certainly. on those and table for us. If it can be done today, that's very handy. Yeah. Um, I want to talk about um, what I call the infrastructure propaganda blitz. That's my wording. Now, I refer to the 18... No one jumped, so that's okay. I must be on the money. I refer to the 18 million advertising campaign that was discussed by the government in February. Yes. So has the has the budget for this changed? Uh, no, the overall budget has not changed. So it's still 18 million. That's correct. Has any of it been spent so far? Uh, yes. Uh, okay. The expenditure to to the uh, 31st of March, which is the most recent figures that uh, we have. Uh, to date, $6.941 million has been expended. 
Okie dokie. Now, on the last occasion, you indicated the media buy would be 13.7 million of the 18. That's correct. And now, has that changed? Is it still that figure? That, that remains the total media buy. Total media buy, okay. When did the campaign commence, Mr Murdoch? Uh, it commenced on the 28th of February this year, Senator. Okie dokie. On the last occasion, the evidence was that, and I'm quoting, such a campaign should be targeted around five to six months. Is that correct? Uh, that, that's correct. When the campaign was established, that was the time frame, Senator, yes. Is that still the time frame? Uh, yes, it is. Uh, there has been, uh, it's been running now for some two, two and a half months or so. So it started uh, two and a half months. So it started, you said started in February, didn't you? Yes. So if we went for five to six months, that could take us to the end of July, end of August, that would be fair? Yeah, the, the campaign is scheduled to be completed by the 31st of August, Senator. 21st of August. 31st, sorry. Oh, 31st, okay, 31st of August. Is that still the plan, to go to the 31st of August? Uh, well, that would be somewhat dependent on the timing of uh, the election and when caretaker would commence, Senator. So just explain that to all those listening out there, what that may mean. Uh, Senator, in accordance with the caretaker conventions, uh, the normal processes would be that such campaigns would be deferred until the completion of the caretaker period and the election had been process had been completed. Then incoming government would then review and take a decision as to whether they wish to continue that campaign. Sure. So we know nearly $7 million has been spent so far. Now, if an election was called this weekend, when would the caretaker period kick in? When would it start? Uh, that, that would be yet to be determined, Senator. That would be a matter for the Prime Minister. Um, generally, what is it, one day, two weeks? Generally, within one to two days of the, of the uh, Governor-General's assent. So do you still spend this still plan, I should say, sorry, Mr Murdoch, to spend $4.3 on the campaign in 2016-17? Uh, there has, we anticipate a higher spend. Setting aside the potential for the caretaker period, were that not to occur, we anticipate a higher spend uh, in, uh, in year 15-16 than what yeah. prisoner is forecast. To what figure? Uh, I'll just ask Ms Goodspeed to give you the, the updated Vanessa figures. Ms Goodspeed, uh, General Sorry. Manager Communications. Yep. Uh, the, the spend for 16, 17, is that what, that's what you asked? Yes, it was, the 4.3 million. It, it is um, 4, 4 million for 16, 17. Yep. Um, and of course, that is subject to a government decision on continuation of the campaign or, or ceasing it. Okay. So there's nothing stopping that spend coming forward and all happening in the next week or so, is there? Uh, yes, there is no... Uh, the Minister for Finance must make a decision to move any funds, Senator. Okay. Um, and so the, this, the, this spend for 16 17 will remain sitting there. It will not be moved into this financial year. The four, point, the four million? The four million will remain in 16 17. Oh, it can't be brought forward? Not now, no. OK, all right. So of the four million, so that's... Uh, so I'm just trying to establish, so there's seven left now. Uh, there's four that's quarantined over here, which gives us 11, so there's still about $7 million that uh, could be accessed and spent before caretaker mode. Um, well, that, that is, as the campaign is currently planned, that you're given that, say, if we don't go into caretaker, yes, the campaign will continue. Should we go into caretaker, that any spend this financial year will stop? Once, once you're in caretaker? Yes, we are not to expend any, sure. any funds. But we could still, the government could still, there's still $11 million that could be spent, brought forward in the next couple of weeks, or whenever, prior to caretaker count. Um, there's nothing that says they can't. There is $4 million in 16-17. No, that's right. That's, yes. that's quarantined over Correct. there. The what whole is in 15-16? Um, leaves about $7 million more. Well, it, yes, te well technically, if, if, if we go into caretaker, no, the money no. will not be brought forward. There's a current, um, the remaining funding, if, Senator, should we not go into caretaker, the no. campaign will continue on its current path to spend that money in 15, 16. Yeah, okay. So if, if, if we do go into caretaker, that current spend will stop yes, through I understand caretaker. That. Yes, but Senator, just to add to that, you've got to buy media in advance. Mm. If, if we go into caretaker, let's for argument's sake, next Monday, we can't buy mm. space in media between now and then to spend that, that money. Yeah, there's no sweat here. I'm getting it. Okay, not yet. Okay. So, have, 
Senator Dodson, yeah, sure. Just a question on that. Um, have you been involved in preparation of any uh, plans for the spend of that residual amount? No, Senator. Only what we have actually, as a department, have planned through a media buy when the campaign was developed. Okay, so there's, there's no pending proposal in relation to the spend? Um, the way that it works is um, when the campaign commences, we have a, what we call a media buy. And we, we set out a plan over the six months of the campaign as to television advertising yes. and website, etc. Um, and that is a current plan. And that plan is still in place unless we go into caretaker. But is that in relation to the seven Other, residual and, amount? And there will be, if, if caretaker hits, that money will stop and there is no other plans to and use I, that I money. I understand that. I'm just asking whether there are plans afoot now. No. Okay, thank you. Thanks, Senator Dodson. No. <coughs> okay, so for the purposes of timing, I would like, Chair, to move to Infrastructure Investment <coughs> Decision <coughs> Division, if I may. No, no, Thank you. <laughs> yes, I'll, I'll be a candidate. You behave. Mm -hmm. I'm with you behave. Do you want to go first? Wait, okay. Yeah, I just want a few of them in there and rail out progressively. Yeah, yeah. Only be a couple of minutes, Sterling. Yeah, yeah. Sure. This is the one I talked about back in 1996. You're a very patient man, Chair. In my maiden speech. <laughs> yes, mate, I have. You're mate. a very patient man. Oh, How are you, Mike? Very well, Cindy. Let's talk about the record. Here go. Right oh, out. Now, are you going to lead off? Yeah, Mr Murdoch, uh, welcome on. back. Hang on. Surprise hang estimates. On, hang on, hang on. Oh, he's right now. Was it 598 million in the budget for the inland rail for Australian Rail Track Corporation? Uh, that's that's correct, Senator. Um, 598 was it? I'm just going five, off the top of me. Uh, five, 598 million yeah. dollars is gone, or just short of that, uh, has been set uh, aside for the next stage of the inland rail project, which is the land acquisition, uh, corridor uh, planning, and all the various assessment processes. Very good. 300 million in the previous budget, was it? Uh, 300 million was established, yes. That was the government's commitment. That was established in 2013-14. So we're now making some real progress after Senator Heffernan's maiden speech back in 1996 when he said we need the Inland Rail. It took you 20 years to have to get it moving. Visionary. The, the government has committed to the project, Senator, yes. Yeah, good. So it's, it's underway, it's happening. That, that's correct. Well, a simple question, when is it going to be finished? Uh, we're aiming for... When will trains be running on it? Well, we're aiming for the no, Australian Rail Track Corporation business plan aims for about an eight-year build, about an eight to ten-year build. So it's a that. Is that, that from 2013 to 14, or from now, or from? Uh, it would be from now. I think I'll just ask Mr. Wood, but it's, it's essentially it would be about eight years from now. We might live long enough to see it, have. But you're all invited to my funeral, if I don't. <laughs> so eight years from now, you think you'll have it running? Uh, Senator Richard Wood, General Manager, Rail and Intermodal. Uh, the business plan that was um, developed started from 13, four, assumed from 2014, so about eight years from now, that's correct. However, um, you know, that could um, change, it could be ways to optimise the delivery of it, um, depending on both available finances but also the uh, particular design and techniques. That it will no doubt bring huge relief of vehicles off the Newell Highway, correct? That's correct, so one of the one of the key elements of the business plan is the diversion and the mode diversion of freight. Uh, I think the minister's on the record talking about the uh, each each train uh, would remove a, a substantial number of B doubles or other combinations from mm -hmm. the road, which would otherwise take place through the through the growth in the freight task. And just one other question, Mr. Murdoch, if I can before finishing up with you, um, the two billion dollars loan allowance in the budget for building dams. How will that be administrated to the states? Can you explain a bit to me about it? Uh, I'm sorry, Senator, that's with the agriculture and water portfolio. Well, I don't expect you to answer it then, if that's the case. <laughs> no, I, I wouldn't try to, Senator. I just thought it might have come under, under infrastructure, but of course it will be with the water portfolio. It's with the water portfolio. Thanks, Chair. Now, I'll go, before I go to Senator Stell, uh, yeah, it's true that back in 1996, um, after the fail of the first proposition for a fast train from Sydney to Melbourne, which was Kumagai TNT, if you were born then, Mr Murdoch, um, it's a while ago. You know how much the cost was for that? I worked for it. 1.4 billion, the whole thing. The reason it didn't happen, I was heavily involved to try and get it going and take the inland route, not the ski fields route. 
um, was that the dopey politicians at the time wouldn't allow the people who were building the train any of the development rights along the line. I think we should have both a fast train from Sydney to Brisbane, and, and the cost, by the way, of the, of the line and the train at that stage was less than the cost of the refurbishment of the sewage system in Sydney, and it would be a 100-year corridor. This is the fast train, not the freight train. Um, and Goulburn sort of was getting excited. Goulburn doesn't have the water supply, but places like Wagga, Wangaratta, Wodonga, you know, an hour from the city, it's just, just the thing that we need to do. But we also need, I'm coming to a question, the freight line, is it engineering, in an engineering sense, is, is it not safe or sensible to, to, if you're going to buy the corridor for a railway line from here to Brisbane, Melbourne to Brisbane, put a fast train on it as well? Um, well, high-speed op high operates to completely different technical specifications. It does indeed. It does indeed. So, is so it, uh, it could well be too dangerous to be... It, generally, they need they operate because of the Crossings speed. and all that. That's right. You need a fully protected corridor, uh, and generally they operate to a much higher uh, capacity. And generally, when you're doing freight, you need a higher axle load. Uh, and, yeah, yeah, yeah. And, uh, and you, yeah, I guess so. so uh, yeah, different yeah, technical different. standards. Yeah, but anyhow, I don't, think we sh I don't think we should forget that because I had a call the other day from China and the negotiations are going on up there now where a company wants to buy the Waiola Steelworks and as part of the deal, build the fast train. From? Melbourne to Brisbane. Okay. Yeah, uh, over to you, Stella. Yeah, good, uh, thank you. Now, I want to talk about West Connects, Mr Murdoch. And the federal government has allocated funding to West Connects via two methods, has it not? That's correct, Senator. And one is a grant of $1.5 billion. That's correct. And the other is a concessional loan of up to $2 billion for stage two. That's correct, Senator. Okay, so with respect to the grant, Mr Murdoch, how much of the $1.5 billion has actually been paid to the New South Wales government? Uh, at this point, uh, $750 million has been paid uh, from that component, Senator. Thank you. Um, when will the final instalment of the grant be paid? Uh, we anticipate, based on milestones, that we'll pay 450, an additional $450 million by 30 June this year, uh, and we anticipate the balance will be paid uh, in calendar year 16. Calendar year 16. Now, is that early? Uh, we anticipate, based on current milestones being achieved, yes, Senator, we anticipate an early uh, calendar year, so early we, financial year 16-17, so this calendar year, yep. we'll complete the balance of the payments of the 300 million. And, and how much is the balance? I'm sorry. Three, I'm 300 million, Senator. 300 million. So potentially there's another 750 million coming very quickly. That's if right. all things line up. Within months, Senator. Yep. Okay, dokie. And these are milestone payments, you that, said. That's correct. You? Yes, okay. With respect to the $2 billion concessional loan facility, what is that current status, Mr Murdoch? Uh, the, the concessional loan has been con essentially contracted or agreed to with New South Wales, uh, and that concessional loan will be paid out over the next few years in, in agreed milestone points. Uh, but the, essentially the concessional loan has been contracted. I'll ask Mr Danks to give you a fuller explanation if I can. Yeah, OK. Uh, Andrew Danks, Please. General Manager, Major Infrastructure Projects Office. Um, the first drawdown for the loan will happen before 30 June this year and it will run through to December 2019. It will be drawn down on a pro rata basis with senior debt. So we go in at the same time the senior banks put money in. So is there set payments for set dates? Uh, there is. Um, there's a schedule of, there's about 43 different payments between 30 June this year and 30 December. Could you table that for us today without me asking you to name them all now, without you taking the way I notice, could that be provided to the Secretariat so we can... Oh, I don't have it with me at the moment, Senator. I'll have to see if I can pull it together. Can I ask a, I've got a question about that as well? Senator Stirl, just because I was going to clarify exactly that, <coughs> that point on, on Sure, look, I've only got one more for uh, West Connect, so can I finish that? All right, and then, then you just got one, then I can get get going through yep, here. Okay. Yep, yep. All right. Okay. Okay. So, can that be done today, Mr. Burner? Could oh, that be we'll faxed up or something that. like that, yes, or whatever you do? Sir. Look, that'd be good. Okay. Thanks. Now, um, is the facility established and agreed? It is. It was signed, uh, I believe, 20th of November last year. 20th of November last year. Okay. That's mine for um, West Connection, and then I've got a host more. So, if you've got that one, you yes. want to do now? Okay. Well, I'm, I'm looking at. It's in Budget Paper 1, Table 7, 
um, page 333 of Budget Paper 1, details of the Australian Government general government sector items between the underlying and headline cash balance estimates. And there's a line in that that says West Connects. So, and I wanted to know whether, they, whether the figures in that are, is in fact the timeline for the drawdowns of the concessional loans. Can you just repeat which table you're reading at? Um, it's, uh, it's table seven. I haven't got it. Uh, I'm told it's page 3-33 of budget paper one. Uh, yes, that's, that's the drawdown um, year by year, Senator. Okay, so that's all right. So that says that there's 38 million that's been drawn down, will be drawn down in this financial year. That's correct. And then 6.45 next year, 7.24. And then beyond the forwards, 546 and 47, adding for 2 billion. Okay, thank you. Okay, thanks, Senator Ross. So I just want to give you a nice little deal. Mr. with your office, so I don't want to uh, and, and, you know, draw it out. So, is the Department aware of any approaches from the New South Wales Government seeking additional federal support for expanding rail freight out of Port Botany over and above the existing program? Uh, yes, Senator. The New South Wales Government has put to ourselves uh, and Infrastructure Australia a proposal for uh, further work to, to complete the duplication of the Port Botany rail line. Uh, it's a further duplication of 2.8 kilometres of rail into and out of Port Botany. That's it? That's correct. At what cost? Um, the estimated cost is around the, on the current indications, and the, we're waiting for a final project proposal, is of the order of uh, $220 million. 220 in the but order. They, New South Wales are currently reviewing the costs of that project, and we're anticipating a project proposal in the coming months, a more detailed project proposal. Okay, so we'll work on the 220 million at this stage. Is that right? Yes. Okay. And what's the benefit of these additional works? Um, essentially, it provides for an expansion of capacity in and out of the, the Port Botany area. Um, there is currently a bottleneck in that area through uh, the rail crossing, but, but also the, uh, the single line uh, has a limited capacity into the in and out of the port. Okay. I want to go to contingency reserve if I can now, please. Certainly. Could you tell us how much money is in the con contingency reserve for the infrastructure investment program? Um, Senator, is, we can give you certain amounts. This is unallocated at this stage. Um, uh, currently, there are three categories of unallocated funds in the program. Uh, they are uh, in Queensland. Uh, the latest amounts, uh, which were provided to the Queensland State Government in the program of works on following the budget, uh, there's a, a Queensland contingency of $90.42 million. Uh, there's a, there's a separate contingency unallocated at this stage for the Bruce Highway of $756.76 million. There's a, an amount of contingency in Tasmania, which is for the, the government's commitment to the freight rail project, subject to matching from Tasmania, which is unallocated to 30.41. Uh, and there is a national contingency uh, which is uh, still subject to finalisation, but currently is of the order of $1.2 billion. $1.2 billion, thanks. Now, I'm going to ask you about some profiling for, the contingent, for that contingency, <coughs> if I can. Certainly. And I want to look at the, infra so the, infra I'm sorry, the Infrastructure Investment Program contingency. So the, the total amount, what was it again? Uh, the total of those amounts I've given you is uh, 2.117. 2.117. So can we break that up into years, if we could, please? So for 15, 16? Uh, there's no unallocated contingency in 15, 16. Okay, 16, 17? Uh, 192.26. 17, 18? 177.76. Uh, 18, 19? 181.74. Uh, 19, 20? 965.24. Later years? And the balance is 600 in the out years. 600. Thank you very much. So I can go to the East West Link. Three billion contingency, if I could, please. Certainly. On budget paper number one. So it states the Australian Government contribution to the East West Link project. And I'll quote the Australian Government remains committed to the <coughs> construction of the East West Link, despite the decision of the Victorian Government not to proceed with the project. To this end, the Australian Government will provide three billion to the first Victorian Government willing to build the East West Link 
and is therefore recording this commitment as a contingent liability in the budget. Mr Murdoch, is the East West Link still part of the government's infrastructure program and plans? Uh, yes, it is, Senator. Uh, as, you've, as you've indicated, uh, the government has made a commitment and as a contingent liability should a future Victorian government seek to proceed with the project. OK, now I just want to move on to the Perth Freight Link, which has had a bit of uh, conversation around it this week and will be for months to come. Can you outline what payments <coughs> excuse me, have been made to the West Australian Government to date for the Perth Freight Link? Um, I don't believe any payments at all have been made for that project to date, Senator, by the Australian Government. OK, that makes that pretty easy then. Um, do, does the Department expect to make any payments to the West Australian Government in the near future? Uh, I'll ask Mr Pittard to give you uh, an update Mr. on Pittard, the project. Mr Pittard, you, you've got the poison <coughs> chalice. Thank you, Senator. <coughs> Roland Pittard, General Manager of the North West Roads Branch. Uh, Senator, we um, uh, don't expect to make any payments to the Perth Freight Link project this financial year. Right, OK, thank you very much. What about early next financial year? Um, I'll break that up. Sorry, I'll break that up for you. I'll talk about the budget profile if I can. So I'll get it all out in one. So I want to talk about uh, stage one and stage two, and I'm calling stage two the 288 uh, million, I think it was, for the tunnelling under those uh, uh, suburbs. Or 261, 261, sorry. Okay. So we had two lots, 925, the original one from the feds? That, that's right, and the, sub, the, the more recent commitment in the budget is 260.8 additional. Yeah, OK. Thank you. All right, so if I can break them up, Mr Pitta, if you have that information for you. If you can give me, so you said 15, 16, there's nothing, correct? Um, We've paid nothing, but is there a profile uh, for anything? Um, I, I, sorry, Senator, I, there is, I, I, can I correct myself? There's um, a $10 million payment in 15, 16 for um, the uh, uh, stage three of that project, which is some pinch point widening on the Row Highway. Oh, I didn't even have stage three. Okay, 10 um, million. Yep, that's in this year. Uh, then uh, <coughs> the 16, 17, no. Then we've got um, in 16, 17, yep. uh, we have uh, $207.7 million uh, profiled. This is stage one. No, sorry. This is the combined project. We haven't we haven't broken the project out into separate stages. Oh, okay, dokie. That's for none okay, of so the this years. Is for the, this is for the complete project. So sure. Let's go with that then. Sorry. How much was that? Two hundred and seven point seven. Yep. Uh, for seventeen eighteen, um, three hundred and forty one. Mm-hmm. For eighteen nineteen, three hundred and thirty six. Yep. For nineteen twenty. 291.1, and um, that's, uh, that's the current profile. Does that all add up? That adds up to the 925? That, that adds up to 1185.8. How much? 1185.8, yeah. which includes the um, additional funding announced earlier yep. in April. 1.2 bill, 1.1. OK, thanks, Mr Pittar. So can I move to the, the PM's Victoria announcement of $1.5 billion on April the 8th? <clears throat> and if I may ask, through you, Mr Murdoch, when did the department become aware of the PM's April 8, 2016 announcement about finally spending $1.5 billion it paid to Victoria two years ago? Um, Senator, the department was involved uh, in providing advice uh, and involved in discussions with the Victorian government in relation to developing the package over the uh, over the last few months. So I said the Victoria, the Premier, sorry, the Prime Minister's announcement was in April the eighth. So you were involved. Uh, the department was involved before the it, announcement. There, there have been talks for sure. uh, a considerable period with the Victorian state government in relation to options for utilisation of those funds. Okay. Uh, are that. That package was finalised over the last couple of months. And is there still ongoing conversations, or have they all ceased? Uh, conversations are continuing in okay. the sense that uh, the Australian government has made a proposed offer to the Victorian government. Uh, the Australian government is now initiating conversations and to sort out the details. Uh, ministers <coughs> have ministers between, of the state of Victoria and the Commonwealth uh, have met and discussed the Commonwealth position. Uh, we are awaiting a Victorian response. 
uh, to the formal proposal uh, and discussions are happening at officials level to try and sort out implementation arrangements should Victoria accept the uh, proposal. Okay, do we have any specific details of the payments? Uh, not at this stage. We're, our first stage, we've had some initial discussions at officials level in relation to projects which could proceed more quickly, such as the Monash Freeway Stage 1. Can you uh, tell us about that? Uh, the Victorian government has proposed, uh, had proposed a $400 million initial project on the Monash Freeway. The Australian government has proposed that uh, be accepted, but also a much larger package of works on the Monash Freeway, up to a billion dollars of work. Uh, that the details of that have got to be sorted out in terms of timing. Uh, additionally, we've been talking to Victorian officials about advancing projects such as the M80 uh, and the Victorian uh, uh, rail projects as well. Uh, we are obviously, depending on the timing of caretaker, those, converse, those talks will continue uh, throughout uh, to the lead up to a caretaker. Okay, so the VIX identified 400 for the Monash, but the Fed's come up and said, well, we want to give you a billion. Is that right? Uh, the Commonwealth has offered uh, uh, up to a billion dollars, yes. For the Monash? Yes. Alex Foles, Acting Executive Director. The Monash project, Monash Freeway project, is contained currently within the Western Distributor project, overall project. The Monash Freeway element of that is a $400 million project on the Monash for yep. widening. Okay. That, from, um, that project is a design and construct project. Total cost about four hundred million. So okay, but that one billion the Fed offered the, by the Commonwealth is that over and above that is, the one and a half So there's billion? an uh, there's an additional uh, three hundred million on offer from the Commonwealth, on the understanding that uh, on the condition that the Victorian government match that, and that would be a total project cost of a billion dollars on the Monash. So just so I'm not confused, the, the VIX have identified 400 million. The experts in the Commonwealth have identified we want to give you 1 billion, but we'll put up 400 million, but you have to match it with 400 million when the VIX only wanted 300 to start with. No, 400 to start with. What? Uh, it's not just me, is it? No, the, okay. so the Commonwealth is offering is proposing a Commonwealth contribution of 500 yep. million for the Monash. 500 million for the Monash. Which would so be a, a total where the Commonwealth is asking that that be matched uh, by the Victorian government, which would enable a $1 billion spend on the Monash. The initial phase one project, which the Victorian government had proposed to this point, was a $400 million project, which would have <coughs> been $200 million each. So the Commonwealth has, has said yes to proceed with that one, but also offering another 300 million, which is hoping to be matched by Victoria for further work on the Monash Freeway. Okay, I won't be cheeky because I'm not a Victorian, but that so, that sucks. So that's I mean, seriously so that's, asking Victorians to match. For, anyway, okay, I'm just going to move on. Sorry. Well, well no. While we're talking about how how did the department arrive at a figure of 500 million? Why wasn't 480 or 512? How did, how did they get 500? It's based on some preliminary work uh, that's been undertaken in relation to what uh, what other projects on the Monash uh, <coughs> would be undertaken to alleviate some of the congestion on that on that road. Obviously, that's an amount which has to be tested with the Victorian government, but the Australian government uh, wa wanted to make a contribution of that magnitude to address some of the issues on that road. It would be unfair for me to suggest that it's been tested all right. Um, can, can, I just, can I clarify, Senator Still, just yes. on those figures? Yes, so of course. That there was, so in, in, as part of the Western Distributor proposal, there was $200 million of federal money that you were committing to for that. Uh, and you were well, no, actually... It's being sought by the Victorian government. It's being sought, and you were saying yes to that, and then an extra... And then you're saying, and we'll put in an extra $300 million, as long as both of those are, are matched by the Victorian government, which would that, add up to the billion. Great. And so that $500 million that's um, listed on page 131, yeah, sure. that includes both the, <clears throat> the $200 million that was sought plus the extra $300 million. That's correct. That's correct. OK, so what advice was provided to the government on the state of negotiations between the Victorian government and Transurban over the Western Distributor Project? Um, advice was provided based on the, the reference business case that was provided by the Victorian government to, to ourselves in relation to the Western Distributor Project. That, that is a reference business case, not the Transurban uh, 
a Victorian government business case that enabled us to make some determination of the of the project at the initial stages it was, uh, and so we utilised the information from that to provide advice to the government on both the Western Distributor and also the Monash project. Sure, but no advice. You you didn't get advice from Transurban. You we, didn't see we, that advice. We haven't been provided with the <coughs> the. the, the Transurban Victorian yep. Government business case. We've been provided with the Victorian Government reference business case okay. for the Western Distributor project, which works on the basis that were Victoria to deliver the project, uh, this this would be the reference business case. Okay, Dougie. Was uh, Infrastructure Australia's advice on the announcement sought? Uh, all of the investment over. Uh, $100 million will uh, require Infrastructure Australia assessment in accordance with the government's position. But it wasn't so far. It wasn't part of the five, here's $500 million we can do up in Monash. And Not at this billion, point. We're awaiting, we will await and develop further business case in relation to the investments that will have to be put through the okay. Infrastructure Australia process. So okay. you've made the commitment prior to Infrastructure Australia <coughs> saying that it's yes. signing off on it. Well, the government's yes. position is that. <laughs> <laughs> investment will require Infrastructure Australia processes to be But completed. you've made a political a commitment. Yeah. The government's yeah. made a commitment. You didn't see my lips move there, Mr Murdoch. Yeah. See how I did that? Um, with respect uh, to the M80 Western Ring Road upgrade, also announced on May the 8th, has there previously been Commonwealth allocations for the specific work completed? Uh, there was the first stage of the of the M80 uh, project, which was agreed in 2000 and 2009. It was commenced and through to um, a, through to this is 2009. So yeah, I worked my way through. So yep. that's when, and there was a commitment. Uh, I think I stand corrected of 750 million by the Australian government, which led to a total expenditure of 1,100 million on the M80. There so, so sorry, just sorry. So there's about 400 from the Commonwealth, is that right? No, there was more than 400. We'll get, okay. you, the details. We'll get, you, the, we'll get you the details the, shortly. The remainder of the balance of the work to complete uh, the full work on the, on the M80 process, there was a commitment made in 2014 by the government uh, of the next stage of about $250 million. Uh, the offer of the remaining $350 million is the Australian government's 50% contribution to complete all of the upgrade of the M80 ring road. Okay, but as part of the 2009 announcement you were talking about with the M80 Western Ring upgrade, so am I right to say that nearly $250 million has been cut from the M80 in early 2014 from the original figure uh, from the was Commonwealth? The, the comp this, this, this Australian government has not uh, made commitments previously. Their commitments were made in 2014, and again, this new commitment to complete the Western Ring Road. No, I understand, but there was a figure, which you're going to find for me back in 2009, when we first started talking about the M80 Western Ring Road, and I'm led to believe that in 2014, nearly $250 million was cut from the M80, covering uh, the same work. Uh, uh, Senator, uh, I'd have to get you the precise details. Sure. But they're, they're, they're um, yeah, I'll have to just, yeah. have to I, just get that on. But on you're not, those. you're not yep. saying I've got this wrong. The, the, no, I'm not. But I can say to you that under the uh, from 2008-9 to 13-14, the Australian government did contribute 864 million, which upgraded 23 so kilometres of the M80 okay. at a total cost of 1.13. Sure. I just want you to tell me that I'm wrong that there wasn't a 250 million cut. Yeah. Okay. We'll take that on that. Yes, we'll I, will, I will take that on that. Yeah, sure. Okay. Now, how will safety and productivity benefits of rural and regional roads to be funded with the $345 million be measured? How will you do that? Um, that? The terms of that program are yet to be settled, Senator. So we, um, we're, but certainly the government uh, has made it clear its intention is looking for projects that will improve particularly road safety outcomes in regional Victoria, yep, good. as well as complete sections of road which actually make major improvements to safety uh, and productivity and obviously continuations of some of the programs on the Western Highway and the Princess East are projects that the government is looking to progress. So since that announcement on May the 8th, I think it was, I think it was May the 8th, uh, has there any work been done by the department? Um, we've only had preliminary conversations thus far with Victorian officials. That work's uh, yet to be undertaken. Okay, so there's no money targeted anywhere in specific? <coughs> Not at this point. <clears throat> okay, all right. What criteria, could you tell us what criteria will apply to funding under the urban congestion package? 
Again, Senator, we, we're talking with the Victorian government uh, to determine uh, they've identified projects in the past which have uh, high congestion benefit, uh, but we're yet to see a final list of projects that will proceed and criteria have yet to be developed as to how they'll be agreed. Okay, now, Chair, we've still got a few questions. Not, not that many. We, we're going through it, but can I just have a rest and give Senator Dodson a go? Oh, could I? Oh. And then we'll be finished. Can I have a go? Yep. Can we go to me first? Is that all right? How long have you, yep. how long have you got? Oh, probably 10, 15 minutes, I'd say. What do you reckon? You got oh, to go I, was just try, I was just trying yep. to finish. Yep. 10 minutes. Yep. The okay. starts now. Give me 10. We can... Thank you, Chair. Thanks, Mr Murdoch. Um, continuing, now, I'm, I'm rather confused about the, the dollars, in particular the part of the transport budget that represents actual new, newly announced investment and how much is just re-announcing money that's already been allocated in previous years. So how much, of, what part of the transport budget is new money that hasn't previously been announced? Um, Senator, there are... A range of new commitments in the in the budget. The, the, the if I can take you through those. Firstly, there are new commitments to the continuation of a number of programs which previously were not funded beyond the year 1920, uh, beyond 1819. They are the c continuation of roads to recovery, and in fact, the government has committed an additional 50 million dollars <coughs> a year to roads to recovery, and that'll continue from 2019-20 onwards. So that's so in terms of the forwards, that's an ex so basically adding on the extra year. So that's the extra year, but then continuing the program beyond the forward estimates. Yep. The government's okay. taken decisions. In, ter in terms of the forwards, yep, it's an extra 50, 50 million, and then. Uh, well, in 1920, previously there was no funding commitment to roads to recovery. So that, that, that's an additional $400 million in 1920 ongoing. Uh, similarly, there's a $350 million in 1920 ongoing for maintenance, which is provided to state and territory governments for maintenance of the yep. national network. Uh, $60 million uh, in for the Black Spot program, continuing. $60 million for Bridges Renewal program in 1920, continuing. $40 million for the Heavy Vehicle Safety and Productivity program in 1920, continuing. Uh, and $10 million for research and evaluation. Uh, so, w so when you say continuing, so for how many years out are then, is it allocated? <coughs> well, at this stage, minutes? the forward estimates is that additional year, but then the, the expectation is the program will continue okay. for at least another five years. Obviously, but yeah, beyond the forwards. Yeah. So, so there are those projects. So other ones? Uh, additional to that is the uh, announcements we've just been discussing with the uh, allocation of the $1.5 billion for Victoria. Now, that, but that $1.5 billion was... Is that the money that Victoria has already got? This uh, is a history of this $1.5 billion that was initially allocated for Melbourne Metro and then was reallocated for the East-West Link. And it's, it's money which has been provided for the East-West Link project. And um, so is this, is this 1.5, is that the, the 1.5 billion that Victoria has already got or is it the 1.5 that the Commonwealth has been sitting on you know, previously in the locked box? It's the 1.5 which was prepaid to Victoria. For right, the so it's 1.5 that Victoria already has has been... But, but which the Commonwealth had uh, up until this decision had uh, factored into its budget position for this year because Victoria was asked to return that money in accordance with the agreement that had been reached with the Victorian Government. Mm. And can I just ask, before we move off, off that, just continuing on from Senator Stell's questions, you said that in terms of the negotiation over the project that that's being spent on, that there was a range of negotiations, but then the, the announcement that was made on April the 8th, that was the first time the Victorian Government had heard of this that particular suite of projects to spend uh, that 1.5. It was the first time they'd heard of the full suite of projects, but there had been discussions for some time over elements oh, of that. Potential options, but that's that correct. was, here's the suite of projects, and now you are in continuing negotiations as to whether they want to accept that we, suite of we're projects. Awaiting, we're awaiting a formal response from Victoria in relation to those <coughs> okay. projects. Um, so that $1.5 billion has been allocated across, but, as we discussed. Which is not really new money, though, because it was previously allocated to Victoria for transport well, projects. Well, it, it was previously allocated to the East-West project and had been factored into being returned to the budget this year. So it is an allocation of new funding uh, for, the, for those projects. Um, that's $500 million for the Monash freeway. Yeah, yeah I've got all those on, on, on page 181. We've, yeah. Given we're short of time, I've, I've got that yeah. list. Okay. Uh, additionally, the Australian government in this budget has announced its commitment of $260.8 million for the uh, additional stage, the tunnel uh, section of stage two of the Perth Freightling project. 
Uh, it's also announced a $200 million commitment to uh, the Rockley Dara section of the Ipswich Motorway Stage so, 1. So those two, have they, are they actually new, previously unannounced fundings, or are they...? Uh, they are new, new commitments, Senator. So they've got a, So they they have a new commitments, particularly the new commitments and new impact on the budget bottom line. That's correct. They are they are new new projects coming into the program. Okay. Uh, and additionally, the government has provided uh, will provide fifty million dollars for business case development for new projects, particularly uh, urban uh, rail projects, and uh, as part of its cities agenda, uh, and. Um, Obviously, as we discussed with Senator Williams, the Australian government has also made a commitment of, uh, of additional new funding for the Inland Rail Project, $593.7 million for the Inland Rail Project to proceed. But that's, that's, is that on the budget books at 597? Yes, yes, it is. 593.7. Uh, yes, it is. It'll be provided, <laughs> the intention is to provide as an equity injection into the, into the Australian Rail Track Corporation for the next stage of Inland Rail. Okay. Um, the, the 50 million um, that you said, that to, which on page 131 says to allow the Commonwealth to adapt, adopt a more active role, et cetera, in preparing project and business cases, is that the same 50 million that was flagged for the Smart Cities Infrastructure Financing Unit in the budget? <clears throat> Uh, it's, it's not for the infrastructure financing. This is $50 million which is being provided for business case development, and yes, it is part of the, the government's city's agenda. But is, so it is a separate $50 million? Because we're told that there's $50 million for the Smart Cities Infrastructure Financing Unit. So this, is it the same $50 million or a separate $50 million? Uh, I'm not familiar with that <laughs> reference. On this. I, there is, there's two commitments. One is to have a, a, smart, a financing unit. Additionally to that, the Australian Government is providing $50 million for business case development, particularly for shitty shaping activity. OK, so they're separate $50 million. Uh, no, same, there's, same, uh, it's the same $50 million. The same $50 million. But It's not yet clear uh, how the financing unit will be established or funded. OK, but it's only one $50 million, so basically right. it's the same thing. That's right. Okay, so that explains why we can't, couldn't find that smart cities infrastructure financing unit anywhere else. So it's, you've basically called it two different things. It's a bit uh, well, there are two different processes. One is the establishment of a financing unit, the details of which are yet to be finalised. The second is the provision of up to $50 million for business case development, which will support the development of projects. Which okay, will support it's, the it's, it's one $50 million allocation that's, that's going to cover, cover all, all of those things. Um, so, looking then at um, public transport specifically in the budget, what are the public transport projects that, in this budget that are definitely receiving funding? Well, there are, there are a number of uh, rail, rail projects, uh, as well as obviously uh, all of the road projects do support public yes, transport. No. <laughs> Uh, given that, as we've discussed... Well, not all of them. We have discussed this, yes, but we, we specifically this, public yeah, the, transport the, projects. The predominant please. form of public transport for most Australians is bus travel, and uh, obviously improvements but to the road network do make not a always. Do make a substantial <laughs> difference to and the efficiency of the system. Look, let's not waste time discussing that. I want to particularly talk about, about other specific public transport projects. Uh, well, as I said... Buses are providing yeah, no, the public transport. But you're transport. not funding the buses, you're just putting the roads that can be used by buses. But let's talk about other public transport projects other than the roads well, then agenda. We'll, then we'll move on to rail projects. Mm -hmm. And there are a number of rail projects being funded. And I'll ask my colleagues to take you through those, uh, which includes uh, the contribution in Western Australia and elsewhere. Uh, Mr Foles? Um, Senator, so in Western Australia, there is a contribution of $490 million to forest field, the forest field yes. railway. Yes, so is, is that a new allocation? Yes. So why, Mr Maddock, you didn't mention that one as part it's, of the new... It's, a GS, it's part of a GST equalisation for Western Australia. It's, it's a payment which has been not through our portfolio, so you asked about projects in the infrastructure investment program, I spoke about those. This is being done through uh, a special payment through the Treasury portfolio as part of the GST equalisation, uh, for which which is going to be committed to the Forestville Rail Project. Yeah, OK, so it's... So it's sort of an extension to the tra to transport and infrastructure budget through... Treasury. It's been done through the mechanism of the, the, the payment okay. to WA for GST equalisation, but it will be utilised on the Forestville Rail Project. Okay. And uh, under the Asset Recycling Initiative, which is also administered through Treasury, $67.1 million has been provided to the ACT for its capital metro. Sydney, there's an agreement with New South Wales to fund uh, for ARI funding of $1.695 to go to Sydney Metro. 
Sydney's rail future will take 98.4 million under the Asset Recycling Initiative, and Parramatta Light Rail will get 78.3 million. Melbourne Metro will get 857.2 million. There, the Western Sydney, um, Western Sydney planning for the airport rail scoping and design at 27 million. Okay, and that's and that's all through asset, the asset recycling program. All of those ones that you just listed. Uh, no, the Western, the Western Sydney, Sydney one is Western through Sydney the rail is through our through our infrastructure program and through the Sydney West Airport project. Uh, and additionally, the government has also uh, recently signed off on the Gold Coast Stage Two light rail project of 95 million dollar contribution which again is through the Infrastructure Investment Programme. Right, and, again, and is that that new, newly announced funding? Uh, it, was announced, it was announced late, late last year and yes. was finalised uh, just last week with the, uh, with the uh, uh, commitment and the start of work. Okay. Um, with the Asset Recycling Programme, can you confirm what role the states and territories have had in terms of the project selection using the funds that they've been allocated? Um, all of the projects uh, have been put forward by the states and territories. Um, the, the process has been that they have identified certain projects which they have sought uh, asset recycling funds for. Uh, the Commonwealth Government then uh, considers those and uh, reaches an agreement with the state or territory that those projects will be funded under the Asset Recycling Fund. So when they were announced, though, so it's similar to the $1.5 billion to Victoria, they, the states didn't know exactly what the suite of the, which projects were being selected by the Commonwealth. No, no, the, the Commonwealth. Asset Recycling Fund works on the basis that the state and the Commonwealth will sign a, a schedule to the National Partnership Agreement which sets those out. So they've been developed jointly. So, so, so can you explain then what happened with the Victorian Government who decided to you know, go it alone with the funding of Melbourne Metro and then got this 800 and 53 million or whatever it was. The Victorian it seemed like it was rather unexpected that they weren't expecting it, to get it was that. Absolutely no, expected uh, by uh, Victoria. Victoria put forward the Melbourne Metro as one of its projects for asset recycling. Uh, so it, it would have always been working on the basis that an avenue of contribution from the Commonwealth would be the asset recycling money. So, so, the, so were the states and territories, they were aware of which projects had been funded before you know, it was made public in the budget they, papers. Yes, certainly, they, they were aware. Yeah. They put forward the project proposals and they were the subject of consultation with the states and territories in reaching that final list of, uh, of okay. projects which the Commonwealth so, would allocate asset recycling funds so, for. So when Victoria said that, you know, we were going they were going it alone with the Melbourne Metro and they couldn't wait for the, the, the Commonwealth, they actually knew that they were getting they, they the were money from asset recycling. They were certainly the aware that asset recycling money would be available uh, or could potentially Why be available. Why do you think they said they were going to go it alone then? Why? I, I can't speak for the Victorian <laughs> government. <coughs> okay. okay, I've got one, one more question. Your time's up. Yep, I'll just one, please. Go on. Okay. Um, it's <coughs> about the East West Link money that, actually, I've got two, if I could. Um, which you, you said there's a contingency. That's set aside for the East West Link. Where is that in the budget papers? It's in budget paper one, Senator, and it's on page 8 30, and it's a contingent liability, not a contingency. So, okay, so it's, a, so, it's, so it's sort of one step removed. It's not there it, as a contingency. It's a contingent liability. Ability. The money would be found should, should the need should arise. You'd then scramble somewhere to have it. Okay. Can I? My my last question is about the progress of the Western Highway duplication, in Victoria, and just um, is the department aware of the significant controversy that's currently going on with the um, loss of trees and the natural landscape features being that are being destroyed for this the building of this road, and what's the Commonwealth's view of this? Just have to. I am aware of that, but I just don't know if I've got any information at the moment, Senator. No, there were over a thousand um, trees that removed when they originally estimated there were going to be a hundred huge 500-year-old river red gums with with enormous hollows in them.
Sorry, I mean, is, the, I mean, is the department concerned about the, the problems that there have been with the, the bill? Senator, of this I road? don't have the information at hand. Notice. I'll have to take that on notice. Okay, thank you. Right. Senator yeah. Dodson. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Chair uh, uh, Sacred Heart Educated and all. Thank you, Chair. Uh, my chairs to the Secretary. My, my question is to the Secretary. In terms of Okiji, yes. um, previous budgets have retained. $339 million equity funding for development of the Okiji Port in Western Australia. Is this funding still in the budget as being paid in 2016-17? Uh, it remains in the budget. Uh, its provision remains as uh, for the project, uh, and I think at this stage it is provision for 16-17. Um, but we, we are awaiting further advice from Western Australia and the project proponents at this stage. So it is, again, provision for, but uh, not clear as to when uh, and if that pay payment would be made. Okay, because the Western Australian Government has clearly indicated it's not going to go ahead. Yeah. Um, why, why is this money being retained there? Uh, it's been retained as a commitment to the project, uh, should the project proceed. It's been retained as a potential equity injection into a project vehicle. Um, should the project not proceed, then the Australian Government would take a decision to, to no longer allocate that funding. But at this stage, the Australian Government uh, is retaining it there that should the project proceed in the future, uh, that it has made provision for it. When you say the future, what's, what, what do you define that as? Well, at, at this stage it remains. We've been moving the money forward each year over the last couple of years. Mm. Uh, it would require a future government could decide to no longer retain that commitment. Uh, at this stage, the intention is to retain it in the forward estimates over the next four years. OK, thanks. In relation to um, the uh, uh, pr profiling of projects in Western Australia, uh, the same as the as currently published on your website, are they the same as the ones that are currently published on your uh, website for the scope of the works? Uh, the scope of the works would be, remain unchanged. The, the, move, the funds may have moved, uh, depending on advice from Western Australia in relation to the drawdown of the funds. I bet they um, have. Okay. Uh, the budget shows that spending on major Western Australian projects in 2015-16 and 2016-17 is at least 44 million less than forecast in the last budget, 444 million. Uh, what is the reason behind this? Uh, I'll get that information for you, Senator. I, I suspect some of it will be the profiling of the Perth Freight Link project. Um, and I'll just get the final details of what movement of funds have taken place in Western Australia. Because some projects in Western Australia are nearing completion, like Gateway. Others are somewhat delayed. Yeah. So. And Mr. Peter, I'll just he, he's got the same list I have, so he'll read out the uh, uh, Senator, the the changes relate to um, a number of of, of of projects where um, there have either been um, some some uh, some savings or or movements to the the right. Um, so the the Perth. Uh, uh, airport Gateway WA project um, has had uh, <coughs> savings in the order of um, $42.7 million with that project uh, concluding earlier. Um, the North West Coastal Highway Manilia to Baradale has had savings in the order of um, $72 million um, and uh, there's been some reprofiling of funding for the um, Northlink WA uh, project, the Swan Valley uh, bypass component of that, um, which um, has seen $108 million move, um, sorry, $34.28 30, million move from 1516. Um, sorry, sorry, if I can. Yes. Moved from where to where? Uh, uh, this is off the, Darwin, the, the Perth Darwin Highway you're talking about. Sorry, no, I've got, I've, I've misread that line. No, that, that's good. static. Um, it, it's seen money move to the to the right for the Swan Valley bypass. Um, so it's come so off from sorry, it come from 1617 from? to 1718, Senator. So it's delayed. Um, not not delayed. It's just fitting with the construction schedule. So they haven't met it yet. Better. I beg they pardon? haven't met the, the targets yet, so that money was supposed to be this year, but now it's moved out to 1617. Is that right? Uh, that's moved from moved from 1617 to to 1718. Okay, two years away. 
All right, 34 million. Um, Sorry but, to interrupt. But, but funding st that still leaves 118 million dollars in funding for 16-17 to align align with the construction schedule. Okay, thank you. Thanks for that. Um, what's happened to the 440, 499 million extra GST money from last year? That um, that funding um, is administered by a, a, a separate um, MOU. That uh, that is applied to um, a range of uh, road projects in um, in Western Australia. Um, uh, I understand that there have been um, savings uh, in the order of uh, $26 million, uh, 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 according to uh, to that project. What project? Um, there are a series of road projects. We'll get you the details of, Senator. There are a series of road projects in Western Australia which the that $490 million was applied to. And that's been spent? That is in the process of being spent, yes. Yeah, it's if you under, can tell us what that's Most going. of those are under construction. We can get you the details of those. Yeah, yeah. So yeah. I, I, I can provide that. <coughs> well, we've got, we've got that now, Senator. Great. So there were, there were savings on the, uh, of $6 million on the Reed Highway uh, work uh, from that 499, Senator, and the Mitchell Freeway work of, uh, of $20 million. Is, is it possible to table both so those bits of information? Yeah, we, the yes. other projects, Senator, are Quinana Freeway, Row Highway to Russell Road, and it's a widening southbound. There's the Northlink WA Swan Valley so, bypass. So, sorry, put, can you put some figures around them for us, please? Because you see, as Senator Dodson said, there was $490 million. $99 was million. So far, we've identified a small amount of that. Yeah, and that money was made available to Western Australia. The shed, just look up the shed. The, we'll get you the projects and the we'll get you the projects and the amounts that were allocated to them. Uh, the uh, what Mr. Pittar was giving you was the savings to date on a number of them, which is being reinvested in WA. Great. Okay. Can we have that before we leave today? Uh, yes, we'll try and do that. Please. So we won't hold you up now. Yeah. Sorry, Senator. Yeah. So can we move to uh, <coughs> rail spending uh, from the budget paper um, one, statement five, table fifteen. <clears throat> There's a series of matters laid out, items laid out in the sub -functions. The 2016 budget explains this as expenses on rail transport will cease from 2018-19, reflecting the completion of existing rail projects and the government's decision to provide equity investment in future rail projects. Has the federal government decided to take equity in public transport projects? Um, to this point, our equity injections are through the Australian Rail Track Corporation, uh, but the Commonwealth has, as part of its innovative financing principles, left open the opportunity for future projects to be done through equity, yes. Is, is it re we, reasonable then to assume that that'll be in terms of freight rail? Uh, at this, to date, it's been in freight rail through Australian Rail Track Corporation, but in the future, we've <coughs> left open potentially for looking at urban rail as equity injections uh, in the future, but that would be subject to reaching an agreement with the state government, who are the owners often of the public systems, to create the sort of vehicles you could put equity into. Okay, thank you. Chair, I have some questions too. Uh, yeah, well. Can I? Uh, Thanks, Chair. Do you want to do your one? Yeah, I do. Well, get off that thing and get onto it. <laughs> yes, Chair. <laughs> Mr Murdoch, just this amount of money that the Feds, <laughs> or you gave uh, the Victorian Government for this East West Link, how much is that amount of money again? 800 million or something? Uh, there's a commitment of 3 billion for the East West Link. Now, did you hand over 3 billion? Uh, 1.5. 1.5. And you haven't got it back? Uh, no, Senator. The, uh, the you asked for it back? Uh, yes, Senator. What's the response? Uh, the Victorian Government has uh, put an alternative of, of other projects that the money could be spent on, uh, and the Australian Government has reached a decision to, uh, to allow Victoria to apply that money to other projects which have been announced in Victoria. Right. So they've kept it all this time? They have, but we have required that all of the interest earned on that initial $1.5 billion also has to be applied to agreed projects. Yeah. Not bad. Cancel the project and keep the money. You done? Yeah, I'm done. Can I come back, Chair? Can I just get following on from Senator Dodson's question to Mr Murdoch and Co. in relation to the uh, 
the rail transport spend of 2018-19. Could I get a breakdown, Mr Murdoch, and how much of that will be spent on public rail infrastructure? Uh, yes. I'll just get that information for you. I sure. think Mr Folds gave you a list earlier of uh, rail projects. Yeah, he was um, talking to Senator Rice. Rice, was, yeah. yeah so, but I just want to get I just want to get the spend. I don't want to know you've done that. Yeah. Senator, if you're referring to the table in budget paper one, that, that um, table is prepared by the Department of the Treasury. It includes expenditure across the Commonwealth, so we don't have the precise breakdown okay. of that table. The projects in the asset recycling, for example, we don't have the final profile for that as yet. That's a matter for the Department of the Treasury. Uh, we could, if, um, if useful, go through the profile for projects that we administer. Oh. No, I, don't want to waste, I, I, don't, I don't want to waste time, that's fine, yep. but I just have to ask you guys, because you are the main department, if you could tell me how much the public rail spend was, it would be great. We, we mm. can give you that on notice, Senator, if that's all right. Is that another one I can get before we all run away tonight at uh, 11 o'clock? We'll try. Oh, yeah. Yeah. If that's possible. Well, it's the well, by the time we all run up, no, I don't want to forecast any yeah. yeah. we, we can certainly give you the ones that we administer, and then, yeah. as I said, we don't have yeah. the profile for the asset recycling. No, that's fine. Things. Could you tell us what... Well, OK. Yeah. But if you could tell us what you do, can that be come, come yeah, forward we'll now? Yeah, we'll try and do that this evening. Yeah. As a figure? Yeah. OK. You'll provide that yes. before you, dinner you break. Just, black, just to be money? clear, um, Senator, which Sorry? You, just to be clear, that was across the forwards? You yes, to please. Oh, that's, I'm, yeah, I'm talking 2019-20. Oh, 19-20. Because that was in relation to Senator Dodson's earlier question. Okay. Well, Mr Secretary, do you have black spots money? Yes. Well, yeah, there's a black spot up my driveway. Is the I, I declare an interest, Chair. There's a black spot well, on your record. Well, as, as, as you know, as you know, Chair, fond as you are, as I am, fond of you as I am, I don't think I can stretch the program to look after your driveway. And nor are you sure, Chair. Chair. Just, just on that very issue, well, I've got a dirt road to my farm. It's very corrugated and rough. Mr. Murdoch, well, right, can have a look at it. No, I shouldn't have said it. <laughs> back well, to you, Senator. Yeah, thanks, Chair. Now I want to go back to the 2016 spend. And I asked what new government funding has been provided. Now, I'm going to name a few projects. If we could run through them quickly, it would be greatly Sorry. appreciated. So the following government projects. So the new spending in this budget. The South, Austral the South Australian Northern Connector. Uh, yes, Senator, there is provision for uh, funding this coming financial year, 16-17, for Northern Connector. Yep. How much? that number. Northern it may seem boring to those listening, but we'll rattle through them. A bit of luck. Never boring, no, not boring for me. No, that's true. <clears throat> so you just want 16, 17 so, for Northern Yes, Connector? I do, please. So this is new funding. This is a new project which will yeah. start yeah. Uh, calendar okay. year 16. So new government funding. So the Northern Connector Centre. The profile is for 1617 is 84 million. Thank you. For, seven, for 1718. Oh, okay. well, you want to go through them more? Okay. Well, Keep going. Yep. Is 284. Yep. 1819 is 280. 280. Yep. And 1920 senator is 140 in the forwards. Okay. Look, I appreciate that, but I, I, I'm not chasing the, the, the profile. I'm just actually looking at the, the extra announcements. Does that make sense? Yeah. So, yes. so if I can just get that. So the total Australian government funding is $788 million. OK, for the, South Australia, the Northern Connector, right, The eh? Northern Connector, that's correct. The Armidale Road, I like that Armidale one. Armidale Road is $114 million. Thank in you. Western Australia. Gold, yep. Gold Coast Light Rail Stage Two. That's ninety-five million. million. Yes, beautiful. Uh, the extra funds for the Perth Freight Link, which we discussed earlier. Uh, Just confirmed. Two hundred and sixty point seven. Yeah, you did say uh, that. Uh, uh, correction, please. Uh, Armadale Road is one hundred and sixteen, not one hundred and fourteen. That's even better. Okay, one hundred and sixteen. Thank you. The fifty million to pay merchant bankers to develop business cases. Ha ha. That's fit. Just seeing if you're listening. Okay. 
I'll just say, so I'll talk about merchant bankers, you all laugh asleep, but you lot woke up. I thought that was a try -off. Okay. What about the 19, the 2009, it was, the 2019 20 extension to the Roads to Recovery program? Uh, that's four, 400 million. <coughs> are these all extra money, you're telling me? This, yeah, this, yes, Senator, they are all new commitments. This is all new commitments. Since the last budget, yes. Okay. All right. Uh, black spot programs? Uh, additional $60 million in 1920 and ongoing. Uh, heavy vehicle program? Uh, six, uh, $40 million. Okay. Extension to the Bridges Renewal Program? $60 million per annum. And the National Network Maintenance? $350 million per annum. Beautiful. No worries. Can we move on to Northern <coughs> Australia Infrastructure Facility, please? Uh, Senator, we don't administer the Northern Australia Infrastructure Facility. That's now with the industry portfolio. Sure. OK, but you would have had some um, uh, involvement determining the projects, I take it? Uh, not for the infrastructure facility at this stage. The, the legislation only recently passed the, the Senate uh, and the, the various instruments are now being put in place. But uh, to this point, we, we haven't been involved in the administration or, or the selection of projects in that one. OK, all right. <coughs> All right, and just to confer, sorry, earlier, but I'm just, sorry, going back to those programs here that I just talked about, it is the case, isn't it, that all these are being funded from within the existing program? Uh, no, they are additional funding for it's the- all additional. In yeah, 1920. Did, I thought you did say that, okay. All right. Can I clarify, some of them are being funded out of unallocated, <coughs> the unallocated funds, and they, is it a redirection of unallocated funds? Uh, well, no, all of these sub-programs, uh, the Roads to Recovery, <laughs> Maintenance, Black Spots, Bridges, Heavy Vehicles and Research, uh, are new commitments which have been funded. Right, so back to the NAFE, if I can. I understand what you're saying. So you're saying you, you, you haven't played any role in determining projects that might qualify for the funding? Uh, not to this point, Nothing. Senator. Oh, OK. All right. Can we go to Northern Australia Roads? I know Senator Dodson has an interest here, Chair. Certainly, Senator. No worries. As I do, too. So has the, the um, is the outlay for that 600 million? That's the title program, yes, title Senator. Program. Okay. So, and there's been expressions of interest um, that have closed in January this, this year, is that right? That's correct. Um, we received, we, we've been receiving further business cases more recently. I'll ask Mr Pitta to give you an update. I think the, we, we advised the states uh, were putting in business proposals right through to the end of March. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Mr Murdoch. Correct. Um, so the state, the northern, the three northern jurisdictions have provided um, submissions to the program, Senator, uh, in response to um, uh, uh, a request from uh, the minister to, to put forward submissions. Um, and. Um, that those submissions are, uh, have come forward. States and territories <coughs> sought um, some additional time uh, to put forward some of those submissions um, to around sort of February and March, uh, and, and the department's been in the process of, of assessing those, those submissions, Senator. Okay. Can I ask how many were received at the close of uh, January uh, 29? Um, Senator, I believe, I believe uh, the department received in the order of, um, of, of 60 uh, submissions from, from jurisdictions all up. Okay. And uh, what's the total value of those expressions of interest bids? Senator, um, uh, I think the, the, uh, the total value was in the order of um, in the order of $3 billion, if I, 2.7 to $3 billion, if my memory serves me correctly. So around $3 billion. And so what happens from now? What happens from here? Um, ultimately, Senator, uh, it's a matter for um, the, de the department providing advice to, to the minister uh, and, um, and, and the minister making decisions uh, on, uh, on those submissions. Okay, can you just clarify for me which minister is going to make those decisions? It would be the Minister for Transport and Infrastructure, Minister uh, Chester. Mr Chester, okay, thank you. Thanks for that. Uh, what, role, uh, what role is your department playing in this process and uh, compared with the Department of Industry? 
Uh, we, we have uh, responsibility for the Northern Australia Roads package, so uh, all the submissions have come to us. So we've coordinated the jurisdictions and also, and then uh, undertaking the assessments <coughs> of each of the proposals for the government. <coughs> so uh, our, our our role is to uh, to get the proposals brought forward and then assessed and provide advice to the minister in, in relation to uh, which projects we we think are the more uh, are the are the more uh, ones with the highest degree of uh, productivity and efficiency and safety outcomes for Northern Australia. Thank, thank you. Uh, in terms of beef roads, um, is there an allocation of 100 million there? Yes, there is. And how many bids have you received under this program? Senator, um, where uh, we ran a series of roundtables with, with industry uh, and using uh, the CSIRO to assist with um, a model that they've developed to identify the highest, uh, um, the roads that identify, uh, generated the highest returns to the beef industry. Um, the last workshop was held in Darwin in early March. Um, the Minister uh, has now sought submissions from the three nor northern jurisdictions based on those round tables. Uh, so so they, are, uh, they are still to come to government for consideration. So we're still waiting on those submissions. Okay, so can you give me an idea of the total of those expressions of interest? Um, we, d we don't actually have them as yet, Senator, but the CSIRO modelled around, um, around 60 different scenarios that had come from various um, stakeholders and industry participants. Okay, and, and that's within the scope, is it, of the 100 mil? But they were within the scope of the 100 million. Uh, and so if I can move then to uh, road construction savings. Um, has the department estimate savings on construction costs arising from the cooling off in the construction sector? Has there been a rise in your costs? That, we, that's more broadly, presumably, Senator, than, than just Northern Australia? Yes. Senator, we, we, we know we are getting much more aggressive pricing in a number of jurisdictions. Uh, we haven't done uh, modelling per se, but we are starting. We're doing some benchmarking work at the moment with the jurisdictions. We are seeing some very good price uh, reductions below the estimates that were put in place, and we, as we've outlined earlier today, we are starting to see some savings, particularly in Queensland, uh, Western Australia, uh, think, and New South Wales as well. But we can't give you a figure which says what is the sort of percentage we're getting better. It varies project to project. Okay, but is there any way of of um, establishing what does the federal government uh, take to ensure that the states just don't pocket the, the savings? Um, well, we, through the tendering processes that are undertaken by the jurisdictions that we're intimately involved in, Senator, <coughs> those tendering processes are open tenders and so the market will dictate what the prices are and the, the market has been delivering very competitive prices at the moment. Have you got any idea what the savings might be in the scope of that? Well, the savings occur project by project, Senator, right. and I mean, I'm it, it, not trying to be difficult, but, no, but no, any, fine. but every project is actually unique, and so you could have savings in a pre-construction phase and in the main construction phase, and what that can mean is that a risk that you thought might be there didn't eventuate, and as a result, you didn't have to pay the money if that had happened. So if you're building a road over a piece of land that maybe has a mine void underneath it and you weren't aware of it, then the cost of dealing with that could be a significant impost. Likewise, the reverse is also true. If you've prepared for that and it doesn't happen, that can result in a saving. And these things are reviewed periodically and the um, in the tender process as states who do the work on our part and with us involved in the steering groups and the project steering groups, we see how those uh, those prices sure. match construction and when savings are available, they're available to be reallocated. And, and does it vary in terms of rail and road or...? Uh, it doesn't. We're, we're certainly seeing much much better price outcomes at the moment in the road sector. Yes. Right. Uh, it's, it's harder in the rail area to see Not at this stage. Um, we haven't got as broad a range of projects but certainly in the road sector, we are, start, we are seeing significant uh, savings coming through based on cost estimates that were originally provided. And, and, and in terms of the states, are you seeing any variations there in terms of...? Uh, we're certainly seeing uh, 
very good prices in Queensland. Uh, Western Australia, probably a little bit less. i am just mm. checking my offices. Uh, but, and certainly in jurisdictions like New South Wales, where there's a lot of work, we're still getting very good prices there through, uh, through competitive processes. So it's right across the country, there's been certainly uh, uh, better price outcomes being achieved. And you see big construction companies moving from one state to the other, to, which reflects the market conditions in the state that they're in. So there has been some movement of construction people and equipment and machinery from um, from Queensland down into New South Wales, where there's a large amount of work, on, particularly on the Pacific Highway. That's why it's important if you can get me that information that I requested on the $490 million gift to WA, which still doesn't match our GST steel, it would help Senator Dodson and I yep. actually see where the savings mm -hmm. are and alleviate any fears from, from us that the state government might be pocketing it. Yeah, thank you. Thank you, Mr Chair, Mr Acting Chair. He's gone. <laughs> Senator Rice, did you have any further questions? I did. I've had some more Thank questions. you for your patience. More questions on um, West Connects and whether the department has received an updated business case for West Connects. Yes, there was an uh, updated um, strategic business case was um, was provided in November last year to the department and to Infrastructure Australia that uh, reflected the expansions of scope of the project which were announced by the New South Wales government late last year. And what are the, um, what are the requirements for, for the business cases that the department requires uh, in terms of its, you know, its detail and all of the information that's required? I understand uh, there's, there's a, a range of different um, certainties, I suppose, in business cases. There will certainly uh, we and Infrastructure Australia do certainly set out a, a, a range of things we're looking for in the business case. It covers the project proposal, the details of the scope uh, and the construction envisaged, and, and also the financial position vis-a-vis -vis the, the benefit. We look for a benefit cost analysis, for instance, or another evaluative techniques. We look at uh, the project scope and we look at the, uh, the costs involved. So there's a whole range of things in that frame which we look for in the business case. Um, and including so, the needs analysis and options analysis and the like that takes place as part of any business case. So the business case, the updated business case that you received in November, so you've signed off on that as being sufficient and the, the final business case that you need in order to be able to, to hand over the money? Uh, yes, we believe it's a robust business case, as does Infrastructure Australia. Right. Um, and there's a West Connects Interdepartmental Steering Committee, um, I understand. There is as a senior steering committee for the project. That's got a federal government representative on it. Who the, is that federal government representative? Uh, it's, it's myself and Mr Folds. Right. OK. Thank you. Can I ask a couple of Certainly. In relation to roads in the north? Certainly. Have you had any expressions of interest in, in the following roads, in the Dampier <laughs> uh, uh, Peninsula Road and in the Tanami? and in the, the Gibb River Road. Have you had any expressions of interest in those matters or have there been any tenders let in relation to those? Um, certainly, as part of the Northern Australia Roads Package, yes. we've had uh, proposals brought forward by the Northern Territory Government in relation to the Tanami, the upgrade of the Tanami Road. Well, I'll just see the, the Gibb... I'm not sure we can go through all the, yeah. all the proposals. Certainly, I can confirm the Tanami is, is, a, is one of the major um, proposals from the Northern Territory Government. I'd have to take the others on notice, if you don't mind, Senator, and right. get you that detail. Yes, that'd be great. Uh... Can I just ask them before we, before we do go? So I take it the Northern Territory Government, has their expression of interest been from the Tanami down the bottom end? <laughs> or the Tanami all... I'm just thinking $600 million is, is, a lot of, <laughs> is a lot of money, but it's not a lot of money in what we uh, actually need. The, the Northern so... Territory Government is looking for the, com for the upgrade of the whole road, the whole Tanami road. Whole road. And nothing from the Dampier da da Peninsula or Gibb River? Beg your pardon, Senator. Nothing. So, as, Senator is there anything on the Dampier not, or Gibb River? Not familiar with the Dampier Peninsula. Peninsula. Look, I'm, 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 I, can't, I can't answer that question no. accurately, Senator, I'm afraid. I, I'm not familiar. I, I don't think, from recollection, it's one of the projects that's been submitted, but we'll check and come back to from you. From a greedy point of view, from Senator Dodds, and I'm backing him 100%, we just want to make sure that <laughs> our state gets a little bit of a... Yeah. is up there on the starting block, too. Yeah. yeah. Could you uh, we'll just take it on those and let us know? We'll, we'll certainly we'll check which, which pro projects yeah, Western yeah, Australia's put in.
Great, thank you. Thank you. I did have so the infrastructure uh, investment. Yep, yep, sure. and just in, it was something I overlooked in the West and on West Connects, and and apparently, and I don't know the terminology, but again, going back to the business case, that the department asked for a, a P90 business case. Is that uh, the, the terminology it, two it years is, ago? Uh, yes, that, yes, that's yes. essentially uh, the level of assurance, which means that the project is likely to um, be within 90% of the estimated cost. Mm. So is the, the updated business case that you've got now, is that a P90 business oh, case? Is. New South Wales consider yes, it to be a, a yes. P90 business, business case. And you're, you're happy and with it being a P90? And Infrastructure Australia is yes. of that view too, yes. Being a P90 business right. case. Okay, and is the department yeah. currently looking at or assessing <laughs> the Western distributor at all? I know there's a business case into Infrastructure Australia, but is uh, there... Yes, we are, and as I indicated earlier to Senator Stirl, it is uh, the, business, the Victorian government reference business case. It is not the final transurban Victorian government business case. It is their reference business case, essentially their public sector comparator business case, mm -hmm. and we have undertaken an assessment of that for the Australian government, yes. Right, and do you expect to get the, the transurban Victorian government, you know, the final business case? Uh, that will... I, we don't. I think the, the indications thus far are that Victoria is proceeding with its own uh, assessment of that process and has indicated its intention to uh, negotiate an agreement with Transurban for that project. But you've, you have got some funding in, in it in as far as that you're funding that the, um, 200 million that was part of the Western Distributor well, we, we've asked for the case. We've asked for the Monash to be taken out of the Western Distributor case and be dealt with as a separate project. Uh, so, and the Australian government has made no other commitment to the Western distributor. Right. So, um, so in terms of, well, let's. But you have got that engagement through, at the moment through the because the business case for Western distributor includes the Monash as part of it, doesn't it? That does. Yes. And so, currently, in terms of that two hundred million dollars. Um, you have got that engagement in the overall Western distributor plus Monash. Well, we, we, we are treating the Monash discussions as separate now. We, we would like to proceed with the Monash as separate to the Western distributor delivery case model. Um, have you... I understand that well, we have been told that it, there have been some in, um, independent peer reviews done of the economic modelling and the transport modelling for the Western distributor, including the, the Monash part. Have, has the department received copies of those independent peer reviews? Uh, not, not to my no, knowledge. Not to my knowledge, Senator. Senator I think no. they've been undertaken for the Victorian government. And have, have you been made aware of the existence of those peer reviews? We're aware of the existence of them. Uh, I'm aware of the, the, some of the people who've been involved in those peer reviews, but to my knowledge, we have not been provided with that material. No, would you expect to be provided with that material? And would that would that have an impact on whether you should hand over the you know the two hundred million dollars to the, the Monash part of the combined Western distributor Monash project? I think those my understanding is those peer reviews are looking uh, much more at the other elements of the Western Distributor project, in particular the revenue stream that's available from the future of the concession on CityLink and also the way in which that is then used to fund the Western Distributor project. Um, so I, I wouldn't expect so, unless Victoria was of the view to include the Commonwealth in that transurban negotiation, which my understanding at this stage Victoria is not, uh, it's unlikely we'd be provided with that material. But I, my understanding is there's also an independent peer review of the transport modelling, which would also include transport modelling for the Monash section of it, I would expect. Uh, I'd, I'd have to check that as to whether that, but I'm not aware we've been provided with that unless it's been referenced in the, as I said, the comparative business case which we've been provided, which I don't think it was. Okay, thank you. Stronger, where's the uh, stronger community? Uh, that's here in infrastructure investment. Oh, okay, great. Well, we've still got some questions we want to fly through if we can. Yep. So you just tell us how many full applications did the department receive for the Stronger Communities Program? Certainly, Senator. I'll ask Ms Wall to give you those numbers. Um, oh, great. While you're doing that, just in all the excitement I forgot, just back to p phrase very quickly. Am I right did it, that there's been an application for about $3.5 billion worth of work? Is that right? Uh, it's a large number for beef roads. I don't know. Yeah, sorry. Just going to get this right. I think it was around $3 billion for Northern yeah, Australia yeah. roads. Um, beef. Oh, yeah. Northern yeah. roads. We Sorry don't know the final amount information. for beef roads yet, but I, I anticipate it will be significantly oversubscribed. 
Yeah, absolutely. So it just means the Dampier Peninsula then Senator Dodson gets it all. No, that's fine, thanks. <laughs> and they'll have to all Senator, wait. Senator Rice, just before um, this question is answered, it's a P50 business case. That means it's a uh, that means it's a 50% probability that the number will come in at or below. So only a P50. No, not not only P50 is a legitimate business case, and this P50 is is a standard in in a business case. Right. Uh, um, my, and P90, um, and it's about the level of assurance, and they're both robust and strong measures. But I'm so is is a P90 more robust and stronger well, than a P50? It's like a, it's a standard deviation, effectively. So yes. yeah, if you have a bigger number, then if you have a bigger number. No. Then your project is um, more likely to fit yeah. within that can, bigger can number. Can I confirm no. that I've, so it's I'm, a more, if we don't yes. get I'm told that the department requested a P90 business case when it was first engaged in whether it was going to fund WestConnex two years ago. Does that confirm that that's the case? The only thing that I'd have to check, and I'll have to take this on notice, is whether the original business case that was assessed by IA and rated as threshold was P90 or P50, and so I'll just have to um, take I've, that I've, I've check. been led to, my, I've been told that the department requested a P90 business case mm -hmm. two years ago, and that in fact you haven't received a P90 business case. I'll have to take that on notice, Senator. I can't recall two years ago. Right. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Oh, sorry, I, I interrupted you in all the excitement. So I was asking how many full applications did the, the department receive for the Stronger Communities Program? Yep, Ruth Wall, um, Acting General Manager, Investment Coordination and Stronger Communities. For round one, um, we received a total of um, 1,971 applications. And for round two, which closed um, last Friday, the 29th of April, we received 1,307. Thank you. So I note that round one of the Stronger Communities Fund closed at the end of October 2015, that's correct? That's correct. And, uh, okay, so of these, how many of these, you told me 1,971, they've all been fully assessed? No, Senator, we still have um, 305 um, applications that we're still assessing, mostly waiting on applicants to provide us with information that we need to finalise the assessments. Okay, so have there been any that have been assessed, ticked off and all good to go? Oh yes, Senator. Okay, we've would had, you like to tell us how many? We've had 1,438 projects approved. Very good. How many rejected? We've had um, 134 applications have been um, deemed ineligible for funding. Oh, okay. And then 63 have withdrawn during the process. How many? 63? 63 have withdrawn. Is it possible to get all those details on notice? Tabled? Sorry, Senator, yes. those numbers again. Who they are? Who they are. Oh, sorry. Yeah, sorry You're they're... asking for the yeah, details the are. of yeah. the ones that have been withdrawn? No, the ones that are successful. Okay. Yep. They're yeah, available um, on the web as well as we um, finalise the grant agreements. Good. So that they're all available on our website, Senator. Oh, they're all there? Okay, yeah. even the ones that are rejected? No, just no. the successful ones that have been contracted. Yep. Okay, and we can't get the ones that were rejected? Uh, Judy Zelke, Deputy Se oh, hello, Secretary Ms. Server. Selke. Been trying to be quiet, Senator. Mm -hmm. um, I, I will you just know, Ms. Selke told me to go jump in the lake the, the most nicest way in writing there last week. It was really well done. Uh, I'm sorry you feel that way about my letter, Senator. That was quite smooth the you way you did. You didn't write my letter as well. Did anyway, you? sorry, sorry, I digress. Uh, Senator, I, I just wanted to note that with our granting programs, um, it's not general practice for us to advise unsuccessfuls in that regard. It's not something whereby we actually ask our grantees whether they're prepared to have their names put forward publicly if they're not successful. Okay, that's fine. So how many MPs would have a list of all these projects assessed? Uh, Senator, they'd have a list for their particular electorate. So every MP has a, a list? M each MP has their own list. Of only the successful? Um, they would know which projects of theirs were in ineligible as well. Oh, they would? Yeah, okay. we inform them um, as we go with So projects. that's every MP? Every, every MP would know for their electorate only. OK. All right, no worries. So can you tell us um, the total value of the projects recommended by local <laughs> members to the department for round one? Um, so the total value of applications submitted for round one are 21.8 million. Million. So do we know how the remaining funds will be allocated? Um, 
Is so a million left over. Isn't it? Uh, yeah, there's t it's a 22.5 um, million yep. dollar program. Mm -hmm. um, so we have contacted each of the local members, and um, they have the opportunity to submit um, more projects. Um, but there's been no decision in regards to how the funding, if it's not used, will be utilised. So, okay. Senator, for those projects that were deemed ineligible, MPs were able to replace those. Uh, with, with other, other projects? With other projects. Oh, okay, okay, okay. So, of the money that's left, about a million dollars, do we know when that will be exhausted? There's no decision in relation to that at this stage, um, okay. Senator. And um, uh, Ms Wall was probably about to say that there's $15.9 million worth of approvals to date so far from that money. Of the $22.5 million? Yes. What was, where did I get 21? 21. What was the, what was the 21? The 21.8 was the amount of applications we have received. Oh, okay. So there's $6 million left over, about $6 million. So the, the 15.9 is what has actually uh, is the value of applications approved to date. So if we go into caretaker mode, what happens to the six million? The um, program, uh, Senator, is something that is decisions are taken by uh, the department under delegation. Therefore, the program will continue throughout the caretaker period. I will in taking okay. decisions. So um, uh, members of parliament have considered the applications um, that were put forward to them and submitted those then for, um, for further assessment in regard to it. If they are eligible and found um, suitable uh, value for money, then they will be approved and then funded. So the department can tick off in caretaker yes. mode, makes no difference? Yes. Okay, if there's any money left over, what happens to it? Uh, Senator, that would be a consideration for government uh, once we finish the two rounds of the program. Okay, no worries. Um, when do you, do you expect to complete all assessments for round one? Senator, we're hoping that uh, assessments will be completed for round one this month um, and uh, for round two we hope that we would be finished by June. By June? Okay, Doug. It could, sorry, end of July. Sorry, Senator. End of July, okay. So, how, so I'll talk about round two. How many full applications did the department receive? It was 1,300, you said, wasn't it? 1,307. Okay. It's, it's a lot less than round one. Do we know um, why? I, we, a number of um, members have asked for an extension and we're currently going through contacting all members to find out um, what their plans are for the future in regards to submitting more applications. <clears throat> sure. Okay. So is it possible to get a list of projects submitted in order of submission from, uh, from which electorates? Can we do that? Uh, Senator, um, uh, again, the, we have the issue then of who is unsuccessful in relation to that. Um, uh, uh, we would, of course, be able to provide you, as it will be up on the website, with those that are successful from round two. So you couldn't just give us a list without the unsuccessfuls? Uh, well, we don't know if they're unsuccessful yet, Senator, for round two, because we haven't assessed them we as yet. We have done the assessments yet on round two. Oh, you still... Oh, no, but so we're oh, completing sorry, round one. They yeah. closed on Friday yeah. and we're chasing up those MPs who are yet to submit uh, applications or have not fully uh, submitted applications up to the amount that's available to them. Okay. Did you do it? No, that's fine. Did you do any forward work thinking or expectations of how many projects you would uh, have received for the program? Well, Senator, um, uh, each uh, member of parliament is able to put forward applications to the value of $150,000. Yeah. Obviously, um, the number of applications then is dependent on the projects that come forward. Um, uh, there is a maximum limit of uh, $20,000 um, per, uh, per grant. Um, so if, for example, somebody only gives, you know, $20,000 projects and won 10000 then it'll be a very low number, whereas if somebody, uh, an MP, has projects that are on average, say, two dollars or $3,000 each, then, um, then, you know, you'll have a higher number. So it's not really possible to predict an exact number in relation to it. Uh, therefore, our gauge was what we received for round one. OK. All right. Which was about 600 difference. And 1,900. Yeah, but 600 difference. Right. Yeah. Okay. So has the department or is the department aware of the minister receiving any representations from MPs regarding the speed of the processing applications for the fund? Uh, Senator, the um, program has um, taken quite considerable um, effort uh, to be able to get underway. Um, therefore, yes, that we are behind time and therefore uh, the department as, as well has received considerable uh, representations on how we can um, improve the speed of processing of from applications. MPs. <clears throat> um, uh, from both the, uh, um, the grantees themselves as well as from members of parliament. Is it possible to get a list of those? Uh, Senator, we can take that on notice. Sure. Thank you, Ducky. 
Can I go to Senator Dodson or whoever else? Yeah. 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 Whoever else it may be. Uh, Longgrain's had enough one yet. Yeah. <laughs> I've got a bit more I could ask. I just want to, say, I want to clarify you something. You want to toss? Patty, you have a crack, mate. Uh, oh, but Scott, Senator Ludlam would like to have you, a What are you up to? Uh, hopefully. You here for mischief? Or you... <laughs> we are really getting How much time do you need? Because we're... Five minutes. All right, I'll give you five and that gets as long as you... Dinner at six. As long as you <laughs> promise me you leave the room. <laughs> 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 do you want it in writing? No. <laughs> I don't put stuff like that in writing. Um, so a short while ago, the Prime Minister showed up in Perth and announced another $200 million for a tunnel to go into Perth Freightland. Now, I'm really interested to know as forensically as you can identify for us in a step-by-step -step manner how this act of genius came to be and what visibility you folks had of it before it was announced. Um, Senator, I'll ask Mr Pinto to give you the details. Essentially, uh, I think as we discussed previously, in going to market for prices, the West Australian Government looked at options for the Stage 2 development uh, and, was, and asked tenderers to price uh, options, including tunnel options. Uh, my understanding is that that uh, process took place and the Western Australian Government brought forward uh, a <coughs> proposal and took the decision to incorporate the tunnel option into stage two of the project. Uh, so it came out of the Western Australian uh, tender and evaluation process. And do you folk lay any kind of critical thinking against a decision like that or you just roll with it? No, we've been involved in discussions and considerations, and Mr Pittar can give you a description of those, but we have been involved in uh, extensive discussions with the West Australian officials in relation to the options, including the tunnel option. Bob, is that a... That, that, that's correct. Uh, thank you, Senator. So um, uh, the, the Western Australian Government had been looking at various options around uh, potential different um, alignments for Section 2 of the project. Um, and uh, had worked with tenderers to come up with uh, uh, other uh, options as part of the procurement process. You're still working with Leighton's. They were identified as the preferred tenderer. There wasn't quite a contract <coughs> signed, but the state narrowed it to one preferred tenderer late last year before the Supreme Court threw everything up in the air. Is it Leighton's that you're referring to as the tenderer, or do you mean the Western Australian Government as proponent? Um, I believe that Leighton's uh, is one of the, the consortia, so that so that the Western Australian government has been asking um, uh, preferred tenderers, and, and I think that the other preferred other tenderer as well to to look at um, options around the, the the section two of the of the tunnel. Late in 2015, other tenderers were actually set aside. Latents was announced as the preferred supplier. Yeah. If you're making an announcement to us at estimates tonight that other tenderers are still in the mix, no, I'm just giving you the opportunity no, to, I'm not, to be I'm clear. not going to do that, Senator. I'm not doing that. You I kind think, of I just think it, must, it must be Leighton's. Yeah. It's, this is a, for, an, for $1.2 billion worth of Commonwealth money, you're curiously unclear as to who the proponent is and who the tenderer is. Well, the, the proponent's the Western Australian Government. So, tick. And who's the tenderer? I, I don't have the, all that detail in front of me, Senator. I believe it's Leighton's. It's reasonably basic detail. All right, we'll, t we'll take your word on that. Um, have you seen any kind of detailed design work, alignments? Where are the diesel stacks going to go? For a, let's start with that. The detailed design work um, will be undertaken as, as part of uh, the process going forward. Um, so uh, that would, would be the normal course of events uh, once funding commitments are made and decisions are uh, uh, are made around uh, the final alignment. So when will we be able to tell residents where the, where the uh, I don't know what the technical term is to be honest, but when you're, when you're air conditioning these tunnels for heavy freight vehicles, a lot of them diesel, you have these stacks that basically carry the polluted air to the surface. When will we be able to let residents know the location of those? All that would be part of the normal process going, uh, uh, going through the detailed design work and the community consultation that would be part of that process. Um, the project and section two of the project will also <coughs> need to undertake um, or go through uh, environmental clearance processes. Uh, that would involve, uh, in all probability, a public environment report that would require uh, public input, public consultation and that sort of thing. Uh, a state PER or a Commonwealth one? 
um, it, it would require both, uh, in all probability, uh, a state as well as as well as um, uh, 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 clearance under under federal requirements. Federal environmental law. That would be the expectation. What's the national trigger? I recognise you're not here repping for the Enviro Department, so you can keep it top line, but what's the federal environmental trigger that you would imagine would be enlivened by a project Look, I'm, like this? I'm, I'm not going to comment on that. That's, a, that's ultimately a matter for the yeah. Environment Department. You'd anticipate Commonwealth Environmental Assessment. I'm Correct. personally sceptical, but it's okay. If that's what you anticipate, that's good. Um, will information on impacts on local traffic and air pollution into the local air shed be considered commercial in confidence, or will residents be informed as to what's actually in play? Senator, they'll, they'll be matters I would expect that would play out um, in um, the, the, the public environment report process. Are you comfortable that this is a good use and an appropriate use of more than a billion dollars of taxpayers' funds, or are there still some doubts in the back of your mind? The, the project has, as a whole has been assessed by Infrastructure Australia as um, a project of, of high priority. Uh, as in their February report, um, so it is a, a project of, of, of national significance. It was a project that didn't even exist two years ago, so it's jumped straight to the top of the charts, which is remarkable. The project as a whole hasn't been assessed because there's still no way to get this so-called freight link to the port of Fremantle, unless you've got some info you'd like to share to us. What's stage three of the project? How does this freight link connect to the port? Well, the project, as it stands at the moment, has been assessed by Infrastructure Australia as delivering significant benefits. So it's removing in the order of 13 or 14 sets of traffic lights. So the benefit costs of the project uh, are as, as they are, as the project currently stands. And um, uh, that's, the, that's the project that has been assessed by IA. How, do you, how does it get to the port? How does the freight link get to the freight terminal? Well, it uses the existing facilities that are there. Um, the expectation is that the, the current uh, Stirling Bridge, with some uh, modifications around priority with, uh, with traffic lights and, and lane reconfiguration, some, some modest reconfiguration will provide adequate levels of service up until about 2026. Have you actually been to the intersection that we're discussing? Do you know? Look, I, I have, Senator. You have. And do you believe that assessment, that that's the case? Um, I'm, I'm comfortable that that's, that's the assessment. Oh, my. Oh, it just gets worse and worse, doesn't it? Yeah, it does. That we could have... Look, my, my personal view doesn't really... To be, to be that's fair enough. You know, it was probably a, a question that I should have been pulled up on. Uh, your, your personal feelings aren't the question here. What modelling have you seen that gives you comfort that we're not actually creating a $2 billion truck car park in East Fremantle? Or what can you show us on an evidence base as to um, what is going to happen at the very end of the freight link where you tip this entire funnel of heavy freight vehicles and other vehicles into <coughs> a set of traffic lights at the bridge? Yes, really. Yeah, really. It is really. Okay, righto. Your, your name's on this too, Sean. So you start engaging. Righto. Yeah, you better. Just Go ahead. Any evidence care. at all? Because you're quite correct to pull me up. This is not about your feelings. What evidence do you have? Senator, I go back to um, the assessment of the, the project um, that was undertaken by Infrastructure Australia that outlined the, the benefits of the project and, and what it would deliver um, uh, to... to um, the, the, the economy in terms of, and also in terms of benefit cost ratio. So Infrastructure that, Australia weren't able to assess stage three of the freight link because it didn't exist at the time they did the assessment. Bring it to South Australia, just, just ignore it. Just, let's, just bring it so over, bring it over, yourself. come at us. I mean, <laughs> no, come on. Time's hard. really short. Live there. Time is not short. This is where we live. Sorry. I know that's weird. So, we so don't Senator, have a chair I, to pull the senator into again, line. I, so. well, I, we do have a chair. He's there. That's Senator Stirl. All right. Well, he's doing, he's, the he's doing his best to pull you into line. Sorry. Sorry, Sorry, Sorry Mr. Senator, if I may, I'll go back to the point that I made earlier in relation to the intersection of uh, Stirling, Stirling Highway and, and Canning Highway. Um, the advice from the Western Australian Government is that with some uh, relatively modest reconfiguration of that intersection, um, that intersection will provide adequate, um, an adequate level of service uh, up until 2026. It's 
stuff from there. It's not your assessment. I understand you're drawing on work elsewhere, but that is patently ridiculous. It just, it just doesn't work like you that. Have a question? That intersection is already incredibly congested. You're proposing to funnel traffic in, into that area. Um, I wouldn't mind confirmation. I, I think it was probably you at the table and it would have been the estimates before last. We were talking about the PPRs, the project proposal reports, and you clarified for us, you were reasonably unequivocal, that funding would not leave um, the Commonwealth into the state of Western Australia's bank account until you had uh, all of the PPRs for all stages of the project on your desk. Can you just confirm for me that that was you? I'm reasonably sure that that was... Can you recall that um, conversation? Uh, I, I can recall discussing project proposal reports. Yep. Um, I, just, believe, I, yeah, I believe I would have said that uh, Commonwealth funding is released on the basis of project proposal reports. Yeah. <clears throat> All right. Rather than trying and to I don't, make you I don't word believe. Word. I don't believe I would have said um, necessarily that it depended on having project proposal reports for 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 everything. But I I believe I would have talked <clears throat> about project proposal reports. Yeah. So just spell it out for us how this works. We've got a three stage project. Stage one through the wetlands and Banksy Woodland. Stage two is now the tunnel. Is there a PPR for stage three, whether it just be the traffic light upgrades or whatever you're proposing to do? Um, no, I want to be clear about Go ahead. definitions on, on stage three. There is a, a third stage to freight link, which relates to a pinch point on the row highway around where um, Orong Road joins freight link. Now, that's not the okay. stage three that you're talking about, no, I that's believe. Right. Is that what you would be calling stage three? Well, that's that's the definition yep. at the moment. So you're talking about a different stage I'll three. I'll call it stage four if you want. If it's an upstream pinch point, I guess that's that's neither here nor there. I'm talking about the pinch point at the very end where this entire thing terminates. I think you know the point that I I'm know making. you'll know the area you're talking about. Yep. So have you seen a PPR for that? Uh, no, we haven't, Senator. So how can you fund stages one and two if you haven't seen the final stage? Because, as I mentioned earlier, the uh, proposal as it currently stands uh, relates to uh, stages one and two, the, um, the row eight component and the connection from row eight through to the, the Stirling um, uh, Canning Highway uh, uh, intersection. And that's the project that's currently uh, before government and government has made a decision to fund. Okay. I've just been sent, because of some quick footwork back in the office, the exact wording. I'll read it back to you if you like. Um, this was from last October. I put to you, if the state came back seeking more than 100 million for that third stage across the river, we'll call it stage four if you want, I don't mind, but for the final link into the harbour, um, then under the process we would assume that a PPR would need to be produced. And you replied, word for word, for any additional stages of the project, we would expect to see a project proposal report for any additional scope. Okay. That does sound a rather different to what you're telling me now. You're saying for the time being, we will we'll upgrade the traffic lights at Stirling Bridge and she'll be right for another 10 years. Um, uh, I think what you're talking about there is, is a, uh, a larger uh, scope of works for the crossing. We would expect to see that in a PPR. Um, I would also expect that when we see um, a project proposal report for um, uh, Section 2, that it would also uh, encompass uh, a level of works around um, the uh, intersection of um, Stirling Highway and Canning Highway. Yep. Okay. So that's what you're calling stage Mo two? Modest, modest civil <coughs> works. Uh, that's like turning circles on High Street and that it, kind it of might, stuff. It might be prioritise, lane prioritisation, yep. signal prioritisation, um, some, some lane widening, All that right. sort of thing. I'll wrap up because the Chair's been quite indulgent in terms of time. So this is my last one. You haven't seen the PPR for Stage 2 yet for the tunnel, is that correct? That's correct. Okay. So can you we confirm... Wouldn't, we wouldn't expect to at this stage. Yep, only just announced. Can you confirm for us then that, that the Commonwealth appropriation both for Stages 1 and 2 has not yet been transferred to the Western Australian Government? Um, we can confirm that. That was confirmed earlier in the hearings today. It was. Okay. Right Thanks right. very much for your time. Thanks, Chair. Right well, now, Senator Dodson. And Senator, just for the information of the committee, Senator Dodson's just promised me a pup out of his hat. <laughs>
You don't have to do that anymore. Yeah. No, it's better than the rabbit, though, I presume. Don't let him push you around. Look, uh, I want to ask some questions in relation to the uh, National Stronger Maybe. Regions Fund. Uh, we've got a few, I'm sorry, but uh, I appreciate the fact that you people have been here you know, for a good while. But, and you've given us some very good answers. I, um, I note that the government allocated more than $293 million for the second round of the National Strongest Regions Fund, with only $200 million being budgeted. I further note that the budget indicates that the government expects to spend $315 million in the 2017-18 financial year. Why did the government only spend $35 million in the 2015-16 fiscal year when $200 million was originally allocated? Um, Senator, if I can begin, the, the allocation was $200 million. That was the notional allocation per year, but that was done at the time the program was established to spread the, the five payments equally over the five years of the program. But as the applications were received and then have been assessed and contracts have been entered into, we've been reprofiling the money to actually align it to the project spend. So there's a notional allocation of 200 over a five-year billion-dollar program. But as the contracts have been entered into, we now develop milestones for payment. So essentially, the, the reason 35 million was only been forecast for payment in 15, 16 is that all that is all the project proponents will need to spend to meet their milestones and we've pushed money out into the out years. So essentially to this point, the Australian government has committed uh, a certain amount of money, but milestone payments will actually accord with the project delivery. Um, I'll ask Mr uh, McCormick to give you a, a, a better update on that, where we're at. Gordon. Uh, Gordon McCormick, General Manager, Regional Programs. Uh, as the Secretary uh, identified, we can um, uh, commit up to $200 million a year, which doesn't mean we actually uh, pay that amount of money each year. So we can sign funding agreements up to that amount of money. Um, we're expecting to expend about $35 million this financial year. That is actually pay the monies out from uh, the funding agreements that we've actually executed. Okay, I'll come to that. Can you explain why $315 million is earmarked to be spent in 2017-18 um, in that financial year? Based on um, <clears throat> the projects that have been had funding agreements executed and based on the, the needs of the proponents in uh, completing their projects uh, for rounds one and two, we've made an estimate on what is, will be required in those out years. So until we have only completed two rounds and we're still assessing round three um, and we've only committed half the money. So at this stage, having signed up um, half of those under rounds one and two, we still only have a, a fair idea of what the actual need will be for all of those, for all the proponents. Okay, so you, <coughs> I, tell you, I understand that you haven't uh, completed your assessments for round three. That's correct, Senator. Oh, OK. Um, so then, can you tell me how much money has been committed in, the, in round three of the fund? Uh, we haven't committed. The government hasn't made a decision for round three until we've completed still the... Still assessing. Yeah, we're still assessing that, and we will make recommendations to government for decisions on which projects are to be funded. Uh, can you confirm that the projects from round three of the program won't begin being funded until the 1st of July 2017, as stated under the guidelines? Uh, until at this stage, yes, Senator, we won't be able to um, provide the advice to government or the government won't have time to actually make decisions before the 1st of July. On, the, on round three projects. Okay, so is it possible for you to give me a complete list of the projects approved from round one and two of the fund and the status of whether it's been contracted or not? Uh, yes, Senator. 
All projects, um, approved projects, are listed on our website for rounds one and two, and uh, I can provide you with a list of the, uh, the current status of each of those um, on notice. Is that possible to be done by way of electorates as well? Or, um... uh, that'd take a lot longer. We don't take into our possible senator possible to take that on notice. Parliamentarians were asked to give you proposals, were they? Uh, yes, we don't actually look at electorates until after Strong, an announcement. Are oh, you talking? About no, no, he's talking about stronger regions. There. Stronger yeah, communities do doesn't have politicians. No, sorry, you talk national stronger regions fund. Yes. By electorate. Yes. Uh, we can take that on notice, Senator. Yes. So when you say on notice, how long is that? Um, That's a very leading question. Uh, Senator, we don't I, I appreciate, look, I appreciate the difficulty that we're all in, but you know, we'd like to have it today if that's possible. Uh, uh, Senator, it's not actually a consideration yeah. in relation to the program, so it's not something that we would have readily available. It would actually have to be work to be, uh, to be undertaken, so hence why um, Mr McCormick's uh, giving you that response. It's something that we couldn't produce quickly. No, that's fine. I understand. Yeah. I've also understood that it's a standard stock answer sometimes. <laughs> yeah, we have. Well, thank a, you for the clarification. Yes, um, we, we do have 162 projects that have been um, identified or approved for funding under those, and we'd have to go through and identify those electorates for you. Okay, so uh, I gather then that you can confirm for me that when round three funding uh, will be available, that it will be announced in July. Uh, that's a decision for government, Senator. Okay. Can you give me a complete list of the projects approved from round? I've asked that question, I think. Is it possible to provide the electorates? I've asked that and you've given me an undertaking to give me some responses. So what's the total funding amount um, of the projects that have been signed, with, with, that you've got signed agreements with? For signed agreements. <clears throat> Two hundred and seventy point one four million dollars. Thank you. Uh, I, no I note that as part of the the appraisal process for round three of the National Stronger Regional Fund applications, uh, the department was required to advise on the merits of the eligibility of applicants and provide this to the ministerial panel, who ultimately decides the projects that would be funded under the fund in consultation with the National Infrastructure Committee of Cabinet. What was the nature of the advice that the department provided to the ministerial panel? For round three, Senator? Yes. Uh, we haven't completed the assessments yet to, prov uh, to enable us to provide that advice yet. Okay, so, so we haven't provided No advice that. on round three to the ministerial panel? No, not, not yet, Senator. Okay. Of the assessments you've made of the round three applications, have you put those into any rankings? Uh, not yet, Senator, until we've actually completed the whole process, um, because it's done in stages <coughs> with each project, we'd have to look at all applications uh, and, and make uh, consideration and recommendations after we've completed all the assessments. Okay. And when, is that, when are those assessments due by? Um, or that, is that particular finalisation of the assessments, when's that, what date's that? Where I think um, we've advertised in the guidelines that we expect to complete um, the assessments, um, I think, in by early June. Okay. And can you, can you tell me, well, you haven't made any recommendations for number three as yet, I understand. Um, I've got no further questions on that. Thanks. Thanks, Senator. Good stuff. Senator Rice, you have a crack? Um, look, one last five minutes. On infrastructure? On infrastructure, infrastructure. yes. If we've, got five, if we've got five minutes to go. Right. Yep, OK. Um, I want to go back to the issue of where the, the, where the funding for these for the infrastructure projects comes from which Mr Murdoch, you were saying, some of it was new funding. On page 100 and, 
132, or 131, 132 of budget paper number two. We have the new investments showing no impact on the bottom line in the table there, and the sentence that funding for the new projects, business case development and sub-programs will be met from within the existing resources of the infrastructure investment program. So essentially there is no new money going into investment. It's a reallocation of existing departmental funds. Uh, not quite. But what that's capturing is the fact that uh, some of those, such as the new sub-programs of 920, is actually a new commitment. They're previous to this budget, there hadn't been a decision to fund those programs ongoing. Uh, so that's a new commitment. But it's being funded from within what we would call the forward base envelope of the program. Um, so it's, it's, it's a new commitment, a new 920 million. Some of the other funds, such as the, uh, the Ipswich and Perth, um, which are happening earlier than the 1920, are being funded from essentially unallocated funds within the program. Okay, so the, we've got the 1920 ones, which are new commitments, yep. but all the others are coming from unallocated funds. From unallocated funding within the program. 490 GST. Yes, that's, new that's new. And yep. the 594 million for inland rail is also new. That yep. equity funding. Okay, okay, but all the rest are coming from unallocated funds, so they're not they're not a new commitment to infrastructure. Everything in 1920. Yes, was, not was not part of the forwards. Yeah. yeah. Okay. So, that's so that is all new. And then the commitment for the 920 million ongoing <coughs> every year for the sub programs, rose recovery, etc. That is but also the other new. Ones, the other ones, just to clarify, are all from yes. existing um, resources. <coughs> and, and finally, Mr. Murdoch, um, I want to go back to your statement about the roads that you're funding being good for public transport. In Victoria, we've got 850 million being proposed to, for the Western Ring Road and the Monash Freeway. Do you know how many bus services use those two roads? I'm not familiar with the bus timetables for Melbourne. I'm happy to find <laughs> out. Um, there's, those two roads add up to 72 kilometres. They're 38 kilometres for the Western Ring Road, 34 kilometres for the Monash Freeway. Um, there's three kilometres of the Western Ring Road, so three kilometres of the 72 kilometres have got bus services that use them, Mr Murdoch. So I don't think you can claim really that there the federal go. government investment in these massive mega roads is investing in public transport programs. Don't, don't take the I, I would hate to see the bus network in Melbourne if we didn't have those two roads operating. Yeah. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Now, it's time for the good news. <laughs> I, want to, I want to let you know that you can send home Aviation and Airports Division. Yep. Um, over the page. Um, Office of Transport Security. Yep. Policy and Research Division. Policy and Research. Yeah. No, 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 I haven't agreed to that yet. No, 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 I said I haven't agreed to it yet. Oh, well, we haven't agreed to that yet. Australian Rail Track Corporation. Uh, Western Sydney Unit. National Capital no, no, Authority. No, Australian no, Rail Track. No, hang on, I haven't agreed to that one yet. I told you, so give me, give me, give me, <laughs> give me some time. We'll so we'll you're all right it. if I send home Western Sydney Unit, National Capital Authority, and National Transport Commission. The last three. I'll tell you, who you can send home. Yes, National Cap, National Capital, National Transport. Western um, Sydney. No, not Western Sydney. Oh, not okay. ARTC. Or not policy. Okay. At this time. Okay. Well, right, you got the rest. I don't want air services. Get them right. home before All right, so I'm well, sending, sending well, home well, aviation, well. airports, Office of Transport yeah, Security, yep. and National Capital and National Transport Commission. Get yeah, going. Yeah, right. going. They're gone. Right. Not local government either, thanks. You can hear yeah, them going. Going. Not, not local government. <laughs> no, no, we'll keep them. Right, eh? Now, where are we up to? I've still got more questions. Right, there you go. Oh. And I want to talk about no, you community. Want to go home. Oh. Go. community. No, I'm Infrastructure Australia, I want. So yeah, no, I'll, I'll, I won't be long, okay? okay. Just I want to talk about community development grants. So, how many projects have been funded through the government's additional 50 million for this program? We're hoping not to get have a dinner break and just get through it. Right. I don't think it really exists. So, uh, community, community development grants? Yes, please. Uh, as at uh, 31 March, 
there were uh, 299 projects under community development grants. 299, uh, great. Is there possible to get a list, Mr Murdoch, of those projects? Uh, yes, I believe they're on our website. If they're not, I'll provide them to you. Oh, okay, thank you. Does the department expect any announcements will be made for the additional funding from this program during this year's federal election campaign? Uh, that would be a matter for the government, Senator. I couldn't okay. comment. Okay. Uh, would you describe this as a, uh, a government election commitment fund? given the first round of funding for a clearly funded 2013 government election commitments? Uh, yes, it, the, the program was established to fund government election commitments in the 2013 election, as well as uncontracted pro projects from the Regional Development Australia Fund and the Community Infrastructure Grants Program. Okay, in relation to the Community Development Grants Program, how many funding agreements have been signed by the department with successful applicants for round one of the fund? Uh, I'll ask Mr McCormick to give you the numbers. I, sure. I think it's as of 31 March. Um, Gordon, how many have been contracted? Uh, as at um, the 4th of May, 271, uh, 271? Com community development grants projects have been contracted. 271. Okay. Can we, and so can we get a list of those projects? Uh, Yes, Senator, we can provide a list and it is on the website. It as is we on the website? Them. Yep. Okay, thank you. What is the total funding amount for the projects that have signed agreements with the department? What do you want? $249.07 million. $249.07 million? Yep. So how yes, many? Senator. Sorry, how many projects had, that, that have been selected for funding through round one of the CDG program don't have funding agreements signed with the department? Um, it's not, we don't have rounds under community development grants, oh, okay. uh, Senator. Uh, they're projects identified by government and as the secretary indicated, um, uncontracted projects from a previous government. Okay, so then can you supply me with a list of these projects that don't have funding agreements signed with the department? Uh, yes, Senator. Um, of those, we have, there are 28 remaining. 28. And we can take that on notice, Senator. Okay, you can provide me with that list. That's not on the website, is it? No, we, okay. we put them up as we contract them. Sure, can we get them before we go tonight? Is that uh, possible? I'll put the request in. Uh, yes. Check how much work's involved, I think. Sure. Okay. So what is the total funding amount for the projects that don't have signed agreements with the department? Uh, 80.16 million. Thank you very much. Now, my final question for this part of the portfolio. Yes is how are we going with the 400 odd million dollars break up that you're going to provide to me in relation to our earlier catch up on GST yeah. payments in Perth. We'll have to get that after the break, T. So you can and how long I'll, 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 I'll give you the secret squirrel. I'll have to filibuster before I let you go if I don't get it. Yeah, that's, and let me give okay. you another tip. We're hoping not to break well, I didn't know we're hoping just to go through and get it out of the road. So it would be really good if you could do that for me, please. Thank you, Mike Chair. I'm ready for Infrastructure Australia. All right, All right that completes Infrastructure Investments. Yep. Thank you. Sure do. Get on by the gun. Good.
Right, are you ready? Yep. Thanks, Five yeah. minutes. Five Thank starts you. now. Thanks. Hello again. Um, Mr Davies, I want to start off oh, my questions are about the um, Western distributor business case. So Infrastructure Australia is assessing the Western distributor. Is that the case? Uh, uh, so Philip Davies, uh, CEO of Infrastructure Australia, yes, that's correct. We're currently assessing the business case for Western distributor. So so what's the, the stage that you're at with the assessment of the Western distributor? Oh, so we've, we've, we've started the, uh, the assessment and uh, we're in the stage of seeking clarifications and having an ongoing dialogue with the Victorian government. Um, so, what uh, what have you got in terms of documentation from the Victorian government? Have you, um, in terms of the the business cases that have been provided to you? Um, so we're we're assessing the Victorian government business case for Western Distributor. So is that that's the complete business case? When I was talking to Mr. Murdoch earlier, he said that the department only had the reference case. So you've got the full Victorian no, government. Uh, no, so it's the reference case. It doesn't include uh, any material from Transurban. Right. Will you be getting the, the full business case with material from Transurban? Uh, no, I don't believe so. We've Do you think that's a, an issue with your assessment of the of the project that you haven't got the full detailed business case? Um, so our our assessment is uh, in regard to potential uh, um, future funding from the Commonwealth. So um, that that business case has come from. The Victorian government. But in terms of your assessment as to how valuable a project is, I would have thought that you would need to have all of the detail that the Victorian government had and that Transurban had as their, you know, their, their proposal as to um, how effective it was going to be at solving the, the transport problems. So, it's so we're, we're, uh, we're assessing the strategic merit of the um, project and also the uh, economic business case against, against the problem which it's uh, so defining. Do, do you think you could do a better job of assessing the strategic merit if you had the full transurban Victorian government business case? So, so in terms of in terms of how the project's delivered, that's a matter for the Victorian government. But in terms of its effectiveness, surely the business case, particularly the um, the transport modelling and the economic modelling, in terms of being a solution to be solving transport problems. That would be, you know, there's more detail obviously available than is being made available to you. So the, ref the reference case is providing us with all the detail we need to do our assessment, including transport modelling and so on. In terms of interrogating the transport modelling, how are you being able to do that? Are you uh, doing your own assessment of your own modelling of <coughs> the transport of the? So um, we, we take a standard approach to these assessments, so we don't undertake our own benefit cost ratio, we don't <clears throat> undertake our own modelling. What we're doing is reviewing the, the work that's been done by the proponents, so in this case the Victorian Government. Uh, so we're looking at their work and that's why, as I mentioned at the start, there's a toing and froing in terms mm -hmm. of so we seek clarifications and on, on occasion we ask them to run uh, Additional model runs and those kinds of things, so that we can understand fully understand what what so it is have, we're looking at. So, have you asked them to do that in this case? Um, so, uh, as I mentioned, that's an ongoing process. Mm. Yeah. So, but so the, that assessment, you know, the one of the problems in the, the, the transport modelling and the economic modelling hasn't been released to the public. There has been a business case released, but the transport modelling and the economic modelling have been redacted from that business case. So. You haven't got those th that full detail either, is what you're telling me. Uh, no, so we've we've got the uh, the full, as uh, the secretary mentioned earlier in <laughs> regards to the uh, department. We've got the full reference case. But is there, is but there further modelling that's done? I mean, you've got the reference case, but then there is there is a more detailed business case or a, a more. Um, Accurate or more? You know, what's the difference between the reference case and the other and the other business case that you haven't got? Um, so I think you I think you're referring to the the business case that um, or the submission that's been made by Transurban to the Victorian government. So we're not party to that. It's a commercial uh, decision for the Victorian government. What we do have is the reference case that has taken so that has on that board, and that's presented to us as part of our assessment. So has that got? So you have got all of the details of all of the transport modelling and the economic modelling that has been done for the project. 
as part of your reference case? Or is there other more detailed transport modelling and more detailed economic modelling that you are not privy to? Um, so we've, we've got all the material that's been, that is integral to that reference case. Yes, but yeah. is there more modelling uh, in th terms of transport modelling or I'm, economic modelling that you that, do not have? That's a matter for the Victorian Government. I'm, we're not aware of what else they've done in terms of their own work, in terms of uh, other options. Can you, can, would you be able to confirm for me whether you know that, that whether there is other information that the Victorian Government have that you haven't been given uh, So I'm, I'm, we're not aware to? of that. We're not. We're not aware of uh, what other work they've been doing. OK, and you don't feel that you need to ask that, to have all the information in order to be able to do a, an accurate assessment of the effectiveness of the project? So what, what, what we do seek is, is uh, consistent with other assessments. We'll, we, if we would like other information that, that uh, would help us do the assessment, then we'll ask for that information. Um, do you know yeah. of the existence of uh, independent peer reviews that have been done of the transport modelling and the economic modelling? <clears throat> um, so I, I'm, I'm not aware of that. I'll refer to my colleagues to... Uh, well, I asked Mr to, Murdoch the, same, yeah. The, yeah, the, the question before, but within Infrastructure Australia. Uh, perhaps Ms Chow can comment on that. Anna Chow, Executive Director, Project Advisory. Um, we understand there has been some um, peer review of traffic models. Sorry, I might move that closer. Is that better? Yep. Yes. Uh, we understand that there have been some peer review, but we have not seen the results of those. Um, do you think that it would be valuable to you to see the results of those peer reviews? Um, it would be in terms of the, out, um, the actual recommendations. So are you going to be requesting those independent peer reviews? We have asked for other information as you, part have, of our review. Have you requested the independent peer reviews? Um, we'll take that on notice. Um, Ask question. No. Well, well you, you say you have requested other information, but have, uh, I, you must know whether you've, given you know that the independent peer reviews exist, whether you have requested them or not. Yes or no? Well, to answer the question. No, well, it's, it's a, it's a well, very... No, no, don't Five minutes is now nearly ten, so get don't, on with it. You know. Well, I'm, I'm, I'm waiting for an answer. Well, you've got your answer. Give no, an answer. No, no there's an... In the, we have, this is Senator a very Ross important point. No worries. Ask we, have got an, we have got independent on, peer reviews that have been done That's right. that are, I would expect would be critical right. for your assessments of the project to have have the copies of those independent peer reviews. So, that's, so Senator, if I may, the, um, it's, it's normal for peer reviews to be done on all projects. And that, we're, we're not uh, party to, as your earlier question, we're not party to all the work that uh, Victoria has done in relation to this opportunity um, or what peer reviews they've done. So what, what, we, fo what we focus on is, is the business case that was presented to us and where we feel we need more information, then, uh, then we go and seek that information through um, our questioning, uh, request for more information and so on. So. Um, my uh, understanding is that there are independent peer reviews that may indeed be, be critical of the business case that you have been presented with. Don't you think that it would be valuable for you to know of the of those you know any potential criticisms of the economic modelling and the transport modelling that has been done? So that that I think it, that work would be confidential to the Victorian government if they wish and to share that with us. That's a matter for the Victorian government. Part of our role is to do our own assessment, so um, mm -hmm. that's the so process, I, we're, I, that's the going, process we're doing at the moment. Are you going to be doing your own independent yeah. transport modelling of the Western distributor? Um, or are you taking their transport modelling on trust and you don't even know what the results of the independent peer review of their transport modelling that has been done? So, and you, don't, you seem to be not very interested in acquiring it. So, so as an independent body, our, our review is independent and we will... Uh, as we do with other assessments, we continue to seek additional information. If, if uh, any component of the business case we feel is lacking information, we'll go back and seek that. We'll ask for sensitivity analysis very commonly to be run on, particularly on transport modelling, so that we can fully understand the, how sensitive those models are and what, what the 
underlying assumptions are and the sensitivity of those assumptions. So, and, and that's that's very much part of the work that we do as 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 an independent uh, body. So are you doing that for the West Industry uh, Transport are, yes. Modelling? And will the, will those results be made public? Um, so, as with all our assessments, we make those assessments public once they're uh, complete much. and presented to our board. Thank you very Thank much. You. Um, Patty, you got a question? We've got a, got a couple, Mr. Uh, Chairman. Hello, are you out <coughs> there? Get yourself back in here. Indeed. <laughs> um, <clears throat> these are in relation to the funding cuts. The budget says that Infrastructure Australia will have its funding cut by 25% from July 1, 2017. How will this affect the work of the uh, Infrastructure Australia? Uh, so, um, Senator, our, our budget for uh, this year is $11.768 million, and uh, next year reduces slightly to $11.6 million, and then for the years 2017-18 onwards, uh, reduces to $8.8 .8 million. Eight and a half. Eight, eight point eight. Eight point eight. That's that's currently what's um, okay. allocated. And my question was, how, how will this affect the work? Um, so at this stage, we're, we're, um, we're operating within our budget for this current financial year, and we're planning within our current, uh, within the allocated budget for, for next year, and then in, in due course, um, we will develop budgets for, for those uh, outer years. And if we consider we need additional funding, then we, that would be a matter to uh, to raise, but at this stage we're operating within our allocated budget. Okay. It appears that your use of supplies will halve, and if I'm wrong, tell me please, will halve from six million to three million, is that right? Um, so what, what one of our um, focus areas in, in, the, in this year has been to uh, move away from, reduce our contracted services and dependence on external uh, contractors and consultants and, and bring that resource in-house. That's supported by a, um, a recruitment program that's currently underway. Um, so you'll see uh, that reflected in the numbers uh, with an increase in uh, employee expenses and, and salaries um, with a counter reduction in contracted services. So what, what are the main expenses you have now on external supplies? Um, so we have um, the, the main ex expenses are using uh, contractors to support um, the functions of the organisation as a corporate entity, uh, but also in undertaking our policy work and our research work and the work we've just been talking about in terms of, uh, which is an important part of our work, assessing projects where we uh, routinely will use expert advisors and, and economists from, from outside the organisation to support that work. Okay, and, that, and that includes audit and evaluation? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Uh, <clears throat> um, and, and I suppose, how how do you see this affecting the scope of the works you've got to do? Um, so, so again, at this stage, we're we're we're, we're working within the uh, the budget this year, and, and we've got our work program, and uh, we've also developed the work program for for the next financial year, and that's. Um, we're comfortable with that. That uh, supports the work we've got <clears throat> planned. Okay. The, the, this is on cities, and the Prime Minister made a statement uh, the other day on um, uh, potentially $50 million for uh, funding business uh, case developments. I think it was. Are you any anyone's familiar with that? Yes, sir. Okay. Um, at the 30-page announcement that went with it, I think at page 35 of that, um, it reads, the Australian Government will commit $50 million to accelerate planning and development works on major transformational infrastructure projects, including urban rail. The fund will support the work of infrastructure financing, the infrastructure financing unit, allowing for <coughs> development of project business, for project business cases and financing and investment options to deliver the infrastructure our city needs. Okay, can I ask if the if Infrastructure Australia was formally consulted prior to the release of the, that policy? Um, so we, we, we get to fully understand what, what, that, uh, what that means. 
uh, the in terms of the policy. We also saw the announcement. What we did uh, as part of our recent 15-year uh, infrastructure plan that we released in February, uh, recommendation 9.6 in there recommended that all governments invest more uh, money in the development of uh, longer-term plans as well as uh, including uh, business cases. That was certainly one of our recommendations. <coughs> Done I think I might have, uh, Mr. Chair. Thank you. All right, that. we'll move on. That, that finishes Infrastructure Australia. Done. Thank you, Chair. We'll go to the Surface Policy Division. Mm -hmm. We want to get finished before we That's right. Did you put a candidate in well, can I just advise that um, for him. Senator Sell, we think, had questions for surface transport policy, is it? For surface policy, but we can't find him. <laughs> Who's, <laughs> next? Who's next? How do you got? Have you got anything for surface policy? Because uh, we'll I'll tell you what we'll do. We'll come back. We'll, 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 we'll go to Casa. We've got a couple, Mr. Chairman. We'll go to Casa. Oh, well, to accommodate. Leave it, Pat. We'll go to Casa. We'll come back. <coughs> Sit down. Make yourself at home. <laughs> Sit down. Sit down. Go around there. Well, that's all my name tag is. Oh, you got a name. Chair, can we stretch our legs for a moment while I just go and see if I've got Casa here? All oh, right. Oh. And if you haven't, we're all going home. Oh, Chair. Yeah. It's getting a bit tough. Casa is on, mate. If they're not here, and you know, too bad. They, well, we did. Hello, well, here's someone. Well, you can't have your cake and eat it too with these timings of these estimates. No, you can't. No, I'm not talking to you. I'm we can do surface about. transport. Oh, right. He's back. Right. Um, we were just going to cast of it. We'll round up. Structure so Australia, aren't we? We've we'll finished them. No, I haven't. No, well, they're no, gone. No. We couldn't no, find no, them. No, 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 no. Where are they? They're gone. No. Now you knew I had infrastructure. We went Australia. round looking for you. Doesn't matter. I was in the toilet. Oh Sorry, bullshit! You were. No, I need infrastructure Australia. You oh. want to come bring no. back infrastructure yes, Australia? Yes, yes, I do. Jesus yes. fucking Christ! You knew that. No. Don't you dare! I told you I had questions for infrastructure no. Australia. We'd finish. No, we're, we're, we're just trying to run honestly up. look Don't for it. We did. We didn't come in the toilet. loo and say, are you in there? Well, I wouldn't have been game because you probably weren't using Australian paper. <laughs> I've missed this meeting. Um, You'll miss it, won't you? Chair, we've, we've got CASA and air services on their way, so we've called them to come early. Can we just, yeah, yeah. Um, just while we're waiting for it. Well, I, I would hope it's only 10 or 15 minutes, yeah, if we can. Uh, Chair, while we're waiting, can uh, I, uh, we're just trying to round up infrastructure, infrastructure Australia back in. I'll come back. I've got some answers for Senator Still on Perth WA roads. Fantastic. Which I'll do after you do infrastructure and Australia. So what okay, Alba has filled you up with And buddies. that's something that I can take away to you going to table as well. That's great, Mr Murdoch. Thank you. So, Al, are we still on track to not go to lunch, you know, or whatever it is? Well, I'm going to plough through because a lot right, of mine will be yes, down. no. So, look, what I want to do is just, no, sorry, no, gentlemen, no, but... Uh, so we nearly got away with it, boys. Yeah, nearly. Well, sorry, good. Sorry, Chair. No, no. Infrastructure Australia. Yeah, thank you. It's a stunt that I tried to pull and got caught out in government too. Thank oh. you, Chair, for letting we, me. He, have did, he did go and have a look for you. No, so. that's right. I know. He didn't look where I was. So I just want to go back to, uh, in terms of cities, Mr. Turnbull's, of the Prime Minister's $50 million to fund business case development. So you'd be familiar with the PM's announcement, of course. Have you read it? Yeah. yeah. Has anyone read it? Good, OK. So I want to refer to the passage from the document that says the Australian Government will commit $50 million to accelerate planning and development works on major transformational infrastructure projects, including urban rail. OK? And the fund will support the work of the infrastructure financing unit, mm. allowing for development of project business cases and financing and investment options to deliver the infrastructure our cities need. So can I ask? Was no. IA formally consulted prior to the release of that They've policy? Given me an answer, uh, no, Senator. They've given me an answer on that. You've already answered this, have you? Yeah. yeah. Oh, okay, it's, fantastic. It's, it's Sorry. The, the second part. Tremendous. Okay, well, let's go to the priority list of projects being assessed. And I apologise for being out of the room. So, if I can go to the list from February priority. Oh, so, sorry, the February priority list. Okay. So, I just want to update it. 
So can you update us on the National Inland Rail? Uh, so we just completed the assessment of that initiative, um, okay. Senator. Tremendous. Uh, now to New South Wales M4 motorway. Uh, we've also recently completed that assessment. Is this all on your website? Uh, it will be in the near future. Do you know when? Uh, as soon as uh, we finish the routine process of checking commercial okay. and All facts right, well you with, can tell us what yeah, you're doing. Yeah, so soon, for. yeah. West Connects? Uh, same with that, that's recently completed. Completed, Melbourne to Dombarton Rail Link? Uh, that's uh, still under assessment. Okay, now in Victoria, the Western Distributor? Uh, so that is also still under assessment. Okay, Murray Basin Rail Project? And that's also under assessment. Under assessment. In Queensland, the M1 Pacific Motorway, Majiraba to Varsity Lakes. Uh, so th that's, um, that's coming to the end of its assessment. So it's still under assessment? Yes. Yes, okay. Ipswich Motorway from Rockley to... And that's also uh, still under assessment, but uh, close to completion. Okay, what about the Forestfield Airport rail link in WA? Uh, that's still that's still in the middle of its assessment. Still in the mix. Yeah. And in the Northern Territory, the upgrade to the Tanamai Road. So again, that's still in the middle of its assessment. Okay, so Mr Davies, in addition to being the CEO of IA, um, you previously had a role in the Department of the High Speed Rail Studies between uh, 10 and 13, that's correct? That's correct, okay. Senator. There uh, were major works, in fact, $20 million worth of work next. Um, and in your view, can I ask you uh, for the scope, for the value capture to fund HSR on Australia's east coast? Uh, so that's not something I've uh, looked at, Senator. Sorry? That's not, not something I have an opinion on or, or that I've looked at. But you couldn't bring us up to speed with it? That's not, not something I've, uh, since the uh, study was done, that's not something I've been involved in. Okay, would you yeah. be able to tell us how much it could fund? Uh, again, I haven't seen that analysis. Yes, yeah, haven't seen yeah. that? No, okay. Um, in the Western City Rail Study, can you tell us uh, what involvement, if any, does IA have in this joint federal New South Wales study? Uh, so at this stage, we've not been involved at all? Not at all, okay. So the infrastructure priority list, I'm going to uh, actually ask you for a yes or no and if, there, if you've received a business close. Okay. Now, now, there yep. is a number, but we can plough through it, OK? Uh, preserve, uh, sorry, the Canberra Public Transport Improvements. Uh, no. No, no. No proposal? No. OK. Uh, connect gas supplies to so Eastern... Can I just uh, yeah. ask my colleagues if I get one wrong to... Yeah, sure, as well. sure, jump in. It, look, yeah. there are a few, but we'll get through it. So there's a no for the... Canberra Public uh, Transport and Purpose. The Preserve Corridor East Coast High Speed Rail? No. 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 Uh, connect gas supplies to eastern gas markets? No. 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 Okay. West Connect Stage 3? Uh, yes. Good. All right. Southern Sydney to CBD Public Transport Enhancement? No. No. Chalora Junction Upgrade? No. Uh, Port Botany, Sydney Airport, St Peter's West Connects Connection? Gateway. Yeah. Yes, so that's, that's part of yes. the West Connects. Yep, okay, yeah. so that's done. And it, as I said, if there's a business case as well, could you, if you could let us know. Otherwise, I take it there is no business case, is that right? Yes, that's okay. a business case. All right, that yep. is a business case. Yep. Uh, Preserve Corridor, Outer Sydney Orbital Road, Rail M9. Uh, not at this stage, no. Okay. Preserve Corridor, Western Sydney Airport Fuel Line? No. Preserve Corridor, Western Sydney Airport Rail? No. The same for Lower Hunter Freight Rail realignment? No. This is all part of the Preserve Corridor? Yeah. That's a no? No. Uh, Preserve Corridor, Western Sydney Freight Line Intermodal Terminal Access? No. Active Transport Access to CBD? No. no. Um, Western Line Upgrade CBD to Parramatta? No. Uh, West Connect Stage 48, 4B, Western Harbour Crossing and Beaches Link? No. Newell Highway Upgrade, Melbourne to Brisbane? No. Okay. New England Highway Upgrade? No. Yeah, I have, Senator, and it won't take all that long. So go for a walk outside and we'll come back and we'll be finished. Pacific Highway A1, Coffs Harbour Bypass Stage 1? No. Pacific Highway M1, extension to Raymond Terrace, stage one? No. Western Sydney Roads upgrade? 
Western Sydney Airport access? Uh, so we did previously um, assess one component of that for Bryn Jelly Road, but only, only Bryn one Jelly Road. Only one component, yes. Pin Jelly Road. Yeah. Yeah, okay. So it's a half. Frail, uh, freight rail access to Port Kembla? No. More bank intermodal terminal road connection upgrade? No. Newcastle Sydney Wollongong Sydney Rail upgrade? No. Uh, Hawkesbury Nepean Valley flood management? Uh, no. Provision of enabling infra and essential services to remote Northern Territory? No. Upgrade Tanami Road? Uh, so yes, that's one we're currently yep. assessing. Okay, currently doing it, yep. right. Darwin Region Water Supply Infrastructure Upgrade? No. Cross River Rail, inner city south to Brisbane CBD? So we've we just started that assessment process. Thank you, Dave. But we don't have the full business case at this stage, it's still in draft form. Okay, thank you. Port of Brisbane Freight Rail Connection? No. M1 Pacific Motorway Gateway Merge Upgrade? Uh, yes. 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 Okay. Uh, M1 Pacific Motorway upgrade Majuraba to Varsity Lakes. Did Sorry. I already mention that? Yes. yes. I did, didn't I? Yeah. Beer Burham to Nambour Rail upgrade? No. No. Uh, no. No. Gladstone Port Land and Sea Access upgrade? No. No. Mount Isa Townsville Rail Corridor Upgrade? No. Cunningham Highway, Yamanto to Ebenezer Ambly Upgrade? No. Lower Fitzroy River Water Infrastructure Development? No. No. Okay, we'll move into South Australia. The Gawler Line Rail Upgrade? No. Adlink Tram Network Expansion? No. No. Streslecki Trek track, ceiling and mobile coverage? Not a new one. We're ploughing uh, through not, this, just not take a deep breath. No? So we've previously seen that project, but not recently. Previously? It was, it was, it was previously assessed. Right. Um, I'm not exactly sure of the date, last year. Um, so it hasn't been re- Hasn't been finished. So the assessment was complete. Oh yeah, okay. And, and uh, we recommend, made some recommendations. Oh, okay. And yeah. it hasn't been uh, resubmitted since. Right. Oh, so yeah. no business case. South Australian Regional Mineral Port Development. No. Okay. Sturt Highway Productivity Vehicle Capacity Enhancement. Sturt Highway. No. Gawler Crat and Rail Access. No. Northern Adelaide Water Infrastructure Development? No. Derwent River Crossing Capacity in Tassie? No. no. Tasmanian Irrigation Schemes Tranche 2? Uh, not Tranche 2, no. Not, not Tranche 2? Uni of Tas STEM Facilities to Hobart CBD? No. Tasmanian Sewerage Infrastructure Upgrade? No. In Victoria, the Hoddle Street Capacity Upgrade, Eastern Freeway to CBD? No. Cranbourne Packenham Rail Line Upgrade? No. Melbourne Metro Rail? So we're currently uh, assessing that. Okay, that's a working process? Yes. Or progress. Westgate Freeway, Port of Melbourne, CBD, North Road Connection? Western Distribution. Yeah, so that's... Um, that's Western covered District. by the Western Distributor oh, okay. so that's business a yes. case from the Victorian Government. Senator, can I just correct the question on the Port Campbell freight access? Yes, of course. Um, because that's partially that partially um, is covered by the Malden Dumbarton. Oh, okay. But yeah, the, there's, right. there's a number of different ways of addressing that link. Yep. So it's partially um, covered by the Malden Dumbarton um, business case that we do have from the New South Wales Good. Government. Good, thank you. Not many to go now. Uh, M80 Western Ring Road upgrade? Yes. 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 Cranbourne Packenham Level Crossings removal? No. no. Eastern Freeway City Link Connection improvement? No. Your memory's amazing here. Yeah? Preserve Corridor Melbourne Outer Metro Ring E6? No. 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 
Melbourne Airport to CBD public transport capacity? No. Metro, oh sorry, Melton Line Rail Upgrade, Melbourne Outer Suburbs to no. Sunshine, no. no. Metro Road Ring, Greensboro to Eastern Freeway? No. Melbourne Outer North to CBD capacity upgrade? No. Melbourne Container Terminal capacity enhancement? No. Into that great state of WA, wrap it up. Perth CBD North <coughs> Corridor capacity? No. Perth Forestfield Rail Link. Yeah, we're currently assessing that business case. Uh, progress. Okay, Perth East, West and South Corridor upgrade. Mm. Senator Jeremy Parkinson, Director, Project Advisory. I just wanted to clarify with respect to the Perth CBD North Corridor that we do have some business cases for okay. works in that region of Perth. Uh, an extension to the Mitchell Freeway um, and the uh, North Link and Swan Valley Bypass. We are assessing those business cases at the moment. Very good. So I'll go back to the Perth East, West and South Corridor upgrade. Is that part of it? No. No? no. Okay, that's no. Perth Airport Third Runway? No. Oh, okay. Perth Container Terminal Capacity Enhancement? Uh, no. And my last one on this, Improved Road Access Remote WA. No. Well, uh, just one other clarification. Sorry, on yes. Senator, uh, on the Nepean um, Hawksby, Hawksby Nepean flood uh, risk management yeah. system, we we are we do actually have a draft business case on that. You do. Yeah. Oh, that's good. Okay. Ladies and gentlemen, I thank you very much for coming back for all of ten minutes, whatever it was, and I really appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you. And I am finished with Infrastructure Australia. Senator, while we're waiting for the next item, can I give you the information you asked on the WA infrastructure package? The $499.1 million payment in 2015. Um, the projects uh, that are being funded with that funding, um, Northlink uh, WA, Tonkin Highway grade separations, that's $84.4 million Australian money, Australian government money. Yep. Swan Valley Bypass, 54.4. Quinana Freeway, Row Highway to Russell Road, widening southbound, 23.2. Yep. Row Highway, Berkshire Road, grade separation, 8.8. .8. 8? 8.8, 8. 8. 8. 8. Yep. yes. Um, Mitchell Freeway, Burns Beach Road to Hester Avenue, 189.1 million. The Reed Highway, Malaga Drive, intersection grade separation, 61.2 million dollars. Uh, Perth Traffic Congestion Management Program, 22.4. The Auburn Grove train station precinct, yep. roadworks, $20 million. And the Great Eastern Highway, Belogaman Road to Mundaring, $9.6 million. Uh, and there's a total of 26, that's our current spend rates. And as Mr Pitar advised earlier, $26 million in savings that have been achieved across those projects have been reallocated to the Perth Freightlink project. So what, just quickly, what did that all total up to? Uh, 473.1. For 73.1. And you're tabling that as well? Yeah, I'll table the document. Yep. Look, that's fine, Mr Murdoch. Thank you very much. Can I thank the department for being so efficient? Thank so, you. Where are we going to so, Chair, we've yes. got uh, ATSB outside, or you can move to surface transport. I've got, I've got probably half a dozen questions for surface transport. Well, do you want to do surface transport and then we'll move to ATSB? Yeah. That's well. great stuff. And you haven't got Cassie yet? Uh, Cassie's just about here. Well, you're having cancer, are you? ATSB are outside. You go cook at me. No, well, that's not me, mate. Marcus, welcome. Well, go cook it in. I oh, damn. I'm the deputy I'm chair. I'm bloody well It's the Surface transport, Chair. Good, thank you. Chair, can I kick off? You're quick. I'll be quick. I want to talk about the Motor Vehicle Standards Act review and the economic Certainly. Uh, modelling. Did the department uh, or modeller consider the impact on individual dealerships or brands? Uh, Marcus James, uh, Acting Executive Director of uh, Surface Transport Policy. Um, I can't answer that at the moment. Um, I don't. I don't know. I'd have to check. Because you don't know. Yeah. Because I don't, don't know. Want to. Not because I don't want. Oh, to. okay. <laughs> All right. That's yeah. Just that's fine. 
How long before you could get the nod on that? Um, we'll try and find out very quickly for you, sir. Yeah, I think there was modelling done mm. of uh, the likelihood of personal imports. Yeah, um, good. But I don't think it was a, a comprehensive economic modelling on impact to dealerships. There were estimates made of the likelihood of the numbers of volumes involved. I think there was an estimate of uh, an upper limit of uh, upper volume of around 30,000 vehicles would be uh, would be likely to access personal imports. Mm, that's correct. It's 30,000. Okay. But, well, but no can... no uh, economic analysis of impact on dealerships was has been undertaken. All, all brands. Uh, no. Okay. Um, so I, no. I'll, right. I'll check that uh, while yeah. we're progressing tonight. So. Uh, currently, there's about a bit over one million new vehicles enter the Australian yeah, market. Uh, the ones that personal How many are coming in now? Ah, there's completely different schemes at the moment. There, we've got schemes for specialist oh, enthusiast yeah. vehicles and the like. So they're not like for like sender at the moment. Um, but I'll get you the volumes of how many are coming in on uh, special permits. Well, Thank you. Oh, mm -hmm. Okay, thanks. So did they, the, the department or the model, consider what price point these vehicles may be seen to be viable? Um, certainly looked at as part of the regulatory impact work that's currently happening, um, which will be developed for the legislation, certainly did look at uh, the likelihood of which parts of the market and certainly the, the view was it was more likely to be the upper end of the market would be more likely for personal inputs, where the greater price variation and model variation is likely. Okay, thanks Mr Murdoch. And was there any consideration that in 2015 the most expensive 30,000 new motor vehicles sold had a weighted average price of 140,000. Was that the figure? I know uh, you did say it's the top end. Yeah, I'd, I'd have to check. I'd... Yeah, sure. Okay. Mm. And uh, I can add that um, in terms of uh, current imports, it's about 20,000 20, vehicles imported into Australia each year under current concessional arrangements. So 20,000, Senator Xenophon, is the yeah. number that's currently coming in under concessional schemes, principally quick. specialist and enthusiast vehicles. So this would go up to at least 30,000 so this But these would be yeah. 30,000 which are essentially general purpose vehicles or available to the market as opposed to the to the current concessional schemes which so relate 30, to 30,000 plus 20,000. That's correct. Okay. Okay, so well, uh, did you model the impact of a loss of these models being sold by Australian dealerships and what they mean or what that means for that part of the market? Um, we haven't. I'll just get Ms Wheeland up to the table, just on the sure. modelling. Um, we, as I said, we didn't do general economic impact in relation to the models or brands. Just, um, could you just repeat that yes, question again? Yes, I can. Again? I just asked, um, did you model the impact of a loss of these models being sold by Australian dealerships and what that means for that part of the market? Yep. Uh, Minister uh, Donna Whelan, General Manager, Strategic Policy Branch, Surface Transport Policy Division. Um, Minister Fletcher, in announcing the reforms in February, put out an economic fact sheet about the implications of the reforms Sorry. on the sector more broadly. Um, the modelling that relates to the dealership impacts is largely minimal, and that's been. <coughs> excuse me, I've just run to get here. Um, reaffirmed by the, uh, a release put out by the largest franchised dealers network in Australia uh, to the stock exchange that said that they expect the impacts to be on dealerships to be minimal. To the, the impact to be minimal? Okay. But there's been Do no modelling done. The fact, sheet, the fact sheet hasn't um, been fact checked, has it? The impacts are very uh, dependent on the a couple of consumer uh, impacts, one of which is uh, exchange rates and therefore whether um, it makes economic... OK, I've got one last question I want to... Whether it makes financial sense for the individual to, to purchase that vehicle and... Um, assume Don't that's the question. Yeah. Don't go away. No, you're still listening. My last question then, if I, if I can, please. Did the modelling consider any impact on taxation? Uh, we looked at the impacts on taxation, but the, uh, if what you're asking, Senator Stoll, is there any difference in the uh, taxation arrangements in relation to the reforms, uh, the government announced the removal of the $12,000 import duty on uh, used vehicles. That has a negligible uh, impact because, in reality, it's rarely imposed because it's only imposed in the context where you don't have a, an approval from the vehicle regulator to import that vehicle. 
and in practice uh, consumers have get that approval from our department, from our vehicle regulator. What, what about taxation collection? Uh, as in through, through luxury car tax, yeah. etc. cetera. Um, there, there is minimal impact on those because those duties, etc., will be imposed as they are now for vehicles that are imported into Australia. Thank you very much. Chair, I have no further questions uh, for thank you, Transport Captain. Policy, but can I say, I do have for Policy and Research Division, I have to pop into a quick meeting, then I'll be straight back. For which? I have Policy and Research Division, I have ATAR, A, ARTC Local Government and Territories Division and, the, and Western oh, Sydney right. Unit. Just, just checking, Chair, to finish with surface transport. I am finished with surface transport. Okay. I don't know if anyone Who else we is. Seen that? Thank you. All right, thank you. Um, do you wish to proceed now to ATSB? Yes, I believe. All right, CASA, let's go. CASA? So, Still in the way. Well, um, they're not here. Oh, we've got we've got well, well, I mean, we've given plenty of notice that we're ahead of schedule. So, we've got. We, we oh well, that's that's. Where are we going? We've got ATSB yeah. and AMSA are available if you want to move. Right, to right, go on. Is, is anyone want them? Yeah, I've got which for ATSB. Oh, right. ATSB. Okay. Service transport. Done. Thanks. Bill. Yeah. Yeah. Do you have any questions on the LLG? Do you think ATSB would take up? All right. Yeah. Do you want to kick off? How much have we got for ATSB? How much have we got for ATSB? One question. One or two questions. Might be the same question. And then you've got CASA, have you? Yeah. Have you got much? I've got a meeting I can shoot to for 15 minutes. So what do you want to do to... What, what do you need to get out of the road, survey before you make four? Oh, you? I've got four. But there's this back four. Right. Because I want to get out. I want to get out of here. I thought they'd like gone home. Well, so did I. Mm. Cassa and ATSB. ATSB. Oh, shit, right, eh? Quick, hurry up. I thought you because I don't want to leave the room. Send a voice. We're going to get to Mr Dolan, welcome. Could you uh, give the committee an update, please, on the uh, revisited report into the ditching off Norfolk Island? Uh, Senator, we've gathered all the information, documentation and other evidence that we require to do a full reassessment. That's currently being analysed by the investigation team. Uh, so they're in the, in the business of analysing uh, all the what they've acquired and, and drafting a report. You are to tell us when you expect to see that out and are you able to tell us who's leading the team? Uh, the current estimate is that we'll have a draft available for consideration by uh, directly involved parties by June uh, and it has been led by Dr Mike Walker from our Brisbane office. Mm -hmm. Thank you. So just following questions from that chair, thank you. Uh, uh, Mr Dolan, uh, you managed to um, get the, uh, the flight recording, flight recorder, the flight data recorder yes, uh, from 40 odd metres or whatever it was mm -hmm. uh, off Norfolk 50. Island. Um, were you able to retrieve data from that? Uh, both from the uh, cockpit voice recorder and from the flight data right. recorder. Right, and, and can you indicate in broad terms whether that information was useful or not? Uh, the flight data recorder, because it only recorded limited parameters, added some value, as I understand it, but not a huge amount. Uh, but the cockpit voice recorder had two hours of recording and added some valuable information for the team. Right. And um, have there been any issues raised by any of the uh, 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 interested parties, uh, affected parties, uh, in terms of the issue, issues of procedural fairness, uh, issues of... Uh, the process involved? Uh, none that have been brought to my attention, Senator. It's the more detailed management of the project is with Mr Walsh. Is there anything you're aware of in terms yeah, no, of concerns, uh, Mr Walsh? Julian Walsh, General Manager of Strategic Capability. I'm not aware of any concerns. We've been um, um, liaising closely with uh, the crew of the aircraft, the captain and the, and the, uh, the co-pilot. Um, and um, I'm not aware of any concerns. I think it's been quite productive and uh, they engaged well and I'm not aware of any concerns. Sure. And finally, in respect of MH370, I note that the budget said that there'll be no further funds. Is that right? No. Uh, that's, the current, that's the position. There's uh, no further appropriations. Um, to summarise, Senator, 
the estimated total cost of covering the entire search area is of the order of $180 million, right. of which $80 million was... A... Sorry. Sorry? 100 men from Malaysia. Yeah, sorry, I was going for with Australia first, Mr. Yeah. Uh, of which 100 million is contributed by, up to 100 million by Malaysia, Australia had it, um, and the Chinese have given us um, 20 million dollars in kind and in cash, and the rest 60 million dollars from the Australian So, so government. the search is basically, there won't be any more active, will anyone else be taking up the search, or is, is there basically a, an acceptance that there will be no uh, attempt to to, the, to to find MH370. The position of the three governments, Senator, was if we completed the search of the defined 120,000 square kilometres without success, then the search would then be concluded. Right. Thank you. Yes. ATS speaking, go home. Chair, just in recognition, uh, Mr Dolan will be finishing his role as the ATSB Chief Commissioner in June. I'd just like to place on record uh, certainly my personal appreciation of his work over the last few years and wish him the best and his family for his retirement. What do you mean retirement? Well, to the next phase of his life, shall we put it that way? Right, uh, get out of here while they're going. Good and congratulations. Well done, congratulations. Chair, while we wait for the swap over, can I just ask Mr. Murdoch yeah, okay. the figure that you gave me was from the $499 million GST grant. I was asking where the, the 444 that's disappeared. So that's the, 444 million has disappeared. There's a cut of 444. Oh, we dealt with that earlier, Senator, in terms of the movement of funds, largely with, in Western Australia with the reprofiling. So if you can just show me where that 400, the cuts in the yeah. 444. Well, how that's trend. Yeah, it's a movement of funds across the projects, which Mr. Pitar outlined earlier, but I'll get you that on notice. If you can get, before we leave? I'll try if to. If you can yeah. try and do that, thank you. Yeah. That's and I'll table the other one. Thanks, Mr. Murdoch. Right, our questions for CASA, and if Senator Zenderfond's not here, I might get you to go home. Hey, Dad. Bad luck, he's back. You're into it, go on. About to send them home. Mr. Um, Skidmore, thank no, you. Be for quick. <laughs> if you didn't interrupt me, Chair, I'd be, I'd be quicker. Uh, Mr Skidmore, um, you may be aware in, in terms of uh, understand that there is a rally of general aviation taking place in Tamworth tomorrow. You're probably aware of that. Uh, Mark Skidmore, Chief Executive Officer and Director of Aviation Safety for the Civil Aviation Safety Authority and yes, Senator I am. Okay, and, and as I understand it, there are a number of uh, 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 unhappy parties involved in general aviation who are concerned about a number of issues including uh, the ADSB. Have you had an opportunity or has CAS had an opportunity to engage uh, with various groups that will be at this rally in Tamworth tomorrow? Senator, I'm not exactly, exactly sure who will be at the rally tomorrow. Right. And in so it's difficult to actually say we've engaged with anyone, but we've engaged with a number of people regarding ADSB. Right. Is there any plan to delay the implementation of ADSB given some of the concerns that have been raised in uh, the general aviation community? And you're aware of the submission of, uh, uh, of Dick Smith of the 14th of August last year and the evidence he gave to a Senate inquiry in respect to this. Senator, currently CAS has no plans to extend or change the mandate that we have for ADSB. Right. But you are aware of the concerns of the financial impact it could have on general aviation? I'm aware that concerns have been raised, yes, and. And have those concerns been in any way uh, uh, tested or, or attempts to, to ascertain in CASA's eyes, the validity or otherwise of those concerns about the impact of ADSB on general aviation. Senator, the mandate was set some time ago and there was a regular regulatory impact statement was made at the time then. We haven't gone back and revised or updated that because the, the mandate was established some time, I think it was in the 2012 sort of time frame. Right. So we, so we have not, however, I will say that we have been engaging with avionics companies, getting an understanding of systems that are out there and looking at how it the, how costs could be reduced. Okay, but you're, you're aware that we're, we're due to start, I think, well, below, well before New Zealand, for instance, in terms of ADSB. Is that your understanding? In re I'd have to check the timing in regards to New Zealand. Ours is 2017. I am aware the United States is 2020. Right. So we're starting three years before the US. I think New Zealand is due to start, stand corrected, a year after 
the US. I so believe it might be 2021 from memory. Yes. But the mandate we set was, that has been set, was established uh, some time ago and the consultation that occurred with industry occurred back then in regards to setting and establishing the time frames. I'd have to find some of the right. details regarding it. So, so d because of time constraints, Mr Skidmore, what, what has been put to me by a number of people in the general aviation community is that a lot, many general aviation uh, uh, operators uh, will hit the wall because of ADSB, that it will be a significant financial impost, uh, that the costs uh, would in all likelihood come down significantly once the US adopts it uh, by 2020, that uh, why are we, you know, why are we doing this uh, several years earlier than the US, which is going to be the, the market leader, if you like, in rolling this out? Senator, I don't think anyone disagrees that ADSB is a good system and we're putting it in place and there's, there's already 73 or 75 stations that the, the Air Services has established. So we, the system is up and running. It's already been being used. There's a number of people who have already implemented ADSB would be turning around and denying them the benefits of ADSB if we, well, if we what suddenly... What portion of general aviation would have implemented ADSB, do you think? Can you take that on notice? Can I just correct? It's in the number... The mandate is for IFR aircraft, right. so that encompasses a number of operators and a number of systems, it's not just general aviation. In regards to the exact numbers of those who have implemented the ADSB in the general aviation space, I don't have those numbers with me at the moment. If you could take those on notice. And take that on notice. So is CASA still open to talking to representatives of the general aviation community about their serious concerns in respect of ADSB? Anyone can talk to us in regards to asking for an exemption if they can put forward a good safety case, Senator, and, and that's we're, not, we're happy to question. look at it. The question was about the implementation date, which many in general aviation fear will be disastrous for general aviation in this country. CASA has currently said, well, there is an established mandate in regards to the time frame for ADSB, and we have no plans of changing that at this stage, Senator. Notwithstanding Australia's uh, a unique regime, the sort of evidence that uh, Mr Smith gave uh, when he gave evidence, there's also, other, there's also other arguments that would say that if we waited until America was actually implementing, then there wouldn't be the systems around. The price would actually go up, Senator. What? what? If, there's more, if there's more of it... Because, no, say. because all the systems would be being used and being imp implemented into systems in America. Right, so there's been an analysis of that? I've, there's been... I'm just saying there are other arguments that yes. support that... But has that argument been tested? Is it subject to any, any analysis to verify that argument? I mean, both ways, I guess. Well, exactly, both ways. I haven't got the argument in regards to the other issues associated with ATSB either. Right. Have you been invited to attend the Tamworth meeting tomorrow? No, I have not, Senator. OK. That's, I, I didn't know. I honestly didn't know whether you were invited or not. That, that's... Uh, I think you want me to be done now, so... Again, this is your last estimates ever. Uh, I'll capitulate to you. He's thinking about renominating in three Senator years. Senator you got a couple of quick ones? I'm happy to put these on notice, given your constraints on time, Chair. Uh, Mr Skidmore, welcome. Could you uh, take on notice to provide the committee with an update on the uh, process for second risk profiles? Sorry, Senator, I missed that with the door slam. <laughs> I, I, hope, I hope that's not... Uh, yeah, somebody... <laughs> ...to do the coming election. Um, Sector risk profiles, the industry has been very positive about those. Uh, I'd like an update on where CAS's view is at that process, who you've got working on it, and what resources you're investing in it, because it appears to be a good way in terms of uh, collaborating with industry. Yes, um, Senator, I'll take that on notice, and thank you very much for those comments. The uh, ASRR, um, some of the updates you provided online, particularly your speech, I think, in Canada, about some of the progress and things moving forward, can you give us a update against each of the 37 recommendations of the Forsyth report, um, just as to where you're at and your time frame for implementation. Well, we can um, certainly give you an update in regards to the government response to the, the Aviation Safety Regulation Review report and what our implementation is on those. Um, I know what the government response was. I'm, I'm interested in where you're at and, and um, where your time frame for implementation is going, um, particularly around the issues that you're obviously aware of, 48 part one, part 61, 141, the things that are concerning industry. Uh, but I'm also interested, for example, in how well the Industry Complaints Commissioner um, is functioning in, in the way that Forsyth envisaged to get quick turnaround time. So I sort of appreciate some 
uh, actual facts and figures around number of complaints, time to resolution, what the outcomes were, <coughs> how many have had to go back to the board member to indicate that um, CASA has taken a view that perhaps the independent expert, the board member, uh, didn't think were going to be appropriate. Oh, we can certainly do that, Senator. The terms of reference for the ICC were amended to be uh, directly to reporting to the board. Mm -hmm. So that was one of the that was one of the aspects of the aviation safety regulation review that we've implemented. Sure. We can give you more figures in regards to the ICC process mm -hmm. and the complaints. Okay. We um, have spoken on many <coughs> occasions now about colour vision deficient pilots. Uh, we spoke about the safety case that exists for implementing a individualised um, capacity or functional test for somebody who's failed the bench level testing. I'm just wondering what your current position is on that. I've reviewed the paper and I've had the paper reviewed in regards to proposing an operational testing that would be conducted each year. I'm concerned that we'd be imposing another cost on, on applicants in regards to that, so that worries me to start with. But I'm also concerned that operational testing incorporates many variables that we have no control over. So we're working internationally with, to, with other, other regulators. We're proposing papers to actually get some sort of uh, common standard across all of us in regards to assessing CVD. Mm -hmm. The feedback I've had from uh, pilots who are affected by this is that they would prefer to wear that cost as opposed to have the door closed in their face, which is what many of them are facing at the moment. And in terms of the evidence, again, I, as we've talked before, I see very little difference to assessing somebody's capability to pass an IRT on a given day, and we assume they are then going to be safe for the following year, uh, but I'll follow up with interest. Chair, thank you very much. Thank you. Air Services next. <coughs> Senator, uh, Chair, can I just say thank you very much for your support for aviation and for regional aviation in particular? Thank you. Thank you. Thank, Thank you, you for putting up with me. <laughs> there is that. <laughs> there is that. Hard to believe I had a pilot's license. Yeah, that's going to be still flying. No, no, no. no I was just trying to get Skidmore home. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Right. <laughs> <laughs> okay, go. Where are you go, Nick? Thank you, Chair. Um, uh, Harfield, uh, welcome. just want to ask about land and hold short operations at Melbourne Airport. Uh, you wrote to me on the 28th of April 2016. You're renewing, uh, you've actually, um, um, the, there was a voluntary suspension of those nighttime operations in November 2015. That's now being reinstated. Is that right? Uh, Senator Jason Harfield, Chief Executive Officer. That's correct, Senator. And can you provide the committee with details of the, the basis of that um, uh, reinstatement of the Zane and Hold Short operations? Uh, in uh, uh, Senator, we voluntarily um, suspended uh, land and hold short operations sure. at Melbourne back last year, yep. and then we, um, as a result of that, we undertook um, uh, a reassessment and analysis of the um, uh, procedure. In doing so, we improved the controller training in regards to what we would call compromised separation in regards to um, aircraft in a double go-round situation. Uh, we did a further risk assessment, but also uh, including with that was introduced a concept called the stagger. And the stagger means that when uh, we are flying aircraft in lasso operations... Um, so is a new concept the stagger? The stagger means that uh, we, we ensure that the arrival over the um, threshold of each aircraft is staggered. Sounds like someone's over the limit, but anyway. Um. <laughs> what it means is that we get to that um, the uh, event of two aircraft in even a, a go-around situation coming to the intersection of the runway at the same time is um, reduced because of the fact that we have a different timing from when the aircraft are landing on the runway. OK. Could you provide uh, documents in respect of that? To Absolutely. The in due course. And I did raise uh, previously a couple of specific instances where uh, uh, people wrote to me saying I was on this flight at this time mm -hmm. and it looked awfully close. Will you, have you, can you just remind me whether you got back to me on that? I don't seem to have. Yeah, we did, they were back on the questions on notice. Um, yes. And if off the top of my head there was one that we could track down that was due to um, a go round situation, um, fully controlled, and the other one we couldn't actually track down. Okay, I'll follow that through. Yes, the, uh, that's fine. So, uh, in terms of, will there be an ongoing monitoring of the lasso? Absolutely, Senator. Okay. 
and your air traffic controllers have had extra training in respect of this? Yes, Senator. Okay. Bless you. <laughs> and you. Policy and research. Thanks, fellas. Have a good election. Um, no. No. Not required? No. Okay. Anyway. Make it go hard. Quick. Some other bugger turns up. No. <laughs> well, you taught me. You taught me. Who's got questions? Uh, I have yeah, right. <laughs> right, Policy and research. Thank you, Sandra O'Neill. Thank you very much, Chair. Um, my, my questions go to uh, City's policy. Uh, could you tell me what involvement has the Department of Infrastructure had in the development of the City Deals policy? Um, when the uh, decision was taken to set up the uh, special task force uh, late last year in the department, um, we seconded a number of staff. We seconded seven staff to uh, to then the task force, the city's task force, which was then in the Department of Environment and is now in the Department of Prime Minister and Cabinet. Uh, those staff have worked on various aspects of the development of the city's policy. Um, the uh, the work on establishing the way in which those the city deals, as were announced last Friday, is, will be work taking place from here. So we've been engaged by providing data analysis and, as I said, seconded staff over to work on the task force. OK, so the staff have left the department in, in a seconded role into PMNC? That, that's correct. And they've now returned uh, this week, in fact. Yes. That, so they've returned to you? They returned to us this week. OK, so could you tell me the date in which that the secondment occurred? Uh, certainly. Uh, I think it occurred around about October last year when the city's work was first undertaken. And which, where did they go first? Not to PMC? Uh, to, to the Department of Environment. Okay, and then on to the PMC? Yes. Okay, and was it seven there for that whole period of time? Yeah, seven staff were seconded for that whole period and they've returned to the department this week. And September. will the department be involved in the implementation of the city deals policy? Uh, Senator, at this stage we expect that we will be involved. However, that's uh, yet, to be, um, yet to be worked through. Okay, so what makes you say that at this stage you think you will be? Um, uh, just IDC involvement, um, Senator, at this stage, so interdepartmental committee involvement. Um, has the department been briefed on city deals? Uh, we, we are familiar with the concepts. We've done a lot of analysis in the past of international experience of the city deal type approach. So we're across it and, we, as I said, we did provide uh, some analysis and data to the city's task force. So who's been doing the briefing? Has the department been briefed or have you been briefing? Uh, we've been briefing through our offices that were seconded to the task force and our Bureau of Infrastructure and Transport and Regional Economics has, uh, has been involved in providing data on cities. We were previously producing the State of the Cities report, which has provided some un analytical underpinning and data on Australian cities in urban shape. Okay. And now that your seven seconded staff have returned, what's the process of uh, their return? Do they provide a detailed update to you on the work that they've been doing? Uh, well, they'll, they'll integrate back into the work we'll do on... We've got a number of transport projects which involved urban, urban design and urban shape issues, projects like the Melbourne Metro, Brisbane Cross River Rail and the like, which are very much uh, urban shaping projects, transformational projects. That team will work on some of those issues now they've returned to us. OK, but the question I asked was, do they provide you with a report on what they've been doing while they were away? Uh, not per se, I don't think. Not a report in a sense. They've been in constant contact with us. Um, we've worked very closely with them while they've been seconded to the task force. They've been um, a point of liaison with the office. So there's, um, because we've had such regular contact, we don't see it need, the need for a formal report. Um, we've been very closely involved in what they've done while they've been seconded. OK, and uh, do you have any more information you can give me about the city deals at this point? Um, how they'll work, um, as, as um, the Secretary said, um, we have some familiarity with how they've um, worked in the international context. Um, it, it will be led by PM&C, how how, exactly how they um, will apply them in the Australian context. They, they obviously wouldn't work in exactly the same way, and that's still to be worked through. 
Okay. With regard to the National Cities Agenda, um, will the Department be involved in that, the National Cities Agenda? It's the same agenda, Senator. Sorry, I don't understand Continues. the question. Yeah. Um, do you have any particular areas of responsibility that you're aware of with regard to the National Cities Agenda? Uh, no, Senator, that's the way. Uh, so at this stage, the, uh, the planning um, work is still underway and uh, the details are, I suppose, being refined, as Ms Power was saying. So yes, I expect we will have a role, um, as will a number of departments in relation to working together to deliver, um, uh, to deliver the plans. Um, noting that, that it's still early days in that regard. So which departments would they be? Well, obviously led by Prime Minister and Cabinet, so probably best uh, question for them, mm -hmm. um, Senator. Uh, but uh, I know that uh, the other central agencies have been involved, the industry department has been involved, etc. a range of those areas. So could you tell me if any funding's been uh, set aside to ensure the successful implementation of the city's agenda? Uh, that would be a question for PMNC, Senator. Okay, in terms of staffing, uh, you indicated that the staff who were with the city deals policy have returned. There's no, no one allocated at this point of time, is that correct? Uh, not from our department, Senator, but um, again, Pr uh, Prime Minister and Cabinet are responsible for, um, for the, uh, both the issue and for the staff, therefore, that they apportion to it. So just to clarify, there are no staff from your department allocated to city's policy currently? No. Right. Um, is th this is a change, or can you confirm if this is a change from the staffing arrangements since my EFO in December last year? Uh, well, yes, Senator. Um, at that time, we had seconded staff. The seven? Yes. OK. Um, what framework is in place to ensure, or perhaps was in place, to ensure the communication between PM and C in the Department of Infrastructure on city's policy? Did you have a formal arrangement? Uh, not, not a formal arrangement, Senator, but um, we have uh, usual arrangements through interdepartmental committees. Um, but as Ms Power was saying, um, they've been, uh, not only have we had seconded staff as part of the task force, we've also um, been in, in regular contact uh, with them in relation to, you know, development of the plan, etc. Okay. And in, with regard to um, the State of Australian Cities, the report itself, uh, has any work been undertaken in, in preparation for the 2016 State of Australian Cities report yet? That report is now the responsibility of Prime Minister and Cabinet as well. Yeah. Okay, so I'm trying to understand, I think, the integration or the intimacy of the relationship between the staff that you had there seconded to that. Do, do you have any idea if they've been undertaking work on that report? It would be a question you'd have to put to Prime Minister and Cabinet. Okay. The exact nature of their day-to-day -day work, I'm, I'm, not, I'm not sure of, Senator. So with the awareness that you have, because you said you do work closely and you're having interdepartmental meetings, have you any idea about the status or the development of that report? No, I don't, Senator. Do you have any idea when it will be, when it'll be published? No, you'd have to ask PMNC, Senator. Noting, Senator, that the focus of the current work has been on um, getting to the Smart Cities uh, announcement and the release of that plan. Um, so it has been, um, you know, quite a workload to get to that point. So that's been the focus of what we've been doing. So what do you think about the likelihood of the report being published any time soon? Uh, again, as Ms Power said, it's a question for Prime yeah, Minister and Cabinet. Um, I'll ask, bearing in mind that it might be the same answer, but um, is it expected that the report will be more substantial in content than the 2014-15 report? Yeah, I'm sorry, Senator, it's the same PM and answer. C. Mm. Um, are you still intending to produce the report through the Bureau of Trans uh, Infrastructure, Transport and Regional Economics? It's going to PM and C. Um, so, that answers those questions. <coughs> thank you. So we now go to ARTC. Oh. ARTC, thank you. All right, thank you. Thank you. Go ahead, I was supposed to go to this again. Yeah. <laughs> Look at them all at the funeral, this gangster that she got shot. Ibrahim. I don't know how he's got away with it. I don't know how he gets away with it. We're just checking, Chair, on ARTC. We, Are you kidding me? We're not sure that, because I was scheduled so much later.
as to whether we oh, found well, them. Well, if you want to, while we're waiting, we can go to... Yeah, here yeah, it is. Uh, that's that's brilliant. brilliant. You can brilliant. always rely on the rail. Always on time. Always on time. Hit it time. Hit it time. Right, now we can do it. Okay. Hello, Mr. Fulton. Welcome. Thank you. This you won't take long. You've been busy, Mr. Fulton. I want to talk about the inland rail, Mr. Fulton. The budget says in budget paper two on page 171 of the $10.7 billion inland rail project. And I want to quote the government will provide up to $593.7 million in additional equity over three years from 2017-18 to the Australian Rail Track Corporation to progress the inland rail project, including land acquisition, the continuation of pre-construction and due diligence activities. Is that correct? Yes, it is. Okay. So will this involve any actual construction at this point? Uh, there may be some small amounts, but the bulk of the work really is uh, in accordance with the 10-year plan we put together last year. It's really pre-construction works. Yeah. Around, uh, you know, the land acquisition, environmental yeah. approvals, uh, geotechnical work, corridor, finalising the corridor, that type of work. Sure. So just so I didn't hear that wrong, the bulk of it, the bulk of the $593.7 million will be in all that? In all of that. So I ask, how many kilometres of actual track build will there be out of the $593.7 million? Will we get a uh, metre or a kilometre? Or no, anything? there won't be any track built for that money. That's all part of the 10-year plan, all pre-construction works to get the corridor ready okay. to commence uh, construction. All right, thank you very much. Now I'll go to the Tarkula announcement, if I may. And of course, I've got two Tarkula announcements. I have one from the previous Minister Albanese for December the 20th, 2012, the Adelaide Perth Rail Corridor Upgrade, which is a ministerial media release. And now I have now the Prime Minister's uh, media release of the 9th of March, 2016, the Australian Rail Track Corporation to deliver significant rail upgrade, Tarkula. And you're very well mentioned in all the way through. Are these, are these the same projects? No, the project I think you're referring to earlier was to do with some rail replacement on curves between uh, Port Augusta and Tarkula. And, and uh, what this more recent project is, is to complete 600 kilometres of the 700 kilometres between Adelaide and Tarkula to complete the rest of the rail replacement right. program. And Mr Albanese's was Tarkula to Perth? Uh, no, Port Augusta to Tarkula. Oh, there was some rail replacement on curves, which is where it wears, okay. obviously. And there was some, and, and back, back before that, there was some rail replacement between Wyler and Broken Hill, which okay. took into account Port Augusta to Port Piri. So the more recent announcement is completing the rail replacement to 60 kilograms over 600 of the 700 kilometres, because 100 kilometres has already been done. So was there any overlap between the two of Not the works? All. Not at all. No, no. Two completely different two completely, projects. Two okay. completely different projects. Thanks, Mr Fuller. I thought if anyone would know, it would be you. So have contracts been entered into with REM Steel for the manufacturing of rails for the Adelaide to Takula rail project? Uh, not yet, Senator. <laughs> OK. Could you tell us the value of the contract? It's 72,000 tonnes of steel, um, you know, depending on negotiations, that uh, it's in the order of... Uh, you know, 70 to 90 million dollars worth of steel. Um, okay, sorry, 70 to 90 Se million dollars? Yeah, it's, in, it's in that range, 70 to 80 in that range. And I, I mentioned Narum for obvious reasons. Is there other tenderers that are quoting on it? No, we have a standing standard contract with Arium. We okay. buy all, we replace rail regularly across our whole network. Okay. And we have a standard contract with them. Oh good, so Arium will get it. To provide uh, yeah, they, need to, they provide rail tours for our network and we test their price against uh, others. Okay, so when do you expect to uh, have the first delivery of rails? Well, we're still in, final, we're still in negotiations with Arium sure. and, uh, and developing the project plan and we're still finalising discussions with the, uh, the government. Uh, so it's still we, early days. Sure, are we expecting this year? Oh, we expect it to be happening this year for sure. Okay, all right. Um, 
When was the last time that ARTC officers met with the representatives of ARIA? We meet with them regularly. Uh, I uh, probably last had a conversation with them a fortnight ago, but uh, one of my <coughs> managers uh, is in regular contact with ARIA, both from the yeah. procurement point of view, right, and secondly for final design of the rollout program to install it. Okay. And when you say this year, are we, we thinking uh, the closer to now or are we talking We'd like to think it could start, uh, you know, July, August of this year. Okay. Production? Yep. Okay. All right. Tremendous. Let's hope. Let's keep our fingers crossed. Um, will any other forms of structural steel um, made by Arium be used in the project? No, it's purely rail. Just rail. Okay. Yep. Does the ARTC use Australian-made steel in other infrastructure upgrades, such as signalling poles and level crossings? Oh, most of those poles are if, uh, made of other products, but it's a very small amount, minor amount. I couldn't tell you exactly where some of that steel would come from, but it's of a very most of our steel is in rail. Uh, right. We install very little signal signalling masts. Uh, they're just legacy issues we've had okay. on the network for a long time. All right. Is the project part of uh, Labor's previous 95 million investment? The $95 million, I think you're referring to there, Senator, was a $95 million yeah. investment of which yeah. uh, it was allocated to the Bookfield network. Yeah. And part of the negotiations, uh, ultimately, $60 million of that $95 million was, uh, uh, was invested in the Brookfield network for rail replacement under that program. The other $35 million uh, involved uh, uh, $15 million of that was for the rail replacement you talked about a bit earlier. Yep, sure, 15. 20 million was for installing a CTC between Port Augusta and Tarkula. Okay. And the balance of it was for six loops that we're just currently commissioning between Melbourne and Adelaide. And has ARTC placed any other orders of rail to be used throughout the network? Oh, we do rail replacement on curves right across the network, but yeah, nowhere near to the volume that we're negotiating with Arium at the moment. Okay. But we regularly source rail and, and who rail replacement. And who manufactures that? Arium. It's all Arium? All Arium. Okay, thank you very much. Chair, I have no further questions. Uh, no, I, no, I don't have any further questions of ARTC. Thanks, no, Mr. Well, now, thank thank you, Senator. Thanks very much. See you back in Adelaide. Okay. Make sure you have those fire permits, right? Um, I'm ready to go to local governments and territories. And thank you, Senator Heffernan, for the, right, eh? and all the best in your retirement. Thank you. We might see you along the track. We might, we might do a will See you along the track. I've, uh, <laughs> our, our, work, our managers along the corridor are looking forward to it, Senator. <laughs> <laughs> He'll be cutting the ribbon. <laughs> that is the, the, you said that with a straight face. <laughs> <laughs> OK. Beautiful. Local government and territories, is it? Yep. Fantabulous. Yeah. How are you, McGregor? Good. Can I kick off, off Chair? Yeah. Thank you. Ms Fleming, you ready to go? Yes, yes, no, Tremendous, yeah, thank you. you. Had to do anything, just... uh, given that almost $1 billion has been cut from the financial assistance grants due to no indexation is now complete, has the Department carried out any form of analysis or impact study to determine how much each local government will be impacted? Uh, Robin Fleming, Executive Director, Local Government and Territories Division, Department of Infrastructure. Uh, Senator, uh, we've continued to undertake our analysis, as we've indicated at previous hearings. Sure. What we can say is that um, the number of local governments receiving an increase in their funding over that period is smaller than previously, but there's no direct correlation between the pause to indexation and impacts on local councils that we can identify at this time. How far off are you having that information, do you think? The difficulty, uh, Senator, is, as we explained previously, that the, the financial assistance grants form that applies 13 principles of horizontal equalisation. So those councils that are um, least able to afford to provide services, by virtue of the way the formula within the legislation works, receive usually through the state grant applications uh, adjustments to counter for those adjustments. And so whilst people can predict losses of um, uh, the size of grant by virtue of 
estimating a linear projection as we've indicated last time. There are a number of factors around population growth, economic viability that go up and down. And so we have not been able to identify to date a direct correlation uh, that, that um, causes any discomfort to local governments as a result of indexation pauses to grants, in part because that applies such a small amount of each local government's revenue base. So on saying that, why did the government do it then, if they had no idea what they might save, or what the gov local governments would lose? Or was it just a good idea at the time and chuck it up here and see how it, happened, how it goes? Well, I think as we've discussed previously, the, the government, uh, in dealing with the, the budget, uh, has been forced to make some difficult decisions. This was one of them. Sure. And uh, the uh, I don't the, agree with it, but I understand that it the, happened. The savings that were, were undertaken have been have been utilised on other sure. budget matters. Um, so the, how much are the savings, Mr. Burdick. Uh, I think the savings, uh, as we previously indicated, was around nine hundred and twenty-five million dollars over sure. the over the forward estimates. Okie dokie. So what I'm asking is, can, where can I find where that nine hundred and twenty-five million came from? Which councils? Well, how it, much did they lose? As we've said. Many councils have seen an increase in their grants because of the way in which the population and the uh, horizontal equalisation sure, okay. processes work yep. under the formula. Um, it's not as clear cut uh, to be able to identify councils which are, have lost consistently. So are you not able to tell me that you don't have information that says the ones that were losers, how much they were down? Is that what you're saying? Senator, we can't, can't accurately predict because it's not that you got a one year and an A plus the next year, because each year, regardless of whether the indexation pause was applied or not, council funding goes up and down based on the local government grants assessment of the distribution of funds based on a number of factors. I'm not as sharp as Senator Heffernan. OK, but I think if you've identified, all the government's identified savings of 925 million, I really struggle to understand. You couldn't tell me where that money came from. Well, so Senator, where did you come up with the figure? Was it just a pot so of money, and you look into it at the end of the three it's years? It's a reduction in the quantum of funding that would have applied if indexation applied, but actually how it applies at an individual council level is difficult to assess because it's a application of a formula and consideration of principles applied by local government grants commissions that has a number of varying <coughs> factors apply to it. So we publish the grants on our website and you can track an individual council's payments across multiple years, but it is difficult to assess what that council would have got had the indexation pause not applied because of changes in other variables. So, Ms Fleming, then, has the department done any modelling on how much each local government area has received over the last three years against <laughs> what they would have received if the indexation had not been paused? So we can tell you what each council received, but we cannot identify what the council would have received because that is nope. a decision taken by seven independent state local government grants commission, each one of which applies the horizontal equalisation principles slightly differently in their formula, and then we apply those applications. So Western Australia has a different system to um, Victoria, to South Australia, but they all apply the um, principles in developing how they distribute the Okay, so I'll take this no, you can't, you can't supply me what I want, okay. So we know the indexation of FAGs are off and running again 17, 18, correct? Correct, Senator. Okay, beauty. So can we confirm that the formula the Treasurer is using to index the grants based on population and CPI changes has not been altered since the indexation pause? The formula is the same under the legislation as it's always been. No change, Senate. okay, that's good. Has the Minister received any correspondence from local governments complaining about the cuts? Uh, Senator, local governments... Uh, I have, do, but I'm just asking yeah, the Minister. Local answer. governments uh, do lobby from time to time around the pause indexation, yep. and he would have received mm -hmm. correspondence from various uh, local governments from time mm -hmm. to time. Uh, Are you able to provide us who's the, who those councils were that complained? Do you have oh, we that could take that on notice, Senator. Okie dokie. Well, in that case, Chair, you'd be very happy to know that I have no more further questions for... Chair, I'm just going you to have. Go. Quick. Ms Fleming, on the FAGS grants, yes, they're frozen for three years now. I just looked at the council. I live in Inverell Shire. 
I think they lost about 400,000 because of that freeze and indexation removed, right? But they received an extra 4.5 million under the Rose Recovery Programs this financial year. Next financial year, and are very happy because they're way in front with that funding. Is that a feedback you've received? What I'm saying is that doubling, sorry, the trebling this financial year and next year on Rose Recovery is more than compensated for the for the index freezing of FAGS grants. For, for is that most correct, count, Mr. Murder? That's correct. Yeah, the council I live in is getting an extra four million dollars in two years on uh, roads recovery money, which they must spend on roads. Yep. Of course, FAG, FAGS grants they can spend on anything. I think they're about 400,000 short there, so they're about 3.6 million in front in the two years. Yep. Yeah, good, just want to put that on the record. That's right. Right, eh? Did you hear me, Sterlo? No. Oh, I'm sorry you didn't hear it. But just, do you reckon you might do a runner while you can? They're gone. You're releasing You're the talking to we're gone. <laughs> So we only need Western Sydney. Western Sydney, yeah. Where's Western Sydney again? Just west of Sydney. <laughs> Can I tell you, those of us from Perth don't care where Western Sydney is. Oh, well, right. in, in 1996, because we don't know what the score so is now, yeah. but in Where's Perth? 1996, when I made my main oh, speech, more people were in the western suburbs of Sydney than all of the rural Australia, so it's come a long way since then, too, I presume. Is this right the last lot? Yep. yep. On to you, mate. I'm the licking wishes. I've got a couple of hours of questions okay. here. Okay, you have it. Thank you. <laughs> uh, Mr. McRundle. Did I get it right? Yeah. McRandall. Right. Sorry, it's, Mac Randall. it's all blurry, Mr. McRandall. In terms of the joint scoping study for rail needs for Western Sydney, where's the study? Okay. Uh, Senator uh, Brenda McRandall, Executive Director of the Western Sydney Unit. Um, <clears throat> The study was announced uh, November last year by the New South Wales and federal governments. Um, the intention is to have a public discussion paper around the middle of this year. That's being drafted at the moment, um, together with the New South Transport for New South Wales. Um, our expectation is that it will be available around the middle of this year for um, uh, public um, display and comments, and a final paper will be developed at the end of the year. Can you be more specific than around the middle? Because we're around the middle now, aren't we? We Well, I, I, around the June-July time frame, but we're still <laughs> working through some drafts with Transport for New South Wales, so I don't want to put a specific date on, on okay. that. When was it originally going to be due? Uh, it was in uh, June was our intention. Thank you, Doki. In that case, I don't have anything else. Thank you. How good is that? Excellent. Thank you. Thank you. Easy. Thank you. Chair, just, are we... June, July, just Yeah, we're finished. We're finished. Can I have the indulgence of the, of the chair yes. just for a minute? <coughs> you can. Thank oh. you very much, Chair. That would, that, would be, that would be a first. Chair, I just want to take this opportunity to wish you all the very best yeah, in yeah. your future path. Nearly 11 years ago, I came into this place and was sitting on that side with you. And for nearly Jesus nine madman. years or something, nine years or something, I was on that committee with you, Bill. Senator, Senator Heffernan. And uh, two of the greatest things I think we did were stopping the BSEB from the States and stopping the ADM takeover of Grain Corp. And it was an absolute honour to work with you. Oh and it will be a great loss to this place. Your tenacity, your intelligence, your ability to be across every issue in detail, and that's one of the things I learned for you. Know your stuff, Sparky. And very much your representation of rural and regional people has been absolutely extraordinary. We're going to miss your colour and movement. <laughs> I am particularly going to miss you, Senator Heffernan, and I hope the winds blow you on a wonderful path for your future. Thank you. Thank you very much, Minister. Thank you very much, Minister. And it is a great pleasure, but to understand the privilege of being in Parliament and the privilege of being able to help people just with a, knowing the right person to phone, etc. It just blows you away. And uh, yeah, and, and so I'm most grateful for your words. And the other thing is to see young people make their way up the scale and someone like yourself now doing a very important job for rural Australia in particular. Yes, so thank you very much, but uh, it, yeah, it's, uh, I've got to go and jump off the cliff now, hand my phone in, hand the car keys in. <laughs> and Senator Nash, um, Minister, we join you in your comments.
uh, and your best wishes for good fortune to smile upon not only Senator Heffernan, but Margaret, his long uh, injury. I was going to say suffering, but she Probably. is, uh, uh, I, I won't presume to know, but certainly uh, he has added to all of our lives here and we will miss him. You're quite right. Senator Heffernan. Senator Bill, one of the greatest things you did was a great working relationship with Stirlo. Yeah. On the other side of the po politics, and the two of you worked so well oh, together, yeah, that's good. That you put politics aside and you did the better for the <coughs> committee, and I think you both should be saluted very much for that. Yeah, All well, the best, mate. Look, I would like to acknowledge uh, Glenn um, and the... Uh, and I mean, I have to say, if you're a visitor to this committee, as we call them, an interloper, yeah. um, it, it sometimes is a bit of a shock to culture because we may appear to be blueing when we're winking <laughs> on the side. But, but we've absolutely, Stella, haven't we? We've absolutely dealt with the issue, set aside the politics. I have a very strong view in public life, don't have a price and don't play politics with people's livelihoods. And I think that sits this very well. And then we go to the professional staff that have actually made our reports readable and, and intellectual and logical. We must thank the professional staff as well. Can I just quickly chair, so for those watching and listening, thinking, why isn't he saying anything? We had a man hug yesterday. I enjoyed one of the best valedictory speeches I spoke yesterday. No one is going to miss the heft more than me here, and that sounds very strange because we are the yin and yang in the Senate. Um, we said a lot yesterday. And we'll certainly still be mates for a long, long time to come, Hef. Okay, I'm, so I'm getting emotional. Thank you. And thank you very much for the hands hard people over the years who successfully have deleted most of the swear words. <laughs> uh, all all well. the best to you, Jim Whiteley. Yeah. yeah. Thank you, you Jim. Um, you've been a great secretary. So we'll adjourn. Good night.